Camel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, here it is, Saturday night again, and time for our weekly visit with that excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's waiting for us in the old familiar study, so let's waste no time enjoying it. Good evening, Mr. Bell. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. You bet I am. When it's time for Dr. Watson to tell a new adventure he had with the immortal Sherlock Holmes, I'm not going to miss a <laughs> second. It's nice of you to say so, my boy. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Before I sit down, Dr. Watson, you mind if I take a look at the old metal case on the mantelpiece? It wasn't there last week. No, I placed it there because it played a prominent part in tonight's story. You see, it's a memento of yet another encounter that Sherlock Holmes and I had with the arch-villain of London crime. Professor Moriarty. But what is it, Dr. Watson? Looks like an old compass. That's exactly what it is, my boy. But there are no numerals on it. Just these strange figures around the dial. Oh, those apparent hieroglyphics helped us to solve one of the most diabolical murders that we ever encountered. I call it the adventure of the half-eaten apple, the Coptic compass, and the unclothed corpse. I can hardly wait, Dr. Oh, I'm sure you'll wait long enough to have a word with our listeners now, won't you, Mr. Bell? (laughs) Right. Men, aren't you sick and tired of hair preparations which leave your hair looking and feeling greasy? When you run your hand over your hair, does your hair feel sticky and dirty? Does grease come off on your hand? If so, then now's the time to change to Kreml hair tonic. The first thing you'll notice about Kreml is how clean it smells, how clean it looks and feels on your hair and scalp. When you use Kreml, you can run your hand over your hair. And honestly, men, it's a pleasure. Not a trace of that greasy, sticky feeling. Yet you can't beat Kreml to keep hair neatly groomed. You see, Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair in place longer, with such a natural, well-groomed appearance. So, men, let Kreml give your hair this handsome, clean-cut look which is bound to make a hit, both on the job and with the ladies. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how's about the compass, the half-eaten apple, and the... And the unclothed corpse? (laughs) Well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began on a November morning shortly after the turn of the century. Holmes, seldom one to indulge in exercise... For its own sake, it displayed a rare burst of activity and joined me in a stroll through Regent's Park. Just before noon, we retraced our steps, and as we turned the corner into Baker Street, I nearly collided with a tall, well-dressed man walking in the other direction. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Oh, it's quite all right, sir. Excuse me. Aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am. I'm Major Stanley. Indeed. You're a little, little early for our appointment, Major Stanley. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Dr. Watson. I am early, Mr. Holmes, and when your housekeeper told me you were still out, I decided to take a stroll. Then let's walk back together, and perhaps you can tell me your problem as we go. It isn't exactly my problem, Mr. Holmes. You see, I made the count to the Maharaja of Kasul. Oh, really? It's a very interesting job, I should imagine. Uh, yes, it is. You know, is. I was in India myself, uh, for Shawa and further north. I was oh, once attacked uh, by, Quite, uh, Watson. Some oh, other time, don't you think? Oh, sorry, Holmes. The no, Maharaja's problem would seem either. pressing since his emissary has been oh. so eager to reach us. Oh. Uh, please continue, Major Stanley. Uh, Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the Star of Kasul? A fabulously valuable diamond, isn't it? Yes. It's the treasure of the Maharaja's collection. At the moment, it's in the vaults of the Bank of England. No, it's the best place for it, I should say. There have been several jewel robberies lately. Uh, so I've been told, and that's why I've come to you, Mr. Holmes. You see... The Maharaja has come to England to have his portrait painted by Sergeant. Your problem becomes apparent, Major Stanley. When this portrait is painted, the Star of Kasul will no doubt be set in the Maharaja's turban. And you quite justifiably feel concerned about the jewel's safety. Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It must be cleverly and closely guarded on its daily journey from the vaults to the Maharaja's suite and back. Well, hardly sounds like a job for you, Holmes. No, Major Stanley. Without wishing to appear conceited, I may say that such a routine matter is rather outside my scope. The Maharaja insists on having you, Mr. Holmes. I assure you his fee would be princely. Uh, Here we are at 221B. Come in, Major Stanley. We'll discuss the matter further, if you like. Mrs. Hudson, we're back. Very well, Doctor. 
Oh, Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? Uh, there were two gentlemen waiting to see you. Said they had an appointment, but they've gone. Said they'd come back later. And uh, did they leave their names? No, sir, they didn't. Well, that's odd. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Hi, sir. Let's go upstairs, shall we, Major Stanley? Very well, Doctor. Uh, regarding your problem, Major Stanley... It occurs to me that Humphrey Pedder might be a good man to see. Humphrey Pedder? Yes, I'm not personally acquainted with him, but I'm told that he specializes in the uh, uh, more physical aspects of detective work. The Maharaj will be very distressed if you refuse him, Mr. Holmes. Naturally, I wish to... Uh... I'm sorry, Major Stanley. I've made my decision. I can't handle the case. See Mr. Pedder, if you will. But, but Mr. Holmes, uh, can't, can't we sit down and talk about it at least? Yes, Holmes. After all, there's no need to be rude. I'm afraid not. Good day, Major. Well, I, I've heard you were eccentric, Mr. Holmes, but I, I didn't know how eccentric. Holmes, what on earth's the matter with you? You ask him up, and then you won't even let him in, uh, enter the room. For an excellent reason, Watson. Come inside. Look, there on the floor. Great heavens. I could hardly let the emissary of a Raja walk into a room containing a corpse, and an unclothed one at that. <laughs> Lift the blanket off the face, Watson. Right, you are, huh? There. Oh, oh doctor. The poor man. Is that the face of one of the men that called here? Aye, sir, it is. Cover it again, Watson. I saw the other one leave, sir. He said his friend had already left. Oh, I never dreamed... This that... one you saw leaving, was he carrying anything? A bundle, perhaps? No, sir, he wasn't. Could you describe him? Well, he was tall and thin... And he had a but high if he was forehead. carrying no bundle, where are the corpses' clothes? There's no sign of them in here. What a shocking thing, sir. A murder right in your living room. Oh, will I send for the police? Definitely not, Mrs. Hudson. And please keep this to yourself. Aye, sir. When a corpse is deposited on my own carpet, there's a certain point of honour in being able to present the police with a complete explanation when I do call them in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. What a terrible thing. Holmes, this is incredible. Why leave a corpse here? And why unclothed? The obvious reason to remove clothing would be to make identification difficult. And how did the murderer get the clothes out of here? Mrs. Hudson said that he wasn't carrying anything. We have many other questions to answer, old chap. The knife wound in the heart gives us no clue, I'm afraid. But observe the singular collection of objects that are lying beside the body. Well, let's have a look at them. A railway ticket, a funny-looking compass... And an apple that has been bitten into. The corpse has protruding teeth... I bet you that he didn't make the bite in this apple. Holmes, these must be the murderer's tooth marks. If you're correct, Watson, our murderer is an extraordinary man indeed. Well, why do you say that? Because if you look closely, you'll notice the interesting fact that this bite was made by two sets of upper teeth. <laughs> you're, you're a well no mistake, Professor Moriarty. <laughs> Two sets of upper teeth. Now, that was the best touch. Yes, Carter. I must confess it was neat. Simple, of course. You start the bite with your upper teeth, reverse the apple, and conclude the bite. <laughs> yes, simple. But I trust also somewhat disconcerting for the great Sherlock Holmes. Our past encounters have given me an insight into his very unusual mind. I'd like to have watched his face when he walked in there, Professor. So would I. But the next 24 hours will give me little leisure, I fear. I must arrange for a certain matter concerning a change of ownership in the Star of Kasul. This should be a fascinating game. But the old compass, the railway ticket. Carter, with your somewhat limited cranial development, it must be hard for you to absorb the subtler points in such a plan, but surely its basic purpose is obvious. Sherlock Holmes is about to be engaged by the Maharaja to guard the jewel. I had to divert his attention, so I perpetrated an intriguing murder on his own doorstep and surrounded the corpse with meaningless and completely unrelated objects which I knew would torment his curiosity and keep him off my trail. And that corpse would take some explaining to the police too, Professor. Yes, that's why I placed it there. It puts him in an acutely embarrassing position. He has to try and solve the case or become the laughing stock of London. <laughs> it's one of your neatest jobs, Professor. Oh, I won't say that, Carter. But I'm quite sure that I've posed a problem that Sherlock Holmes will be totally unable to resist. <laughs> I 
I can't resist this problem, Watson. No fee on earth could make me bother with the safety of a mere diamond when such a puzzle presents itself. On my soul, you talk rather as though you were settling down to a game of chess. You've got to solve this problem, Holmes, or else it's going to put you in a ridiculous position with Scotland Yard. And just think if it got into the papers. I shall reserve my imagination for the problem posed. The question of the apple is, of course, obvious. Well, I suppose all you have to do is to find a man with two sets of false upper teeth. <laughs> Very simple. Quite. The only way such an imprint could be left is to take a half bite with the upper teeth, reverse the apple, and repeat the procedure. The only question here is, why indulge in such a bizarre performance? Well, whatever the reason, those are the murderer's tooth marks. Unquestionably. You notice the eaten portion of the apple has only just commenced to turn brown. The bite was undoubtedly taken in this room. But to identify teeth marks is a monumental problem and might prove insoluble. Let's turn our attention to the compass for a moment. Well, I've never seen one like it. There are no numerals on it, no points of the compass indicated anywhere. Just a lot of funny little squiggles. Oh, no, Watson. Surely you recall the singular affair of the Coptic patriarchs? Do you overrate my memory, Holmes? In any case, I don't even know what a cop is. My dear Watson, sometimes you astound me. Well, it seems to me it takes very little to astound you. I repeat, what is a cop? The cops are the principal Christian race descended from ancient Egyptian stock. What you refer to as squiggles on this compass, in reality, are letters of the Coptic alphabet. Oh, that makes it more confusing than ever. An apple bitten into by an eccentric and now a compass with ancient Egyptian lettering on it. I just can't see any relation between the two of them. And yet we know there must be. That's what makes the problem so fascinating. Well, what does the compass tell you, Holmes? Two things. The Coptic lettering on the dial is inscribed by hand. Obviously, it was constructed for a Copt who could speak no European language. Yes, the corpse was definitely not of Egyptian origin. I'll wager that he was born not too far away from the sound of bow bells. I agree, Watson. And so the problem becomes more confusing. Now, uh, let us examine another piece of this fascinating puzzle. The railway ticket. Well, it's the unused return half of a first-class ticket from the village of Chipping Sodbury to London. Yes, and the date stamped on the back is November the 6th. Today? Yes, Watson, today. Chipping Sodbury is a tiny village. I imagine that the number of passengers that travelled from there to London this morning could be counted on one hand. You're going to Chipping Sodbury? Yes. It shouldn't be too hard to find out who purchased this ticket. And while I'm doing that, I want you to stand guard here. Oh, oh, oh. With the corpse? Yes, Watson. And I suggest that you keep your revolver handy. My revolver? You mean... I mean that after what has happened in one short morning in Baker Street, we should be prepared for any eventuality. In just a moment, we'll see just what eventualities do develop. But first, if you're smart, you'll take better care of the hair you've got. Let me assure you, men, you can't use a better product than Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which no other hair tonic has. That is why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer. Why your hair always has such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. And listen carefully to this, men. Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A quick massage with Kremel stimulates the circulation of blood right in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated, how clean your scalp feels. At the same time, Kremel removes loose dandruff. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls, Kremel actually helps condition the hair by making it feel softer, more pliable. So men, why be satisfied with a product which merely keeps your hair in place? when you can have handsomely groomed hair plus all those extra advantages of Kremel. Buy a bottle as soon as possible at any drug counter. K-R-E-M-L, Kremel Hair Tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, it seems to me that Professor Moriarty did quite a job in sending you and Sherlock Holmes off on a false trail. He did, Mr. Bell, and for a while his nefarious plan succeeded. But to take up the story where I left off... While I stood guard in Baker Street over the mysterious corpse, Holmes caught the next train for the tiny village of Chipping Sodbury. He told me that after a talk with the village stationmaster, he had no trouble in tracing the purchaser of the first-class railway ticket that we'd found beside the body. It had been bought by a dignified and elderly clergyman by the name of Russell, and Holmes lost no time in calling on it. The stationmaster told me, sir that you were the only person to purchase a return first-class ticket to London this morning. Yes, Mr. Holmes. 
I had occasion to make one of my rare excursions to London this morning. But though it was an unfortunate experience for me, I can't think my humble visit to the city could be a matter of any possible interest to you. I'm very interested in what happened to the return half of your railway ticket, sir. Very odd you should mention that. A regrettable business. Most regrettable. It was stolen from me by a pickpocket, together with my watch and chain. Didn't notice it until I had occasion to look at the time when I was lunching with the Bishop of St. Luke's. You've no idea when or where the theft took place, sir? I walked from the station. The crowds were quite dense, and I do recall being jostled rather heavily on one occasion. You reported your loss to the police, I suppose. Naturally. But I have little hope that they'll catch the criminal. Most regrettable business. Cost me a watch and the price of another ticket. An expensive lesson in the frailty of human nature. <clears throat> Do you uh, care for a cup of tea, Mr. Holmes? Uh, no, thank you. I'm afraid I haven't time. I must return to London on the next train. Urgent and unfinished business awaits me there. <laughs> We followed Sherlock Holmes to Paddington Station, Professor Moriarty. Excellent. He caught the train for Chipping Sudbury, no doubt, Carter. Oh, yes, Professor. A fat lot of good, that'll do him. Even if he does find the old clergyman we pinched the stuff from. Mm, but it consumed valuable time. Time during which I can complete our plans regarding the star of Kursul. Before midnight tonight, I think I can safely say that the jewel will be in our hands. <laughs> How very fortunate that Sherlock Holmes has such a devouring curiosity. Any luck, Holmes? A waste of valuable time, Watson. I found the purchase of the ticket all right. The return half, together with his watch, had been stolen by a pickpocket. Oh, Lord, so that means we start all over again. No, Watson. At least one clue has been eliminated. Let us analyze the remaining ones more thoroughly. Now, the problem of the Coptic compass should next engage our attention. A call on the Egyptian embassy might prove illuminating. You know, Holmes, <laughs> while you were away, I, I had a brainwave. Congratulations. It was connected with the missing clothes from the corpse. Where, I asked myself... Where would be the obvious place to hide clothes? Why, in the, in the clothes closet, of course. So I searched both our wardrobes absolutely thoroughly. They weren't there. Interesting, Watson. Of course, I'd already done the same thing. Oh, well. The problem of the missing clothes is still... Numbskull! Yes, Holmes? Why didn't I think of it before? What is it, Holmes? The special wardrobe that I keep for my disguises. In the dressing room. Come on, Watson. Oh. By Jove, yes, I, I never thought of that. Perfect place for hiding the dead man's clothes. Let's see if there have been any recent additions to this raggledy collection of mine. Costa's outfit. And there's the clergyman's suit. You always made a surprisingly convincing clergyman, Holmes. And here's the unfailing passport to many a servant's back door. The stained and roughened worsteds of the English plumber. Yes, these patched and frayed ghosts could tell many a tale of... Hello. Look here, Watson. Plain blue suit in rather good condition. Quite. And it doesn't belong in my collection. I think we've solved the mystery of the vanishing clothes. The labels have been ripped out of the coat. Yes, and the pockets emptied. All possible identification removed. We're getting warm, Watson. We're getting very warm. Wait a minute. What is it? Give me a knife. All right, sir. There's something in the lining of this coat. Feels like paper. Perhaps the murderer didn't remove all identification after all. Here you are. These scissors will do the trick. Splendid. There we are. Piece of paper sewn to the padding of the coat. Yes. Let's see what it tells us. Humphrey Pedder, 118 Montague Crescent, Knightsbridge. That's the private detective you were talking about earlier on today. Do you suppose that Pedder's the corpse? At this stage, Watson, I shall suppose nothing. We'll go to Montague Crescent and find out for ourselves. <laughs> Pedder, I can't say how glad I am that we found you alive and well. From what you gentlemen have told me, Doctor, I feel glad myself to be here. Is it your custom to have an extra identification label sewn into all your clothes, Mr. Pedder? Yes, Mr. Holmes. 
A detective never knows what may happen to him. I've always felt such identification might be valuable. A very sound precaution. Thank you, sir. And you say that a suit of your clothes was stolen from your wardrobe last night? Yes. And I can't unearth a clue. Embarrassing situation for a detective, Mr. Holmes. Yes, it certainly is. Though I'm sure in your position, you've never had a thing like that happen to you. I uh, doubt, Mr. Pedder, if you know just how embarrassing a detective's life may become. Yes, yes indeed. Take our present situation, for instance. Quite, I'll... Watson. Mr. Pedder. I can't get a word in it, George. Did Major Stanley call on you today? I suggested that you would be eminently suited to the task of guarding the Maharaja's diamond. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going over to the Savoy tonight to talk to the Maharaja. Much obliged to you for giving me the recommendation, particularly since I've never had the privilege of meeting you. I'd heard very flattering reports of your ability. I'm very glad, Mr. Holmes. Your recommendation means a lot to well, me. Well, Holmes, we've drawn another blank. Yes, Watson. I fear we must return to Baker Street and see if an ancient compass can point the way to the solution. Where to, sir? The Egyptian Embassy in Grosvenor Square, Cabby. Watch your gimlet. Jump in, Watson. I feel a blasted fool trotting around London with a cupcake compass under my arm. I hope this leads us somewhere. If the excursion proves fruitless, Watson, I'm afraid I shall be compelled to get in touch with Scotland Yard. A few hours' delay in reporting a murder can be explained, but beyond that, we may find ourselves in trouble. Well, I think you should have reported it before this. By the way, Holmes, did you notice the broom and pair that drove up to Pedder's house just as we left? I'm afraid for once I was sufficiently preoccupied to yield to you in observation, my dear Watson. I'm not certain, but I thought that it was Major Stanley who, who stepped out of it. Major Stanley? And yet Mr. Pedder said that... But of course, what an idiot I've been. Cabby, cabby! Yes, sir? Turn around and drive us to the Savoy Hotel as fast as you can. Right, you are, didn't it? But uh, why the Savoy Hotel, Holmes? Surely the situation is crystal clear now, Watson. It's just about as clear as porridge to me. The whole thing's a plot to fool me. Tell me, Watson, what is suggested to you by the combination of an unclothed corpse, a stolen suit, and a railroad ticket? Well, if I knew the answer, Holmes, I'd have given it to you this morning and saved ourselves a lot of trouble. The answer, Watson, is organization. A group of well-organized criminals who are able to perform these unrelated tasks. And who's the only person in London who can arrange for running the criminal gamut from murder to plain pickpocketing? Moriarty. Professor Moriarty? Of course. Remember Mrs. Hudson's description of our visitor? Tall, thin, and with a high forehead. And if you add organization and Moriarty to Major Stanley, the Maharaja of Kursul, and the portrait painter, the sum total should be apparent. You mean that you've solved the problem of the unclothed corpse? I mean I know precisely how Professor Moriarty intends to steal the star of Kursul. Master Cabby, there's not a moment to lose. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, it's an astonishing story you've told me. At least it explains my apparent rudeness this morning, Major Stanley. You can appreciate the embarrassing position in which my friend was placed, sir. You, yes, indeed. But, but of course, you understand that Mr. Pedder here is now in charge of guarding the Star of Kasul. Quite, Major. And uh, you're in very excellent hands, I'm sure. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. But your own problem still fascinates me. The unclothed corpse, the compass, and the apple. As a humble exponent of your profession, I'm curious to see how you arrived at your conclusions. I reached them only just in time, Mr. Pedder. If I hadn't, I should at this moment be paying a fruitless visit to the Egyptian embassy. Well, I'm still confused, Holmes. And yet the answer is simple. What was outstanding about the crime committed at Baker Street? What was its uh, individual peculiarity? Well, I suppose the air of mystery that surrounded it. I prefer to use the word mystification. The crime fascinated me, stimulated me, as Professor Moriarty hoped it would until I realized that it was intended to do precisely that. The whole plan was a decoy, designed to prevent me from accepting your mission, Major Stanley. How could I accept such a commonplace job as guarding a jewel while such a fascinating problem was presented in my own living room? And the apple and the compass Fictional were... clues that led nowhere, but were sufficiently challenging for the criminal to know I wouldn't be able to resist tracking them down. It's an amazing plot. And the railway ticket and the suit of clothes that was stolen from me were all meant to focus your attention elsewhere and away from the diamond. Exactly, Mr. Pedder. Well, Mr. Holmes, I assure you we are very grateful for the warning. Yes. We shall be more than ever on our guard now. We know where the danger's coming from. Professor Moriarty. I'm taking the star across you back to the Bank of England in a few minutes. I assure you that I shall guard it extremely well. I think, Mr. Pedder, that if you don't mind, I'll take charge of the stone. 
But, Mr. Holmes, I've already been commissioned for the work. That's true, Mr. Holmes. Since you refused the job, I had to make other arrangements. Mr. Pettit was your own suggestion for the assignment. Nonetheless, Major, I think the Maharaja will sleep much more comfortably if I take charge of the stone. Holmes, I don't think it's very ethical. After all, you did refuse to take on the case, you know. This is hardly a time for ethics, Watson. Where is this Tarf Kasul, Major Stanley? I just handed it over to Mr. Pedder before you arrived. Then, supposing you give it to me, Mr. Pedder. By the way, I don't have the pleasure of knowing your real name. But Holmes, he's Humphrey Pedder. Oh, no, Watson. The unclothed corpse of Humphrey Pedder still lies in Baker Street. This is one of Professor Moriarty's most trusted henchmen. You're too smart for your own good. Look out, he's got a revolver. A little slow in drawing it. A beautiful uppercut, Holmes. Send for the police, please, Major Stanley. We have a prize catch for them here. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'll take the liberty of removing the diamond from the pocket of our recumbent friend. There we are. Behold, Watson, the Star of Kasul. What a magnificent stone. Magnificent. And yet one man was murdered for it. I only wish another might hang the cause of it. But Moriarty still goes free. And he killed Pedder. We'll catch him, Watson. We'll catch him. He is getting clumsy. If he'd noticed the credentials in Pedder's clothes, he would have been in possession of this bauble before the night is out. Instead of which, the evidence of this man here may help us to trap him. I hope so, Watson. But Moriarty inspires his henchmen with such loyalty that I doubt if he'll give us much help. The jewel is safe. Our own peculiar problem is solved. And we've captured a prize villain. Next time, we shall capture the master himself. <laughs> Did you, Dr. Watson? Did I what, Mr. Bell? Did you and Holmes finally capture Professor Moriarty, the master himself? No, Mr. Bell, haven't you uh, got a word for our listeners? <laughs> yes, I have. In just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. Girls, here's some advice from one of America's foremost beauty authorities, John Robert Powers. Mr. Powers tells his famous million-dollar Powers models to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And how right Mr. Powers is. Because cremel shampoo has been especially developed to glamour bathe each tiny strand of hair to its own natural, glossy luster. It leaves the hair shining bright for days. Just a vision of beauty. You know, cremel shampoo is great for washing children's hair, too. Yes. Its luxurious, active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. Cremel shampoo never dries the hair. So, ladies, buy a bottle at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to its natural shining glory. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, next week I think I'll tell you a story about a dowager dip. A dowager dip? What on earth is that? <laughs> That's a, a slang way of saying that our story concerns... The Dowager Duchess of Penfield, who had the misfortune of being a kleptomaniac. And the story also concerns the strange, and I must admit, embarrassing adventure of the elusive emerald. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo. And inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. When Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the elusive emerald. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Richard Diamond. 
Private Detective. Hello there. This is Diamond. I have a little office on Broadway at 53rd Street. And if you happen to be in the neighborhood sometime, you might notice a sign on the door. It reads, Diamond Detective Agency. Yeah, that's how I make a living, such as it is. I sit at my desk behind that door and wait for someone to come in and hire me. Eventually, trouble works its way into someone's life and gives him a shove in my direction. He tells me about it, and I listen with the attitude of a father confessor. When he's done, I dry my eyes and tell him what I think. What I think really doesn't matter, because it's just a shortcut to a hundred dollars a day in expenses. Sure, you can hire a guy for less money, but when I work, it's for a price I figure I'm worth. It's got to be that way because sometimes it works a little dirty, and I have to swallow a lot of pride. I get mixed up in everything from simple divorce to muscle-bound homicide, and when trouble can't find me a client, it starts working on yours truly, and I wind up in a corner. I guess trouble figured I was just about due for a squeeze play because one night last week, two lifers in the state pen started working me into their plans. Well, what about it, Walsh? Shut up. Wait until the guards pass. Okay. Drag out the cards like we was playing. Sure. Is it uh, set for the night? Yeah. I got the car and everything. Yeah. We'll head for Florida and get across to Cuba. Oh, well, I'd be glad to get out of this uh, three lousy years. Yeah, I got eight behind me. I used every minute figuring how I'm going to take care of a guy. Oh, Walsh, you're not going to start that again. Forget it. Be glad you're getting out. You knock off that guy and you'll never make it to Cuba. Now, look... I figured this whole thing out. I paid out a lot of dough just to make it come off. And when it does, I'm going to kill an ex-cop. And you're going to help me. Me? Yeah. Unless you want to rot here. Oh, you're out of your mind. If this break comes off, it'll be the neatest trick in years. And you want to louse it up by knocking off some guy on the outside? You can stay here and rot if you want to. The only way I take you along is you help me to get a guy named Diamond. Yeah, but you waste a lot of time in New York. They'll have the roads covered by then. Look, just because this diamond guy knocked off your brother and that bank job, you see. You, you bust out of here, it's on my terms. But now make up your mind, it's getting late. Okay. Give me the layout. <laughs> Yeah, what is it, Otis? We just got a call, Lieutenant. Two prisoners busted out of Sing Sing, killed two guards. Who are they? Big time. Bob Wells and Charles Walsh. Charles Walsh? Yeah, lifer. I know, I know. Diamond helped send him up before I took over this department. Otis, get Diamond on the phone. Diamond? Yeah, Diamond. Who'd you think I meant? Little Red Riding Hood? Yeah, yeah Lieutenant. Mm, oh, Diamond, Otis. Bring me my bike card, and Otis. Someday I'm going to get good and sore. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Ah, uh, nuts. Now, what's the matter? His office don't answer. Give me that phone. Eh? We've got to find him before Walsh does. Maybe he's over at Helen Asher's house. All right, Otis, stop standing on one foot. You can leave. Miss Asher's residence. Hello, Francis. This is Lieutenant Levinson. Is Diamond there? Why, no, sir, but Miss Asher expects him. Oh, oh wait a moment, sir. Here's Miss Asher. It's Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond, Miss Helen. Oh, thank you, Francis. Hello, Walt. How are you, Helen? I was looking for Rick. Oh, I was just talking to him. He should be here in about 20 minutes. Why? Uh, will you have him call me right away? Is something wrong? No, no. Just tell him... Tell him an old friend of his is in town, and I have to talk to him about it. Oh, all right, Walt. I'll tell him. Oh, thanks, Helen. It'll be at least 20 minutes. He's walking over. Okay, Diamond, hold it right there. Start walking over to that sedan. Don't you know it's not polite to point? Look, laughing boy, I got a big gun in my pocket. Well, I'm proud of you. I thought it was a crossbow. Get moving. 
Okay. I'd never seen him before. He was a tall guy with a scar on his chin. He walked me over to the sedan and opened the door. He moved in close and shook me down. He relieved me of my thirty-eight and motioned me into the front seat. I slid in and he started to follow, so I kept one leg out in front of me and kicked him in the face. I couldn't get enough leverage to cool him, but it gave me enough time to get out the other door and start making like a miler. I looked over my shoulder and saw him climb out holding a bloody nose. I knew he wouldn't take a shot unless he got close enough to make it count. So when he started after me, I ducked into the subway. I found a dime and went through the turnstile. The train was getting ready to pull out, so I pushed my way on just as the Garnet came down the stairs. He said he wasn't happy to see me go. He didn't even wave goodbye. Wait a minute, you! Wait! Oh, nuts. No. You and your swell ideas. What's the matter? I waited for Diamond outside his office, like you said. I started to hustle him in the car, and he kicked me in the face. Oh. I think my nose is you broken. You stupid... I told you to be careful. Yeah, sure you did. You think I like getting booted in the nose? Look, if you want Diamond so much, you get him yourself. Maybe you can tell me how you're going to get to Cuba without me? Huh? Oh. Well... What do you want me to do now? I still want Diamond. Yeah, but he jumped the subway train. How am I supposed to find her? I found out he's got a dame over on Park Avenue. Pick her up and bring her over here. Pick her up? I'd give you that chair for kidnapping. I'll use her to get Diamond. Pick her up if you want to get out of the country. Yeah, but a now, snitch... Look, I it... busted you out of store. I can bust you right back in. No. Now, pick her up. Her name is Helen Asher. She lives at 975 Park. Well, what if someone else is there? What if there is? You want me to stop over making a fourth for bridge? Get him out of the way and bring the dame to me. Hello, Otis. Well, Diamond. Lieutenant's been looking all over the city for you. I bet you've been a nervous wreck. I wouldn't care if you fell off the George Washington Bridge, Shamus. Why, Otis? And after all, we've been to each other. Uh, nuts. You better go on in and see the lieutenant. Sure. Hey, uh, Sergeant. Yeah? When are you going to get some new shoes? If yours turn up any more in front, you'll have to ski to work. Uh, Hello, Walt. Rick, we've been looking all over for you. Why don't you cops get on the job? It's getting so it isn't safe for a citizen to walk the streets at high noon. What are you yakking about? Well, I leave my office to go to see Helen and some goon tries to hold me up. Well, you're lucky you didn't get it right then. Do you know who busted out of jail last night? Go on, scare me. Charles Walsh. He swore if he ever did bust out, he'd get you. Wow. Well. That explains something. Why, what happened? This character tries to hustle me into a car, so I shoved my foot in his face and beat it into a subway. But it wasn't Walsh. Might have been Bob Wells. He busted out with him. I can tell you in a minute, got a file on him? Sure. Otis, bring in the file on Bob Wells. By the way, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, Walt, do you mind if I use your phone? No, go ahead. I better call Helen. Tell her I'm going to be a little late. Well, I just talked to her and asked her to have you call. Where is everybody? Yes? Francis? Oh, Mr. Diamond. Please hurry over here. Something's happened to Miss Asher. What are you talking about? Miss Asher's been kidnapped. What? Yes, sir. The man came in and made Miss Asher go down to his car at the point of a gun. He also hit me over the head. Was he a tall man with a scar on his chin? Yes, sir. That's right. We'll be right over. Walt, I think the guy that tried to push me around has kidnapped Helen. Oh, no. He pulled a gun on her and slugged Francis. We better get over there. Now, if Charles Walsh is loose and he's trying to get me, then snatching Helen is a sure way to get me to come around. Hey, uh, where's that file on Bob Wells? Oh, wait a minute. Otis. Yeah, Lieutenant. Haven't you got that file on Wells yet? Yes, sir. I'm just bringing it in. Well, step on it. Otis is bringing it in. Here you are, Lieutenant. Let me see it. Hey, now, wait a minute. Oh, shut up, Otis. This is the guy, all right. He's the one who tried to pick me up. Uh, uh, may I take one of these pictures, Walt? Sure, but what are you going to do? I'll see if I can find him. You go on over and talk to Francis. See if this is the same guy who took Helen. I'm going to go down to Skid Row and talk to a wise old owl who knows about things like this. I got out of the 5th precinct in a hurry and grabbed a cab for Skid Row. I knew an old deadbeat down there who had a line on every crook in the underworld. 
and there was just a chance he could tell me where Bob Wells was hiding out. His name was Wilbur Truitt, and he hung out in a shabby dive called the Parrot. Hello, Wilbur. What? Hey, God. You at the piano, strike up a chorus of my buddy, for the wandering boy has returned. Look, Wilbur... I I... would rise and bow from the waist as befits the occasion, but I fear that some sterno I accidentally came in contact with has rusted my spine, and I am forced to remain in a sitting position. I haven't got time to listen to the routine, Wilbur. I'm looking for someone. Here, take a look at this picture. Ever see this guy? Unless I have my morning constitutional buck... I can bring nothing into focus but a large bottle and a straw. Oh, oh waiter. Waiter, uh, give me a bottle. You have arrived in the nick of time. I get that wonderful warm glow when you ask for a whole bottle. A snap comparison would be that of a happy mother smiling blissfully at a nursing babe. Okay, well, but now tell me, uh, uh, do you know this man? One sip of strength, and I shall have the eyes of a carrot-stuffed feline. Now, now, yes, I can see the gentleman clearly. In fact, my vision has so greatly improved it begins to take on the functions of an X-ray. For instance, I can readily perceive that the man in question is addicted to false stimulants, and his low brow and squinty eyes tell me that he is indeed a person of some doubtful character. You're looking in the mirror. No, here, here's his picture. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mr. Bobby Wells. The description is flexible. Know where I can find him? Up until yesterday, he was residing at an institution upstate. Sing Sing, I believe. It is very possible that he is hiding out in one of his old haunts on 23rd Street, but uh, I couldn't say for sure. Oh, why not? Uh, This bottle you purchased entitles you to one of my best Yes, To be absolutely accurate, I would need further inducement. It's the risk, bucko. Uh, bring me another jug, bartender. Ah, bless you. Try looking in a rooming house at 533 West 23rd Street. Now, if you don't mind, I shall forget the necessity for long conversations and begin to concentrate on the work ahead of me. Goodbye, Bucko, and stop in again. Say tomorrow morning if you wake up feeling charitable. I left Wilbur trying to figure the best way to parlay the two bottles and headed for the address he'd given me. It was a typical apartment house of the district. A four-story building with a high premium insurance policy. I asked the landlady if a Bob Wells lived there, and she told me a man answering his description had taken a room there that morning. She told me he'd gone out a few minutes before and she'd let me into his room. I told her to keep a lookout and warn me if he showed. Then I started looking. I tore the place apart, but I didn't come up with a thing. I spotted the phone and started to call Walt, and that's when I saw it. A pad lying by the base of the phone with a heavy imprint left from the writing on the top sheet. I pulled an old trick. I took a pencil and rubbed the lead lightly over the imprint... And up came one telephone number. I dialed it and waited. Feinberg's delicatessen. Oh, uh, is Bob Wells there? Oh? Bob Wells. Never heard of him. Thanks. Well, it's like that. One minute you think you got a lead hot enough to melt your change purse, and the next you find yourself looking like a tree surgeon in Death Valley. But in my business, it takes a conventional three to strike you out. So I found the address of the delicatessen, and 15 minutes later, I was standing between a smoked herring and a three-foot salami talking with Mr. Weinberg. What can I do for you, sir? Oh, uh, I talked with you, oh, say, 20 minutes ago about a Mr. Bob Wells. Bob Wells? Oh, yes. Never heard of him. Uh, take a look at this picture. Maybe you know the face and not the name. It's familiar. Yes, I think I've seen him somewhere. Think hard now. This is important. Are you a policeman? Detective. Oh, how about it? Oh, yeah, yeah. So long as you're a cop, sure I remember him. He came to my store last night. I remember because I had already closed and he kept pounding on the door. Finally, I let him in. He was very rude. He bought a lot of groceries, but very rude. Have you seen him again? Sure, he came in this morning about locks and bagels. Still rude. Hmm. Where's your phone? In the back. Has, uh, 
This Mr. Wells done something? He left Sing Sing without saying goodbye to the warden. Huh. Huh. Now, look, uh, I'm going in the back and use your phone. If Wells happens to come in while I'm back there, stall him and come back and tip me off. I'll do my best. But he better not be rude. Hey, Walt, I'm in a delicatessen over on 24th Street. Yeah, Rick. I traced Wells this far, found out he's been buying food here, probably for Walsh. You think Walsh is hiding somewhere in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. They probably took separate places so they could move in a hurry if one hideout got hot. I'll be over there right away. Good. Comfortable, honey, but no yelling. Or I'll have to stuff up that pretty mouth. I don't understand this. Why did you kidnap me? I've been having a hard time getting in touch with your boyfriend, Diamond. Figure if his girl's in trouble, he'll come look. I, I don't have a boyfriend. <laughs> sure, sure, play it straight. But you watch. Tonight I call your butler and tell him we got you. If Diamond wants you alive, he comes to a spot I got picked up. And he comes along. I don't know any diamond. Ain't she cute, Bobby? Yeah, cute. Want me to fix her so she forgets how to lie? No, I don't care if she claims diamonds are uncle. <laughs> Go on down to Delicatessen and get some food. I'm getting hungry. Okay. I still think we ought to be getting out of town. In one hour, I call this dame's house. At 12 o'clock, I meet Diamond in the park. Then we get out. Why do you want to see uh, this diamond? Oh, we're old friends, baby. He sent me up for life, and he shot my kid brother full of holes. I just want to see that Diamond gets everything that's coming to him. You talk too much. You've got some bad habits yourself. Now get that food. And if you're too lazy to walk downstairs, I'll show you a shortcut. Uh, Three floors, straight down. You can jump for it. Okay, okay. <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. What can Weinberg do for you? Hey, Lieutenant, that chopped liver sure looks good. Keep your fat hooks off of that, Otis. Walt. Oh, yeah, Rick. Back here. All right. The storekeeper is watching out for Wells. If he shows, he'll come back here in Tempest. I parked the squad car two blocks over. I didn't want Wells or Walsh to think something was up. Where's Otis? Otis! I'll be right with you, Lieutenant. I'm just buying something to nibble on. Hmm. His nibble would grind up a whole cow. If Wells comes in and spots a cop, he'll take off like a jackrabbit. Hold it, Walt. It's huh? my yeah. That guy coming across the street. Looks like Wells. Oh. Otis, get away from that door. Huh? I can't hear you, Lieutenant. A man's coming in the store. Get away from the door. He is? You want me to hide? No, you idiot. Just play it smart like you didn't know him. But get away from the door so he'll come in. Oh. Okay, Lieutenant. Leave it to me. Oh. Walt Duck. Good evening. What can Weinberg do for you? Uh, I'll have a couple of sandwiches. Hey, try the salami. It's great. Huh? Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, make it salami. Call slot. Uh, pickle beer. Nice pickle. night. Listen, uh, idiot. Yeah, sure. Master. Yeah, he's doing fine, no, Walt. Just... Relax. You live around here? Oh. Huh? No, uh, just seeing a sick friend. Yeah. Uh, maybe that salami ain't such a good idea if your friend's sick. You know, I had an uncle with ulcers. He couldn't touch the stuff. It's too much garlic. Ketchup? No. My friend's got a cold. Oh. Well, then I don't guess it'll hurt him, but... You know, the best thing for a cold is good mustard plastic. And now you, you, you take the plastic... Here's your sandwiches, sir. Uh, Sixty cents. Sixty. Here you are. Thanks. Thanks. Hope your friend gets better. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, come on. How did I do, Lieutenant? Well, one thing is sure. He thought you were too stupid to recognize him. Can you still see him, Rick? Yeah. Yeah, he crossed the street and he's starting to walk west. I'll tell him. He knows you. Good. When you spot the place, call me here. Think I should throw a net around the neighborhood? Not till we spot the hideout. Right. Hey, Diamond. They got your girl. How are you going to get her out? They'd probably use her for a shield. That's a good point, Sergeant. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Here's the sandwiches. Swell. Hey, hmm. you only got two. Oh, there was a cop in the delicatessen. A cop? Yeah, big stupid one. Listen, 
I, I told him I'm getting food for a sick friend, see? And he starts giving me all kinds you of remedies. sure rem you weren't tailed? Tailed? No, who tailed me? Cop stating a delicatessen. Okay. Here, honey. Have a sandwich. I'm not hungry. Oh. Suit yourself. Here, Bobby. Oh, thanks. Hey, when are you going to put in that call of this dame's butler? Right after we eat. Then we go to the park and wait for Mr. Diamond. Yeah? I'm in a drugstore across from the building that Wells went in. It's about a block away. Nifty drug. Block west on your side of the street. I'll wait inside. We'll be right down. Come on, Otis. The lieutenant hasn't spotted. Okay. Thanks for the bagel, White Break. That's all right, officer. Come back again when you can pay for it. Come on, Otis. Move your big feet. Okay, okay. Hey, you got any brilliant ideas how we're going to get Helen out of there in one piece? No, I got to admit I'm stuck. Why don't you get that bear trap mind of yours working and make yourself a hero? Yeah. Well, maybe we could start a fire in the building and have to come out. Oh, swell, swell. There's nothing I'd like better than a well-done girlfriend. Well, I was trying. Yeah. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Otis, remind me to kiss you on both cheeks. Hey, what are you doing? That's a firebox. I'm turning in an alarm. There. Oh, we're going to start that fire? No, but Walsh and Wells won't know there isn't one. When the trucks come and the firemen bust in the place, they'll think it's burning down around their ears. Yeah, maybe then they won't watch Helen too close, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Well, here's the nifty drugstore. Yeah. Rick, I've been worrying about something. Yeah, I know. How do we get Helen out? Yeah. Well, relax. Otis came up with a solution. Otis? Yeah, I turned in a fire alarm. And when the trucks get here, you can tell them what's up and they can go in the building and make like it was on fire. Well, won't Walsh know it's a phony if he can't smell smoke? The chief can tell him it's blazing in the basement. When they hit the street, we can get enough firemen to shield Helen and then take Walsh and Wells. I'll call a precinct and have the block surrounded. We'll need lights if they make a break for it. Uh, which apartment house are they in? That one, across the street. After I call the boys, we better go over and find out which room they're in. Quietly clear the rooms on both sides in case the shooting starts before we expect it. <laughs> Garlic upsets my stomach. How about that call? Yeah, right. Well, what's your phone number, baby? It's in the book. Oh. She gonna be troubled, Bobby? <laughs> he wants your number. Now, come on. We ain't got all night. All right. Evergreen 54308. Oh, that's better. Gotta be more careful, Bobby. Your lip's bleeding. Yeah. Hey, Walsh. What's that? Sirens. Maybe that's the cops. If somebody tailed you, you... I told you I wasn't tailed. Wait, I'll go see. That's fire trucks. They're coming down a block. I don't smell no smoke. Hey, they're pulling up in front of this building. The joint must be on fire. Let's get out of here. Uh, maybe it's the building next to us. No, they're bringing the hoses right in front of the door of this joint. I'm getting out. Sit still. Maybe it ain't a big one. We can't go busting out in the street. Well, maybe it ain't a big one. But if it is, I don't want to end up like a pound of spare ribs. Ah! Why, you... Yeah. All right, now, come on. Hey, what's that? Yeah, what is it? Fire department, we're back here from the building. What are we going to do with the dame? Shove her in that closet. Just a minute, we'll be right with you. Hurry, Tom, there's a fire in the basement snooting a gas man. The whole place may go up any second. Did you hear that? Yeah, step on it. Okay. Hey, better step on it. Down these stairs. We can find our way. Hey, there's a couple of prowl cars. Yeah. Separate. We'll meet at the other place. Okay, Walsh. That's far enough. Ah, it's the shamus. Get him, Walsh. Don't reach for it, Walsh. I owe you something, Diamond. <laughs> you all right, Rick? Yeah, Walsh. He's a worse shot than his brother. Where's Wells? He made a break for it, but he won't get through. All right, Wells. You can't get through. Drop your gun. You won't take me, copper! Well, that's that. What about Walsh? Uh, he's pretty dead. Come on, I want to find out what happened to Helen. Well, Walt and I went up to the room and found Helen in the closet. We took her downstairs and she cried a little on my shoulder. I like that. Makes me feel so protective. 
Walt cleaned things up and dropped Helen and me off at her place. An hour later, Helen got back to normal and we relaxed on the couch and forgot about Wells and Walsh. <sighs> How do you feel now, baby? Daddy. Want to get Francis to fix some dinner for you? Oh, no, I'm not very hungry. But you can have some if you want. Mm, no, no. Want to play some canasta or something? But you always said it was a bad 200 game. Yeah, it is. Well, I forgot my jack. <laughs> Silly. Want a neck? Ooh, what you said. Come here. No. Helen. No, I'm mad. Mad? What for? Because those two thugs ruined a wonderful evening. What's the matter? Want me to go? Oh, you idiot, of course not. But I had a big surprise planned. You did? Yes. Believe it or not, I had two wonderful seats for South Pacific, and now it's too late to go. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I'm sorry, baby. I'd love to have seen it. Me, too. Well, I'm not exactly it's your pinza, but I'll try to make it up to you. Oh, Rick, that's a wonderful idea. All right. What'll it be? Uh, some enchanted evening. Oh, really? Me, 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 me. Hmm. A some enchanted evening. You may see a stranger. You may see a stranger across a crowded room. Rick. What's the matter? I was just trying to make like pizza. But, honey, it's safer for you to make like diamond. Oh. And somehow you know. You know even then. That somewhere you'll see her again and again. Oh, you're not Pinza, but it's wonderful. Thanks. Some enchanted evening. Someone may be laughing. You may hear her laughing across a crowded room. And night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of her laughter will sing in your dreams. Rick. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Ricky. Fools give you answers. Wise men never try. Oh, oh, honey, what's the matter? I was just falling in love with myself. Come here. You never let me finish. Do you mind? Mm. Oh, well, no. And I'm sure Mr. Pinza doesn't either. <laughs> You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Helen was played by Virginia Gregg, Lieutenant Levinson by Ed Begley. Also in our cast were Wilms Herbert, Paul Fries, and Larry Dobkin. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Richard Diamond is written by Blake Edwards and directed by William P. Rousseau. Now this is Eddie King inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. I know my life is in danger. I think you can help me. I'm desperate and don't dare go to the police. Please, if you want to help, call at the Tivoli Theater box office for the ticket left there. Our handbill will tell you more. Our handbell will tell you more. Yeah, that's the way it started. 
The note from the girl, Maria. The theater ticket. And then, murder. And now, back to Box 13. It was Thursday when I received the letter from Maria through Box 13. Some of the letters I get are from cranks. Some from people who are just curious about a reporter turned fiction writer who advertises adventure wanted, will go any place, do anything. But with this one, it was just like Susie said. Gee, Mr. Holliday, it doesn't look like one of those crank letters or somebody that's just curious, thinks you're crazy or something. How can you tell, Susie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just female ignition. There's a dictionary over there, Susie. Look up ignition. Don't you know what it means, Mr. Holliday? Hmm. It, it's when a woman... Skip it, Susie. Skip it. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to pick up a ticket for tonight's show at the Tivoli. Take a look at this handbell. Torino. The great Torino. Like his look, Susie? Well, hmm, I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay, Susie, close up shop for the day. You're going to follow it up, huh? That's the general idea, yes. I want to see what Maria has on her mind and why she's afraid. This was it. I picked up the ticket at the Tivoli. A big poster told me this was a charity affair with the axe doing a two-night stand. Tickets? Ten dollars a throw. I circled around the lobby, looked at the acts advertised, singers, dancers, a dog act, and then there it was. A big life-size cut out of the great Torino, complete with mustache and goatee. Nice-looking guy, maybe too smooth-looking, but it was what he was doing that made me take a better look. He held a rifle to his shoulder and was aiming it across the lobby at another cutout. And this one? This one was a girl. Pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. Big eyes, maybe a little scared looking, and looking straight across at the great Torino and right into the barrel of that rifle pointed at her head. Well, if this was Maria, she had a right to have something on her mind. Anybody who stands up and lets a rifle be fired at her is earning a living the hard way. I was thinking about it when the call buzzer zizzed in my ear. I didn't know with a crowd during the overture and took my seat. First we're all right on the aisle, easy to get at. An usherette shoved a program in my hands. The great Torino was scheduled next to closing. Okay, that meant I'd have to sit through the rest of the acts. I did. It was skipping. But the great Torino was something different. He had two assistants, a girl and a good-looking young guy. It was a magic act with class, and Torino was clever with his hands. He did a trunk effect that was really great. And the girl who helped was the same girl whose cutout was in the lobby. Torino tied her with a rope, slipped the big canvas bag over her, and locked her in a trunk. He fired a shot, and bang, the girl came running down the aisle. And the trunk she was put in, well, empty. All done in a split second, too. The great Torino took his bow, but I noticed something. When he reached out to take the girl's hand and bow with her, she managed to be busy at something else. Okay. She didn't like him. He gave her a funny look and walked to a rack and picked up a nice nickel-plated rifle. I sat up in my seat because the girl threw a quick look at me and a tiny nod. No one would have noticed it but me. I I looked back at Torino, who was speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to call your attention to my final effect. A most dangerous one. So dangerous that few illusionists will attempt it. The history of the magician's art has recorded several deaths during the feat. My assistant will go into the audience now and select a committee of volunteers who will please come upon the stage. Maria, if you please. So the girl was Maria. I guess my cue was to be selected as one of the committee. I raised my hand. She picked me. I went on the stage with four others from the audience. Stood there while Torino went to the footlights and spoke again. Uh, please, the music. No music. Please, no music. Thank you. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall give the gentlemen of the committee this rifle. It may be examined thoroughly. Also, three bullets, which they may mark later for identification. Gentlemen, the rifle. And here, the bullets. Uh, please mark the lead in any way you choose, unmistakably. We took the rifle and the bullets. And the great Torino, well, he had the audience sitting on the edges of their seats. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and Torino wasn't going to tell them until the right time came. And one of the other men on the committee spoke to me. Uh, bullets look okay to you? Yeah, as good as any bullets can look. Twenty-twos, huh? Yeah. How do we mark them? Initials? Yeah, yeah, good idea. The three of us cut our initials in the lead. That all right with you, mister? Good. How about the rest of you? Suits me. I've got a knife here. Yeah, let me see the rifle. Yeah, sure, here. Rifle look okay, no gimmicks? Well, not that I can see. All right, my, my initials are cut in the bullet. Uh, you want to cut yours? Oh, yes. I cut my initials, D.H., in one of the bullets. So we had three bullets with initials cut in the lead. No chance for substitution. Then Torino took the rifle and the bullets. Thank you, gentlemen. Grazie tanto. You are satisfied? Uh, sure, I am. Yes. Good. Now, if you will all watch closely, I shall load the bullets in the rifle. So, and uh, what is your name, sir? Holiday. Good. Then, uh, Mr. Holiday, if you will please hold the loaded rifle until I am ready for it. Oh, sure, sure. In this way, there can be no trickery. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw me load the market bullets, yes. So, and you have the loaded rifle. Good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce once more Maria. Maria? The young lady is as courageous as she is lovely. Maria, you will take your place, please. Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? Oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> then that leaves it up to me. No. The rifle, please. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall ask for complete quiet. Thank you. Maria... You are ready? Yes. I'm ready. The great Torino walked to the other side of the stage. He raised the rifle to his shoulder, pointed it at Maria. She was pale as death. Her arms were tense, tight. Perspiration stood out on her forehead. And on mine. And on everyone in the audience. Then... So help me, this is what happened... A bullet appeared between Maria's teeth. She let it drop to a plate. She held it in her hands, then... And two more bullets popped between her teeth and fell to the plate. No one in the audience moved. No applause, just that tense feeling. Torino walked over, took the plate. His hands never touched the bullets. I'll swear to it. He walked to me and the other three men with me and... Gentlemen... You will please to identify the bullets, yes? This one. Initials T.G. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's mine, all right. Thank you. And uh, this one. K.R. Mine. Thank you. And the third. D.H. That's mine. <laughs> off the stage, Maria managed to get a note into my hands. When I read it later, it asked me to meet her at a little coffee shop about three blocks from the theater. All right, that's what I did. We sat in the booth, back out of the way, and Maria talked. Thank you for coming, Mr. Holliday. That's all right, Maria. I, I saw a great act, but what am I doing in it? You can help me. Please help me. How? Doing what? You can keep Torino from killing me. More coffee? Didn't you hear me? Oh, sure. Sure, but I don't get it. You saw the act. The rifle trick. Yeah, it was great. Then you must see how easy it would be for Torino to kill me while doing it. Slow up a little, Maria. Let's start from the beginning. All right. You saw the other assistant. You mean the good-looking kid? That's Billy. I love him and he loves me. 
Then what's your problem? To read no. He hates Billy. And he hates me for loving Billy. Jealous? Insanely. Well, quit then. I will. After tomorrow night's performance. But why wait if you're afraid? I won't be afraid if you're there. What could I do? Be on the committee again. If I think any, anything's wrong, I'll signal you. And then? Do anything. Drop the rifle, but don't give it back to Torino. Now, wait a minute. How could he kill you? He'd claim it was an accident. Three magicians or their assistants have been killed accidentally doing the trick. The mechanism of the gun goes wrong. Giving away secrets, Maria? I have to. There's a mechanism in the breech of the gun. It drops the real bullets down into Torino's hand when he closes the breech. Oh, then I get an unloaded gun. There are blanks in it. The mechanism substitutes them for the real bullets. Hmm. That's good. And he slips the real bullets to you. Yes, when he takes my hand to introduce me. And you slip them into your mouth. While the audience is watching Torino and the rifle. I see. Maria. Yes? Why don't you go to the police? Torino would know. He'd know. How? He watches me. Then aren't you afraid he's watching now? No. Not tonight. I slipped away. I don't think I could manage it again. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday? You're my only chance. I saw you had in the paper, Box 13. You mean the police would ask him questions and he'd lay low until he got the chance to... Yes. Will you be there tomorrow night, Mr. Holliday? Look, I have a ticket for you here. The same seat. Please. Please. All right, Maria. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to keep the trick from being trumped by the great Torino. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it sounded like a great assignment. From the way the setup looked from where I sat, it gave the great Torino a perfect chance to kill Maria. I checked on Maria's story about the accidental deaths during the trick, and Jonesy at the Star Times verified it. A smart cookie like Torino could fake an accident, and who's going to pin the black ribbon on him? Nobody. Okay, it's up to you, Holiday, to figure it out. Next night, I sat in the same seat and watched Torino go through his act. The trunk thing, still great, knocked the audience off their seats. Me, too. Couldn't figure it. But the big stuff was still to come, the rifle trick. I went on the stage, kept my eyes on Maria. I marked one of the bullets again. Oddly enough, Torino didn't seem to recognize me. That was all right with me. And now, ladies Torino and went through his same spiel, I word for word. I kept my eyes on Maria. But it was though she'd never seen me before in her life. She looked... Well, it sounds silly, but she looked hypnotized. Then I heard Torino saying to me... Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? No, thank you. <laughs> Torino looked at me hard. My name and my face together might have tipped him. There was a funny look in his eyes. I stared at Maria. Not a sign from her. Maria, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. I relaxed a little. She hadn't given me a sign. Everything was all right, and then... Maria! Maria! She dropped. Maria dropped. And right between her eyes was a little round hole. Look, Holiday. Is that straight, that story? Sure it is, Kling. She was afraid she'd be killed. But you say she didn't give you a high sign. No, she didn't even look at me. But she told you if there was anything wrong, she'd tip you. Yes, but she didn't tip me. Okay. Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Get Torino over here. Yes, sir. All right, you. Lieutenant Kling wants you. Got any ideas, Holiday? Uh, I'm dry. Bone dry, Kling. And what about this guy, Billy, she told you about? I told you. Okay. It was accident. Accident. Something she was go wrong. Please. Quiet. Now look. Accident. She's oh. wrong accident that happened. You're so... I am an artist. You tell me I do something wrong. No, no, no. It is wrong. Holy accident. mackerel. Sergeant. Million times Sergeant. Yes, sir. Streak. Put it's this guy in his dressing room. Room. And keep him there until he blows off that head of steam. Wrong, you know. But now watch his door. Listen to me. And the window from outside. Yes, sir. Come on, Hootie. Come on. It's funny. I'm hysterical. 
I don't think. What's funny? The girl Maria. I don't think she knew me tonight. She looked right at me. Didn't give me a tumble. Yeah? So? She told me she'd signal me if anything was wrong. I... I don't get it. But it looks as though she... She what? She deliberately let Torino fire a gun she knew was set to kill her. Okay. Well, that makes great sense. I know. No sense at all. And besides that, they're... Get away with it. You're going to let him tell you it's all an accident. Well, don't believe him. He killed her. That's Billy. Cling. What? Let me ask him a couple of things. Now, look, Holiday, I'm in charge of this case. You're in on a rain check. Okay, but I'm in, huh? Yeah, for the one reason that Maria told you about it, and he I... killed her. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I'd better go help the sergeant. Any objections if I mosey along with you? None. Just keep your mouth closed, that's all. Sure. All right. So I listened while Kling asked questions. But there was something knocking at the back of my head, asking to be let in. Something I'd seen, heard, remembered. I didn't know. But what bothered me was Maria not giving me a signal. When she said she'd know if Torino was up to something... Billy answered Kling's questions. No, no. All I know is that Torino <laughs> bluffed Maria. He said he'd kill her if he saw me hanging around her. Who loads the rifle with blanks? Maria. Maria. Does she do it tonight? She always does it. Quiet up with you. Maria loaded the rifle herself. She did. Before the performance. So I got an idea. I left the stage where the investigation was going on. And I walked backstage toward the dressing rooms. I wanted to talk to Torino. But there was a large blue cop sitting at the door. He looked at me and... Well, Holiday. Oh, hi, Murph. I feel lousy. No, oh, that's too bad. Uh, say, I uh, think I could talk to Torino? No. Oh, no, look, you can watch and listen, tell Kling everything that goes on. <laughs> playing detective, Holiday? Nope, uh, playing a hunch. What about? Why not listen and find out? And if you learn anything, tell Kling. And you might learn something good. You mean something that might break the case? Yeah, might. Oh, well, uh... What's the matter, Murph? Can't you use a couple of strikes? Aye, sure. Oh, okay. But I'm standing right here, understand? Sure. Right. Hey, you, get up and... Oh, brother. Look. <sighs> Ain't nobody gonna ask him no questions. No, I... Don't think he's in any shape to answer. A promotion, you say? A promotion? I'll be lucky if I ain't fouled up for good. This guy's been knifed right under my nose. That's right. Somebody stabbed Torino. He was as dead as Maria. And nobody saw anybody go in or out of the dressing room. There was one window. It was open. But the officer outside swore he had his eye on it. Hmm. Nobody in or out. And nobody in the room but Torino. And the knife was in his back, so suicide was out. Clegg and his boys turned the room upside down. Torino's apparatus and trunks were shoved around. Still nobody. And it turned out nobody had a motive for killing Torino except Billy. Me? Me? Are you crazy? I never left the stage. I was talking to you. I was answering questions. I can't be in two places at once, can I? He was so right. Kling was tearing his hair. Then more questions. The rest of the acts were strangers to Torino. Knew nothing about him. I was thinking about it when something hit me. Something Billy had said. While Kling was still firing questions, I got to a phone. Hello? Oh, hiya, Kenny. Still running that private eye? Swell. Do something for me, will you? Hmm? Okay. Put a man on the Tivoli Theater right now. And get him to tail a guy named Billy. Huh? Here's what he looks like. About 5'9", stocky, light complexion, wearing gray suit. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. Hi, Susie. Any messages? Uh-huh. The detective agency called. And what? What's the message? Oh, oh I wrote it down in shorthand. Here. Uh, trail Billy in shoe 
No, wait a minute. Ooh, terrible ink. Uh, oh, I got it. To insurance company this morning. He placed claim for double indemnity policy for his wife, Maria Baker. Hey, hey wait a minute, Mr. Holliday. That's not all. That's enough. I'll see you later, Susie. Torino, Torino. Step on him, Jonesy. Oh, you want odd facts? It takes time to find them. Even in the morgue of the Star Times. Okay, Jonesy, okay, but hurry up, will you? Ah, uh, here we are. Torino, born Italy. Skip that. How long has he been in the country? Uh, six months. Noted magician in Italy and Europe before the war. Only six months. Now, Jonesy, if you were a magician, you wanted assistance. How would you get them? Advertising a billboard. Magazine for show folks. What else? Hmm. Where can I see the last six months' copies of the billboard? Right, I got a local office in town. All the copies you want. Hey, where are you going? Thanks, Jonesy. Be seeing you. I've got a lot of reading to do. Six months' copies of the billboard. I looked through every one of them, and when my eyes were falling out of my head, I saw it. An advertisement. The one I wanted. And the one that tied up with something Billy said. And something I saw during Carino's act. I tried to get Kling on the phone, but no dice. He was out. I left word for him to meet me at the Tivoli, and I went there myself. There was nobody there but the watchman. The five-dollar bill got me in. Oh, there's no place gloomier than backstage in an empty theater. I headed for Torino's dressing room. Because I had a good idea how someone got in and stabbed Torino. Then disappeared. I opened the door, stepped inside. It was dark. The shade on the window must have been down. I was fumbling for the light switch when somebody pulled the shade on me. Who slugged your holiday? Yeah, Kling, I have. All right. Who? Billy, maybe. No dice. He didn't come near this place. We had a tail on him. Do you know about the insurance? Sure. But he couldn't have killed his wife because she loaded the blanks into the gun. Uh huh. And the medical examiner's report on the bullet that killed her? What about that? 22. And no initials on it? No, none. So it looks like this Maria deliberately planned her own death. It wasn't an accident. If it had been, the bullet in her head would have been marked. Kling, put out a dragnet. For who? For the one who slugged me. I'll cut it, Holiday. If you know anything, spill it before I lose my temper. Who do you want to pick up? Here's a description. Young woman, about 26. 26. Brown hair. Brown hair. Lovely blue eyes. Blue eyes. About five foot two. Five foot two. Worked as a magician's assistant. Hey, what are you giving me? That's Maria. Uh Uh-huh, Maria. She's dead, you dope. You mean her twin sister's dead, Kling. Twin sister? What are you talking about? The chunk effect Torino worked. Could have only been done with twins. Billy tipped me off on it. Billy? Sure, when he said nobody could be in two places at once. And Torino advertised in the billboard for twins. You are dreaming this. Put out a dragnet for Maria. Who stabbed Torino? Maria. She got her twin sister to take her place in the rifle trick last night. That's why I didn't get a signal from her. The sister didn't know me from Adam. Now, look, Holiday, we searched this dressing room. There was nobody in it when Torino was stabbed. Maria was here. Look. False back in this cabinet. Good old magician's gimmick. She was here all the while. Maria and Billy took out an insurance policy on her and planned to make me the patsy. Because I'd testify that she told me Torino hated her, that she was scared. Torino was knifed to keep him from spilling about the twins. Billy was in the clear on that. Because he had an alibi when Torino was killed. Okay, Clint? I, uh... Okay. We'll put out a dragnet. Yeah, Susie. They got her. Gee, sounds just like a story. Uh Uh-huh. Only nobody will believe it. 
Look, I've got a knot on my forehead to prove it. <laughs> well, does that make you hysterical? No, but I was just thinking. <laughs> Don't be reckless, Susie. What about? I was just thinking. With that bump, you'll have to wear off the face hat for a while. <laughs> You're a great help. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Wheaties presents Dangerous Assignments. On stage tonight from Hollywood, Dangerous Assignment, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah. Danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment is going to involve my trying to hide three divisions of troops behind an empty water glass. I found him right in the middle of a big deal, as usual. Oh, Steve. Commissioner. I hope it was a square deal. She didn't look square to me. Uh, what have you told him so far, Ruth? Oh, only that you wanted him to go looking for a woman. <laughs> I figured that was the best bait I could use. Well, don't tell me it isn't true. Oh, it's true, all right. But I'm afraid your association with this particular woman won't be a very pleasant one. I might have known. I have your passport and credentials ready when the commissioner's through with you, Steve. Okay, Ruth. Well, what's the deal, Commissioner? Vienna. Vienna? Long time since I've danced the Strauss Waltz. You can leave your ballet slippers home, Steve. Here's the setup. With the situation what it is, we have to increase our arm strength on all fronts. Naturally, our consulates are kept informed as to proposed increases of strength in their respective areas. So? So, two days ago, a document containing information regarding troop movements in Europe was stolen from our consulate in Vienna. The troops have already embarked, and with these unidentified subs around... We can't take chances. I see. Any idea who swiped the document? Yes, a janitor named Joseph Bildner. Well, that doesn't sound so tough. Find Bildner. We've and... already found Bildner in an alley in Vienna last night, murdered. I see. Well, that sort of puts a new light on things. The document wasn't on his person. Just before he died, he mumbled the name Eva Loesch. Eva Loesch? Hey, that name rings a bell. A siren, you should say. But I haven't time to go into her background now to fill a book. Manville Olson can tell you all about her. Who's Olson? He's with the consulate in Vienna. You'll arrive there early tomorrow evening. Go to the Imperial Bar at 8 o'clock. Olsen will be waiting for you. Why meet in the bar? Not that I have any objection. Well, this investigation has to be kept undercover, particularly the part about Eva Loesch. Olsen will tell you why. Now, Steve, get over there. Talk to Olsen. Find Eva Loesch. And most important, get those documents back. Well, that's it. You've got your assignment. Good luck. <laughs> Dangerous assignment will continue in a moment. Now, here is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Ever think of this? You wait longer for breakfast than for any other meal of the day. From the time you go to bed until you eat breakfast is the longest period there is between two meals. So, breakfast has to be good to do the most good for you at a time when you really need food. Which is why I say start breakfast with Wheaties and milk and fruit. It's a pleasant way to get protein, vitamins, and minerals, and just plain whole wheat energy, in a hurry, without a lot of fuss. Wheaties supply energy when you need energy, because there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Yes, a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. 
Sure, breakfast of champions. See for yourself. Have some. See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Yeah, I've got my assignment. Find a girl named Eva Loesch and get a stolen document from her. Ordinarily, there's nothing I like better than to share Shea La Femme. But from what the commissioner has told me, I've got an uneasy feeling that this is going to be all share Shea and no Femme. Well, it's Friday evening when I get to Vienna. I check in at the hotel and then head for the Imperial Bar. Over at a corner table, a guy gives me the nod. I head over there. You're uh, Mitchell, aren't you? Yeah. Olson? That's right. Have a seat. Thanks. Look, uh, the commissioner back in the States told me that you could give me the background on this Eva Loesch. Well, I can tell you all we know over here at the consulate, which isn't enough. Eva Loesch was a red-hot Nazi. She was killed in the Berlin Blitz. What? We thought. Now it looks as if she's been very much alive and in hiding all this time. And worse yet, it looks like she's up to her old tricks. You mean a new Nazi party? No. You know, some of these ex-Nazis have a habit of selling out to the highest bidder. I get it. Now, according to what the commissioner told me, this document concerning our troop movements was stolen from your consulate by a janitor named Bildner. He was found murdered in an alley and mumbled Eva Loesch's name just before he died. That's right. We believe Eva killed him and has the documents. But of course, we've kept all that under cover. We don't want Eva to know we know she's alive. Here. Hmm? This ad I spotted in the afternoon paper. Take a look at it. What? Huh? Will the cab driver who picked up a woman passenger at the plaza last Tuesday night at 8.30 please come to 37 Burgestress? Hey, Tuesday night. That was the night that Bildner was murdered, wasn't it? Yes. In an alley about half a block from the plaza. Huh. This could tie in all right. 37 Burgestrasse. Okay. I think I'll answer that ad, Olson. I'll check with you later. Yes? Are you the one who put that advertisement in the paper this afternoon? Come in. Yes, I'm the one. Why? Fräulein... Frau Denise Menescu. Who are you? I'm the cab driver you're looking for. Oh? Uh, describe this woman you picked up. What? Oh, well, she's about... Oh, medium build, dark hair... You're lying. Huh? I do not know who you are, but you are not a cab driver. Now, look. What? Yes? You are the one who puts the notice in the paper. Oh, great. I guess... I would like to talk to you, please. Just a minute. I am the cab driver in question. Who is this man? This man is about to leave. No, I do not think so. What? Oh, well, come to think of it, you may be right. How come the gun, Buster? You will stay right here, both of you. You are not cab drivers, either of you. In my case, you are quite right. As for this other man, I do not know who he is. I will find that out presently. Well, as long as we're going to play guessing games, maybe you wouldn't mind if I start guessing who you are. You do not have to guess, my friend. I will tell you. I am Lieutenant Oscar Sigal of the police. The police? Well, that takes a load off my mind. Does it? Yeah, but I can't say as much for Frau Manescu here. She seems to be real upset at the news. Frau Manescu? The name seems to mean something to you, Lieutenant. You are not by any chance related to George Manestu. Yes, sir. I'm his wife. But this is completely mystifying. Why would the wife of George Manescu be implicated in such an unsavory affair as this? Somebody mind telling me who George Manescu is? What is your interest in this matter? Maybe these credentials will answer that question, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. They have indeed answered that question, Herr Mitchell. Now, how about filling me in on this George Menescu? Oh, a local politician of high character who has worked in close cooperation with your government here. I see. Well, in that case, Frau Menescu... Oh, there, there is no use holding back anything more. I, I did not want a police brought into this. But, well, here you are. Here I am indeed. I must strongly impress upon you the wisdom of making a full explanation at this time. Yes, I... Well, you see, Eva Loesch is my sister. What? I believed, as did the rest of the world, that she was dead. I believed that until Tuesday night. 
when she came here to see me. What did she want? She said she was in trouble and wanted to hide here. I refused. And then she said I, I must help her. In what way? She said that a, a man was killed, but that she did not do it. That there was a cab driver who could clear her if she could only find him. So you ran that ad in the paper? But I, I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I, I couldn't go to the police. I, I know what damage would be done to my husband's reputation if it were learned that... The notorious Eva Loesch was his wife's sister. So I, I, I ran the advertisement, hoping it would help clear her. And then if the relationship were to be revealed later, it, at least it would be not quite so bad for my husband. I see. Well, that all leads us up to the big question. Where is Eva? I do not know. From Manuscue, it is my duty to warn you that withholding information... I'm telling you the truth. I swear it. I've no idea where Eva's hiding. She said that she would contact me in a few days, but I had not heard from her. Look, sisterly love is a wonderful thing. But I hope that you realize, unless we locate Eva in a hurry, there's going to be a lot more damage done than just to your husband's reputation. Sisterly love, you think that is what I feel for Eva? As far back as I can remember, we've hated each other. My only regret is that she was not killed in Berlin. Then we have your promise that you will communicate with us at once if she contacts you again. Yes, yes, at once. And rest assured, gentlemen, it will be a happy day for me when I can turn my dear sister over to you. Well, it sounds like quite a surprise party you ran into last night, Mitchell. Yeah, it was, Olsen. And of course, the biggest surprise was finding out that Mrs. Minescu is Eva Locia's sister. Incidentally, what information have you got on the Menescus? Well, he seems to be our white hope in local politics around here right now. He's very pro-United States. As to the background, George and his wife Denise apparently were anti-Nazi right from the start, which must have made it a little tough on them in Germany. Yeah, I can imagine. I believe they were married just before the fall of Berlin and managed to get out of the country. Uh, would you like to meet George Menescu Mitchell? Yeah, I would. Can you arrange it? I'm playing golf with him in an hour. Why don't you come along? It's a deal. Let's go. <laughs> That last shot of yours was a honey, Mr. Minescu. Looks like you're only about two feet from the pen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. But I wish you to know that from now on, I believe nothing you say. Oh? When the three of us started this game, you were full of apologies about your bad goals. We are now approaching the 17, and you are three strokes over par. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid Mitchell makes most of his apologies before he makes his best. <laughs> well, you can't blame a guy for trying to get good odds. <laughs> Indeed, you cannot. Well, here we are, gentlemen. And I must say, this is the part of golf I enjoy the most. Putting? Yes. Well, it's the part of the game that pays off. Mm, perhaps it is because putting is so helpful to me. How so, Maniski? Well, I practice it constantly, even when I'm at home. Particularly when I'm thinking about something, putting relaxes me, helps me to think clearly. Mr. Olsen, I believe you are aware. Your putt. Oh, sorry. Uh. Downhill putt, too. That's the kind I don't like. Well, in your case, practice sure pays off, Mr. Minescu. Your putting is very sharp. Oh, thank you. Too bad, Olsen. Rim the cup on you, huh? Yeah. Well, that gives me a six. Well, yeah, looks like I'm next. Little break to the right, it looks like. Not quite as much as it looks. Thanks for the tip. Nice putt. <laughs> I had good advice. Maybe you can return it sometime. Be glad to, except I don't think you'll need any on this putt of yours. It can't be more than two feet. Well, I need this for my power. Well, this is a lot more pleasant way to spend time than roosting behind a desk. Yeah, but it isn't helping us find Eva Loesch. Missed. I'm sorry, Mr. Minescu. I didn't realize you were set to putt, or I would have kept still. Oh, uh, that's quite all right, Mr. Mitchell. Your voice did not bother me. I don't know what went wrong. Well, it looked like you tightened up all of a sudden. Yes, yes. Well, it is no matter. Come, the next tee is right over there. I'm really sorry about that, Minescu. Oh, but I assure you, I was not even aware you were talking, Mitchell. For the life of me, I can't understand why I should miss a two-foot putt. But that is what makes the game of golf so unpredictable, I suppose. Yeah, I think they call it the human element. <laughs> yeah, I think they do. Yeah, let's see. Uh, oh, I believe you're still up, Minescu. Hmm? Oh, yes, yes. 
You know, Steve, it seems to me that you raised your voice a little when you mentioned the name Eva Loesch. Did I? Wait, we mustn't rattle Manescu anymore. He's ready to drive. Oh, miserable. Eh, quite a slice. I must have cut across the ball. Gentlemen, I, I hate to say this, but I, I seem to have a headache. I wonder if perhaps you would excuse me from continuing with our match. Sure, matter of fact, I've had enough. How about you, Olson? Sure, any time. We can cut back towards the clubhouse through this grove of trees. Oh, please, please, I don't want to spoil your game. Why don't the two of you continue? No, no, it seems to be getting a little too warm for comfort anyway. <coughs> Olson! Mitchell, he's been shot right through the head. Quick, Manescu, let's get into that grove of trees. I think it'll be a little safer there. But where did the shot come from? Who knows? Here, in here. It was from a rifle, which means the sniper could be behind a hundred different trees and bushes on the golf course. But I do not understand why anyone would want to kill Olsen. He had no enemies. That's what I was thinking, Manescu, and it gives rise to a few assorted interesting thoughts. What do you mean? Maybe that bullet was meant for somebody else. Somebody else? Do you mean yourself? Yeah, maybe me. Or maybe you, Manescu. Steve Mitchell will continue his dangerous assignment in just a moment. Folks, I'd like to have you meet a good friend of mine and a prominent member of a fine little organization known as the Chicago White Sox, Mr. Lucius Benjamin Affleck. Ooh, Ed, don't say it like that. Who ever heard of a ball player named Lucius? What if I went around calling you Paul Edward Prentice? Let's just make it Ed and Luke, huh? <laughs> All right, Luke. Say, just how long have you been with the White Sox? Over 20 years, Ed. Golly, I've played in darn near 2,500 games. Then it bat almost 9,000 times. Man, I'm from way back. Well, Luke, you don't look it. How do you keep up the pace, anyway? Well, Ed, I sleep good. I eat good. I eat mighty good. Beat is about four mornings a week. Those little old flakes put a lot of snap, even in an old-timer like me. Must be because they're 100% whole wheat. I sure like Wheaties and milk and fruit. You know, Luke, that's exactly what I hear from a lot of ball players and plenty of other people, too. No wonder they call Wheaties the breakfast of champions. Thank you, Ed Prentice and Luke Appling. And as for a breakfast of champions, friends, sure, they're for men who go to bat for a living, but confidentially, they're for us, too. You and me. We need whole wheat energy, same as the champions who play ball for their paychecks. Don't forget your own breakfast of champions. Wheaties, get yours. <laughs> Now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Steve Mitchell. Ah, Mitchell, I have been expecting you. You uh, uncovered anything new, Lieutenant Siegel? Indeed I have. You told me that when you mentioned the name Eva Loesch on the golf course earlier today, Manescu reacted visibly. That's right. I dangled a little bait under his nose, and he snapped at it like an undernourished barracuda. Huh. Of course, to be fair to the guy, he probably knows that his wife is Eva's sister. It could have been that. I am positive it was much more than that. Oh? I have done a considerable amount of investigation into Manescu's background, and I am sure it will be of interest to you to learn that in the old Nazi days in Germany, Manescu and Eva Loesch were... Uh, shall we say, extremely friendly. Oh, yeah? Well, that kind of puts a different light on things. Yeah, indeed it does. After Eva's death, Manescu married her sister, Denise, and made his escape from Germany with her. Hmm. And now Eva's popped up again. You know, that gives rise to an interesting possibility. Yeah, the possibility that Manescu has been seeing Eva again and knows where she is. Which means he either has those documents or knows where they are. Well, I've got to hand it to him for the big act he's been putting on about being such a friend of the United States. If our suspicions of Manescu are correct, one cannot help feeling sorry for his wife, though. Yeah, it must be pretty rough spot for Denise if she has any idea what's going on. Oh, excuse me, please. Lieutenant Segal speaking. May I speak to Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, one moment, please. It's for you, Mitchell. The lady in question. Oh? Hello? This is Denise Manescu, Mr. Mitchell. Something has come up. I must see you at once. Okay, I'll be there in about 15 minutes. Well, it could be that Denise is starting to smell a rat, Lieutenant. I'd better get over there and see if it's the same rat I think it is. So, I head to the Manescu's house. Manescu, with a preoccupied look and a putter in his hand, lets me in the front door. Then he disappears into his study. Denise is waiting for me in the living room. Thank you. 
very much for coming, Mr. Mason. Oh, sure. You said something had come up, Denise? Yes. Uh, first, let me ask you, did you say anything to my husband when he let you in the front door? No, he looked like he was in another world. Yes, he seems to be worried about something. I'm afraid I know what it is. You think maybe he's been seeing Eva Loesch lately? Yes, I think he has. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. When my sister died, I thought that part of his life was over. It, it is not a very pleasant thing to realize that you have been married on the rebound, Mr. Mitchell. I told you that... But, What's the matter? Steve, there is someone on the roof of the house next door. What? Wait. Whoever it was saw me watching and disappeared. Come on. Here, we can go out through these French doors. Huh. Now we're in sight. Did you recognize him? All I could see was a trench coat, a slouched hat, and a gun. Look, you stay here. I'll circle around this house and try to climb up and nab him. I circle around the house next door, and I spot some vines running up the wall. I start climbing, but ten feet from the ground, I hear a sound that stops me cold. I drop to the ground, run back to Manesca's house. The study window is shattered, and in front of it stands Denise, staring inside, half hysterical. Denise, what happened? Denise! Too late. I tried to warn him. Warn who? Look, here's the window. Manescu, on the floor. Tell me, what happened, Denise? After you went around to the other side of that house, the person came back to the edge of the roof. That the door to the study? Oh, yes. Come on. Oh, suddenly I knew what was going to happen. I started running to the study window to warn my husband, but then the shot. Here we are. Mm. Bullet entered the top of his head. Must have come from the roof, all right. Wait a minute. What's that water glass doing on the floor? But I, I don't know. Uh, he must have knocked it over as he fell. Well, the man who shot him is probably a few blocks away by now. Steve. Steve, I do not think it was a man. What do you mean? You told me before the shot that he was wearing a trench coat and a slouch hat. Yes, but just before the shot, I got a quick look at the face. A woman? I think it was my sister, Eva. A most perplexing case, Mitchell. First, the janitor Joseph Bildner murdered. Second, the American also murdered. Third, George Manescu. Murdered. But at least we know who's behind it all, Eva Loesch. So the big problem is finding her in those documents, Lieutenant. You know, there's one thing I don't get. Why is Eva hanging around town if she already has those documents? Mitchell, have you considered the possibility that Manescu might have been shot by his wife, Danny? Sure, I've considered it. She had a motive, too. She knew her husband had been seeing Eva, but there's just one little item that sort of knocks that theory into a cocked hat. Yeah, unfortunately, you are right. You are referring, of course, to the angle at which the bullet entered Manescu's head. Yeah, from the top of his head down. Which would indicate that the bullet was fired from some distance above him. That his wife was out on the terrace at the time, slowly below him. Uh, as a matter of fact, below All him. of which brings us back to our friend Eva. Excuse it, please. Are you Lieutenant Segal of the police? Yeah. I think perhaps you would be good enough to tell me what this is all about. Perhaps you would be good enough to tell me your name and what, what is all about. Excuse I'm Anton. I drive taxi cab. So? So today, in newspaper stands an advertisement. Wait a minute. You mean the one about the cab driver who picked up a woman at the plaza last Tuesday night? Yeah, you put it in? No, no. Uh, go on. I answer the ad. I go to the address. There is policeman there. And over in one corner, a woman sitting with her head in her hands, crying. That'd be Denise. So I tell policeman that I picked up a woman last Tuesday night. Probably Eva Lord. I did not know her name. I picked her up in the plaza, and she stayed in my cab only two blocks. She kept looking back over her shoulder, and then she made me pull over to the curb and got out. All this I tell policeman. He takes down my address and tells me to come over here to Imperial Bar and report to you. Very well. Thank you for your information. You may go now. Go, he says. Still nobody tells me what this is all about. Well, that was a big bunch of nothing. Mitchell, this case is giving me a headache. Murders, stolen documents, political intrigue. And every time we think we have a fresh lead, it disappears into thin air. Poof! Poof. Hey, hey, watch it. Yeah, it would appear my gestures are a little too much. Waiter! Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? Look, Siegel, 
You knocked the glass off the table just now, and it broke. This is not a very profound observation, Mitchell. But I found a glass lying on its side in Minescu's study after he got shot, and that glass wasn't broken. Yet the table there is about the same height as the table here. What are you getting at? Minescu's glass wasn't knocked off the table. It was placed on the floor. So? So we've been a couple of prize jugheads. I still do not understand what... The whole thing has just fallen into place, Lieutenant. There's just one big thing wrong right now. What do you mean? I mean we could be just about five minutes too late. Mitchell, there's the cab driver's house just ahead. Okay, let's stop here, Lieutenant. We'll circle around to the back of the house. He probably keeps his cab there. Mitchell, I still do not understand why this taxi cab is suddenly so important to us. Look, remember what that cab driver said? When he picked up Eva after she'd killed that janitor, she only stayed in this cab a few minutes, then got out. Yeah, yeah, she hid the documents there. That is why she had Denise put that ad in the paper. She wanted to find that taxi cab driver. That's right, wait. Yeah, there's the cab in that little lean-to back of the house. Okay, let's take it as quiet as we can now. Mitchell, a flashlight. Someone is in that cab. Yeah, that doesn't really surprise me. Come on. Oh. Found those documents yet? Dennis Manescu. No, Eva Loesch, Lieutenant. It's one and the same person. What? No, that's a lie. Save it, Eva. The real Denise got killed in the Berlin Blitz, didn't she? No. You figured it would be a neat scheme if people thought it was you who were killed. You posed as Denise, married Manescu, and got out of town. Lies. All of them lies. I guess Manescu was the right guy after all. He probably figured you'd reformed when he found out that you hadn't. You were afraid he'd expose you. You tried for him once on the golf course and got Olsen instead. Then you rigged this little scheme for my benefit at your house this afternoon and killed him. Mitchell, watch out. Yeah, I see the gun. <laughs> your rain isn't as hot as it was, Eva. Drop it. That's better. And thanks for giving us the one piece of evidence we needed. This gun of yours. I... Five will get you ten. We can prove that the slug that killed your husband came from this gun. Oh, you... you... I will kill you. Uh, uh, temper, temper. Uh, Mitchell. Yeah? This is all very nice, but there's one thing that we may have difficulty in proving. What's that? The angle of elevation of the bullet that killed Manescu. That's right. How could it have been fired by Ava here, who was standing on the ground outside the window? You that see? That brings us back to the empty water glass, which was lying on its side on the floor in Manescu's study. I should have figured it sooner. Figured what? Look, when Manescu let me in the front door, he had a putter in his hand. He'd already told me that he practiced putting at home whenever he had a problem. And along about then, he had a big problem. What to do about Eva? Putting? Yeah. How do you go about putting a golf ball, Lieutenant? Why, why one takes the club in his hand, bends over the ball, and... You can stop right there. That's what Manesco was doing. That's why the bullet entered the top of his head. Right, Eva? I have nothing to say. You don't have to. You know, you never want to underestimate anybody's golf game, Eva. You probably thought your husband's putting practice was a big joke. Well, <laughs> maybe you were right. Yeah, I guess you could call it a joke. A real funny one. It'll kill you. Well, we certainly enjoyed that assignment, Brian. Your usual sterling performance. Thank you, Frank. I uh, had an extra bowl full of Wheaties this morning. Maybe that helped. Well, I'm sure it did, Brian. But seriously, you know, Wheaties can make a difference. Oh, I agree. Less of a letdown. Oh, more of the old up and at That's right, but I have something to impress, Frank. You have what? The real reason I eat Wheaties is I like them. Well, good for you. Best reason in the world. It's fine, the whole wheat, vitamins and minerals and proteins in Wheaties. But it's just the plain goodness you go for, huh? That's right, Frank. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the words of an honest man. Get your Wheaties tomorrow. Work better all morning for it. But most of all... Eat them because you like them. Right, Brian Donlevy? Right, Frank. Good night. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif, with music by Basil Adlam, conducted by Ralph Hollenbeck, and is produced and directed by Bill Carn. Join us again next Wednesday when Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell embarks on another dangerous assignment. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Thursday, that's tomorrow night, 
to Sarah Berner in Sarah's Private Caper on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Next, listen for the Falcon on NBC. Steve Mitchell is written by Bob Reif with music by Basil Adlam, conducted by Ralph Hollenbeck, and is produced and directed In just a moment, Suspense, starring Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. Now, let's stop in at Ed Jones for a moment, Billy. Okay, Dad. Hello, Ed. Well. How's the world's greatest ignition service station tonight? I have. Hi, Billy. Hi. I'm busy on a couple of cranky ignition jobs. Hey, how's the car running? Never better. Take a look. Sure. Glad to. Hey, Dad, Ed's got his radio on. Is it the Autolite show? That's it, Billy. Suspense is my Thursday night special. Ignition systems, spark plugs, batteries. Ed, you've got everyone in town switching to Autolite. <laughs> Billy, your dad's trying to take over the Autolite announcer's chore. <laughs> <laughs> See, Doug Fairbanks Jr. is on suspense tonight. You like him, Billy? Yes, sir. He's a self-starting, smooth-running humdinger. Why, he's got the pep of an Autolite ignition system, a set of spark plugs, and a stay-full battery combined. Uh-oh, here's the show. Suspense. Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations bring you Radio's Outstanding Theater of Thrills. Starring tonight, Mr. Douglas Fairbanks in a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Today, everybody's switching to Autolite, and tonight, Autolite takes pleasure in presenting Anton Leder's production of Deep into Darkness, starring Douglas Fairbanks. This is a story about fear, and I'm an expert on fear. Me, Ken Matthews. That cheap, broken-down hotel room is as good a place as any to start. It was all I could afford. New York, the city of bright lights, and and me, stretched out on a squeaky bed, watching a spot change shape on the ceiling. It's a kind of game to keep a man from going crazy. For seven years, I watched another spot, changed it into a million shapes, got to know it better than I knew myself. That spot on the ceiling of my cell at Joliet Penitentiary. When it was over, when they were finally ready to let me go back into the world, the warden had something to say to me, some, some advice. Matthews, you're leaving us early because of your good behavior record. Now, if I were you, I'd start fresh on the outside. Stay away from Chicago. Go someplace new where they don't know you. I sort of figured on doing that, warden. Good. You'll find it easier. I'd find it easier. <laughs> I wonder how it is when it's tough. Nobody knew me in New York. Nobody wanted to know me. And as for a job, well, did you ever wash dishes? <laughs> I washed a million. Now, any dirty jobs nobody wants to do, I did them all. That's how I built up my fortune. $17.50, United States currency. That's how much I was worth this one morning when I saw a sign out in front of a construction job. Men wanted the sign said. I believed it. I looked up the form. Bill, what's that compressor? Come on, Jim. Keep it moving. <clears throat> Uh, looking for something, bud? Yes, uh, you, you you, have a sign out there. Are, are you hiring men? Could be. What do you do? Oh, just about anything. I I can keep books, handle your time. I, I used to be an accountant. Oh, yeah? But um, if that's not what you're looking for, well, well I can swing a shovel, too. I, I just want a job. Yeah. I like that attitude. Got your discharge certificate with you? Discharge? Yeah, honorable discharge. Always like to give a break to ex-service guys. Oh, well, I, I wasn't in the service. Yeah, oh. For it? No, no, I... I sat out the war. I was in jail. Oh, it's tough. <laughs> it got a little mixed up on your account, huh? <laughs> no, it was manslaughter. I killed a man. What about the job? I, I really need it. Uh, look, buddy, I don't want you to think this is my idea, but... But uh... you can't use me. Huh? No, I can't. You see... Yes, I see. <laughs> Start fresh, you see. I got my orders. See, you know how that 
it is. The bosses figure there's a lot of vets looking for jobs. I got to give them the first crack at things. Oh, well, if I was to. Uh, it's all right. It isn't your fault. Maybe, maybe some other war. Somehow that was the last straw. I started to hate. I hated everything and everyone. And then I thought of my fortune, my seventeen dollars and fifty cents. And suddenly I knew there was something I wanted to buy. What you want to use the gun for, Mister? I I don't know. I just want to have it. Hmm, well, we're supposed to put something down here. I mean, along with your name and everything. Oh well, put down target practice. That's good enough, isn't it? I guess so. What's the name? Put down Smith. Smith. Oh, it's like that, huh? Look, Mister. I don't want to get into any trouble. I run a respectable place of business here. You and... want to sell a gun, don't you? Well, sure, but you want the fourteen dollars, don't you? Okay, okay. So it's Smith, and you're going to do some target practice. Give me the fourteen bucks and get lost, huh? Thanks. Thanks a lot. Funny thing, I, I still don't know why I wanted that gun. I swear I don't. Kill myself, rob a bank, or a filling station? I haven't any idea. I suppose I just thought that having it would make me feel better. Only it didn't. It hung in my pocket, heavy as lead, cold, dead, just like its owner. I turned into a side street, 52nd, 51st. I wasn't sure. I stopped to light a cigarette, and a car pulled up to the curb. It was a big car with a chauffeur, a black car, smooth and shiny. Then I looked at the man getting out. Just one look, and wheels started spinning around in my head. I got dizzy. The sidewalk twisted and bounced around like it was having a convulsion. But when he spoke, the shock of hearing his voice straightened it all out. Made it cold and clear as hard crystal. Just a few words to that chauffeur. Wait for me, Davis. I won't be long. He turned and walked past me, right by me into the bank. But he couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything. That was Lee Burke I was staring at. Lee Burke, the man I'd killed seven years ago. <laughs> For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in Deep into Darkness. Autolite's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, sure looks like young Doug's got it, eh, Billy? Boy, I'll say he has. What a chip he's got in his shoulder. Billy, stop chipping and chirping like your mother. Oh, uh, by the way, Ed... That ignition system of mine score a bullseye? <laughs> She's completely on the beam. <laughs> My jobs usually are, especially when they're Autolite. Yes, sir. Money can't buy better ignition equipment for your car. Autolite parts are made by the world's largest independent manufacturers of automobile electrical equipment. And Autolite service stations are equipped with highly trained men and specialized machines to give your car the best in automobile service. And that Autolite ignition system sounds intelligent enough to take an IQ test, eh, Ed? Stop pulling Ed's leg, Billy. <laughs> I'm used to it, Hap. But I'll tell you this. Autolite makes original equipment for many of the finest cars in America. Ignition systems, batteries, spark plugs, generators, lots more. So it's only natural that Autolite ignition is... Well, it's a perfectly timed team with smooth on-the-dot performance. So when your car's electrical system needs attention, drive into your nearest Autolite service station or the dealer who sells your make of car and ask for original factory parts. Autolite? Autolite service stations are listed in your classified telephone directory under Automotive Electrical Service. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. as Ken in Deep into Darkness. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. few moments of watching a man walk across the sidewalk into a bank, I lived it all over again. The way it happened when I killed him seven years ago back in Chicago. There wasn't anything about it I couldn't remember. Ken, darling. Yeah? Do you love me, Ken? Do I love you? <laughs> oh, no, not at all. 
I just sit in that goofy nightclub night after night because the food's so good. Oh, Ken, you're sweet. Lila, why don't you forget that place? Give it up. Where, where's it going to get a girl like you dancing in a cheap honky tonk? You have and... something better to offer, darling? I've offered it a half a dozen times. Marry me. I got a good job. It'll, it'll get better. Hand me my drink, will you? Sure. Here. What do you say? I've told you, Ken, over and over again. I'm not getting married. Not to you, anyway. You're a sweet guy, sure, and I'm very fond of you, but little Lila isn't burying herself in any house with a bunch of squalling kids. That's for suckers. I don't think you mean that at all. No? Well, you just watch, darling. I'm going to wind up with a diamond so big it'll take a two-ton truck to deliver it to me. I'm going to have so many mink coats, I'll use them for pajamas. Yeah, that's the way to talk, sis. You tell him. Hello, Lee. Oh, you're beginning to sound like you're getting good sense. Now, yeah, what are you doing up here with this bookkeeper anyway? <laughs> and a good evening to you, too, Lee. Never mind. I thought I said I didn't want you wasting your time with him. He's all right. We were Get going... out of here, Matthews. Now, wait a minute. If Lila wants me to go... Oh, I'm not want... satisfied with my suggestions, eh? Well, I have a good mind Lee, to... stop it. Put that gun away. Every time you have a few drinks, you start waving that gun around. Really, Lee, you better put it down. Stop acting like a kid. Acting like a kid, huh? I'll show you who's acting like a kid. I'll... Give me that gun. Lee! Yeah. Come on, Lee. Give it to me. I'll, I'll break let... your arm. Go, let go, my... It went off. I I was only trying to take it away from him. Oh, you killed him. Ken, you killed my brother. I didn't mean it, I tell you. I, you saw what happened. I I was only trying to get the gun. Get out, Ken. The police will find you. Get out of here. Hurry, I tell you, get out! <laughs> It was pouring that night, and I ran down the street with the rain slapping me in the face. I ran up a back alley into the darkness, and then, then I stopped. I didn't want to run, not for the rest of my life. I went to the nearest police station, turned myself in. They took me back to the Burks, and we found Lila sitting in a chair, glassy-eyed, just staring down at her brother, Lee. He, he was right where I'd left him, sprawled on the floor, face down. Lee Burke was dead, and they gave me ten years for killing him. Only now he wasn't dead. He couldn't be. I'd just seen him walk into a bank. Uh, <clears throat> a nice car you got. Yeah. Uh, must, must be an important man to have a car like that, eh? Yeah, he's a big guy. Lots, lots of money, I suppose, huh? Yeah, he's crawling with it. That make you happy? His, uh, his name uh, it doesn't happen to be Burke, does it? No, Wilson. Oh. Keith Wilson. He also happens to be a stockbroker. Anything else you want to know? Keith Wilson. Yeah, and I'll beat it. The boss is coming. The boss? <laughs> now, isn't that something? All right, Davis. I'll go straight to the office now. Yes, sir. In a hurry, Lee? What? Why? Oh, there, there must be some mistake. My name isn't Lee. Oh, pardon me. was Lee. There wasn't any doubt about it. And he knew me, too. I could see it in his eyes and in the way his face went white. I didn't understand it. I, I couldn't figure out why or how, but Lee Burke was alive. The rest of the fortune went for a taxi ride, but it was worth it to me. And I guess if I hadn't had enough money to follow Lee's car wherever it went, I'd have forced the cab driver with that gun I'd bought. But it wasn't necessary. We went out to Long Island. Way out. And then the car swung into a place with a big half-circle drive. Lee Burke, now Mr. Keith Wilson, was doing very well for himself. And so was Lila. <gasps> What's the matter, Lila? Ken. Is it like seeing a ghost? Ken. Ken, it's really you. I saw a ghost just now, too, only he was very much alive. So that's what he was so excited about. Lee? Yes, he came in, rushed upstairs. Told me to call the airport, get him a plane for Miami. Did you? Not yet. It won't do any good. Ken. Ken, what do you want? Why did you come here? I just wanted to be sure, Lila. Absolutely sure. What are you going to do? I'd like to kill him. I ought to kill you both. No, Ken. Don't talk like that. It, it wasn't me. I didn't plan but it. But it was a plan, wasn't it, Lila? Wasn't it? Yes. You want to tell me about it, or do I have to choke it out of him? I'll tell you. What's the difference? You didn't kill Lee. 
You didn't kill anybody. Huh? It was a frame-up. Then how could I have seen him like that? Lee was on the floor, dead. No, that wasn't Lee. He he found the man, Ken, a, a stumble bum, a drunk, and the man looked just like him. Close enough for what Lee had figured out. It was the crookedest scheme you ever heard. Took out insurance with every company in town, half a million dollars with me as beneficiary. He was going to kill this drifter and disappear, let me collect the money. It was as simple as that, at first. Keep talking. But I told him it wouldn't work, Ken, that they'd never pay off, not that much. Not till they checked fingerprints, teeth, everything, but he had that figure, too. They wouldn't check a thing if a fall guy pleaded guilty to a murder charge. So that's how it was. You were the fall guy. I let you take me home that night, remember? I remember. Lee had his gun loaded with blanks. It was an act, the whole thing. Then when you ran, he finished the job. He had the drunk in the bedroom dressed in his clothes. He brought him into the living room. Killed him right in front of me. That's who you saw when you got back. Good Lord. That's why... Why I hate my brother, why I don't care what happens to him. Thanks, Lila. That's going to make it easier. Lila! Lila, just call the airline. No, Lee, not yet. But I told you not to waste any time. You don't know what this means. She knows what it means, Lee. We all do. What do you want? Why'd you follow me here? Hey, look, I think you you better get out of here. You'll... I'd stay away from that telephone, Lee. I'd stand still if I were you. You'd better do as he says, Lee. He's got a gun. Ken, listen to me. You can't do this. Not now. You don't want any more trouble. Why, if the police found the out... The police? If you told them I was going to kill you, it wouldn't make sense, Lee. Because I've already done that. Remember? Now, look, Ken, look, I can explain the whole thing. It, it was a mistake. I'm glad you know that now. I've made a lot of money, Ken. I've been very lucky. I'll, I'll, I'll split with you. You look like you could use some money. Yes, I could. Sure, that's good. Only uh, forget the gun, huh? And stop acting like you want to kill me. You wouldn't gain anything that way. Come on, Lila, fix some drinks or something, huh? We'll, we'll talk this over friendly-like. Ken, you know Lila was always crazy about you. I was always crazy about her. Oh, Ken, I... But let's talk about something else right now, Lee. Let's yeah. talk about America. Sure. You know, this is a wonderful country, the way the laws are set up to protect a man. Ever hear of double jeopardy, Lee? Brings Ken. up a rather interesting fact. That you can't try a man twice for the same crime. <laughs> Seven years I spent paying for killing you. Seven years at Joliet and you weren't even dead. That means I've paid for something I haven't done yet. I still have the right, Lee, to kill you once more. Oh, now, Ken, stop it. You're talking crazy. Th th there must be something you want. I only want to kill you, Lee, because you deserve to be killed. We both know that, don't we? Only, I don't think I'll kill you now. Not, not right away. Oh, we'll be reasonable. Is that it, Ken? Be reasonable, I say. I'm going to stay right with you. 24 hours a day, right up to the time you deal. Oh. I know exactly when and how I'm going to kill you. And you won't know. You'll never know, Lee, until it happens. You'll just wait. Just sit and wait and wait. I never left the Burke's mansion. Never let them leave. I was with Lee from the time he got up until he went to bed. I stayed with him every waking hour, and I never stopped twisting his life like a piece of putty, putting fear in his mind until... Well, until there didn't seem to be anything else left there at all. Just a trembling, driving fear in everything he did, everything he said. Lila, Lila, can't we do something? Get to somebody. Oh, Lee, what can I do? You, you could have said something to the servants. You had a chance before he sent them away. I didn't. It all happened too fast. Got rid of them as easily as he cut the telephone wires. Well, we've got to do something. Get in touch with somebody. With, with Madeline, maybe. Oh, yes? What will your blue blood fiancé think of you now? When you suddenly stop calling two days before your wedding and then don't show up? The wedding? Oh, Lila, don't you see? If anything should happen to the wedding now, I'd be ruined. Well, he can't get away with this. He'll let down some time. He's, he's got to sleep. So do we. Lila's right, Lee. Uh, well, Ken, you, you were there by the door. You, you heard. About your wedding? Yes, Lee. I got back just in time, didn't I? Can I pour you a Manhattan? Oh, no, no, I don't want anything. Your funeral... No, don't, don't say that. <laughs> You're falling apart much faster than I thought, Lee. It 
wasn't taking long at all. Lee couldn't sit still for a minute, couldn't take his eyes off me. Of course, little things like this didn't exactly help. <laughs> who, who, who is it? Ken? Yes, Lee. It's Ken. Got the gun? I have the gun, Lee. Oh, this... This is the time, huh? Mm, no, Lee, no, I don't think so. Here, drink this. What is it? Milk. Warm milk. Ah, uh, it'll put you to sleep. Yeah, for good, you mean? No, 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 no. Just until morning. You see, I wouldn't think of killing a man on his wedding day. What? Don't tell me you've forgotten your wedding to the blue-blooded Mr. Haven. You've come a long way, Lee, marrying into the social register. Oh, don't, Ken. Come on, drink up. You'll need your strength for the wedding. No, no, that's all off. I, I, I haven't even called her, Ken. Lila has. I made her call. She made some very pretty excuses for you, and the wedding will go on as scheduled. What, what are you going to do? Nothing, only behave yourself tomorrow. Do as you're told, and you might live through the ceremony. <laughs> Thou, Keith, take this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy state of matrimony. Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep thee unto her so long as ye both shall live? Say no. Ken, say no, or I'll kill you right here in front of them all. Say it, Lee. Mr. Wilson, the answer, please. No. No, no I can't. I, I, I can't. Wilson, please, I can't. the answer. This must be... One thing wrong with that little wedding scene. I had fun, sure, but in the excitement, I'm afraid I relaxed a little. I wasn't sure how much it mattered. That depended on Lila. When I was sure Lee was asleep that night, I met her in the living room. Got right to the point. Something on your mind, Ken? Yes. Mousy. Who's Mousy? Ken, you... you look so tired, so thin. Tell me, Lila. Tell me about Mousy. What do you know about him? Lee's been talking about him in his sleep, talking about Mousy and you, Lila, and me. You'd better oh, tell me all about it. Ken, you're hurting my arm. I, I don't know anything about Mousy. Maybe he was there at the wedding. Maybe you saw him. Maybe you gave him the message, did you, Lila? Ken, stop it. You know I promised I wouldn't do anything like that. Don't you trust me? Trust you? Should I, Lila? Do you really think I should? But you know how I feel about you. Surely you don't think... Oh, Ken. Ken, darling. Get away from me. Ken! So that's it. It was all just a gag to keep the little girl in line. How did you expect me to feel after all this happened? That's right. I was naive, wasn't I? Sure. Okay. Well, I won't be naive anymore. You can bet on that. Lila. Good night. Ken, darling. <laughs> I cooled off, I realized I'd gone too far. She wouldn't be on my side anymore. Unless... Unless I could talk to her again and make it... Make it all seem like a, like a mistake, a joke, maybe. Yeah, that, that'd be the thing. But when I went to find her, she wasn't around. I, I didn't see her again until next morning. Every morning, I went out to the gate for the paper, but this time, I waited for Lila to get up and come down so I could talk to her before Lee came in, try to, try to fix things. And standing there in the hallway, I fixed things all right. Fixed them good. Lila. Yes? I... I want you to know that... Well... That I'm sorry about last night. It's all right. No, it isn't, no. no I, I... I didn't mean what I said at all. I guess I'd built up so much hate that... Well, I was upset. I, I was blind to how you feel about me, how I really feel about you. Ken, you're asking me to be naive again. Yes, I guess I am. I like you that way. I I looked for you last night to tell you. You weren't around. Where'd you go? I... Oh, Ken, I... No, it's all right. I don't care where you went. Anyway, now you know how I really feel. Lila. Ken, you... You don't know what you're saying. Yes, I do, Lila. I've been thinking. That's the way it ought to be. We've been a couple of lost souls, but... Maybe by forgetting the past, trying to find some peace of mind... Ken! Think about it, will you, Lila? 
I went out then, out the door and down the driveway. Left her standing there, staring after me. But suddenly, as I was almost to the gate, I heard her coming, running, fast. Ken! No, Ken, come back! And then I saw it, a car that had been parked down the road. It was moving now, gathering speed, coming right past the gate. Ken! Ken, look out! And then she was there. She threw herself right in front of me. Ah! I heard the shouts. I felt her thrown heavily against me, and then... And then her body went limp in my arms. I held her close for a second, and... And then I lowered her to the ground. I walked back up the drive, alone. Lee was out in front of the house, sitting on a bench in front of a big tree. He'd heard the shots, I'm sure, but he was just sitting there, probably waiting for Lila to come back and say that... that Mousy had taken care of me. He turned and looked up as I walked toward him. Lila? Oh, no. His eyes seemed to look right through me somehow. He was that full of fear, I guess. His fingers gripped the tree in back of him, dug deep into the bark. He was waiting for me to kill him. <laughs> Lila's deadly, you're... Your gunman got her instead of me. Lila? Lila? I'm sorry because... because there was something I didn't have time to tell her. I never intended to kill you, Lee. I was just... just showing you how seven years looked crowded into a few days. Seven years? Yeah, that's right. I guess you know now. I guess you know why and what you did. Lee. Lee, this is Ken. I'm talking to you. Ken. Ken. <laughs> I... I don't know any Ken. And he didn't. He didn't even know himself. The way his eyes looked, I don't think he ever will again. They weren't Lee Burke's eyes anymore. They belonged to someone else. Funny. <laughs> the man who tried to be somebody else had finally made it, and it was not good to look upon. Thank you, Douglas Fairbanks, for an outstanding performance on Suspense. Talk about performance, Dad. Auto light ignition is good, but what about Doug Fairbanks? He's really got it, Billy. Well, let's get going. Your mother... Uh... Mom will be as full of suspense as your auto light ignition system is full of pep, purr, power, and pistol point performance. <laughs> that boy knows his auto light peas, and he doesn't miss any cues, eh, Hap? Yes, and auto light is your cue to real motoring enjoyment. So remember, wherever you go... Auto light means spark plugs. Ignition engineered spark plugs. Autolite means batteries. Stay full batteries. Autolite means ignition system. The lifeline of your car. And now here again is Mr. Douglas Fairbanks. I've enjoyed this appearance on Suspense very much. And I've noted with great interest as a Suspense fan that Agnes Moorhead will return to the soundstage next week. The scene of her splendid performances of the past. As one of the many who applauded her portrayal in the suspense classic, Sorry, Wrong Number, I'll be listening with anticipation next week for Agnes Moorhead in The Yellow Wallpaper, a powerful study in... Suspense. Douglas Fairbanks may soon be seen in his own production, The O'Flynn. Tonight's suspense play was written by Edward James with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Yellow Wallpaper. This is the Autolite Suspense Show signing off. Good night. Switch to Autolite. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are traveling east on a cross-country bus, while among your fellow passengers, seemingly innocent and friendly, are a man and a woman who plan to destroy you and 150 million of your countrymen. Listen now as Escape brings you Anthony Ellis' exciting story, Classified Secret. day. Yes. Kids sure not spring. Look at them. I've uh, been watching them. Yeah. Kind of glad, though, I haven't got any. Oh? Well, you know, world conditions, things the way they are. Who wants to bring a kid into it? I uh, suppose so. Do you have a match? Sure. Here you are. Thanks. Have you got it? <laughs> What's the matter? Well, you don't look the type. I almost hoped you weren't. Have you got it? With me? No, but I'll take you to where it is. All right. The money's in tens, twenties, and fifties. In the sack with the groceries? Mm hmm. I thought it'd be safer that way. Yeah. I guess so. How much? Ten thousand. Ten? That's what you agreed to? Uh-uh. I said twenty. I was told ten. They made a mistake then, didn't they? Sorry. What are you trying to do? Nothing. Not a thing. I was told you were with us. I am, but I get paid for it too, don't you? I can't sit here any longer. We might be watched. Will you please give Sorry. me... Sorry. It was a misunderstanding. But... Unless you want to take me to the head man, maybe he can straighten it out. I haven't any instructions for that. Where can I reach you? As of about two hours from now, you can't. I'm leaving town. Will you give us 24 hours? It'll take that I'm long. I'm sorry. To... If you can't pay what I want, there's somebody else who will. I'm going. So long. I was sitting on a bench in a little park in North Hollywood, California. The early spring sun was warm and there was a smell of fresh cut grass. I watched the woman I'd never seen before walk off down the path. She was headed for the avenue and some cars parked beyond the trees. I thought how nice it would have been if, if she were just a woman in the park and nothing else. I waited until she was out of sight then I got up and walked away in the opposite direction. I got the bus at the Hollywood station. I had a train ticket in my pocket, but with the new development, it looked safer to ride the bus. Just before we pulled out, a girl climbed aboard and came down the aisle looking for a seat. 
Excuse me, is this number... 18. Oh, thank you. Oh, here, let me put your case up. Well, thank you. I was afraid I was going to miss it. Yeah, I know how it is. I settled back and watched the city drift away into desert country. As the buses go, it was pretty quiet. There was a four or five year old kid with his mother a couple of seats forward, but he dozed off almost as soon as he got running. I took a look at the girl sitting next to me, not, not in the way you might think, but because in my business, you get to learn to look at people. You never know who it might be. She must have felt me watching. She lowered the magazine she was reading. Would you uh, care to look at one of these? Well, that's nice of you. I, I always forget to buy them. Well, this one's a mystery. I don't usually read them, but on a long trip, they kind of pass the time away. Yeah, they do. How far are you going? New York. Mm, that's a long trip, all right. I'll say. I haven't been back for 10 years. Bet it's changed. Yeah, I guess so. I read the mystery well into Arizona. When I finished, it was beginning to get dark. The kid up ahead was awake and hungry. There was a feeling of expectation on the bus as we drove into the first night of travel. Did you enjoy it? Hmm? Oh, yes, it was fine. Thanks a lot. What was it about? <laughs> Spies. Real exciting. I like spy movies sometimes. I think they do so many of them. You read about it in the papers all the time. I don't know. I think people would get sick of it. Yeah, I guess you're right. They're exciting, like you say. I bet it isn't really like that. I doubt it. Uh, say, my name's Charlie. Charlie Rader. Oh, how do you do? I'm Julie Spaulding. Hi. That kid sounds as hungry as I am. Yeah, we ought to be stopping soon. I hope so. About 15 minutes later, we pulled up at a restaurant terminal and went in for food. I watched for any new passengers who might be getting on. I didn't see anybody, and as soon as I'd finished my sandwich and coffee, I sent a telegram to New York and then got back on the bus. The girl, Julie, and I seemed to be hitting it off, and it was pleasant enough to pass the time. After we got rolling, the kid up ahead decided to sing himself to sleep. It was like a crooning over and over again, the same song, the same few notes. I guess it put everybody else to sleep except him. Makes you sleepy, doesn't it? Yeah. Reminds me of when I was a kid. I used to do that. Kids are funny. How? Well, I don't know. I'm going back to New York for my sister's wedding. She's getting married next week. She says she wants lots of kids. I don't know. Yeah, I know what you mean. Mind if I ask you something? No, I don't mind. What? Are you married? No. I don't mean it the way it sounds. I'm always interested in trying to guess about people. Now, I would have figured you were a married man with maybe two or three kids. <laughs> no, I'm not married. Oh. I hope you don't think I'm nosy. No. Well, that kid singing fixed me. I'm gonna take a nap. Good night, Charlie. Good night.
I must have dropped off too. When I woke up, she had her head on my shoulder. A lock of her hair was falling over her closed eyes. And then I knew something was different on the bus. Somebody on the other side of the aisle, watching. Excuse me, mister. Have you got a match? I'm clean out. Hmm? Mm. Sure. Just a minute. Here you are. Thanks. No, no, no. Keep them. Oh, fine, fine. Thanks a lot. Say, have you got any idea where we are? I'm not sure. I got on at Flagstaff an hour or so back. Oh, oh, oh. oh boy, I envy her. I wish I could sleep like that. <laughs> Your wife? No. Oh. Oh, say, that's rude. Hmm? Taking your matches and not offering you a cigarette. Oh, that's okay. No, I, I don't want one now, thanks. Say, um... I want to tell you something. Hmm? There's a lady in the seat behind you. I think you've met her before in the park. Right? Mm-hmm. We brought her with us to identify you. But she gave us a pretty good description back in L.A. Good for her. Yeah. This is going to be a nice trip. Nothing like traveling with people you know, is there? Nothing like it. I, uh... I don't suppose you've got any reading material you, uh, could let me look at. How about a mystery? It's a spy story. Pretty good. No, I was thinking of something else. I think you know. Something more scientific? I'm very interested in airplanes. Jet motors. <laughs> Sorry. He looked across at me, smiling, pleasant. And anybody watching, it was nothing more than the casual conversation of two strangers brought together by the night and sympathy of loneliness. Then he leaned back and, reaching inside his jacket, brought out a small automatic, which he kept very carefully hidden from any eyes but mine. Always carry this with me on a trip. You never know. I knew, all right. If they couldn't buy what they wanted, there were other ways. That's what he was telling me. And I saw in the man's smiling face that I'd never reach New York unless I killed them before they killed me. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, the program that follows tonight's story of escape is a special repeat broadcast of CBS Radio's hard-hitting drama, Bomb Target USA. With Arthur Godfrey as narrator and a core of crack CBS radio newsmen reporting from spotter locations and from so-called enemy bombing squadrons approaching our shores, Bomb Target USA reports factually and without fanfare exactly what America can expect today if enemy atomic bombers raided our major cities. Immediately following Escape Tonight on most of these same CBS radio stations, keep tuned for Bomb Target USA. And now, back to Escape. Julie and I had breakfast somewhere in New Mexico. The woman from the park and the man who carried the small automatic sat in a booth while we ate at the counter. I'd thought about things most of the night, and I decided to tell the girl. Not too much, but enough so that she might be able to help. And I knew I'd need some help. Coffee's pretty good here. Yeah. Uh, a cigarette? Mm, no, thanks. Julie? Yes? I want to tell you something. 
Oh. I don't want you to turn around and look. Just pretend we're talking about the weather, coffee, or anything, but listen. Well, sure, Charlie. There's a couple sitting in the booth behind us. They're spies. Hmm? Oh, oh you... I'm not kidding. I can't tell you much, but as you love your life, you'll believe me. You're kidding. Spy? Don't turn around. Smile. Just listen. But I... They're trying to get hold of the plans for a new jet motor. It's faster than anything anybody else has got. You are kidding. No, I'm not. How do you know? How do you know about it? I'm working for the government. FBI? In a way. Now, I need you to help me. Me? They think I've got the blueprints, the plans, and they're going to try and get them from me. But can't we get the police? No. Well, why? Because we're trying to get the head man. And if those two are arrested, we'll have to start all over again. They think I'm working with them. But I got tough about the money they offered, so now they're going to try and get rid of me and get the secret for nothing. Did they follow you from Los Angeles? Yes, they got on during the night in Flagstaff. All right, folks, I, I don't let's see. Go. Well, Just oh, stick oh. with me. I'll explain at the next stop. We can't talk about it on the bus because she's sitting right behind and he's across the aisle. Listen, are you pulling my... No. No, you're not, are you? I'm not. We went on through New Mexico and the Pink Rock and the desert. We talked a lot of nonsense, and after a while I could see she was getting back to the idea that I'd been kidding, especially after the man with the gun introduced himself as Mr. Hutchinson and started to talk about fishing. It was about a half hour before our lunch stop. Now you take some of that Northern California country, talk about trout. Steelhead. I tell you, my you have never seen... My dad used to take us up, uh, my sister and me, oh. take us up to a place in Maine. Oh. Dad always wanted a couple of boys, I guess, but when he saw what he got, he figured it wouldn't spoil his plans anyway. So he took us fishing every summer. <laughs> you should have seen the fishing up there. Yeah. I'd like to, someday. I'd like that. How about you, Mr. Raider? Do you like fishing? No, not much. Did you ever try it? A little, when I was a kid. You ought to take it up again. If you have time. Yes, I might do that. Yeah, if a man had a little money put away, he could do a lot of fishing. Yeah, that's the way to live. Have about $10,000, go all over the country fishing, no work, no worries. How does that sound, Miss Spaulding? Oh, what a life. It'd take more than 10000 No, I don't know. Ten's better than nothing. Ten thousand dollars? Why? You they went on talking, and oh, I did some thinking. He was smarter than I'd thought. Looked like a nice, average guy, and behaved like one. That's one thing I'd learned. The more ordinary you can be, the less you're going to be suspected. And these people had it down to a science. It wasn't going to be easy because I was going to have to convince Julie all over again. I could see that. <laughs> My chance didn't come until that evening after our dinner stop. By that time, the woman in the park who went by the name of Lisa Nyland, Hutchinson, the girl, and myself, all four of us were buddies. We'd pulled up over the Colorado border. There was some kind of trouble up ahead, a slide or a wreck. And the driver told us we'd have a half hour or so before we went on. You want to take a walk for a while? There's a cafe a couple of hundred yards back. I'll give you a call when you're ready to move on. Yeah. Oh, kind of nice to have an extra leg stretch. Uh, how about some coffee? Maybe nice. Charlie? Oh, I don't know. I'd like to have a look at the valley down there. We might walk up the dirt road away, get a pretty good view, sunset and all. <laughs> Romantic, huh? <laughs> sure. Why not? Oh, Charlie. <laughs> okay with you, Lisa? You feel romantic? Want to see a valley in the sunset? That'd be very nice. <laughs> okay, let's go. We walked away from the bus and up a narrow ranch road. About a hundred yards up, there was a curve and around to the stand of trees. When we got there, you couldn't hear the sounds from the highway any longer. It was peaceful and, and it was very pretty. I knew that Hutchinson was delighted about the suggestion. It was going to give him his chance, but he made the mistake of playing it a little too clever. And he kept his game of small talk going a minute too long. 
We'd got to the top of a cliff overlooking the valley when I stumbled on a rock and fell a few steps behind before they had a chance to stop. And when they did, I already had my gun out. Hey, what are you going to do? Target practice? No. Julie, get over here. You two, stay where you are and keep your hands behind your head. Charlie. Charlie, are you sure they, they seem to I be... know what they seem. Now look, I don't want to do this, but it's you or me. You should have made the right deal in the first place. I can't let you go, you know that. We might still make a deal. You had your chance. We've got the 10,000. How about, how about waiting till we get to the next town? We'll have the rest of it telegraphed. I out. make mistakes, but not that kind. If you had told us what you wanted, we might have been able to get the 20,000 for you in Los Angeles. Turn around, both of you. Oh, now, wait a minute. We're all in this together. We all want the same thing. You figure you can get more money from the head man in the East. Okay, okay, give us a chance to get it for you. We're in contact. Turn with... around. He gives us our orders. What difference does it make? Now, look. Look, you shoot us. What do you think they'll do? They won't let you get away with it. They'll kill you. Charlie, you can't just shoot them. Turn them over to the police. You, you can't Be just quiet. shoot them. He can't tell the police, Julie. He's with us. Only he wants money out of it. And he thinks he'll get more from the head man in the east. Turn around. I'm not going to say it again. Charlie, don't. I know you've got a duty, but you can arrest them. Please, you can still... I told you to be quiet. Arrest? Listen, Raider. You're not going to... You're not going to kill us over 10,000. Why, it's murder. Even if you... Miss Nyland dropped without a sound. Hutchinson held his middle for a second and tried to keep his balance. I shot him in the back of the head... I knew he was dead before his body slipped to the ground. The girl just stood next to me, her hands tightly covering her mouth, and, and she was shivering. I took a look across the wide valley. The sky was turning purple. I've never seen anybody killed before. I'm sorry. Couldn't you... Couldn't you have arrested them or something? Couldn't you... Did you have to? I had to. They wouldn't have stopped at killing both of us if they'd had the chance. What are you going to do? What are you going to do now? I've got to get the money. For evidence. What are you going to tell the driver? He'll ask where they are. Charlie? Driver's gonna wonder where they are. Charlie, what are you doing? I've got to put them over the cliff. Oh, no. Oh, no. I've got to. Oh. Oh, no. No, you can't. Charlie, no. <laughs> All right. Come on. We got back to the bus, and neither of us said anything about the two we'd walked off with. I guess nobody had seen us together, and after waiting around for another half hour, the driver gave up. Well, uh, I'll drop their baggage in La Junta. Better notify the police, too. Screw you, all right. Okay, folks. Sorry for the delay. You better go back to your seat, mister. Sure. I was starved when he pulled into the depot at La Junta. I'd already made up my mind to lay over and take a detour on another bus. The girl wasn't going to be able to keep quiet much longer, and I had to get rid of her. We got out of the bus... And the two men were standing alongside, waiting. Just a minute, please. Hmm? We're special agents for the FBI. Search them, Larry. Okay. Yeah. yeah, just a gun and money. Where are the other two? The other two? They're dead. He killed them. Oh. We'll take those plans now, Mr. Raider. And don't do anything silly. There are four men covering you. Okay. 
It's in my shoe. You want me to take it off now? Please. Here. Thank you, Mr. Reader. This isn't worth anything, really, you know. We planted it in the factory in L.A. for someone to steal. What we wanted was to be led to the top man in New York. And when you sent that wire to him back in Arizona, we got him. Oh. We were worried about you, Julie, when you didn't call us from Albuquerque. I didn't get a chance. He was with me all the time. Is she? Is she... Are you playing spy, too, Julie? I'm working for the government, Mr. Rader. She's been following you since you stole the plans. <laughs> well, you fooled me. I bet you fooled Hutchinson and Nylon, too. It won't matter to them, though, will it? <laughs> well, that's the way it goes. Take him away, will you? I had to watch him murder those two. I don't want to hear him laugh about it. Come on, Rader. We've got a car waiting. Sure. So long, Julie. Nice to have met you. Escape has brought you Classified Secret, written and directed by Anthony Ellis, starring Parley Bear. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Peter Leeds, Miriam Crucian, Tim Graham, Leroy Leonard, and Georgia Ellis. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week. You are in a cantina in Mexico, listening to a man speak his hate for you in word and music, while somewhere in jeopardy without your knowledge and beyond your reach is the one you love, who may lose her life, for the man who sits across the table hating you is the only one who can save her. So listen next week when Escape brings you E. Jack Newman's exciting story, El Guitarero. Tomorrow night, the Lux Radio Theater stars Jane Wyman and Dick Hames. The play is just for you, with Jane recreating her original screen role. It's a musical comedy about a widowed Broadway play producer who loves his star and faces complications in the reactions of his son and daughter. Just for you, Lux Radio Theater presents the stellar co-starring combination Jane Wyman and Dick Hames. Tomorrow night, on most of these same CBS radio stations. The same evening, CBS Radio stars Fred McMurray in Suspense's saga of The Great Train Robbery. That's tomorrow night at the Star's Address. This is Roy Rowan speaking. And remember, you have a date with Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, Monday evenings, on the CBS Radio Network. Due to the illness of Wally Mayer, the part of Mike Shane will be played tonight by Edmund McDonald in The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
It's a bright and sunny San Francisco afternoon. The sort of day you want to close up your office, say to heck with work, and go over the hill. Right now, Mike Shane and Phyllis Knight have closed their office and gone over the bay. But they can't say to heck with work. In fact, work is calling them to the Oakland Railroad Terminal. As they enter the depot, Phyllis looks at her wristwatch. Twenty past three. Mike, do you realize that train is five whole hours late? Uh, I ought to. This makes our third trip across the bay to meet it. Yeah, well, watch out for these swinging doors. Yeah. yeah. From Chicago, Des Moines, Denver, Salt Lake City on track two. Oh, it's in all right. Here comes the red cast with the bags. Hey, I'd still like to know why we had to come clear over here to the train to welcome Mr. Frank Hewitt Newton back to his own town. I wouldn't know it a minute, Angel. Fifteen-word telegram can't say much more than meet me at the depot, Pioneer Limited. Plus that little business about a package he's sending you, Air Express. Uh-huh. Something's wrong, and I guess he wants fast action on it. Yeah. Hey, there he is. Where? Where? Right ahead of us. Those two men and that red-headed gal. Yeah. Oh, uh, glad to see you, Mr. Newton. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Newton. Hey, uh, Mr. Newton. Oh, it's me, Mike Shane. But, well, I'll just look right through us. Well, maybe he didn't hear us. Come on, we'll catch him at the taxi stand. Okay. Excuse me. Forty thousand people in our way. Oh, hey, oh no, excuse me, sir. Uh, uh, this way, Phil. Hurry, come on. Yeah. They're outside already, Mike. There, there he is. Get into that sedan with the others. Well, run for it, Mike. Run! Oh, Mr. Newton! Mr. Newton! Mr. Newton! Save your lungs. Save your lungs, Mike. He's gone. Oh, for the love of... You know, he's got a real cute sense of humor, hasn't he? Three trips across the bay to glad-hand a guy, and he gives you the glassy stare. Yeah. Maybe it ain't from humor. Let's head back to the office. I want to do some phoning. <laughs> Hello. This is Mike Shane calling. Mr. Newton in? No, no, he got back a half an hour ago. He wired me to meet him at the Oakland Depot, but something went wrong. Oh, you're Mrs. Newton? Yeah, that's right, Mike Shane, the detective. Well, I don't know, I, I got his telegram from Reno telling me to meet him at the train. Yeah, yeah, it was sent from Reno. Oh, well, if I knew, I'd tell you, Mrs. Newton. Y- you haven't phoned me. Oh, well, well thanks a lot. Goodbye. Oh, so friend husband didn't tell the missus he was arriving home today. Mm, guess not. She thought he was still in Chicago. Awfully curious why he was hiring Mike Shane, the detective. That makes three of us. Mm. Where's that telegram? I want to read it again. Oh, oh here, on the desk. Thanks. Uh-huh. Reno, 11.10 p.m., sending package, Air Express, hold for me, stop. Meet me, Oakland Depot, tomorrow, Pioneer Limited, Frank Hewitt Newton. Yeah. Oh, he must have gotten off the train to send the mysterious package. But why? To make little girls ask big questions. Smarty. So far, the score's double zero. No package, no client. I'll get it. Mike Shane speaking. Mr. Newton. Say, what went wrong? We went over to the depot. We, we saw you hollered at you, chased after you. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, well, all right, but, but it seemed funny. Well, no, it hasn't. Where? Fairfax Hotel. Well, sure, if it comes before we close the office. Uh, room 911. Yeah, okay. But would you not mind telling me what it's all about? Uh, hello? Hello, Mr. Newton. Hello? Hello? Oh, he hung up on me. Well, did he tell you why he gave us the fast oh, run around? Oh, he says he'll explain later. Wants me to bring the express package to him at the Fairfax Hotel when it comes. Well, it sounds to me like he's dodging the sheriff or bill collectors. Well, it sounds pretty worried to me. He's dodging something or... But what? Or who? Uh, you're Mr. Shane? That's right. Something we can do for you? I'm Mrs. Frank Newton. Oh, we talked on the phone. Won't you have a chair, Mrs. Newton? I've come here, Mr. Shane, to find out exactly why my husband hired you. 
I'm afraid you know as much about it as I do, Mrs. Newton. In other words, you won't tell. It's about me. Mr. Shane isn't in the habit of lying, Mrs. Newton. We do not know. We think it has something to do with a package which your husband sent to us. A package? Yes, an air express from Reno. Uh, he phoned a few minutes ago from the Fairfax Hotel. I'm to deliver it to him there. <laughs> That's all I know. Fairfax Hotel? Hm. Well, I'll see about that right now. Well, that lady better watch her blood pressure. Mm. This is a divorce case. I'm getting out of it. Yet somehow it doesn't smell like one. Hey. Hey, Mike. Now, where are you going? Fairfax Hotel. I'm going to find out what this hoopla is all about. I'll see you later. Oh, fine. Fine. Now, all I got to do is sit here and just go crazy. I write letters, which is worse. Oh, dear. Hi there, fellas. Phyllis. If you want to see Mike, Inspector, you missed him by 15 seconds. Huh. You must have gone down the other hole. You mind if I sit down? Just make yourself comfortable. Thanks. You're just in time to see me go nuts. Huh? Batty. Telegrams, trains late, phone calls, people tearing in and out. Oh, there. You see? See what yeah. I tell you? See? Air Express for Mr. Michael Shane. Air... This is it. It's come. Let me see uh, it. Uh, take it easy, lady. I just want you to sign. Yeah, sure, sure. The receipt. I'll sign it. Here. Here. Like that? Uh, thanks. You're welcome, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Phil, what's gotten into you? Where's the package? What's the package? What is it's it all about? It's no bigger than a small book. It doesn't even weigh as much. But this is the dear little darling that's got a skagger. Will you let me have that again? Faraday, we got a telegram. Sending you package air express. Hold for me. He walked right past us at the train. Wants it delivered to the hotel. Wife says it's hers. And Faraday, have you got an aspirin? Oh. Relax me, gal. I'll get it. Mike Shane's office. Huh? Oh, no. Where? Market and Geary. Right away. Faraday, what's the matter? What's wrong? Phil. What? What is it? Mike's been hurt. Bad. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. Regular lubrication for your car is, of course, most important. But proper lubrication is even more so. If your car is carelessly or hurriedly greased, important fittings may be missed or left dry. That is why Union Oil Stop Wear Lubrication means extra insurance against mechanical wear and depreciation. Stop Wear Lubrication jobs are a matter of pride with the Union Oil Minutemen. Only the finest high-quality greases are used. Each fitting is carefully and thoroughly lubricated according to the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. Stop wear lubrication is so accurate and scientific that you receive a written guarantee with each job, which is definite proof of reliable service. Your car will roll smoother, handle easier, stand up better with stop wear lubrication. So, ladies and gentlemen, for guaranteed, reliable lubrication, ask your Union Oil Minuteman for Stop Wear. Stop Wear is an exclusive process, available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations. Phyllis and Inspector Faraday have reached the intersection of Market and Geary Streets, where Mike was reported badly hurt. I'm scared. I'm scared, Faraday. I'm just scared sick. If Mike is hurt so bad that I know that he... what you mean, but where is he? There's no crowd, no ambulance. Well, maybe they've taken him to the hospital. Perhaps. Let's ask that traffic officer over there. He's just got to be all right. He's the best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Officer. Officer. Yes, sir? Did the ambulance take the man who was injured here a few minutes ago? What man? Mike Shane, my boss, the best guy who... He was run over. Not on my corner. Ain't been even a dented fender around here all day. But they said Market and Geary, they said he... They said... Oh. Yeah. A phony call. Somebody wanted you out of your office. Oh, I have been a dope. They wanted that package. We've got to get back, Faraday. Too late now. I've lost it. Mike was to deliver it to the Fairfax Hotel. What'll he do to me? <laughs> I'm curious. Let's pick him up at the hotel and find out. <laughs> Phil, Faraday, 
What are you two doing here? Looking for Mike Shane, Lothario of the hotel lobby. Oh, golly, Mike, it's good to see you alive and whole. <laughs> huh? Mike, the Air Express came, and then we got a phone call saying you were hurt and to come quick, and we ran out, and, and uh, I forgot the package. It's it's stolen. Holy, uh, for the oldest trick in a book. Now what'll I tell Newton? Nothing, just hand him the package. Here it is. Faraday? In your pocket? Yes, yeah, sure. I grabbed it when we tore out. No. You knew it was a fake call, and you let me go on worrying. <laughs> oh. I'd like to know who made that call. It was a woman's voice. Mrs. Newton. She tried to get the package before. Maybe. I talked to Mr. Tooten on the lobby phone here. He said he'd be down in a minute. Did he tell you what this hide-and-seek is all about? No. I think he was holding a conference in his room. One of the men we saw him with him at the depot got out of the elevator. Then you're waiting for Newton now. Yeah, if he ever goes down. Well, let's go up to his room and talk to him. Yeah, I'd like to know what's on the fire myself. I suppose that... Okay, it's from 9-11. Well, come on, Mike. The elevators are this way. Yes, and so is Mrs. Newton. She just stepped out of one. Yeah. Uh-oh, let's not tangle with her again. Amen. Yeah, she's going through that arcade. All right, kids. Let's make an end run for it. <laughs> Here it is, Mike. Number 911. Huh? Yeah. The key is on the outside of the door. I will be so glad when we get rid of this package. It's hexed. Mm. Uh, no answer. Suppose we might stick our heads inside? Go ahead. I've got the authority. Uh, Mr. Newton? Uh, Mr. Newton, it's uh, Mike Shane. Well, he must have gone downstairs. Hey, what's that noise? Come on, let's find out. See anybody? Uh oh. <gasps> on the sofa. Yeah. Mike, is that. Is he. Useless question, don't you think? Pillow over his face. Or oh, what used to be a pillow, it's blown inside out. Stuck the gun into the pillow and used it as a silencer. Is that your man, Newton? Must be. Yeah. Yeah, I can still recognize him. Yeah, but this man's dead and we heard sounds. Here he is. Where? Tied up with bed sheets and gagged. Slugged a couple of times, too. Here, give me a hand, Mike. Hey, you bet. Hey. Hey, I know him. This is one of the guys who came out of the depot with Newton. Yeah, he's not tied very tight. Let's get that gag out of his mouth. Oh, thank heavens. I was choking. Can you stand up? I, I think so. Oof. Dizzy. You hit me so hard. Who are you? Carl Stanton. Frank's business partner. You, uh, were, Mr. Stanton. You mean... And he, he... He did it? Very thoroughly. You know who did it? The, there were two of them. A man and a woman. She called him George. That's it, Mike. The other two who were with Newton at the depot. Yes. Frank wired me to meet him there. They were with him. Had guns and said they'd kill us if we called for help. That explains why Newton gave us the brush off at the station. Well, we didn't dare make a sign. They forced Frank to come to the hotel and get this room. They made him phone a detective. I guess it was you, sir. They bring the necklace here. You mean there, there's jewelry inside his package? A diamond necklace. Cost Frank $42,000. Ooh. And he sent it to me because he knew these two were after it. Oh, confound it. They've cut the phone wires. I have to go downstairs to call headquarters. Just a minute, Faraday. Let's get a description of the two so you can broadcast an alarm. Don't worry, I intend to. Now, look, give us the whole story while you're about it, Mr. Stanton. Well... Frank bought the necklace in Chicago for his wife. These people got on the train there, he said. They became so friendly, got suspicious. He sneaked off the train at Reno and shipped the necklace to Mr. Shane. Well, somehow they must have figured out the trick. Well, they found the Air Express receipt in Frank's wallet. So they made him come to the hotel and then phone the detective. The red-headed girl said she was going downstairs to the drugstore, but she didn't come back, and the other one got awfully excited. He said she was double-crossing him. Well, she made that phony call. She went to our building, watched for the express truck, and then tricked us, huh? Probably. Go on, Mr. Stanton. Well, this fellow lost his head. Said he'd blow our brains out if we didn't give him money. We were to call a messenger here to the room with all our company cash. I tried to sneak the gun away from him, and... Well, that's the last I knew. Uh-huh. He slugged you, tied you up, then killed Newton. He really went haywire. I'll get it. I'll answer it. Is Mrs. Newton in? Well, uh, I... come on in. Well, I, I didn't expect to find so many. Good Lord, Frank! Yeah, murdered. 
A couple of jewel thieves. What did you want? Why, uh, I, uh, I was to meet Mrs. Newton here. What for? I, uh, I'm her attorney, Warren Wilson. We're going to discuss Edna's divorce and property settlement with, uh, with him. Looking out for her interests very carefully, aren't you, Wilson? Somebody has to. The way you're milking the company. That's a lie. If anybody was milking it, it was Frank. $42,000 for a string of diamonds. You mean the company bought the necklace? It did. Frank phoned me from Chicago for the money. I told him it would take all our cash we had in the bank. Just a minute. Mr. Wilson, is this the first time you've been to this room? Certainly. Hmm. We found the key on the outside of the door. Why, anybody could unlock it and come in. Right. What about Mrs. Newton? We saw her come out of the elevator. Yeah, but, Mike, Mr. Stanton didn't mention her. Of course, he was unconscious. Wouldn't know. Phil, you looked up Newton's house phone. You remember the street number? Yeah, yeah. Let's get going. I want to swap one time a necklace for one piece of information. Send a cop up to the room, will you, Mike? I'm going down to headquarters and broadcast a pickup for the Chicago paper. Okay, but don't talk the newspapers yet or you'll be sorry. <laughs> What do you wish to see me about, Mr. Shane? The Air Express package just came, Mrs. Newton. We understand it's for you. May I have it, please? Certainly. Here you are. Thank you. Your, uh, your eyes are red, Mrs. Newton. Is there something wrong? Why, uh, no, I, I'm just upset. I'm getting a divorce. Warren Wilson is your attorney, I believe. Oh, I suppose Frank has set you on his trail. Gentleman seems very interested in protecting your financial interests. I don't believe that concerns you. Excuse me. Uh, by the way, I saw you in the lobby of the Fairfax Hotel a while ago. Did you uh, talk over the divorce with your husband? I... yes. How did he take it? Mr. Shane, if you came here to pry into my private affairs... I came I... here, Mrs. Newton, to tell you that your husband is dead. He's dead? Who did it? I didn't say he was murdered. Oh, oh no. Uh, no, of course not. I, I just assumed from the way you spoke... As a matter of fact, he was shot to death. Yes, they're looking for the killers right now. Two jewel thieves followed Mr. Newton from Chicago. Oh, well, then it was for this. This is my anniversary present. That's a pretty costly one for a man who was going to leave you. Well, if I'd only known. We were in Chicago, and I, I told Frank I wanted some diamonds for our 15th anniversary. And he said no, and... We quarreled, and, and I came home without him. This attorney, Warren Wilson, he wanted you to get a divorce, didn't he? Well, he said it was my only protection, that Frank and Carl Stanton were robbing the company, and Warren was worried about my property. Which, of course, he would be glad to protect uh, if he married you. Oh, never. I told him so. I respect him as an attorney, but as a man, a husband, no. He's probably heard that women change their minds. That would pay off even as executor of your husband's estate. You mean Warren might have... Oh, no, he couldn't be smart enough to use a pillow. Mike. No, I guess he wouldn't, Mrs. Newton. In fact, it's pretty ingenious for a woman. Uh, I didn't do it. I, I swear I didn't. I, I, I opened the door and Frank was on the couch and I just turned and ran. and I, I didn't know what to do. I, I was afraid to tell anybody... What would the police say? Oh, that's easy to find out, Mrs. Newton. Put on your hat and coat and we'll go down to headquarters. Case 26, 28, height 5 feet 3. Wait, 105, red hair. Bottlefield, turn it up, will you? Repeating, pick up man and woman, George Highland, alias Slip Doyle, age 36, height 5 feet 9, weight 155, blonde hair, woman Gwen Evans, alias Clara Bloomberg, age 26, 28, height 5 feet 3, weight 105, red hair. Warning, they are killers. They are killers. Wow. Well. Faraday got a real description of the two. Stanton must have identified them from police uh, photographs. Well, then what's the sense of dragging me in? They're the ones. They, they killed Frank. Now, did they, Mrs. Newton? I wouldn't be, no. Mike, that coupe behind us. Yeah? I saw it park across the street when we rang Mrs. Newton's doorbell. You sure of it? I'm positive. Okay, I'll turn up this corner and see what happens. Yeah, it's still behind us, Mike. 
It went so dark, I could see who's driving. Wait a minute, the street lamp. That... Yeah. yeah. I caught it in the rear vision. His pal, Georgie, alias Slip Joy. Oh, the killer! He's alone. He's alone in the car. Oh, oh, he's after my necklace. He's after me. He's after all three of us. Mike, head for a police station. Save our necks and lose. Uh-uh. We're heading for the office of Shane Detective Agents. Mike, you're plain crazy. Maybe. We'll decide that after the trap is set. Oh, fine. If we're still alive to decide anything. <laughs> We'll return to Mike and Phyllis in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire weight of your automobile rides directly on the wheel bearings. Now, wheel bearings are round, must revolve rapidly, and yet support the heavy weight of the car. Because of this concentrated pressure, and because they are also liable to damage from brake dust, grit, and water, the front wheel bearings need the best possible lubrication. Failure to keep these bearings properly lubricated may result in expensive repairs requiring parts now hard to get. Your neighborhood Union Oil Minuteman knows this. That's why he takes such pains to do a thorough job of lubricating the front wheel bearings. First, he washes out all the old grease and dirt with solvents. Then the bearings and races are individually cleaned until they are dry and shiny. Finally, the clean, polished bearings are replaced in the races and greased with special equipment to make certain that every surface is snugly sealed in a thick coating of Union Oil wheel bearing grease. Then your front wheels are all set for months of well-lubricated, easy rolling. The cost for the entire service of your front wheel bearing assembly is nominal. So for safer, easier driving, just stop in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76 and take advantage of Union Oil's front wheel bearing service. Thank you. Mike thinks he has a plan to capture the murderer who is trailing him. With Phyllis and Mrs. Newton, he is just entering his office. Turn on the lights, Phil. Yeah. Mike, this room, it's been ransacked. Sure. So Doyle's red-headed girlfriend, that fake phone call you got, remember? Well, he'll be here any second, Mr. Shane, by the next elevator. Phil, you get into your office. Do exactly as I told you. Okay, all right, but this better work good. And lock your door from the other side. Oh, Mr. Shane, the man's desperate. He'll kill us, I know. I don't think so. If he sees I'm a mom, I'm not. So is my husband. Good evening. Do you always enter with your hat on and a gun on your hand? I saw three of you get out of the car. Where's the girl? Phil? Oh, uh, she went down the hall. To the, uh, she went down the hall. Maybe. Or maybe she's in the next room. Locked. You. Oh, uh, why? Hand over the necklace. Well, I haven't got it. Really, I haven't. Uh, uh, Mr. Shane, he... Oh, he's got it. All right, Shane. <laughs> Sorry. I'm fresh out of diamonds, too. Wasting your time, pal. No diamonds in that desk. Your red-headed valentine gave this place the frisk hours ago. Oh, the dirty little double-crosser. You've got the necklace here somewhere. I saw you go into that house with the package and come out again with it. Grandma, what big eyes you got. I'll give you ten seconds. I'd hate to spoil your nice carpet with a lot of blood. Oh, don't. Oh. Well, I can have the carpet clean. And uh, I'll have to unless you hand me your gun right now. What are you giving me? you got a good pair of eyes, chum, but you don't raise them high enough. Next time you test a locked door, look up at the transom. Huh? Well, it's open. And a gun's sticking right through at it. And it's aimed right at your heart, mister. <laughs> Bad news for your kids. I just talked with ballistics. What do they say? Slip Doyle's gun hasn't been fired for some time. What did I tell you? I didn't do it. Well, maybe he used the girl's gun. We'll have to wait on that. They just picked her up over in Oakland. He might have used another gun. We know he threatened to kill Newton. Well, I, I was just bluffing. He and that other guy knew it. He said I'd be scared of the noise. 
I told him there wouldn't be any. I'd stuff a pillow in his face and shove the gun into it, but I didn't kill him. No, you just got bored with the whole thing. You walked out leaving two guys to turn in the alarm. Oh, I locked them in. That's the catch. The key was on the outside of the door. Anybody could walk in and do the job. Okay, then I'd pick Newton's wife. She's in the next room with Stanton and that attorney, isn't she? Yeah, let's have a talk with him. And you're coming too, Slip. Well, all cleared up. Can we go now? Not yet. We're not dead sure this is the killer. What? But you all said he was. You might have that honor, Mrs. Newton. You tried to cover up the fact that you were in that hotel room. But I explained that. Maybe. But you sure had blood in your eye when you left our office this afternoon. Preposterous. It's this jewel thief, undoubtedly. Well, perhaps an attorney who tried to get Mrs. Newton away from her husband. I was protecting her from Frank and Carl. They were stripping the business. How very noble of you, Mr. Wilson. However, I agree, it must have been this thief. Oh, you're all trying to frame him. Now, wait a minute. Nobody's trying to frame you. You said you threatened to kill Newton. Now he's dead. You said you were going to fire your gun through that pillar. That's how we found it, the exact way. Say that again, Faraday. Huh? Never mind. Have we been slow? Remember when you and Phil found me in the lobby? I said I saw the Chicago guy going out of the lobby? Yeah, sure. That was before I talked to Frank Newton on the desk phone. Well, then... Then Newton was still alive when Slip Doyle left the hotel. I told you so. Slip Doyle made the threats. He told exactly how he'd kill Newton, but he didn't follow through. There was one other person, the only other one in the room, to hear the threat and to carry it out in detail. Carl Stanton. Right. Like a cinch. The jewel thief was a perfect fall guy. No, no, you're wrong. I told you Carl was stealing from the company. With Newton out of the way, he could lay all the blame on his partner. So the two crooks had a falling out. That's why Stanton was tied up so sloppy, he did it himself. Okay, I'll send a man to the hotel to find his gun. That'll cinch you. It's cinched right now. We've got the motive, we've got Doyle's testimony, we've got our own. You'll never convict me. I'll kill myself. I don't you? think you will, Mr. Stanton. They tell me the suicide rate in the county jail is very low. <laughs> You don't have to see me to my door, Mike. I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. Please, Angel, allow me one little touch of Irish gallantry. Oh, <laughs> all right. Here we are. Now, if I can just find my keys. Phil. Hmm? Faraday told me how busted up you were when you thought I was injured. The best boss, the best guy who ever lived. Oh, well, uh, Faraday is an old gossip. You know better than to believe his stories. Oh, jeepers, these keys are here somewhere. If, if I had been injured, dear, what would you have done? Oh, I, I'd come down to the hospital and kiss you, make you well. You would, huh? Kiss me, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, here, here are my keys. Well, um, good night, Mike. Oh! What? What's the matter? What's wrong? Oh, I'm hurt. I just bit my lip. Mm. <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Ed McDonald substituted for Wally Mayer, whose appearance was prevented by illness. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Gallon Cabs present Pat Novak for Hire. Cinderella lost a shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in, in Gallon Camp Shoe Raid. Four miles to a Gallon Camp. Yes, Gallon Camps, the family shoe stores with the yellow fronts, the largest shoe chain in the West with stores from Canada to Mexico to serve the West. 
G-A-L-L-E-N-K-A-M-P-S, Gallon Camps present Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for Hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for Hire. Down on the waterfront in San Francisco, you don't get prizes for being subtle. If you want to make a living down here, you got to get your hand in the till any way you can. You rob Peter to pay Paul, and then you put it on the cuff. It's a happy life if you don't mind looking up at a headstone, because sooner or later you draw trouble a size too big. I found that out Tuesday night. It was about 11 o'clock when I came out of the office and I started down the waterfront. It was raining and the street was as deserted as a warm bottle of beer. As I got near the corner, an old man stepped out of the darkness and started across the street. It was a short trip because the car started up down the street and the old man couldn't have made it with a pocket full of aces. <laughs> I started over to him. The car slowed down for a moment and then turned the corner and disappeared. As it passed under the street light, I caught a glimpse of the license plate in a dull, surprised way, the way you'd grab a feather out of an angel's wing. I bent over the old man and I rolled him on his back. He was breathing hard as I cushioned his head. Please help me. Can you please help me? Well, that's a big order, mister. Uh, I must talk to you. Well, if you got any good quotes, you better get them off your chest fast. My pocket. Inside my pocket. You please put your hand... In here? Yeah. Sure. Two envelopes. What about them? One is money for you. You have the other one. So far. The other one, please keep sealed. And you will give it to... John St. John. John St. John? Yeah. Well, where does he live? You don't understand. It's not... I want to tell you. You don't understand. Well, he was right on that one. I didn't understand a thing except he slipped out of my arms and stopped paying taxes. I dragged him over to the side and I went through his stuff. There was nothing there, no identification, just a card with an address on the other side of town. I opened the envelope and $300 tumbled into my breast pocket. The other one was sealed. There was no name on it, but up in the corner there was some kind of marking. It looked like two crosses spliced together. There wasn't anything I could do for him except pray, and I owe some back dues. So I went over to my office and called police headquarters. I told him where the old man was, and then I checked in the phone book. There was no John St. John listed. Well, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan, a good guy... But to him, a hangover is the price of being sober. I finally found him singing in a Mason Street bar. Dinky, dinky, dobby, sure, dinky, dinky, day. Jocko, the fine Jocko, I want to talk to you. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time for the counterpoint. I'm singing a song, a little sentimental thing from my childhood. It'll keep. I got a problem, Jocko. You'll always have a problem, Patsy, because you can't keep out of trouble. You know that, don't you? You have no self-control. Yeah, all right, Jocko. You have no more self-control than a bucket of mercury dumped in a marble staircase. All right, Jocko. Check the bright talk. I just saw a guy get killed. You're like some violent disorder in nature, some large but unprofitable storm. You keep whirling in circles, Patsy. And if you ever go more than ten feet in one direction, it's because some woman is nine feet away. Then yeah. it begins all over again. Are you all through? Yes. Get to the point. That's another of your troubles. You never get to the point. Some old guy was killed down on the Embarcadero. He checked out fifty feet away from me. Who killed him? I don't know. And why do you care? Professional jealousy? Some car came out of nowhere and clipped him. You sure it wasn't an accident? Yeah, just like the fall of France. Will you stop kneeling me, Jocko? I told you the guy got killed. He was murdered right in front of me. I gotta find a guy called John St. John. How St. John? John St. John. I don't feel like vaudeville tonight, Jocko. The old man gave me $300 to deliver a letter. I made him a promise. Well, you can break it now with only the slightest risk. I got the license number of the car. I want you to hop down and look it up. Then check at headquarters to see if the guy's got a record. I don't like policemen. They depress me. Check it. 
I got to go out here to this address. Here. Uh-huh. Well, what kind of neighborhood is it? Well, it's not exactly a neighborhood. It's more like an architectural afterthought, a lingering defense against the early California bear. All right, all right, no speeches. Just check on that license plate. Now, if I'm not at my place, try this address here. Yes, that's always very interesting at this time of night. Uh, goodbye, lover. Well, Jocko was right about the neighborhood. When I left him, I doubled by my place and I left the envelope. I put it in another envelope and stashed it behind some books. Then I headed out to look up John St. John. It must have been about midnight when I got there, and it was the kind of a neighborhood where a for-rent sign reads like a ransom note. I found the place, though. It was an old rooming house, a third-floor apartment. I knocked at the door, and when she opened it, I knew it was time to wire home for money. If they pick a Miss Blowtorch of 1946, she'll be right up there in the running. A tall, blonde blister with lots of Fahrenheit. She stood there leaning against the door, smiling and looking at you as if you had gold-plated muscles. Gave you a weak feeling where your dinner ought to be. And her voice came right out of the oven. Well, you're out kind of late. Yeah. I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. Oh? Won't you come into my cobweb? Sure. For a spider, you're nice and chubby. Well... A Spider-Man. My name's Lee Norton. You want to write it down? Hmm. I'm Pat Novak, and I'm looking for a guy named John St. John. You seem to be running a temperature on the subject. I don't know a John St. John. Well, I found a dead man lugging around your address. Why? I don't know. Perhaps he admired me from afar. Like a sunset or something. No, he stopped admiring sunsets about 20 years ago. I see. What are you, the avenging angel? He gave me a sealed envelope. And you were supposed to give it to a man named John St. John. That's huh? right. He gave me 300 bucks to ease the pain. Yeah, I figured that. You don't look like the charitable type. He was a nice old guy, so I'm going to find his boy. Perhaps I could help you. You got a clear, fast track. Let's see you go. I told you I don't know John St. John, but I'll do this much. Yeah, I know. You're going to be big-hearted and offer to take that letter just in case you ever meet someone named John St. John. Huh? How did you pay the rent this month? Keep the kettle on. I'll only be a moment. Hello, Lee. If we're early, just give us a magazine. No. Come on in. Well, just enough for bridge. You're right. You're only gone a moment. Who are your friends? Don't suck. Did they lock the manhole before they left home? His name's Novak. Yeah, that's a pretty name. Don't rhyme with anything, but it's pretty, huh, Joe? Yeah, it's all right. Let's have the letter, Novak. You got hold of a bad rumor, fella. Ah, the one I got's good. Let's have it. I don't want to strain your mind, Junior, but try to understand. I don't have a letter. Ask him again. Go on home, mister. You're not going to get anything out of me except a small tip. Now, if you're a good boy, I'll give you a nickel for your friend, too. All right, Joe. <laughs> now, hold him up. Yeah, just a minute. He's got a head of hair. Hold him up. <clears throat> All right. All right, Mike. That's enough. Oh. Well, that's enough. All right, baby. Don't look so sorry. You can't have everything. <laughs> We'll be back to Pat Novak in just a moment. Have you ever worn uncomfortable shoes? Perhaps the size was wrong or the shoe was the wrong shape for your foot. But no matter why, there's nothing more uncomfortable than shoes that don't fit. The more you're on your feet, the more you know it. Gallon Camp specialize in properly fitting shoes for the whole family, right from the toddler's first important step. And Gallon Camp's good shoes are built to give support to active feet. Listen to an authority on shoes. He's Mr. John F. Stahl, 64 years young, a retired postman with a hobby. <laughs> you guessed it, he likes to walk. He says, I've been on my feet most of my life. Since 1935, when I retired as a letter carrier, I walked 10,000 miles. I just walked to San Francisco from Trinity Center, California. That was 410 miles. Walking is fun, but take it from me, you must have good shoes. That's why I stick to gallon camps. Gallon camps are good shoes. And there you have it from a man who knows. Gallon camps are good shoes. That's why gallon camps are the West's favorite shoes, and gallon camps' tremendous volume makes possible gallon camps' reasonable prices. For style, for quality, for reasonable price, for good shoes for the entire family, visit the stores with the yellow fronts. Mr. Stahl walked 410 miles to shop at gallon camps, but there's a store in your neighborhood. 
And now back to Pat Novak for Hire. You know, it's easy to sleep if you got the right friends. When those two gunups were through, I hit the floor and made Rip Van Winkle look like an insomnia victim. I didn't like the floor, but it was in better shape than my face. I don't know how long I was there, but it must have been a couple of hours. I rolled over once and tried to get up, but it was like trying to barbecue a cake of ice. There was a sick, sweet smell in the room. I tried to place it, but my nose was out on strike, so I went to sleep again. Next thing I knew, it sounded like New Year's Eve. Here you go, Patsy. Up on the couch. (coughs) What's the matter? Nothing. If you're a kitchen stove, the room's full of gas. Oh, some of my playmates, I guess. Well, you weren't at the apartment, so I tried here. Yeah? What time is it? Two o'clock. Who got the quaint idea of the gas chamber? A girlfriend. It was love at first sight. Did she get the letter? I left it home. You're getting smart. Yeah, three hundred dollars worth. They lifted my dough. Well, you couldn't use it where you were going. I, uh, checked on that hit-and-run card. It's listed under the name of Sidney Bronson. Has he got a record? No. Well, everybody's a beginner. Well, let's go home. It'll be dull, but you'll get used to it. Wait till I wash my hands. Sure. Patsy. Yeah? What did your girlfriend look like? Was she the lively type? Yeah. Why? What's the matter? Because she's not anymore. Yeah. Those gunsels play rough. She's kind of pretty. What did she do besides send out vibrations? I don't know. But she knew all about John St. John. Yeah? She picked up a bait like a hungry bass. Also, look at that ring. How did you get around to that? The insignia on it. It's the same one that's on the envelope. Spliced crosses. Let's go home, Patsy. The police will be here. Yeah. Even Hellman will know she's dead. Come on, we bet. On your way out the door, Jocko, try it sideways because I think it's blocked. Hello, Novak. You look pale. It's my color scheme. What do you care, Hellman? None. She looks peaceful. Yeah. Be quiet or you'll wake her up. Oh, tiptoe. She'll always cut her throat before she goes to sleep. Who is she, Novak? I don't know. It's awful cozy here for a bunch of perfect strangers. I don't know every dead girl in town, Hellman. You'll have to check. You can still write, can't you, Novak? Huh? That's all you'll need down at headquarters. Come on. Get out of the haze, Hellman. You don't know who's dead yet, but you're going to book somebody. Yeah. What are you doing up here, praising the joint? I came up to find a guy named John St. John. She doesn't look like a guy named John St. John. She was my lead. I came up here to smell out a rat. She had a half Nelson on me when two gunsels walked in. They came up to fix the gas meter, I think. You stay out of this. I'll make every effort. Now, if you're smart, you'll fingerprint this place, Hellman. Those boys were cute. They've been in somebody's jail. I'll handle my job. You stick to murder. It'll go a long way to pin this on me, Hellman. I can go a long way, Novak. Not with what you've got to drag. We get a call in the middle of the night, come up here and find you standing over that dead girl. That's right. And you want me to sprinkle powder all over. Back up and take a better look, Novak. The view's fine, Hellman. And if you'll take a good look, you'll know why. You haven't got anything to give the DA except a slim lead and a fat hand. You're going to need help. Not on this one. You need help to find the street. Come on back to center, Hellman. Even with both hands, you couldn't... Yeah. Oh, forget it. So take the medicine like a good boy. I'm not going to walk out and let the two of you tour the town. I'm going to book one or both of you on a murder charge. All right. Book Jocko here, then. I love you in a generous mood. You got a string, then, Hellman. Somebody's got to find John St. John. Uh, who's going to find Jocko? Stop worrying. I'll bail you out. You haven't got the right size heart, Novak. You'll let him die on the vine. Helen, sometimes you're guilty of unexpected wisdom. I know it's reflex action, but it's consoling anyway. I want you, Novak. I want you bad. I'll take this guy as a down payment, but I'm going to close out with you. Remember that. I will. All right. Come on, mister. Wait a minute. Patsy, you're not going to let him lug me off like this? What else can I do? The guy likes you. Now, it was a bum curve to throw Jocko, but somebody had to dig us out of a hole, and Jocko wasn't the boy. You can't shovel dirt with a bar rag. I had no idea where to start. There were two murders, and they were both tied up with John St. John. He didn't look like a good guy to know. There was that insignia, too. The one on the letter, and the girl's ring. Oh, sure, it could be coincidence, but... That's what they said about Bluebeard. The only thing I could do was open that letter. So I went back to the apartment. I didn't have to turn on the light. 
They were running in pairs tonight. She was sitting there on the couch, proud of a pair of long silk legs and smiling like a guy who knows he's got a million bucks in the bank. She was blonde, too. A little more lemon juice, maybe, but blonde anyway. She was nice and comfortable, and I got the idea she'd just signed a lease. Good evening. How do you do? Not very well so far. A sly remark, Mr. Novak? No, I'm just bringing you up to date. Your girlfriend's dead. Yes? Yeah. I just want to let you know the gas jet's out in the kitchen. Oh, don't shout. I'd like you better if you could. I don't need your vote. Who's John St. John? I don't know John St. John. Is he worth breaking your heart over? There's a good guy down on the clink sweating out a murder rap for me, so I want John St. John. Mm, you've got nice friends. Who's Sidney Bronson? How does that fit into the picture? This started with a waterfront corpse. The leftovers belonged to an old guy that was hit by a car. The car's registered in the name of Sidney Bronson. Mr. Novak, you seem so intense. It's a pity to waste it on random speculation. I told you. I got a friend in the jug. Mm, loyalty's a nice trait. One of your nicest. Yeah. You're a pretty thing, Patsy. Well, don't get fooled by the rapper. I'll take a chair. Anybody ever brief you on trouble? You're hard to see that far away. Come on over and focus, Patsy. Yeah. You're pretty, Patsy. You look like you want a bill of sale. I'm the gentle kind, Novak. I'd just like to break your ribs. Go ahead. I can get a brace. Come here. Mr. Novak. I'll bet you do a swell rumba. Yeah? What's on your mind? What you're going to say when you find out about this gun. Huh? That's right, sweetheart. My finger isn't hollow. Back up and take a look at the gun. Hmm. Well, you got to that purse, huh? That's right. Well, you've ruined my confidence. Now, I'll give you a testimonial. In the meantime, I want the letter. You go after everything the same way. I want the letter. Well, it's in the desk. Come on. Right here in the top drawer. <coughs> oh, let go. Stay away from me. I'm already here, lady. Come on, all right. Drop the gun, sis. Drop it. Well, you can let go of my arms now. Well, that's your version. Let, let go of me. Let go of me. I... Oh. Oh. What was that for? A little something on the house, and I'll beat it. Well, you've ruined my confidence. You're lucky. Go on home. You won't change your mind about that letter? No. Suit yourself. I'll be going. Oh, Patsy. Yeah? I can't help you on John St. John, but I wouldn't worry about that fellow, Sidney Bronson. Huh? Why? Because I'm Sidney Bronson. See you soon. <laughs> Dad began to look like a big, fat, well-fed double cross. I had to find out what was in that letter, so I made tracks for the bookcase. All I could do was browse because the letter was gone. Well, things didn't look rosy for me or Jocko. I was about to buy a file and bake a cake when the phone rang. Hello, Novak. Oh, Hellman. The coroner got a report on that dead girl. She died at 12.30. Well, that's pretty close. What's he got, a stopwatch? Fifteen minutes either way. Those fingerprints panned out, too. Yeah? A couple of L.A. strong-arm men. Well, that's new for L.A. You got a call out? We already picked them up. Your favorite's named Welcome Dangliers. Well, I could make a joke. I already got one. They're set up with a perfect alibi for 12.30. Well, that means I killed the girl. Nobody's arguing. I got some more news. Yeah? I'm out at the Seal Rocks. Well, you got the figure for it. We just found an envelope floating around the water. It's one of yours. You better come on out. You found an envelope, so what? So the envelope turns out to be in some guy's pocket. Come on out. Well, that only meant one thing. Whoever took the envelope out of my place got popular. It was getting late, so I grabbed a cab and rode out to the beach. When I got there, Hellman was standing down in the water. He had Jocko with him. The surf was rolling in, and Jocko wasn't much better. Patsy. Hello, Jocko. How's jail? Dry. Thanks for coming, Novak. You're sweet. Where's the envelope? Here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the same one. That makes you look good. There was a letter in here. Did you take that with the guy's money, Hellman? You got all there is. Hmm. 
This guy on the beach is the third one. It's my opinion the case will solve itself. We're running out of people. Who is the guy? His name's Walter Avery. Here's his stuff. Yeah, what's left? Well, the spliced cross really gets around. Eh? Keeps bobbing up. Here it is on this guy's fountain pen. I'm going to run this guy through the morgue, and then I'm going to look you up, Novak. Yeah? Sure. We want you done with us. That's right. I'll introduce you to all the best people. Good night, lover. It was close to five, so I tagged by my place for some sleep. I tossed around like a fish on the living room rug. Hellman called about nine to throw more dust in my eyes. He said one of the airlines had a passenger to Portland named Walter Avery. Just to make it tough, the guy made the 12 o'clock plane and got off at Portland. I had left field all to myself. I got dressed and I looked up Sidney Bronson's number. There was no answer, so I went over. The place was locked and I looked up the janitor. He wasn't going to let me in, but it turned out that his wife had a birthday coming up. Well, I found something in the apartment. It was a card and it said, Bellcrest Sanitarium. And down in the corner there was a guy's name. Dr. Emil Schoenig, psychiatrist. Vienna, without the walls. The Bellcrest Sanitarium was down on the peninsula, so I borrowed a car and headed down that way. Everything was fine until I got in the front door. They didn't even let me register. <coughs> I woke up on a couch in Schoenig's office It was dark outside and my left arm was throbbing like a love story in a woman's magazine The radiator sitting beside me was Sidney You're a deep sleeper I think I got some help What happened to my arm? Hypodermic You only need one arm anyway In your case, I need a spare who did it? Dr. Schoenig. Oh, he's a darling boy. Where is he? Out on the phone trying to figure out what to do with you. What's that make me, a patient? Mm, that's one way of putting it. You made things easy. We were coming to you for the letter. Do hmm? you want to try that over again? We were on our way when you stumbled in. You're wrong, Sid. Somebody's given you a fast pitch. That letter was gone when you were up at my place. I don't want a bum rib, Patsy. I want that letter. You're trailing the field, Angel. I told you, the letter's gone. A guy by the name of Walter Avery took it out of my place. Walter Avery? That's right, and somebody thanked him. They found him this morning, making like a dead seal. Walter Avery left for Portland last night. A plant, sweetheart. You better read up on your friends. Yeah. Thanks, Betsy. I told you to watch him, Sid. You had more shots. What's the difference? Oh, none, I suppose. Uh, why don't you mix us a drink while I talk to Mr. Novak? I'll be right with you. Well, Mr. Novak, you're one of my best patients. Well, that's because I like your needles. You better go easy on that drink. Yes? Why? Well, you'll get drunk and run somebody down the way you did that guy on the waterfront. Oh? A good guess. You should be proud. That's a good, sensible, final emotion. Here's your drink, Emma. Thank you, my dear. As to you, Mr. Novak. Sorry, there's no drink for you, Mr. Novak. You probably will be. Huh? Forget it. Emil, I talked to Mr. Novak before you came in. He thinks you're a heel. He does. And so do I. I can stand it. He told me about Walter Avery. I'm sorry about that. Walter got that letter. You killed him and took it. I was supposed to blunder around until you got rid of me, too. That's a bum joke, Emil. You're getting hysterical. With laughter, Emil. You put one of your boys on the plane. Only Novak aired the wash too fast. Suppose I did. Somebody ought to bring you up to date, Sidney. You've been hanging on too long. The free ride's over. I might as well tell you now you're all through. I carried the whole bunch along and... <coughs> and I'm all through. Steady, Emma. What's the matter with me? <coughs> What's the matter with me, Sid? Give him a hand, Novak. He just had a bad drink. You wouldn't do that, Sid. I'm full of surprises. You got a stomach full of poison. You got a stomach full of poison in 15 seconds, Emma. <coughs> Put down that gun, Emil. I want you to, Sid. Please, Emil, put down the gun. I'm a selfish fellow. <coughs> this happens kind of fast for you, fellow. Lots of noise, huh, Patty? Yeah. I'll get you a pillow. I'd rather have your lap. Uh, you get mercy, not love, baby. Yeah. Thanks for small favors. How do I look? Not so good. That was the three and two pitch. Yeah, I had it coming up. I'll tell you about John St. John. I know. There was no such guy. That's right. It was the name of the group. Those spliced crosses? Yes. You found out a little late, but 
It's always that way. That's the way I found out about you. Yeah? I had a funny little hunch about you and me. I found out a little late. But I know now, Patsy. Does that help? Well, John St. John was the name of an organization buying and selling government information. That old man tried to tell me, but he checked out too fast. I began to figure something like that when those spliced crosses started showing up. Shoney killed the old man in Sidney's car. He couldn't stop because I was around. The two girls and Walter Avery were both in on the deal. Shoney knew who I was when he saw me go into my office. He trailed me to my place and left Avery there to look for the letter. He killed that girl up in the rooming house, and then he found out she didn't have the letter. When Avery showed up, he took it away from him, threw him to the fish. He was trying to shake Sidney by sending her up to my place after he had the letter. The scheme went haywire when I showed up at the sanitarium. He was trying to work himself out of that one when the payoff came. John St. John? Well, right from the start, Jocko said he was either dead or in the state pen because anybody with a name like John St. John would have killed his parents as soon as he got old enough to find out about it. We'll return in a moment to find out what bothered Inspector Hellman. But now it's Cinderella time. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in gallon camp she'll rate. A pretty face, a graceful figure, lovely shoes. That's a combination that no man can resist. What a delightful feeling to know that from the top of your head to the tip of your toes... You are the picture of glamorous perfection. Here's what Marilyn Buford, Miss America 1946, says. Probably the most fun of being chosen Miss America is modeling the gorgeous clothes. What girl wouldn't be thrilled to select costume after costume from a collection of America's leading designers? And after seeing the importance they attach to the right shoes for every costume, I'm glad I learned about gallon caps years ago. Yes, Marilyn, there's magic in a pair of shoes, as every woman knows. And having the right shoes is no longer a luxury thanks to Gallon Camps, the home of lovely shoes at shh, reasonable prices. And that's why Miss America's favorite store is the favorite store of America's misses. Cinderella lost his shoe and so she got a maid. The modern miss has learned from this in Gallon Camps she And now back to Pat Novak. Oh, it worked out all right. They found the letter out at Shoney's place, and there were some plans for jet planes and a few other trifles. Hellman asked only one question. How come Shoney didn't kill me before I could talk to the girl? <laughs> it's always that way with a guy who commits murder. Either he goes too far or he doesn't go far enough. Be sure to join us next Sunday evening and every Sunday, same time, same station, for radio's newest show, Pat Novak for Hire. And don't forget the store with the yellow front is the Gallon Camp Shoe Store. Gallon Camp Shoes are good shoes. There's something about them you'll like. Franklin Evans speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. With us in Hollywood tonight as star is Mr. Otto Kruger, whose career on the screen and on the stage has afforded him a precisely equal number of appearances as a character on the right and on the wrong side of the law. Whether the man Mr. Kruger portrays tonight is devil or saint, we shall leave for you to judge when the play is over. It is called After Dinner Story. The author is Cornell Woolrich, the radio adapter Robert L. Richards. And so, with the performance of Otto Kruger as Mr. Hardecker, who told this extraordinary after-dinner story, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! Mr. 
Hardacre's residence. I, I believe I'm expected for dinner, please. Your name, sir? Uh, Ken Shaw is my name. Very good, sir. Mr. Hardacre? Mr. Kenshaw, sir. Ah, number one. Good evening, Mr. Kenshaw. Is this where Mr. Hardecker lives? My name is Lambert. Mr. Hardecker? Mr. Lambert. Number two. Uh, my name is Prendergast. I think I... Uh, Mr. Hardecker? Mr. Prendergast. Number three. Mackenzie's the name. Mr. Hardecker? Mr. Mackenzie. Number four. One, two, three, four. So you're all here, gentlemen? Yes. yes. Then suppose we go into dinner, and after dinner I shall tell you why you are here, what I have in mind. In fact, I shall tell you in the form of a story, a sort of after-dinner story. Well, gentlemen, did you enjoy your dinner? Yeah, it was oh, swell. Yeah. Now then, uh, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I have certain instructions to give the servants, and after that, I shall rejoin you. I well, shan't well, be long. Uh, certainly. Well, what did that crack mean? Certain instructions to the servants. How should I know? I, I don't like the looks of the whole thing. Why all the mystery? Well, I suggest that you have patience, Mr. Prendergast. Mr. Hardecker clearly intends to tell us in his own good time. Yeah. And, and another thing. I don't eat in those fancy Park Avenue joints as a room myself, but I've seen them in the movies. They always pass the food around to everybody. They don't just don't bring it out of the kitchen already on your plate and just hand it to you. Well, what possible difference can that make? Well, I don't know, but I know it ain't right. Oh, None of it's right. Why does a man invite four perfect strangers to dinner? What is this thing he, he has in mind for us he keeps talking about? Well, all I know, he says he'll make it worth our while, and I can use a little of that worth your while stuff the way business has been lately. Obviously, the connection between us is that we were all in that elevator a year ago. Oh, what of it? There's no mystery about that. The police cleared that up the very next day. Maybe Mr. Hardecker doesn't think so. The Sorry to have kept you, gentlemen. Now, suppose we get down to business. Uh, Mr. Hardiker, none of us wish to seem rude, but we were just wondering what this business is all about. You have had, uh, you had come to the obvious conclusion, of course, that it has to do with my son. Well, yeah. I don't see why we're, uh, we're all sorry, naturally, but that's all over and done with. Yes, and uh, almost. But there are one or two little details that I thought you gentlemen might help me to clarify. Oh, sure. Oh, oh well. well. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Well, then, if you don't mind, I know you must remember most of it, but it's almost a year ago. I'd like to go over the whole story from the beginning. Well, that's all right. Well, all right. it was just about, just before five in the afternoon on August 30th of last year when the matter which concerns us here this evening had its beginning. And on that day, and at that time, all four of you perfect strangers who had never seen each other before in your lives, found yourselves, for personal and business reasons of your own, on various floors of the Norfolk building in midtown Manhattan, waiting for the express elevator to take you to the lobby. The first passengers were on the 21st floor. 21, going down, please. Express car, going down. There are now three men in the elevator. The operator... Mr. Kenshaw and Mr. Lambert, who had gotten on at the 21st floor. 18. Going down, please. Face the doors, please. Going down. Now there are five men in the car. Mr. Prendergast and Mr. McKenzie had entered the elevator at the 18th floor. 15. Express car to the lobby. Going down, please. Say hello to Eleanor for me. You bet. Bye, Dad. Bye. Six men in the elevator. The last to enter, I had accompanied to the elevator door myself. He was my son. <laughs> These things drop pretty fast. Too fast for me. Hey, this baby is moving. <laughs> Look! 
We can't stop it. We're out of Look control. Out. Stop it. Look out. We're going to hit. Anybody, uh, anybody got a match? I think my leg's broken. Get me out of here. I got a wife and kids. Somebody get me out of here. Get me Shut out of here. Shut up a minute, can't you? You're not the only one with a wife and kids. Has anybody got a match? I've got to get this door open. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have it. Why able to suffocate in here? These things are practically airtight. Yeah. <sighs> Where's the operator? Uh, operator? He's over here. I, I can feel the braid on his coat against my hand. Oh. Hey, what about it, bud? You've got a match so I can see what I'm doing here? Uh, hey, operator. He's he's dead. Dead? Uh, Why doesn't somebody come? What's the matter with him? Why did they come? Pipe down, will you? Pipe down. There. There, I got it. Now we'll get a little air anyway. Oh. There's a light up there somewhere. Yeah. I can hear voices. There, you hear them? Help! Help! Say, help! there's no use help! yelling your head off. They know we're down I here. Yeah. I wish my leg didn't hurt so bad. Oh, let's see. Uh, uh, try wrapping your shirt around it tight. It may stop some of the pain. Thanks. Yeah, easy. Uh, now what? Uh, Nothing. Just sit and wait. That's all. Why don't they hurry? What are they waiting for? Why don't take they hurry? Take it easy. Take it easy. You could be worse off. Worse off? Yeah. Like this poor guy, the operator. He's dead. And so you waited. Six men, five living, one dead. I know how it must have been for all of you, the minutes dragging by there in the darkness with nothing to do but wait. How's your leg? It's better. How long do you suppose we've been down here? That's well, hard to tell. Maybe they think we're all dead. Maybe they're just taking their time. Don't Maybe... worry. They heard you hollering all but right. I... Gee, the, the poor guy. I, I wonder if he had any kids. The operator? Yeah. I, I often wondered sometimes what would happen if one of these things ever slept. Well, now you know. I'll never ride in one again. So he's going to walk up 68 stories to the Rainbow Room. I don't go to the Rainbow Room. Oh, I'm certainly glad my father didn't get on this car with me. He was going to, but... He changed his mind. Wish I'd changed my mind. You know, if I hadn't gone back to make a phone call, I'd have been on another car. What's the use of wishing? Okay, it's happened, and here we are. Uh, uh, listen, there they are. They're going to get us out. Yeah. Hello? Hello up there? Yeah, yeah, we're coming to you. Take it easy. Hurry, can't you? Hurry! Hurry! Well, we, uh, we'll hurry. Anybody hurry? Yeah, one guy's dead. Uh, we'll be through to you in a minute. Okay, Roddy, let it on now. Look, look at that light up there. Acetylene torches. Yeah, they're going to cut a hole in the roof. What a racket. I'm nearly deaf already. Listen, you guys. We're coming through, see? Watch out for sparks. Shut your eyes and stand back against the wall. Okay. I never knew those things made so much noise. It's because we're closed in. No! No! What was that? Well, I don't know. I, I thought I heard somebody holler. Yeah, so did I. M- must have been one of those guys up above. Those sparks are enough to blind you. Well, don't look at them. They will blind you. One went right by in front of my face, right across the car. <laughs> they couldn't have. They're dropping down. Did you see it? It was awful bright. Oh, just a reflection. Don't look at it. I I guess I guess they got it cut through. Phew, yeah. I couldn't have stood much more of that. They're right, pulling off the top. Right. It won't be long now. All right. Stand clear down there. I'm going to jump down. Hey, cop. And no cop ever looked lovelier. All right. Pass them ropes down now. Okay, hold it. All right. Who's first now? Who's the worst hurt of you all? How about this fellow? And that's the operator. 
He's dead. Hey, look. Those other two guys have both passed out. Yeah, shocking, yes. Officer, I've got to get out of here. I, I feel pretty bad. Hey, hold I... your horses. There's nothing wrong with you. But I... That man's got a broken leg. Then. Who's got a broken leg? I... I have, I think. All right. Can you sit in this rope sling here? I'll try. Now, hang on with both your hands. Uh, I'll be all right. Okay. Pull him up. Well, so long, fellas. Take care of that leg. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. My name's Lambert. And mine's Mackenzie. Maybe we'll run into each other sometime. Yeah. Well, so long. All right, let me have that rope now. Well, who's next now? Well, maybe you better take those two guys that passed out. They might be hurt. Why, well, sure. How about this young fella? Sure. Uh, he got a little blood on him, hasn't he? He has that. Glass from the light fixtures, I guess. Well, I don't think it's serious. Mm, you don't, eh? No, he seemed to be all right. Well, whatever he seemed to be, he's not now. This man is dead. Dead? Oh, but he can't be. Look here, my lad, you don't seem to realize that you've come through a pretty serious accident. Well, I know, but he can't be dead. We heard him talking just a few minutes ago, isn't that right? Yes, I heard him. Well, sure, he was talking to us here in the dark. He said something about being glad his father wasn't on this elevator. I can't help what he said or what you heard him say. This man is dead. My son, who had survived the original accident without apparent injury, was dead. You gentlemen were more fortunate. You lived. Five days later, you four met again. It was a police headquarters. About 2.30 on a Friday afternoon. The last to arrive was Mr. Lambert. In here, Mr. Lambert. Thanks. Hello there. Hi, fellas. Hey, how's the leg? Pretty good. Mr. Lambert? That's right. I'm Chief Inspector McMahon. How do? You'll uh, just take a seat there. Yes, sir. Well, we all here now? Mr. Kenshaw, yeah. Mr. Pendergast, Mr. Yes. McKenzie, That's Mr. Me. Lambert. Yes, sir. Well, now, as I told each of you over the phone, I won't keep you very long. I just wanted to ask a few routine questions about that business of the elevator the other day. Well, what's the matter? Something phony about it? Uh, not for our money. It's an open and shut case. Suicide. <whistles> Suicide? Yeah. You mean the operator wanted to bump himself off so oh, he could... No, 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 no. Not the operator. He died of a fractured skull. It's young uh, Hardiker we're interested in. His father's been raising a row, so we said we'd investigate, but... Uh, I still don't get uh, it. Wesley Hardiker was killed by a thirty-two caliber bullet through the heart. What? You couldn't have him. You mean he, he killed himself right in that car with all of us... Hmm? What else? The... He wasn't shot when he walked in, and he was dead when we brought him out. Unless uh, one of you killed him. Whoa. Oh, no. Well, no. Any of you know him? No. No. Oh, well, right. then there you are. Even the father had to admit that as far as he knew, his son had never seen any of you before in his life. But it don't make sense. What don't make sense? Well, I mean, a guy shooting himself in an elevator with four other people that nobody didn't even know it. Did uh, any of you hear the shot? Well, not before they started the blowtorches. I could swear to that. I couldn't have heard one anyway. There you see. Hey, wait a minute. Did you hear something? No. But Mackenzie, remember I said when I was laying on the floor of the elevator that I thought I saw a spark from one of those blowtorches that went across the car instead of falling down? That's right. Anybody else see it? The blowtorches were absolutely blinding. You couldn't see a... Now, how about you, Mr. Kenshaw? Uh, I'm afraid that I fainted or something silly like that. I'm not a very strong person. Well, it was probably the gunshot, all right. Nothing very mysterious about it. The gun belonged to young Hardiker, licensed in his name, and had only his own fingerprints on it. Well, maybe I shouldn't ask, but... Why did he do it? The official verdict is suicide while of unsound mind. He seemed all right. He talked to us perfectly sensibly just before it happened. Just goes to show. You never can tell, can you? Oh, he'd always been nervous and highly strong. We got that out of his father. The strain of being down in that black pit was just too much for him, that's all. Oh, what, what a terrible thing. To break down just as we were about to be rescued. Yeah, it's too bad. Boys seem to have everything to live for, too. But we find that sort of thing all the time. The, the noise, I suppose. I've read of cases of nervous breakdown caused by noise. Yeah, that's it. Well, I guess I don't need to keep you gentlemen any longer. Well, I'm certainly glad there were no complications. Oh, don't worry. If one of you had anything to do with it, you'd be back in the cell right now. That was almost a year ago. Last week, each of you received a phone call from me. 
I can well understand and sympathize with the fact that you were somewhat astonished, perhaps a little suspicious of what you heard. I don't doubt that most of you debated at some length in your minds the advisability of accepting my invitation at all. You, for instance, Mr. McKenzie, you are married, as I remember. I imagine that you talked quite seriously with your wife about the whole affair. I phoned your home, I believe, at about 8.30 last Monday evening. Yes? Uh, this is Mr. McKenzie speaking. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't seem to place you. Oh, oh, of course, Mr. Hardigan. Well, frankly, I don't see the point. You don't know me, and I don't know you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see. Well, all right, Mr. Hardiker. I'll be there. <laughs> That's a funny name. Who was it, dear? His name is Hardiker, the father of that boy who killed himself in the elevator last year. Oh? Well, what did he want? <laughs> he wants me to come to dinner with him on Saturday at his home. Why, well, how lovely. He's a very important man, isn't he? Did he ask both of us? No. As a matter of fact, he's asking the four men who were in that elevator with his son when he, when he died. What a strange idea. Seems sort of, of gruesome to me. Yeah, that's what I thought. Didn't he say anything? Oh, he said quite a lot. Well, what did he say? I'm just thinking... Oh, now, please, Stephen. Don't sit there and be so tantalizing. What did he say? Well, he said something about his son's estate. Seems his son had quite a lot of money in his own right. The old man said he didn't need it, and there weren't any other relations, and... Well, he sort of hinted that he thought it might be a good idea to split it up between the four men who were with his son in his last moments of life, as he put it. Why, Stephen, how wonderful. Why aren't you excited? How much is it? Do you suppose it's a lot of money? Mm, I don't know. Why, it might be several thousand dollars. It might be several hundred thousand dollars. Oh, Stephen, what's the matter with you? Well, just such a crazy thing to do, that's all. I don't see that that makes any difference. If a man wants to do a nice, kind, generous thing... Look, honey, if it was generosity, he'd give it to charity. If it was a sort of memorial to his son, he'd, well, he'd set up a scholarship or build a hospital or something. Well... The old man was pretty broken up about it when it happened. I remember reading something about his being in a sanitarium for a while afterwards. And he never did believe the verdict of suicide. The police as much as told us that at the time. How do I know he doesn't think one of us killed a boy? Oh, that's absurd. All right. But anybody who's crazy enough to divide up a wad of dough between four perfect strangers is crazy enough to think a perfect stranger killed his son. Oh, why, that... Maybe he thinks we all did it. Maybe he's wacky and has some crazy idea about revenge and is going to use the dough as bait to get us all together. I hadn't thought of it like that. Perhaps you ought not to go. I already said I would. Oh, anyway, maybe it's on the level. Stephen, do you still have that gun you used to have when you worked at the bank? Yeah, I have it there. I think you ought to take it with you Saturday night. Honey, I think you've got something there. I think that's a very good idea. And so, gentlemen, I'm quite gratified that you all saw fit to accept my rather unique invitation. And that we are all here together this evening. Uh, by the way, Mr. McKenzie, I'm afraid I must ask you to give me that gun that you brought along. So that's it. And, uh, Mr. McKenzie, you will notice that one of my servants who is standing in the door directly behind you has, uh, got you covered, is the phrase, I believe. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Thank you. How did you know? Why, the butler sort of patted all your pockets when he removed your coats, but aside from that, I've spent most of my waking hours during the past year looking into the backgrounds of all you gentlemen. So I was right about this setup after all. Now, look here, Mr. Hardecker. I came here tonight in perfectly good faith. I even canceled a very important business appointment. With Mr. Joseph Donahue of Celluloid Products. Yeah. All right, let's cut out the mystery. What's this all about? Yes, really, what's Mr. the Hardecker? idea? Do... No, wait a minute. One moment, gentlemen, one moment. But I... I didn't ask you up here under false pretenses. I fully intend to divide my son's estate precisely as I suggested over the phone. 
I sincerely hope you don't resent my investigation of your backgrounds. Well, gee, Mr. Hardecker, I... My background isn't much, I guess, but... Uh, well, perhaps we all owe you an apology, Mr. Hardecker, but you must admit the whole thing's been a little strange. It has indeed been very strange. I think, however, that that phase of the matter is about over. Now, before we get down to business, there is one detail that I'd like you to help clear me up. Why, well, sir. Sure, we'll be fine. Shall I, uh, I bring it in now, sir? If you please. Uh, is it well mixed? Yes, sir. The, the, in the center of the table. Thank you, Johnson. Now, please see that we are not disturbed on any account whatsoever. Yes, sir. Say, that looks good. What is it? Oh, it's got quite a number of things in it. White of egg, mustard, milk. <laughs> it sounds like an antidote for poison. It is an antidote for poison. A what? Gentlemen, there is a murderer in this room. But, oh, but... One of you killed my son and hasn't paid for it yet. Oh, don't be a fool. The coroner's verdict was suicide. This police... is not a discussion, Mr. McKenzie. This is an execution. I, I'm, I'm getting out of here. There is a man with a gun outside each door. You'll find them very unreceptive to that idea, Mr. Prendergast. Sit down. He's got us. Well, I... The only thing we can do is try to talk a little sense into I'm it. not open to arguments, Mr. McKenzie. One of you killed my son. I know who that man is. It's taken me a year to find out, but I now know. The food that man ate tonight was poison. Yeah, now, but... but In poison. ten minutes... He'll drop dead. You can't take the law into your own hands that way. You, you... Unfortunately, the law demands a very specific type of evidence. The police, whom I consulted repeatedly, do not believe it possible to get a conviction on the evidence I have. And therefore, the conviction must come tonight. Well, you wouldn't dare. You couldn't kill a man in cold blood that way. But... There is an alternative, Mr. Prendergast. Hmm? It is there in the center of the table. The antidote. Oh, the murderer may either confess his crime by drinking the contents of that bowl, or he may keep silent and go to his death here tonight, privately executed for what cannot be publicly proved. But they could send you to the chair for that. I am quite aware of that contingency, Mr. Crenshaw, and quite willing to accept the consequences. But the murderer will have gone to his death before me. But... How do we know you poisoned the right... The murderer knows, Mr. Prendergast. The rest need have no fear. Hey, I think the guy's crazy. Maybe he poisoned all of us. Look, Mr. Hardica, this whole thing is insane. Nobody killed your son. As to that, we shall shortly see, Mr. McKenzie. The man who killed my son has approximately uh, seven minutes to live. Seven minutes? It's me. I know it's me. He's poisoned. My whole insides are on fire. It's I me. He's don't poisoned. fall for it unless you're sure. The whole thing may be a gag. I assure you, nothing has ever been more serious, Mr. McKenzie. You know, you know, I, I don't feel so good myself. Neither do I. Probably just indigestion. After dinner, a story like this is enough to give indigestion to a horse. No kidding. Hey, supposing this guy's a maniac. Suppose he just made it all up in his own head and poisoned all of us. Listen, Mr. Hartigan. Let me just tell you this. If I come out of this alive, I'm going to beat your brains out of it. It's the last thing I do. I can't stand it. Mr. Heidecker, I didn't do it. I swear I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't. Shut up. Shut up. Five more minutes. Hey, I feel awful. Maybe we all ought to take some of that stuff, just in case. Yeah, that's it. We'll all take it. Yeah, we'll take it first. Unfortunately, gentlemen, there's only enough antidote for one... Even if you're right, Hardiger, this is no way to do... This do. is my way. You're crazy, I tell you, crazy! Perhaps. Have you a son? Look! Uh, Kenshaw! Uh, 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 will, will, will it save me? Well, gentlemen, now you know... All right. All right, what do I care? I killed him. And I do it again. I hated him. Hated him. All my life. In school, in college, he never even knew that I existed. He was too good for someone like me. And he had everything. everything. Money, everything. And he married the girl that I loved. She didn't know how I felt. I, I never told her. And then, and then, then she died. 
Pneumonia, they said. She wouldn't have died if she hadn't married him. So I killed him. I, I saw him get into the elevator. And then it failed. It fell. It, it was as though God had delivered it into my hand. It came to me there in the dark. I, I, I choked him. I, I choked him and then, then he got out his gun. And I, I put my hand over his and I turned it against him and fired. But I, I, I'm glad that. I, I'm glad. Look, help him, somebody. Help him. Here, hold up his head. Here. Never mind. He's dead. It, it, it didn't work in time. You killed him, Hardica. No, I didn't. I tell you, he's dead. Yes, I know. But what he drank was not the antidote. It was the poison. The poison? You see, I didn't exactly know which of you killed my son. I only knew that one of you must have. And so Robert Kenshaw convicted himself in front of all of you. And was his own executioner. But then, he was never poisoned at all until... Until he drank the contents of that bowl. Gee. I shall divide the estate, gentlemen, as I promised. Meanwhile, you may call the police if you like. Let the law and divine providence decide whether this man died by my hand or by the guilt that lay upon his own soul. So closes After Dinner Story by Cornell Woolrich, starring Otto Kruger. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when our star will be Gene Lockhart in the suspense play called Statement of Employee Henry Wilson. Producer of Suspense is William Spear, who tonight also directed the broadcast, and who with Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. Make a note on your calendar that beginning December 2nd, Suspense will come to you on Thursday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern War Time. 7 p.m. Central War Time and 6 p.m. Mountain War Time. Remember, suspense will be heard on Thursday nights beginning December 2nd. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. I'm always suspicious of a man, even in Cairo, who wants to play hide-and-seek. Especially when he's a total stranger. Well, this fellow in a felt hat and tweeds had been shadowing me for too long. So finally, around 10 o'clock, I left the cafe tambourine, figuring that before the night was over, my shadow and I would be properly introduced. Before it was over, I met a lot of people. Living and dead. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan. Proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the Mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan and tonight's story, Strangers 3. <laughs> Strangers 3. 
I made a dry run down the boulevard by Kiel, and sure enough, the stranger in felt hat and tweeds was still following me. I headed south, away from the crowds. He was right behind me like the back hump on a camel. I picked a nice dark alley for our meeting and faded into a doorway. I didn't have to wait long. As he came by, I grabbed for him. <laughs> Mr. Jordan, stop it. Who are you? What do you want? Take your hands off me, Mr. Jordan. You've been tailing me all day. Why? Only for an opportunity to talk with you. This is a very personal matter. Uh, from the top of the page, mister. And start with your name. Fader Brahms. I'm delighted. Now just what do you want? After I explain, you will understand why I did not wish to show myself. You see, I knew you were a good friend of Angus Morgan. Angus Morgan? You and he were once partners in Istanbul, I believe. Well, what about it? Mr. Jordan, I've been trailing him for over a month. Well, then stick to him. Why trail me? A short time ago, I lost him. But I have reason to believe he is now in Cairo. At first, I hoped that you would unwittingly lead me to his hiding place. Perhaps even your cafe tambourine. Want to stay with that story or try another one? <sighs> Mr. Jordan, would $500 be a decent sum for Angus Morgan's address? You can have it for free. Angus Morgan's been dead for three months. Now you take it from there. A thousand dollars, then. Look, I'll play it once more. Angus Morgan is dead. Not dead, my friend. But very much alive. All right, let's say I buy your story for the moment. Why is Angus's address worth all that dough? <laughs> you are very cute, Mr. Jordan. Well? Have the dough with you? Certainly not. It's hardly the place for a financial transaction. Shall we say your cafe in two hours? Let's say that. I'll have the money there. You will carry out your part of the bargain? I didn't make a bargain. I think you will. In two hours, Mr. Jordan. At the tambourine. I watched Brahms fade off up the street and then detoured by way of the Cairo News Gazette. It was true, Angus Morgan and I had once been partners in Istanbul. Only Fader made one mistake. Angus and I were not friends, not even poor ones. Angus had double-crossed me and run out, owing me $15,000. If Angus was alive, only one thing interested me, my 15 grand. It took some fast talk and 20 piastres to get me into the newspaper morgue that time of night. But from then on, the night clerk was cooperative. And what was that name again? Uh, Morgan. Angus Morgan. Oh, uh, yeah. Moody, Mo, Mo. You know, I wouldn't mind this night job if it wasn't for my wife. <laughs> you married? No, no. Uh, there was a story in the paper about his death about three months ago. <laughs> Don't ever get married, not if you work night. Uh, what did you say that name was? Morris? No, Morgan. <laughs> now, take my wife. Always wants to know what happened. What oh, wait. Did... That's the one I want right there. Uh, no, no, that's Morgan, Angus Morgan. Give it to me. Okay. What can I say to her? She wouldn't believe me anyhow. Angus Morgan. Killed in mysterious explosion, salvaging operation. Off the coast of Ross el Yeah, then she says, why can't an alert, energetic man like me get a day job? Sure looks dead, all right. Yeah, she's just that way. Huh? My wife. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for everything. Here, file this back under Rocky Jordan. Sure. Good night, Mr. Morgan. <laughs> I decided to make one more call before keeping my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. The authorities seemed sure Angus Morgan was dead. But if he was alive and in Cairo, he was here for one reason. A reason named Sabina. She wasn't too much to look at now, but at one time she was the toast of Istanbul. These days she ran a Turkish bath near the Sharia El Modafar. It was late, but her office door was open and the sign said, come in. So I did. I, I can't believe it. When can I see him? He's waiting at the Sharon Sanitarium. Philip, wait. Hello, Sabina. Did I interrupt something? Rocky Jordan. Yeah, we meet again, Sabina, like old times. Don't tell me you want to lose weight. <laughs> no, no. There's enough hot air over at the cafe tambourine to keep me in shape. I'd like a word in private with you, Sabina, as soon as you're through here. Uh, why, I... I am in no hurry, Sabina. So suppose you go ahead and see what Mr. Jordan wants. I will wait for you. Why, that's very kind of you, Mr. Tournay. Yeah, thanks. We'll only be a minute. Yes, Rocky? Who's the overgrown Frenchman? Oh, Mr. Tournay was arranging for me to give someone a massage at the sanitarium. Please, Rocky, what do you want? Sabina, what do you hear from Angus Morgan? Angus? What are you talking about? You know I've he's... I've got a hunch he's alive. What kind of a cruel joke is this? I get reasons for believing it. 
Rocky, I know how you hated Angus for double-crossing you. What good can this do you? Can't you let the past sleep? Still do anything for Angus, wouldn't you? Get out of here, Rocky. Sure, Sabina. Get out! I got out. If Sabina was putting on an act, she wasn't doing a good job of it. But I knew my visit with her was a sure way of making Angus show his hand, if he was around. I went back to my cafe tambourine. It wasn't yet time for Fader Brahms to show up. So I sat out in my office to try and decide how I could handle him. Uh, hello. Hello, hello. Is this Mr. Jordan? Yeah? Good. I want to speak to you, Mr. Jordan. It is very important. Who is this? Oh, yeah. We have never met. My name is Svensson. Swenson? Jan Svensson. Oh, naturally. Mr. Jordan, I saw you talking to a man named Fader Brahms. Nice of you to tell me. I don't know what he offered to pay for information leading to Angus Morgan, but I can guarantee you he will double his price. I didn't know a dead man was worth so much. Mr. Jordan, a man does not yoke when he is 40 fathoms on top. Look, uh, drop the salty talk and get to the point, huh? I am staying at the Hotel Mala, room six. Will you come see me right away? How much money did you say? i uh, sure we can strike a bargain. Well, then get ready to bed, Swenson. You got competition. I hung up knowing that Fader Brahms wasn't the only one who'd been following me. Add one Jan Swenson. I figured Fader and his appointment could wait. Two heads were better than one, and if my 15 grand was around, I wanted to be sure of it. The Hotel Mala wasn't far, and I was there in five minutes. Room six was on the first floor. There was a light on inside the room, and I knocked on Jan Svensson's door. No answer. I tried the door, but it was locked. So I called the hotel manager, and we went in. Oh, oh, what has happened? That bed does not belong in the center of the room and the dresser upside down. It looks like somebody went through here with a bulldozer. Oh, 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 there has been a fight. But Mr. Swenson's clothes are still here. Yeah, a few of them. Yes. Oh, oh what are these? Oh, heavy rubber gloves, like a deep sea diver's maybe. Nice and new. Oh, this is terrible. Dust all over everything. Yeah, even the phone. We must call the police. Yeah, do that. I left the hotel manager wringing his hands and got outside. I checked my watch. It was time for my date with Fader Brahms at the tambourine. And this time I really had some questions. As I turned to go, I felt something tugging at my coattail. It was a small native boy. He handed me a white envelope and dodged away into the crowd. I opened the letter. and It read, Mr. Jordan, before you see Angus, see me. I will meet your price. Signed, Captain Morey. Address... 62 Fernier Road. It looked like time for me to tally the score. First on base was Fader Brahms. Next, Jan Swenson. Now coming up to bat, Captain Morey. I figured that Fader could wait for me at the tambourine, and I caught a taxi to 62 Fernier Road. It had all the earmarks of a sedate rooming house. The skinniest woman I've ever seen opened the door. I'm Mrs. Phipps. May I help you? Yes, I'm Rocky Jordan. Shh. You'll have to keep your voice down. My guests have been asleep for hours. Oh, sorry. Captain Morey's expecting me. Captain Morey? You don't say so. Well, I can't imagine... Look, I got a letter from him. Shh, please. I've got to see him tonight. I'm so angry I could scream. It couldn't have been ten minutes ago. He skipped out of here bag and package. Out the window, if you please. And not paying me one cent for his board and room. Take his clothes with him? Yes, everything except these awful rubber boots. Here, you can have them. Forgot his sea boots, huh? Better give them to the police. The police will be here. I've already called them. Oh, just one more thing. What did Captain Morey look like? Simply horrible. Grotesque and horrible. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I left Mrs. Phipps standing there, a big new sea boot in each hand, and moved out onto the dark street. I got to the nearest payphone and called Chris at the tambourine. He said nobody resembling Fader Brahms had made an appearance there. We were both late for our appointment. Now, there was something else in my mind as I left the phone booth. I wondered if my visit with Sabina was going to pay off. And then it did. The shots were wild and there were holes in the wall all around me. I dropped to the ground, rolled up in a dark corner. The guy with the gun must have thought he got me because he took off down a side street. 
He was big, but he ran like a scared gazelle. I was up and after him, but when I got to the corner, he was out of sight. I let him go. Anyhow, I had one answer. The seed I had planted with Sabina had finally blossomed. Rocky Jordan returns in just a moment. On CBS, My Friend Irma is now one of the most popular comedies on the air, and the two characters, Irma and Jane, are familiar to millions. You'll enjoy Irma to her last dumb remark on My Friend Irma, following CBS Radio Theater, Monday night. Now, back to Rocky Jordan with tonight's story, Strangers 3. Angus Morgan was supposed to have died three months ago. That's what the record said. But when three men named Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey came to Cairo looking for him and said he was alive, I was interested. Angus owed me $15,000, and I like money. My visit with Angus's old girlfriend, Sabina, paid off on the nose. When shots started flying, I knew Angus was close by. Back in Sabina's office, the fellow named Tournier had mentioned the Sharon Sanitarium. And Sabina hadn't covered it too well. So the next day being Sunday, I invested in one dozen roses and paid the Sharon a visit. On the third floor, I hit pay dirt. I swung a door open, and there, propped up in bed playing chess with Philip Tournier, was Angus Morgan. Rocky! I uh, brought you some flowers, Angus. Shut the door. How did you find me, Rocky? In the telephone book. Uh, same old Rocky. This here, your finger man? Yeah. Uh, Meet Philip Tonyi, my bodyguard. Well, we've already met. Twice. Twice, Mr. Jordan? Once at Sabina's and once outside our phone booth. You're a bum shot, Tonyi. I'm afraid you are mistaken. Uh, skip it. Listen, Angus. Rocky, how did you know I was still living? Three men told me. Three? Well, count them. Fader Brahms, Jan Swenson, and Captain Morey. No. They, they, you're having a relapse, Angus. Maybe I better call a nurse. Stop it, Rocky. They say they're alive. Breathing, too. Right down your thick neck. They know where I am. Uh, not yet, Angus. But they're each offering me a few thousand for that information. I've, I'm beginning to see what you mean. Same as there was a debt. I'll refresh your memory. Fifteen thousand dollars. Rocky, I'll pay you every cent of your promise to leave immediately and forget you've been here. As far as I'm concerned, Angus, you're resting where you so justly deserve. Got it with you? Yes. Oh, Philip, this is just between Rocky and me. So if you leave the room... But, Angus, you are sure... I can uh... trust, Rocky. You can get me some cigars while you're out. Go on. Very well. I will be back shortly. Well, Rocky, it's been a long time. The money, Angus, remember? Very well. Did you hand me that valise on the lower shelf of the cart there? Oh, sure. Well, feels loaded. <laughs> I'll have a little left. <clears throat> yeah. Here you are. Fifteen thousand dollars. Cut it if you like. Well, don't worry, I'll be back if it's not all here. Angus, I'm overwhelmed. You're paid. Just keep your promise and get out. Sure, I know when I'm not wanted. Just one more thing. Yes? Tell Tournier to stop using me for a clay pigeon or I'll have your three friends up here next. I'm gonna show you, Rocky. You'll never hear from me again. Angus put his valise back where it was and I got out. I walked slowly down the stairs, trying to decide what I was going to tell Fader Brahms. He still hadn't kept his date with me. Well, I had my dough. I promised Angus to keep my mouth shut, and that's the way it was going to be. I just about reached the main floor when Bedlam broke loose. It was coming from the third floor. I raced back up the steps two at a time. Down the hall, a crowd was gathering in front of Angus Morgan's room. I saw Philip Tournier come out of the elevator, and we reached the room together. We pushed through the crowd of Sunday visitors and into the room. And there was Sabina. Angus, Angus. Sabina, what is it? Pull yourself together, Sabina. What happened? I, I walked into the room and, and there, there he was. There's no doubt about it this time. Oh, Angus is dead. Stabbed to death. From there on, things move fast. Sam Sabaya, captain of the Cairo police, took over. A very thorough man, he rounded up everyone connected with the case. Down at headquarters, I was kept cooling my heels while Sam talked to Sabina and Tournier. He called me in last. 
Well, Georgian, I am afraid you have a great deal to explain. Well, by this time, Sam, I thought you'd have the murder solved. Georgian, this time, let's get to the point. I suppose Sabina told you I had it in for Angus Morgan. That is correct. And Tournier happened to mention that I threatened Angus. Just one more thing. In Angus Morgan's room at the sanitarium was a valise containing $300,000. 300000 He is missing. I believe 15000 of it is in your pocket. Tournier did talk, didn't he? May I see it? Sure. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing, Sam? That's my door. We shall see. Right now, it is Exhibit A. Where is the rest of the money, Jordan? How should I know? Well, now, wait, Sam. You don't think Would I... you like to tell me everything now, Jordan? Of course. I was as sure as anybody else that Angus Morgan was dead. Then people came to me looking for him, said he was alive and in Cairo. What people? Well, first, a guy in a felt hat and tweeds named Fader Brahms. Yeah. Then Jan Swenson and Captain Morey. They both skipped out, but I'll give you their former addresses. You better look them up, Sam. Getting back to Angus Morgan, how did you find him? Philip Tournier let his whereabouts out of the bag when I went to see Sabina. Oh, by the way, an hour later, somebody tried to kill me. I think it was Tournier. But, um, about that 15 grand, Angus owed it to me. I will do my best to find this three thumb you speak of. But, Jordan, the facts remain incriminating. I was halfway out of the building when the murder took place. Save that part of your story for the inquest tomorrow. We will notify you of the time. Okay, Sam, we'll play it your way. Good night, Jordan. Good night, Sam. Oh, and by the way, when you give me back my money, I'm going to buy you a present. Oh? What, George? A can of oil. Your chair squeaks. I went out into the street, and when the air hit me, I knew I was sweating. If we were all released, that meant Sam was playing cat and mouse with us. And everything pointed in my direction, much too conveniently. I had to act quickly while I still had a few hours of freedom. I had a hunch the police were following me, but I didn't care. I had nothing to hide. Sabina was first on my list. She took my bait once before, and she might again. When I reached Sabina's Turkish bath, she was already there. Rocky, what are you doing here? Who let you in? I've got to talk to you. Haven't you caused enough trouble? Leave me alone. Who's Fader Brahms? Jan Swenson, Captain Morey. Why don't you ask Philip Dornay? Well, I will. Where is he? He's staying at an apartment over the open-air market on Farron Street. Oh, thanks. I got a good hunch who killed your boyfriend, Sabina. Maybe you have, too. Who did it, Rocky? That's what I gotta find out, Sabina. Or I may be next. I went to the open air market on Ferran Street. Philip Tournier's room was on the second floor. I knocked. When he finally opened it, he was either out of breath or awfully scared. Jordan! I'm coming in, Tournier. Yes, yes, of course. I I thought you were in jail. Well, weren't we all? There was a policeman watching my apartment. Two of them now. One for each of us. I'd start leveling with me, Tournier. You tried to kill me last night, didn't you? I could have, Rocky, but I shot wild, purposely. I was Angus Morgan's bodyguard, not his finger man. When did Sabina arrive at the sanitarium Sunday? I do not know. You ever hear of Fader Brahms? Why, uh, I have never seen him. Well, try these for size. John Swenson, Captain Morey. Uh, Angus, Fader, and Swenson hired uh, Captain Morey's boat. Uh, they salvaged an army payroll from an American freighter that had been sunk during the war. Uh, where? Uh, off the coast of Russell Hud. The four of them were supposed to split the money between them. Knowing Angus, he changed his mind, wanted all of it. Uh, that is right. After they had hauled up $300,000 of the money, Angus sneaked off the boat, leaving a time bomb behind. Everyone was reported missing at sea, including Angus. Well, they're not missing now. They're in Cairo. Uh, they will kill me. Sure, if you took the 300000 But I did not. What can I do? Just sit tight and don't talk to anybody. Especially not to Sabina. Tournier was halfway to his phone before I got out the door, but I didn't mind. At least now I had something to work with, if I could believe anything he said. I went out onto the street wondering if I'd ever see Fader Brahms again, or Svensson or Captain Morey. Why would anyone kill Angus, take the money, and stay around Cairo for the police to get at? I stood there trying to figure my next move, and then it was figured for me. The door of a car waiting at the curb swung open. Get in, Jordan. Fader Brahms. Sure I'm not intruding. Get in, I said. Okay. But take that shiny cannon out of my face. It hurts my eyes. I may have to use it. I want that $300,000, Jordan. Well, you haven't got it? No. And I want every cent of it. Tell me something, Fader. How did it happen Angus Morgan didn't kill you like he planned? Perhaps I knew him too well. We were on the salvage boat. 
all four of us, lying two miles offshore. One night I heard a sound went up on deck, and I heard oars fading into the fog. It was Angus Morgan taking all the money we'd salvaged. Before I could do anything, there was a blast. I came to on a small vessel sailing for East Africa. It took me two months to get back. And I've been looking for Angus ever since. I see. Now you see why I want that money, Jordan. Why don't you look up Jan Swenson or Captain Morey? Why pin it on me? I think you have it. Jordan, I swear I'll kill you right here. Oh, maybe not after you take a look out the back window. Go ahead. Black car? Keep watching it. The police, Fader. They've been tailing me all day. Perhaps you are not lying. Now listen to some sense. You want the money. I want to get the guy who killed Angus Morgan to clear myself. We can get him together. You... You know who killed Morgan? Yeah. Captain Morey. I'm sure I saw him at the sanitarium. Captain Morey? Of course. What's your plan? Well, first we split up. Shake the police off our trails. Meet me at the corner of Sika and El Modar, right by the old tower. Why there? I think I know his hideout. You'll be there in 30 minutes. Very well, Jordan. I will be there. <laughs> I waited till Fader Brahms drove off around the corner, then I got to a phone called Sam Sabaya. Wasn't long till Sam's sleepy voice came on. Oh, uh, Sam, Sabaya speaking. Listen, Sam, I think I got your man. Uh, you got uh, what, what? 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 What is this? Captain Morey. If you'll be at Sika and El Modar in half an hour, I'll produce him. Jordan, go home and go to bed. Sam, listen to me. But I am glad you called, though. The inquest will be tomorrow at 11. Will you be there, or um, should I send an escort? Sam, I told you where to be. Now, don't let me down. Good night, George. Listen, Sam. Sam! Okay, I'll go it alone. <laughs> Sam was in no cooperative mood. But it was too late to change my plan now. My watch said 11 o'clock. That meant I had just 12 hours to dig up somebody to take my place at the inquest. I walked the whole way to our rendezvous spot through the twisting narrow streets that led to the old tower, a familiar dismal landmark in the lower quarter of Carroll. I finally stopped at the tower. No one was there, but I was a couple of minutes early. <laughs> Laughter sounded from an upper window across the way. It stopped, a light went out, and all was darkness and quiet. I leaned against the wall and waited. Once I thought I saw a figure in the shadows. I glanced back and it was gone. You know, shadows play tricks sometimes. Then I heard it. A quick rustling motion that resolved into a figure as I turned. I felt it coming, but I was too late. Pain stabbed my right shoulder. I tried to move, but the knife had me pinned to the wall. Through a blinding fight to keep my senses, I heard a confusion of sound. Pistol blazed almost in my face. And everything mixed into a whirlpool of shouts and footsteps went spinning off into nothing. With Rocky Jordan right in the middle. Rocky Jordan will be back in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a Mike memo from CBS for Monday Night Listening. The Foxes of Harrow comes to you Monday night on CBS Radio Theater with lovely Maureen O'Hara and John Hodiak. Don't miss The Foxes of Harrow, CBS Radio Theater, Monday night at 7 in California and 6 elsewhere in the West. Now back to Rocky Jordan for the ending of tonight's story. When I opened my eyes, the darkness of the night under the old tower had changed to all white. White walls, white sheets, white bedshirt. The sun was coming in the west window and seated beside my bed, looking me over like a hound looks over a fresh bone, was Sam Zabaya. Well, Jordan, you missed the inquest. Oh, you're breaking my heart, Sam. Where am I? In the Sharon Sanitarium. Oh, the Sharon again. Why here? We, we, we thought you might feel right at home. Well, I'm not. Ooh. What happened? Only a knife wound. Your shoulder will heal. You were more fortunate than Angus Morgan. Yeah. Then all that shooting was the police. Sam, I thought you weren't coming to the party last night. Oh, Jordan, you wronged me. 
Fedor Brahms is now in the Cairo jail. A little worse for the wear. Okay. Now, Sam, when do I get my 15 grand back? Remember? Exhibit A? Uh, Jordan, you promised to lead me to Captain Morey. Where is he? In jail. Captain Morey, Jan Swenson, Fader Brahms. They're all the same man. Oh. It's no wonder we couldn't find the other two. When did you know this? Uh, I should have known from the beginning. Fader was too elaborate with his plans. I figured he invented the other two to keep me on my toes, make sure I didn't lose interest. Mm -hmm. And if a murder rap came up, the police would be out looking for Swenson and Maury, dead men. But, Jordan, that is hardly proof. No, I wasn't sure until Fader Brahms came to me and demanded the money. I told him to ask Swenson and Captain Maury, but Fader didn't bat an eye. Why? Because he knew they didn't exist. No doubt they were actually killed in the salvage boat. Sure. So when I told Fader I'd produce Captain Maury, he knew I was lying. He decided it was time to get rid of me. Just one thing I don't understand. Uh, Sam, about my 15000 uh, What don't you understand? Well, if Fader Brahms killed Angus Morgan and took his money, why didn't he get out of Cairo? Now, very good question, Jordan. Brahms has confessed to the murder, but he did not get the money. What? Sabina came into Angus Morgan's room too quickly after the murder. In his haste to escape, Fader left the very thing he was after. Then he really did think I had it. Oh, but where is the money? But that is a very strange thing, Jordan. After we brought you back here last night, the money was found in the third floor laboratory. How it got there, I don't know. Sam, of course. Angus set the money satchel on the lower shelf of that uh, that little cart the nurses wheel around. It was still there when she wheeled it out. Ah, I see. Perhaps during the confusion after the murder. Well, that about settles everything. Oh, Oh, no, Sam. What about my 15 grand? My dough? Well, you see, Georgian, there will probably be an estate. You will have to put in a claim for it. Well, of all the... Hey, nurse! Nurse! Uh, Jordan, can I get something for you? Yes, Sam, a first-class lawyer. <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. You will get your money. You always do. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Bernard Girard and was produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States... and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Has this ever happened in your home? You're sitting listening to the radio when... Yes? This is the Radio Checking Bureau. Is your radio turned on? Yes, it is. What program are you listening to, please? It's it's, uh, This Is Your FBI, just starting. Do you know who sponsors that program? Uh, Sure I do. It's the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I listened to the Equitable program last week and heard about the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. My Equitable Society representative brought me a copy, so naturally I know that This Is Your FBI is sponsored by the Equitable Society. In about 15 minutes, I'll be back with full information about the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Tonight's FBI file, The Prodigal Brother.
the Federal Bureau of Investigation is an organization composed of men who have studied crime from every angle. They know that in this past year, there have been a million and a half major crimes committed in the United States. They know that there are more than 18 million sets of fingerprints in the criminal files. They know not only those and other figures, but also what are the best ways to fight an outbreak of crime on any front. Their knowledge on the subject is specialized and modern. And yet, some of that knowledge is almost as old as time itself. After a recent archaeological survey of some stones brought to the surface by bombing in Italy during the war, it was decided that the writing on the tablets could be deciphered to mean, and here I quote the verbatim translation, crime must be concealed by crime. Yes, that apparently was true a couple of thousand years ago in a civilization that died shortly after those tablets were chiseled. But while the civilization died, those words, crime must be concealed by crime, are as true today as they ever were. The clothes, the speech, the habitat of the criminal may change, but down through the ages, the basic ingredient that has characterized the professional lawbreaker has been a consuming greed that drives him on and on, so that once started, he stops at nothing. The night's file opens late at night in a quiet suburban district in a large Midwestern city. A short, heavy set man furtively approaches a home in which all the lights are out. He goes up the front steps quietly. He knocks on the door. There is no answer. After a wait, he knocks again. Feeling now that no one is home, he takes a small pass key from his pocket and lets himself in. He turns on the lights, goes to the living room. He picks up the telephone and dials. As the operator answers, we hear him say... Hello, operator. This is Elmwood 46970. I want to talk to Valley City, 7923. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I'll wait. He lights a cigarette. And smokes nervously as he waits for his number. Hello, Pete. Hello, hello, it's Pete Anderson there. This is George Newberg. Yeah, yeah, we got separated. Okay, Pete will call you. When he does... Tell him he's got to call me at Elmwood 46970. Go ahead, dear. Oh, hey, I gotta hang up now. Why? Goodbye. Oh, Larry, shopping's the only part of Christmas I don't like. I know what you mean. Where do you want to put all these packages? In the bedroom. You leave the lights on, Ruth? No, I don't remember. George. Hi, sis. Who's that? My brother, George. Hi, Larry. How'd you get in here? Your door was open, so I walked right in. George, I didn't know you were in town. Oh, I just got in. Came right over here. That's nice. You don't say that like you mean it. I didn't. You in trouble again? Larry, please. Well, that's the only time we ever see him. Well, that's a nice attitude to take after I go to all this bother. What bother? To spend Christmas with my sister. He's right, Larry. You mean you want him here? For the holidays, yes. Okay. Ah, thanks, Larry. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Later that night in the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor approaches the desk of Agent Gene Crawford. Hello, Gene. Hi, Jim. I've been waiting for you to get back. Why? What's up? The SAC just assigned us to work together on a new case. This time, and time is an important factor for us. You know a little town called Thomasville across the state line? Yes. It's right on the lake, isn't it? That's right. Well, two men stole some jewelry there this afternoon. Uh -huh. A few hours after the robbery, they're in a saloon in Thomasville when a local policeman recognized them. They tried to arrest them. One of the men took a bottle from the bar and broke it across the policeman's head. Wow. The two men separated. One of them drove away in a car. The bartender got the license number of the car, and it's just been found abandoned here in town. Any idea who the two men were? No, the local policeman is still unconscious. However, we got partial descriptions on them from the bartender. 
One of them has a scar on his left cheek. Well, that's not very much to go on. What about the clothes they were wearing? Well, the one who jumped into the car and drove away was wearing a black and white check Mackinac with a torn right pocket. Oh, he's the one who had the scar on his face. Any other leads? Possibly one. What's that? The pieces of the broken bottle. They were shipped by air to our laboratory in Washington. Well, we won't get any word from them until tomorrow at the very earliest. That's right. However, if these men were willing to assault a policeman in broad daylight, they must be pretty desperate. Yeah, I'll go along with you on that, Jim. So we'd better start our search right now and hope we capture them before they try to murder anyone else. Hey, sis. Yes, George? How was Larry this morning about my being here? We didn't talk about it. Hey, is this the only razor he's got? The, the straight edge one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this will be quite a shave. Haven't seen these since that one pop used to have, remember? Uh huh. Hey, hey, how about that time I tried to sharpen it on the strap? What a carbon job I did, huh? Yeah, I never forget the way pop George, would. Yeah. Come here a minute, please. Oh, well, I'm shaving, sis. What do you want? I was just making your bed. I found this under the mattress. This gun. Oh. What are you doing with a gun, George? I can explain, sis. You are in trouble, aren't you? Uh, No. Well, then what are you doing with a gun? I used it in my work. Your work? Uh, The last job I had was a night watchman. George, are you telling me the truth? I swear to you I am. Well, I'll show you the permit for it afterwards. It's inside my wallet. Well... You better not let Larry see this. Oh, well, look, sis, if you want, I'll get rid of it, I huh? wish you would. Okay. Hey, just as soon as I finish okay. shaving. Hello? Yes, just a moment. George? Yeah? It's for you. It's a man named Pete. Got a report back from Washington. What'd they have to say? Well, Lab took those pieces of broken glass and put the bottle back together again. That's remarkable. Yeah. Then they went ahead and got enough prints off the bottle to enable Ident to send us a complete description. Whose prints are they? They belong to a thief named George Newberry. The last three times he was arrested, he was working with a hoodlum named Pete Anderson. Oh, I see. We sent a picture of Anderson to Thomasville to see if the bartender can identify him. Taylor? Here. Oh, yes, Arnold? Message here for you from the teletype room. Fine. Thanks, Arnold. That's in the local police department of Valley City. Hey, Anderson was seen there, but he eluded the police and left town. Uh, I'll get it, Jim. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, sir. Yes, that's right. He has? Don't have any idea at all, huh? No, I see. Well, thank you very much for calling, sir. Goodbye. That was a parole officer back east who handled Newberry's case for a while, Gene. He says that Newberry has a married sister living here in town. What's her name? Well, that's the rough part. He doesn't know. He just remembers hearing Newberry talk about it. Well, these men are dangerous, Jim, and if they do meet here, we may have a two-man crime wave on our hands. Yeah, I know that, Gene. That's why I wish the story in this afternoon's papers would bring us some results. Well, it's too late now to get anything else into the papers before tomorrow morning. Yeah. But I think we ought to get down and give them this new information we have and the pictures of Newberry and Anderson. Okay. You go to the star and I'll go to the record. Okay. Meet you back here in an hour. Larry, don't you want to help me spin the tree? Uh, just a minute, Rose. What are you doing? Looking for that Mackinac George was wearing when he came here last night. Oh, I hung it right there in the closet. Where? Oh, I see. Going right pocket. Smells of whiskey. Larry, what are you talking about? There's a story in tonight's paper about a man the police are looking for. Well, what about him? He was last seen. He was wearing a black and white Mackinac with a torn right pocket like this one. Hit a cop over the head with a bottle of whiskey and some of the whiskey splashed over the Mackinac. I think the man they're looking for is George. The paper also says this man has a scar on his left cheek. Oh, sure, lots of people have scars. Ruth, I'm going to call the police. No, don't. You want me to cover up for him? Well, I... I think it's only fair to let George explain. All right, get him in here. I will. George? George? 
Yeah, what do you want? Could you come in here for a minute, please? Yeah, sure. What do you want, sis? I'm the one who wanted to see you, George. About what? There's a story in tonight's paper that the police are looking for a man who was last seen wearing a black and white Mackinac with a torn right pocket. Well? It also says the Mackinac smells of whiskey and the man they're looking for has a scar on his left cheek. George, it isn't you. Of course not. I don't believe you. Are you calling me a liar? I'm not calling you anything, George. Let the police see if you're the man they want. You're not calling any police. Yes, I am. Stand still. Put down that gun. Sorry, I can't go along with you. George, there aren't any bullets in that gun. Huh? I took them out this morning when I found it. Is that really true, Ruth? Yes. <laughs> oh! Larry, don't hit him again, please. I won't. Come on, get up, you cheap punk. We're going to the police. Now, give me a chance, will you, Larry? No. But I promise you that... Larry, I... walking toward that front door. All go right, on, all move. All right, all right. You wait here, Ruth. Now, walk in front of me. Where are you going? Uh, Pete. What's the trouble? Uh, this guy's taking me to the cops. Who are you? I'm a friend of his. Now turn around, mister. Go back inside. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, listen. Fathers and mothers, the next 60 seconds that tick away may mark a turning point in your children's lives, may have an enormous influence on their future happiness, their future success. All that in 60 seconds? Yes, in the next 60 seconds, you will hear about the Equitable Society's famous fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers? What in the world is that? It's a chart that every father who really loves his family should have. A chart which shows him how to figure out just what income his family would need if he should die unexpectedly. The minimum amount of money his wife and children would require to maintain a comfortable standard of living. Fred, do you know how much that would be for your family? No, Mr. Keating, can't say I do. Well, you'll have the answer in five minutes flat with this Equitable Society chart. You're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures. In no time at all, you'll know just what income your family will need to keep going, and to keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Mr. Keating, this chart looks like just what I need. How much will it cost? Not one cent, Fred. They're free. Phone your Equitable Society representative and ask him to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable representative. If you truly love your children, you will not let another day tick away on the clock without sending for the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Prodigal Brother. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI again illustrates a point the Federal Bureau of Investigation has tried to drive home to you listeners on previous broadcasts, a point which it will continue to try to impress upon you, because without your acceptance of this fact, you cannot begin to understand how to help fight the crime wave. You do not owe any loyalty to any criminal, nor are you under any compulsion to be fair with him. Because he does not accept loyalty or fair treatment with any idea of returning the same to you. If you have any notion that anyone you know, be it a relative as close as the one in tonight's case or not, is a criminal, you have only one course of action open to you. That course of action is not one which is motivated by lofty ideals of your duty as a citizen to your fellow citizens. Instead, it is motivated by self-preservation... For only by doing the one thing within your power can you assure yourself of safety. That one thing, that single step which should be taken without any delay, 
without your holding your own version of a fair trial, is pick up your phone and call the local police. Tonight's file continues at the local FBI field office. Oh, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Gene. When I got back to my desk, there were a couple of messages there for me. That's all right, Jim. I just returned them in to go myself. Oh. Well, one of the messages was from police headquarters. Oh. Pete Anderson was seen by a local policeman out in the Sheridan Heights district. How long ago? Within the last half hour. Anderson pulled a gun, shot the policeman, and got away. Again, huh? Yeah. You know, we've got to assume now that this was the rendezvous point. No question about that. Well, the other message I found was from Newberry's old parole officer. Could he give you anything else on Newberry's sister? Only that her husband is an accountant. Yeah, that's not much help. No. I was hoping we'd raise something on that story in the papers. Yeah. Yeah. We've been on this case since 11 o'clock last night. That's uh, 19 hours. We don't know much more now than when we started. No. I just came in on the teletype a few minutes ago for you, oh. Mr. Taylor. Thanks, son. It's from the Philadelphia office, Gene. Hmm? They've checked Newberry's old neighborhood. Did they find anything? Now, well, one of the neighbors remembered that Newberry's sister's name is Ruth, that she's married to someone whose first name is Lawrence. Well, that's a lead, Jim. Ah, oh, come on. Let's get to work and start checking. <laughs> George. Yeah. What are you doing? Uh, tightening some ropes. I want my brother-in-law to be as uncomfortable as possible. Leave him alone a minute. I want to talk to you. Yeah, what about? Stuff we heisted. You give it to the fence? Uh-huh. What did the guy say? We get 6000 for the whole thing if we wait till he has a chance to get rid of the stuff. That might be a year. If we don't want to wait, we can take 2000 now. Thank you very much. We're pretty hot, yet. Could stay under. Where? Here. Didn't you say your brother-in-law is an accountant? Sure, why? If he don't show up at his office for a couple of days, somebody's going to start wondering why. You better catch this place off quick. Well, where we go? Over to Bay City to see the fence. Okay. What about them? Your relatives? Yeah. Before we go, we'll take care of them. This is the place, Gene. You cover me, huh? Okay, Jim. You got the search warrant, haven't you? Yeah, it's right here in my pocket. Might need it. No lights on. Well, we know this is the right place. This has to be Newberry's brother-in-law. Uh, I think we'd better use a search warrant. Hey, our door is unlocked. Oh, come on, let's go in. Okay, Jim. Oh, yes. Now, let's take a look in this room on the left. Huh? Okay. That was the kitchen on the other side of the hall. I doubt there'd be anybody in there in the dark. I wouldn't think so. Well, the bedrooms are probably down here in the back. Let's take a look. Not much sign that anybody's here, Jim. No, there isn't. Pretty quiet. Hey, Gene. Mm-hmm. Feeding somebody in here. Jim, look there. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Come on, there. Hands and feet are tied. Get the gags off first, Jim. All right. All right, now take it easy, mister. All right, ma'am. Mr. Mr. Hostel, I'll get this knot untied. All right. There we are. Oh, thank you. All right, all right. Back up here, mister. Thanks. Are you all right, Ruth? Yes, dear. It's your name, Dylan? That's right. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, uh, Mrs. Dillon, have you seen your brother, George? Well, He I... was here. He and a friend of his are the ones that tied us up after they argued for a while whether to kill us or not. How long ago did they leave? About a half hour ago. Would you have any idea where they went? I heard my brother-in-law say they were going to Bay City. Any specific place there? No, sir. I'm sorry, but that's all I heard. Jim, there's only one road between here and Bay City. Uh, Did they have any transportation? Yeah, I heard them drive away from here in my car. What kind of a car is that, Mr. Dillon? It's a 1942 Chevrolet sedan, black. Gene, let's call up and have a roadblock set up between here and Bay City. Behind the diner. Hey, Pete, why don't we go in and get some coffee? We wait for the driver of that truck to come out. Hmm? Which truck? 
battling with the trailer full of new cars. That'd be a nice score without the driver. We need him. If we get a ride in a truck, we let the driver the front for us. Uh-huh. Here he comes. What do we do? Up the handle. Hey, Mac. You talking to me? Yeah. Can you give us a lift? I'm sorry. It's against the rules. This gun says we ride with you. Then I guess you do. George. Yeah, what? It's a bunk inside the cab and back of where the driver says. Climb into it. Okay. If this guy coming, like it up there with you. Right. We want you to turn around, Mac. Head for Bay City. <laughs> Set down the road. Yeah. Looks like a roadblock. Yeah, they're stopping every car. Driver, take it easy and listen to me. Okay. There's cops up ahead. Stop when I tell you to and talk straight to them. We'll be hiding back here and if you say one word out of line, we'll blast you. Okay, mister. You better stop. I see your identification, please. Here's my badge. Thank you. Well, I have a pictures here of a couple of men we're looking for. Will you take a look at these? All right, sir. You seen either one of them? No, sir. I haven't. Mm-hmm. I see your license, please. Yeah. Yeah, just a minute. Here you are. Thank you. Okay. Here you are. Sorry to hold you up. You can go ahead now. Oh, uh, just a minute. Yeah? Hold it a minute, will you? I want to play a searchlight into those cars up there in your trailer. Yes, sir. Oh, Sergeant, break it with your light. For the front more. Gene? Yo. See anything? No, Jim. Okay. All right, driver. You can go ahead. G-Men. Mm-hmm. Where are you fellas going in Bay City? Just wait till you get to town. We'll show you. Okay. Hey, you hear that? Yeah. Pull over! What'll I do? Pull over. Stop. Okay. Badge again, driver. Yes, sir. Here you are. Will you step down out of the cab, please? Sure. Get out of the way, driver. All right, Newberry. You too, Anderson. Come on out of there with your hands up. I know you're in there. Now come on out or we'll come in after you. I'm going, Pete. No, wait. I'm going. Come on up, Jim. Yes. All right, you. Stand over there. Yes, sir. Here comes the other one now. Hey, he's making a break. No, he's not. Uh, well, good work, Jim. That's the best tackle I've seen all year. Come on, Ennis. Come on, get up. All right, Gene, throw the cuffs on both okay. of them. Okay. We'll all ride back to town together. Newberry and Pete Anderson were turned over to the state for prosecution and given the death penalty for the murder of a policeman. What made Special Agent Taylor decide to overtake the trailer truck loaded with new cars was that those cars were manufactured and assembled in Bay City. Special Agent Taylor therefore realized that there would be no reason for a truck fully loaded with new cars to be headed toward the city containing the factory. And thus, because the special agent exercised a keen power of observation, two dangerous killers were captured. This was no stroke of genius, but it was calm, deliberate logic 
after tireless investigation. It is true that some files are closed because a special agent gets an inspiration or a hunch, call it what you will. But it is even truer that the great majority of solutions are reached because of logic and hard work. For those two are the most deadly weapons in the arsenal of every special agent as he proceeds in the never-ending fight against crime. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. Yes, the seconds, the days, the years are speeding by. The sooner you send for the Equitable Society's fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers, the quicker you will be able to safeguard your family's future security and happiness against the hazard of your unexpected death. So don't delay. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon. Or send a postcard to the Equitable Society, care of this ABC station. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The story of a special agent's search for Santa Claus. Its subject, the Christmas season. Its title, The Return of St. Nick. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The return of St. Nick on This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story of a man who found that stealing a fortune was one thing, but getting away with it was another. So now, starring Mr. Victor Perrin, here is tonight's suspense play, Double Identity. Every time I looked at that gray-green thing squatting against the wall, I remembered how my father used to shout the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, he'd yell, and everyone in hearing distance would tremble. I could hear him like it was yesterday every time I looked at that safe and thought about the money inside. It was five o'clock Friday afternoon. Baker was at the cashier's window passing out the last of the pay envelopes. I was sitting behind my desk watching him. I knew exactly what he'd do when he finished, what he'd say. I'd watched him patiently for almost five years. Well, another day, another thousand dollars. Okay, Mr. Lockman, that's it. Count the cash in your tray and we'll lock up. Yes, sir. Lockman speaking. George Henry. Hey, what's this I hear about you backing out of the game tonight? Well, I'm afraid that's right, Henry. Well, I'm going to miss your pennies, boy. But if it can't be helped, it can't be helped. You been to the doctors? Oh, no, it's nothing that serious. Well, it's probably just the virus. A lot of it going around, you know. 
They couldn't test that new job for the Air Corps last week on account of Pete Jenkins getting it. Yeah, I heard. Well, you take care of yourself, boy. I will, Henry. Thanks. Two hundred and twenty-eight ninety, Mr. Lockman. Oh. All right, Baker. Let's put it away. Now, I'll sure be glad to get out of here tonight. Yeah, so will I. Here, you want to hold this? I'll spin my half of the combination. Go ahead. You think Mr. Kraft will ever trust either one of us with the complete combination? It's not that he doesn't trust us. He just doesn't want to put temptation in our path. Well, maybe so. But what if something happened to one of us while he was away sometime, like he is now? How'd they get it open? I don't know. Yep. Okay. Your turn. That ought to do it. <clears throat> this thing gets heavier every week. Door's not that heavy, Mr. Lockman. You just think it is because you're out of condition. It could be. Now give me the tray. Hey, you know what you ought to do? What's that? Join a gym. Work out with weights. Sure do you a lot of good. I've been going over to Stalker's myself. <clears throat> Put three inches on my biceps. Here, see? Nice, huh? Yeah, fine. Hey, why don't you come with me Monday night? Maybe I will. If you join there, I'll get a month free. Well, we'll talk about it, huh? All right, I'll remind you Monday morning. You do that. Hey, I'd better get out of here. Bertha's folks are coming over for dinner. Corned beef and cabbage? It wouldn't be Friday without it. Oh, uh, Bertha wants you to come over again real soon. I will, Baker. Good night. Good night, Mr. Lockman. Have a nice weekend. Thanks. I plan to. I knew him so well, getting him to turn away from the safe had been easy. While he'd been admiring his biceps, I'd closed it, but I hadn't spun the dial, so it was still unlocked. I reached under my desk for the briefcase, the briefcase with the initials RG, opened that heavy door again, and began helping myself to those tight little green packets of $20 bills, 50 of them, each containing 50 20s. Ten minutes later, I was walking toward the bus stop. My heart was pounding, but I was sure I didn't appear nervous. The only outward sign of how I really felt was on the leather handle of the briefcase. It was beginning to turn dark from perspiration. Then the bus came, and I was on my way to the airport. Yes, sir? Uh... I'm on flight 19 for New York. Your name, please? Gelder. Robert Gelder. Uh, do you have any baggage, Mr. Gelder? Uh, only this briefcase. I, I'll keep it with me if that's all right. Yes, sir. Now, let's see now. Your destination is Paris. Is that correct, Mr. Gelder? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, you're cleared all the way through. L.A. to New York, and you're holding a reservation on overseas flight 120 tomorrow night. Yes, I know. All right, Mr. Gelder. Your flight leaves from gate seven in five minutes. He didn't have to tell me the plane left in five minutes. I knew. I'd gone over every detail of the next 36 hours again and again. First a nonstop flight to New York. Then across the Atlantic to Paris. I'd travel for a while, see Rome, Cairo, Algiers. And I'd make friends. Yes, sir, Robert Gelder would be a man of the world. A man whose every desire would be fulfilled. The money would see to that. My, it's quiet, isn't it? I beg your pardon? The motor. They're so much quieter than I ever imagined they'd be. Oh, well, that's because the cabin's been insulated against noise. Oh, my, when I think there weren't any planes at all when I was born... Well, it, it certainly makes me feel awfully old. Mm. But then we're all growing older, aren't we, uh, Mr... Um... Gelder. Oh, Mr. Gelder. Uh, my name is Mrs. Lee. Are you from Los Angeles? No, no. Uh, Toledo. Oh, I used to know a gentleman named Gelder a long time ago. And I believe, yes, he moved to Ohio, as I recall. His first name was, um... Oh, 
dear, I can't remember. Oh, but he was a barber. I don't suppose he could have been your father. No, my father was a, a minister. Oh, my, how very nice. Mr. Gelder, why don't you put that briefcase under the seat? No. Well, no. really, the way you've been holding on to it, a person might think you have a fortune in there. <laughs> yes. All right. Now, isn't that better? You know, my boys are all in business, so I can tell when a person's overworked. They look just as drawn and tired as you do. Oh, why don't you put your head back and relax? I'll let you know when we start to land at Chicago. Chicago? Why, yes. My daughter's flying in from Dallas to meet me at the Chicago airport. We're having kind but of a... But we meet. don't land at Chicago. This is a non-stop flight to New York. Oh, you you must be mistaken, Mr. Gelder. Oh, dear, you, you've got to be a, a stewardess. I'm not mistaken. Oh, stewardess. Is uh, anything wrong, Mrs. Lee? Oh, stewardess, we do land at Chicago, don't we? Why, yes. But we can't. I mean, when I bought my ticket, they assured me this was a through flight to New York. Well, there must have been some sort of misunderstanding, Mr. Gelder. But don't worry about it. We'll only be on the ground half an hour. <laughs> What did I get so worried about? What was half an hour? I was tensing up. The old lady had noticed the briefcase. I was being too careful, too obvious. So when we landed at Chicago, I left the briefcase on the plane and went in for a cup of coffee. Uh, hand me the sugar, would you please? Huh? Logman! George Logman! What? What the devil are you doing here, George? Why, why, Mr. Kraft. What are you doing in Chicago? Well, I, I thought I'd take a little trip this weekend, Mr. Kraft. A little trip? <laughs> hey, you got some friends here? Oh, that's right, I forgot you're a bachelor. You got friends everywhere, huh? <laughs> uh, friends with skirts, uh, is that right? <laughs> Please, Mr. Kraft. Uh, yes, sir, it's you quiet ones. That's what they always say. Still water runs deep, right? <laughs> Why, George, certainly is a small world, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Now, you just drop that sir stuff, my boy. We're not in the office now. You just forget I'm the boss, huh? Hey, uh, uh, one little kicker for your coffee, huh? I got it right here. No, thanks, Mr. Kraft. Huh? You sure? Yes, sir. I, I don't care for it, really. Oh. Uh, well, you'll uh, be back in the office Monday morning, huh? Yes, sir. Good, good. I'll give you a call. Well, have fun, Logman. I watched him leave, and I wondered why I had to run into him, the one man who could ruin everything. Then I paid my check and walked out of the coffee shop toward the plane. When I was halfway through the gate, I saw him again. Fat, drunk J.T. Kraft was staggering up the ramp ahead of me, going into the plane, my plane the plane in which I'd left the $50,000. You are listening to Double Identity, tonight's presentation on radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tomorrow night on 21st Precinct, CBS Radio unfolds a tale of liquor store robberies, which, says the borough chief, must be stopped by 100%. The plan works when Captain Keogh of the 21st Precinct cooperates by supplying four of his men in plain clothes. He gets gratifying results, but is topped by one of the most surprising climaxes in his career. For a real story of the men in blue in action... Join us on most of these same stations tomorrow when you'll hear the tale of the bottle on 21st Precinct. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Victor Perrin, starring in tonight's production, Double Identity, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense.
For the first time, I wasn't sure of myself. For the first time, I was really afraid. J.T. Kraft, the one person in the world who could stop me from getting away with that money, had boarded the plane ahead of me. I stopped and tried to think. If I stayed in Chicago and let the plane go on to New York with my briefcase, I'd be taking too big a chance. I didn't have a baggage check on that case. Anybody could take it and walk off with my money. But if I boarded the plane, Kraft would see me and start thinking. Then my mind was made up for me. Mr. Gelder? Mr. Gelder, come on. We want to take off. Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm coming. I had to chance it. Kraft was drunk. Maybe I could keep him that way. Then I'd lose him as soon as we landed. Please take your seat and fasten your safety belt, Mr. Gelder. Yes. Yes, I will, stewardess. Hey, stewardess. Who are we waiting on? Somebody named Gelder? Everything's all right now, Mr. Kraft. Well, it better be because I have to be in the... Logman! <laughs> what are you doing here? Mr. Kraft? Well, here, you sit down right by me, my boy. Come on. There we go. Ah, you decided to go to New York, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Well, I... What happened, my boy? Couldn't you uh, score in Chicago? <laughs> ah, it was about time. Uh, what are you going to New York for? you got to be back in the office Monday morning, haven't you? I know. Uh, do, you, do you still have some of that, that medicine? Huh? Well, you know, that kicker stuff you were going to put in my coffee? Oh, yeah, sure, yes. <laughs> well, I thought you didn't... Uh... Here, 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 here you go. Help yourself. Thanks. Uh, yes, sir, this is a double cause for celebrating. <laughs> I sure put it over, yes, sir. You know what I did? I made a deal with the Great Lake people. Good, fat order, you know? That's why I'm living it up. Uh, how about you? Well, I... I've decided to take a few days off. Well, that's good for you, good for you. You know, it must get awful dull handling all that money, not being able to spend any of it, huh, George? <laughs> yes, sir. It sure does. Yeah. 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 Have yourself another drink. Sure, Mr. Kraft. Right after you do. But he'd had enough, and he knew it. A few minutes later, he turned his back to me and passed out. I picked up the briefcase and held it on my lap. Then I slept, too. Huh? Huh? Uh. Oh, we're done, huh? Yes, sir. New York. Uh. How do you feel, Mr. Kraft? I am. All right, I guess. <laughs> I had myself a night, didn't I? We both did. Yeah. Uh, Logman. Sir? What did you say you were doing here? Well, I'm taking a few days off. Yeah. You check with McGill before you left? Yes, sir. Mr. McGill said it was perfectly all right. Oh, oh good. Now, well, let's get our things together, shall we? It was going to work out. I was sure of it. We left the plane, walked across the apron to the gate and into the terminal. All I had to do now was shake hands with him, then duck out of sight until he stepped into a cab. As soon as he was gone, I'd confirm my reservations for Paris, then relax. I'll have a pleasant holiday, Lockman. I'll see you back at the plant, huh? Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute. That isn't your briefcase. What? Here, let me see that. I know, yeah. Take a look for yourself. Initials R.G. You you picked up somebody else's from the state. Well, I... I... Uh, come on, we'll get it straightened out over at the luggage counter. But, Mr. Kraft, this case... I mean, when I decided Stop to... Stop spluttering, Lockwood. This will only take a minute. Yes, may I help you? Well, I, I don't think... Uh, so. Just let me handle it, son. This man picked up the wrong briefcase by mistake. Oh, that right, sir? Yes, I... Mine is exactly like it, and I thought perhaps... Well, don't worry about it, sir. Happens all the time. 
Uh, now then, what's the name? Gelder. I mean, Lachman. Say, that's right, son. That's probably how they got mixed up. The steward has mentioned something about a man named Gelder back in Chicago. Ooh. Said they were waiting on him, remember? Yeah, you remember that too, don't you? Yes, sir, I, I do. Well, I... you know, I'll bet you anything that's his case. Uh, do you have any bags here for a Gelder? Well, I wouldn't know, sir, unless there's a claim check. No. Yeah. No, uh, what about Lockman? Uh, you do have a claim check, Mr. George. Uh, what do you have besides a briefcase? Well, that was all, sir. I didn't need a claim check for it. Huh? You, you only took a briefcase? Well, yes, sir. I I left in such a hurry. Yeah. That... Hey, you got Mr. Lockman's briefcase back there? Uh, no, sir. There is no briefcase here. Yeah. Looks like you're out of luck till Gelder realizes his mistake and brings your case back, George. Um, look, I'll tell you what you do. You, you leave Gelder's case here, and then you come along with me into town. Now, we'll give the clerk the name of my hotel, and when your case shows up, well, he can send it in to you. I think I'd better wait right here for it, Mr. Nonsense, Kraft. my boy. We both need some breakfast and a shower. Now, you come along with me. Alberina, uh, this is Mr. Scrab, Mr. Kraft speaking. I uh, don't want to be disturbed for anything until 5 this afternoon. That's right, 5 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, get that, will you, Lockman? It's probably room service. Yes, sir. Uh, Alberina? Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm expecting a call from the coast at that time. That's 5 o'clock, yeah. Oh, yes, I'll be here. Thank you. Oh, now that coffee smells good. Ed, did you take care of the boy? I put the tip on the check. Oh, good. good. It'll come off my tax that way. Now, go ahead and pour. Okay. Cream and sugar? No, no, black for me. Blackman, what are you up to? What do you mean? Look out, you're spilling the coffee. Now, you know what I mean. Your nerves have given you away, Lockman. But I, I really don't know, Mr. Kraft. I'm on vacation. You took a vacation in May. Besides, a man who's been getting out of payroll every week for the past five years isn't going to take a trip across country on a moment's notice with only a briefcase. Unless he's running away from something. Mr. Kraft, I assure you... You I... assure me all you want. I'm not going to believe you until I talk to McGill at five today. Until then, I'm not letting you out of my sight. But, Mr. Kraft, please, I have things to do, important things. Yes, like what? Well, uh, it, it's of a personal nature. Oh. A woman, huh? All right, Lockman, I'll give you a break. Instead of waiting for McGill to call me, I'll call him. Why? And if he knows about your being here, you can leave any time you like. Put down that phone, Mr. Kraft. What? I said put it down. Now, wait a minute, Lockman. You forced me into this. I had it all worked out so carefully, then you had to come along. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Lockman. Wait for what? Lockman. Lockman, please. Please. Wait for you to call the police crap. Please, Lockman. Please. It was exactly 12 noon. I had five hours before they discovered Kraft's body. Five hours to pick up the briefcase and disappear. Paris was out now, too risky. I'd try Canada. I took the last drink from Kraft's bottle, chased it with coffee, and then, feeling like it was all a dream, I left the hotel and took a cab for the airport. I'm sorry, Mr. Lockman. I'm afraid your, your briefcase hasn't turned up yet. Why, it's all right. The one you're holding here is mine. What? My name is really Gelder. You see, I'd never met that man I was with before, at least before he got on the plane in Chicago last night. Oh. And the way he latched onto me, you'd think I was his long-lost brother. He's making a real pest of himself, so I decided to give him a phony name. Then that was your briefcase? Yes, it's my briefcase. Now, now where is it? Why, I, I sent it back to Chicago. While he rambled on, trying to explain, saying something about how he was sure the mix-up had occurred in Chicago, how Gelder must have gotten off the plane there, I was trying to steady myself, to pull myself together. I had to act fast now. I knew that. 
I had less than five hours to reach Chicago, get the case, and disappear. The clerk was still rambling on when I left him and went over to the reservations desk. There was a plane leaving at one o'clock, arriving Chicago four hours later. I bought a ticket. We landed at five after five New York time. They'd probably discovered his body by now, which meant they'd be looking for a man named Lockman who had registered at the hotel with Mr. Kraft. Yes, sir. Uh, look, my name is Gelder, Robert Gelder. You have a briefcase here that belongs to me. Gelder? Yes. Uh, there was a mix-up over my name. And the case was returned here from New York. It's initialed. It... Oh. Well, that's it. They're on the shelf. Please let me have it. Oh, yes, sir. Came in about an hour ago. Do you have some identification, Mr. Gelder? What? Well, I'll need some identification before I can let you have it. Uh, but I, I don't have any. I, I left New York in such a hurry. No driver's license? Letter with your name on it? I haven't got anything. That's my case. Now, give it here. I'm sorry, sir. You'll have to come up with some identification or fill out a claim form. What do you mean, a, a claim form? It's company policy, sir. They'll run a check on you. Won't take over a couple of days to find out if you're who you say you are. I see. Look, here's five dollars. Oh, you Snap. can't bribe me, mister. I'd lose my job. No, no, I don't mean it to be a bribe. I want you to put in a long-distance call to the baggage clerk in the airport in New York. He'll be able to identify me. Oh, sir, I, I don't know... There's nothing wrong with that now, is there? I, I'm paying for the call. Well, uh, I guess it's okay. Tell him the man with two names is here. Two names? Lockman and Gelder. He'll remember. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Operator? Will you locate Barney? Have him come over here? Yes, sir. Right away. Thanks. The circuits to New York are busy, Mr. Gelder. Well, how long will I have to wait? Well, not long. Oh, young man, would you... Why, Mr. Gelder. What? Mrs. Lee. My goodness, is anything wrong? You're white as a sheet. Mrs. Lee, would you tell this clerk who I am? Oh, why, of course. Well, you know this man, lady? Yes, his name is Robert Gelder. He's from Toledo. And you have some identification to prove who you are? Why, certainly. There, there you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, Mr. Gelder. And here are my baggage checks, young man. Yes, ma'am. I'll get your things, too. Mrs. Lee, you'll never know how glad I am to see you. Well, it's nice seeing you again, too, Mr. Gelder. And I want you to come along to the car. The car? Oh, my daughter's plane was delayed. I've had to wait all this time, can you imagine? So I rented a car while I waited. Oh, I want you to meet my daughter, Mr. Gelder. Oh, I, I'd like to very much. Okay, Mrs. Lee, here are your bags. Oh, thank you. And here's your case, Mr. Gelder. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the delay. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Mr. Gelder, if you'll just take these two heavy things, I'll carry your briefcase. Oh, certainly, Mrs. Lee. Oh, I do hope they're not too heavy. Baggage desk. Joe, you want me? Oh, yeah, Barney, I did. I thought I had a job for your cops, but it got straightened out. The guy was trying to talk me into giving him a briefcase. Didn't he have any ID? No, and two names. Lockman and Gelder. Lockman? Joe, you say Lockman? Yeah, why? Teletype just came in from New York. Where is he now? Well, he's probably in the parking lot. Oh, my daughter's parked just ahead, Mr. Gelder. You see that convertible? Oh, yes. It's very nice. She always wants the best. She's from Texas, you know. Yes, you told me. Uh... I wonder if you'd mind giving me a ride into town. Oh, no, of course not. Are you going to be staying here a few days? Well, I'm not sure. I've got some business up in Canada, Lockman. but... Lockman! Hold it, Lockman! But, Mr. Gelder, what is it? Put your hands in the air. No! Hold it, Lockman! <clears throat> oh, Mr. Gelder! Lockman, hold it! <clears throat> oh, get hurt. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lockman. He should have stopped. Stopped? That's very funny, officer. I never even got started. So, 
Suspense. In which Mr. Victor Perrin starred in tonight's presentation of Double Identity. Next week, we bring you a dramatization of a short story by James Thurber. It is called A Friend to Alexander. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's script was written for Suspense by Alan Botzer. The music was composed by Rene Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Paula Winslow, William Conrad, Charlotte Lawrence, Paul Dubov, Joe Duval, Don Diamond, Bill Lally, and Bill Justine. The drama, the pageantry, the humor and tension of presidential conventions will be recreated for you in a special 55-minute broadcast on CBS Radio Thursday night. You'll hear great moments from the speeches of Brian, Roosevelt, Wilkie, and Wilson. You'll hear Claire Booth Luce speaking to the Republicans in 1948. And India Edwards lecturing the Democrats on manners at the 52 convention. Bob Trout will be the narrator. And you'll hear from high party officials of both major parties reminiscing about backstage scenes. Listen for this special program called Convention Fever on most of these same CBS radio stations tomorrow night. Stay tuned now for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network. Street off Istanbul's Grand Bazaar, not far from the Mosque Valid Sultan, stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by a man named Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, clouded with the smoke of Oriental tobaccos, crowded with humanity, alive with the babble of many languages. Rocky Jordan's faithful man Friday has just told Rocky, Duke, and Tony of a discovery made by his nephew, who is in the employ of a Spaniard named Chavez. At the home of Chavez, many strange things have been happening. Many trunks, boxes, and crates have arrived. Many strange men and women with Spanish, Swedish, and Swiss names, but with the accents of Central Europe, pass through the home of Chavez. Ali's nephew reports that the boxes which arrive, labeled merchandise, contain money, gold, precious stones, art objects, things of great value, which are hidden in the basement. Rocky, intrigued by the possibilities of profit in this information, shows interest in further investigation. His theory is that Mr. Chavez has established a station for escaping Nazi war criminals. When the others leave, Rocky drifts down into the cafe. And when he sees an old acquaintance, an international crook rejoicing in the name of Triplis, he walks over to his table and says, Hello, Triplis. How's tricks? Ah, Rocky, my friend. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I haven't seen you for some time. Where you been? Oh, I have been away. I... Making arrangements to enter a new business, Rocky. I... I'm now engaged in that business. No kidding. Mm -hmm. Anything legal enough to talk about? Oh, Rocky. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Uh, but a fine occupation. Very remunerative and uh, no risk. Uh, sounds good. Making any money? Rocky, you wouldn't believe it. Such money I have never seen. I, I think perhaps you would be interested. Uh, sounds very possible. What's the deal? It is not... Within the law, Rocky. Uh -huh. 
Go on. It is an operation which helps many people, uh, people who are in danger. Sounds better all the time. How about a breakdown on it? Well, I cannot talk here, Rocky. Uh, uh, tomorrow, perhaps, in your office. Uh, I uh, need a partner, Rocky. Okay. Tomorrow at noon. Be there. I, I shall be there, Rocky. It's a deal. Yeah, so long, Trevor. Do you tomorrow, then? Hey, what's that big smile on your kisser for, Rocky? I just had a talk with Trifless. He wants me for a partner. Huh? Trifless teaming up with you? Yeah. We're going to talk it over tomorrow noon in my office. And if he's mixed up in the deal I think he is, he's going to be mighty useful, Duke. He's my pigeon. Anything you can tell me about? <laughs> Guess I can tell you what I think. Oh, brother, I'm weary. Let's sit down over here and have a beer before we turn in, shall we? Sounds good to me. Oh, Akim. Draw two, will you? Yes, you Fendi. Boss, you look tired enough to call it a day. Why don't you turn in? I'm going to in just a few minutes. I just want to relax a little bit before I hit the pad. You know, Duke, I... I think our little chum, Trifless, is going to be a great help to us. Yeah. Well, it's about time Trifless was helping somebody. There's one guy that makes me sorry I didn't stay home and practice my piano lessons instead of learning to fight. Oh, Trifless is a necessary evil, Duke. If it wasn't for people like him figuring out strange ways of making a dishonest dollar, we wouldn't have much fun. Yeah, maybe you're right, Rocky. Sure, I love guys like Trifless. They think they're so clever that it's like shooting fish to outsmart them. What's the angle, boss? What's Trifless cooking up now? Well, I tell you, Duke, since Turkey has declared war on Germany, there's a lot of embarrassment in certain circles. Know what I mean? Yeah. This ain't a neutral country no more. And they're going to round up all the crowds, huh? Yeah. And the Japs. Now, the Japs are just plain out of luck because the Japs are Jap. But the Heinies are in a little better shape. If they can get their hands on a phony passport. Ah. That what Trifless is up to? Sounds like it to me. Yeah, it all adds up, Duke. The dope we've got in this house where Ollie's nephew works. The whole thing. Nobody expected Turkey to declare war. The Germans who can get out of Germany, the rankers in the Nazi party, they've been shipping their money and their valuables into Turkey for months, waiting for the day when they have to change their names and their nationalities to beat the war guilt trials and the confiscation of the piles of dough they've stolen from the little people in Germany. Great little group, Duke. Fine little gang. Yeah. We're going to take a shot at getting them, huh, Rocky? Can you think of any more pleasant work? No. Sounds like a job that could be enjoyed. You know, Duke, these guys we're fighting here in Istanbul, they're the real heels in this war. They're the guys that stood on balconies and shouted their lungs out, selling a lot of dummies on the fact that they were members of a master race. They're the guys that gave the orders to wipe out the population of towns like El Lidice in Czechoslovakia. The guys that robbed the churches and looted the towns in every country the Huns occupied. Yeah, and now they're going to try to get away with it. Yeah. Now, while Hitler chews the carpet and orders the soldiers in the square-headed civilians to die defending their homes and their fields, these big shots are taking a powder. They know they're whipped. They know they're slated for a blank wall and a firing squad. Well, some of them will get away with it, but... Uh, We'll take care of a few, huh? The next morning, Rocky Jordan awakens with a feeling that something unusual is going to happen to him this day. A premonition of something unfinished. As his mind clears, he remembers that Trifless will be at his office at noon. Trifless, the nondescript hanger-on who has suddenly blossomed into a man of wealth. As he is struggling with his shirt, trying to get his broken arm through the sleeve, the door to his quarters opens, and Ollie, his faithful servant, says... What is the matter, Rocky? I, I heard such language. Uh, I was just trying to get this uh, thing... Let me help you, Rocky. You are so impatient. 
A uh, great big boy like me having to be dressed. Rocky, you cannot get that arm through your sleeve with the bandages on it. it, it it's too big. Yeah, uh, we'll slip the sleeve then. Uh, yes, Rocky, I will. Yeah, that does it. Uh, Rocky, my nephew, uh, the, the one I told you about, uh, the one who is working as a houseboy for Senor Chavez. Yeah. Uh, he'll be here in an hour. Uh, you You said you wanted to talk with him. Yeah, that's right, I do. He is most anxious to talk with you. I hope it is not too early, Rocky. Yeah, look, hand me that brown knitted tie there, will you? Uh, yes, Rocky. Mm. Mm. Sh- shall I, I tie it for you? Yeah. My gosh, I didn't know how much I used that left arm of mine. Hadn't any idea what a handy thing it was. Mm. Your nephew uh, run across any more dope that sounds interesting? Uh, I think so. Uh, get your chin up, Rocky. Uh, I cannot see what I'm doing. Oh, sorry, old man. My my nephew reports that two more visitors have arrived at the home of Senor Chavez. They, they arrived at dawn. Uh-huh. Ah, come on, come on. That tie must be all right. Uh, they... Let's get out of here and have a talk with your smart relation. Uh, here, here's your coat. Uh, oh, Rocky. What? Uh, where's the sling? Uh, you you must have that arm in a sling. <laughs> All right, Doctor. It's over there on the dresser. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, here it is. Right. Uh, I don't know what I'd do without you, Ali. You've been more than a mother to me. <laughs> you, you're making fun of me, Rocky. I don't know whether I am or not. Hey, Rocky. Oh, for the love of Mike. Come on in, Duke. Uh, I sure get a lot of privacy around this joint. What's the matter? Am I getting fat or something? You guys figure I'm getting too much sleep? I just came up to see if you were awake, Rocky. What's he doing here? Uh, uh, Duke, uh, I came to tell Rocky that my nephew would be here soon. Uh, this joint is paved with good intentions. Oh, well. What's the occasion, Duke? Well, I've been out around already this morning. I thought maybe you'd need some help getting into your duds with that uh, broken arm. Yeah. <laughs> Ollie got me dressed all right. Where you been, Duke? Over to the British Embassy. Talking to Major Pettigrew. Oh, yeah? What do you have to say? Well, I just sort of asked him what was going on now that there's a war on. Uh, well, the people of Turkey are, are glad that we have finally declared war on the Axis. We have a fine army. One of the finest in the world. I don't think the Turkey's planning on taking any very active part in the war. What did Pettigrew think, Duke? He thinks the same as you. Hey, Ollie. Mm-hmm. How about running downstairs and having the kitchen send up a little breakfast, then? Yes. Uh-huh. You had breakfast, Duke? Yeah, I had one early, but I'm ready for another one. Uh, I had mine. Uh, shall I have two breakfasts sent up, Rocky? Yeah, that's right. Bacon and eggs, over easy. And whatever else they have. But quick. Uh, right away, Rocky. As soon as I get that done, I shall go get my nephew and bring him here. Okay, Ollie. See you later. Reason I came back, boss. Pettigrew wants to see you. He does? What about? Something's cooking. Something that he thinks you can handle better than his outfit. Well, did he give you any, uh, any hints as to just what? Well, I tell you, Rocky. While I was talking to him, I just casually mentioned the fact that you were pretty sure that there were a lot of crowds here in Istanbul, passing as neutrals. Yeah? Maybe you talked too much. I didn't tell him anything. I was just seeing if I could get him to talk enough to do us some good. Man, what'd he say? Well, he thinks you're right. In fact, he knows you're right. And he wants to work with you. Oh, that's just fine. What do I want to work with him for? What do we need him for? Well, don't jump down my throat. I didn't crack anything to him. All I know is that he's got some dope on a few people that he's suspicious of. And he's willing to let you use the information. Go talk to him yourself. Okay, I will. And look, Duke. I'll do the thinking for this outfit. Don't be getting nine feet five when you're five feet nine. I'll make the contacts and the decisions. Okay, okay, so I got out of line. I'll get back in. It's good. Unless Major Pettigrew or any other authority of any country knows about what we're doing the next few weeks, the better off we're going to be. Okay. Nobody's hurt. Come in. 
Archie, when I went downstairs, my nephew was there waiting for me. Yeah? Uh, Senor Chavez had sent him to town on an errand, and he came by here. Uh, can you see him now? Yeah, I suppose so. He, he is very excited, Rocky. He says that he has news of the utmost importance for you. These are exciting days in Istanbul and at the Café Tambourine. With Turkey in the war against the Axis nations, many things are happening. And Rocky Jordan is going to be interested in an exciting new venture. Don't miss tomorrow's dramatic episode of... A Man Named Jordan. A Man Named Jordan is written and directed by Ray Buffum and is presented every day, Monday through Friday, at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Pauline Morris at Victor Turner's office. Continental Adjustment Bureau. Oh, hi, Pauline. How are you? Just fine, thank you. Uh, Johnny, Mr. Turner asked me to get in touch with you and find out what you're working on at the moment. Why, nothing. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Well, good. Would you be interested in handling a case for us while you're there? Oh, Pauline, I'm going to New York on a vacation. Well, this shouldn't take too much time. And, Johnny, it's really one of our most important accounts. Well, how much commission can I figure on? Do you want the truth? Sure. Practically none. Oh, fine. Why does Turner foist these things on me? Oh, I guess it's my fault. I told him I thought you might do it as a favor to us. For Mr. Turner or Continental Adjustment Bureau? No. For you? Okay, what is it? Well, Wait, uh... better still, why don't you tell me about it over dinner? Say, at the Crystal Room? Oh, I'd love that. I've been wanting to go there for months. Hey, you know something? I've been waiting for an excuse to take you there for years. Eight o'clock, Pauline? Eight o'clock. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. It started quite pleasantly. Oh, no, Johnny, let's go back to the table and eat. I'm tired of dancing. Yeah, but once you sit down, you'll start talking business again. Well, of course I will. I do have a job to keep. Okay, okay. Frustrating girl. (laughs) Besides, the sooner you clear up this case, the longer you'll have for a vacation in New York. I said okay. There you are, sit down. Thank you. All right, Miss Morris, let's have the bad news. Well, the insurance company is Delaware Eastern Liability, New York office. Yes, ma'am. Their client who filed the complaint is a large dress manufacturing company. Uh, Century Styles Incorporated. Yes, ma'am. Oh, and if you can manage to pick up one of their latest creations in my size while you're there, I love you forever. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's dance. No, no, wait. The auditors found a deficit in their books, $4,285. Well, naturally, the head of the company wants a settlement. Yes, ma'am. Now, let's... And, Johnny, your biggest problem will be Mr. Elliot. Mr. Robert Elliot, who I understand is something of a personality problem. He can't be any more of a problem than I'm having with you. Now... Let's dance. Expense account item two, $28.63. Train fare and incidentals getting from Hartford to Manhattan. With me, I took all the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Century Styles with Delaware Eastern Liability and Trust. I arrived at Grand Central at 2.05 and was checked in at the New Western by 2.30. Air brisk, sky clear, weather cold. Expense account item three, 10 cents, phone call. To Robert P. Elliott, Century Styles Incorporated. 
Mr. Elliott said he would be happy to see me, so I went right over and found a four-story building that housed two floors of factory and two floors of offices. The factory was the usual crowded, noisy collection of machinery and people. The general offices overstuffed and overheated and overcrowded. Girls, girls, you must get ready. Come on, girls. Now, Look at this sand hill. Jenny, you'll just have to reduce. How can we fit you when the pins keep popping out? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I'm looking for Mr. Elliot. You are? True. Well, I'm Robert Elliot. Uh, oh, you must be Mr. Dollar. That's right. Stand by, Jenny, sweet. Please, these pins. We all suffer for our art child. Now, bear up. I'll deliver you soon. This way, Mr. Dollar, to a quiet corner. Mr. Elliot was small and wiry, wearing white warachis, green slacks, a corduroy jacket, and a flower print shirt of no identifiable color. As I followed him across the large and elegant showroom floors, I couldn't help stealing glances at the merchandise, animate and inanimate. Everything I saw was strictly high class, a group of goddesses. Mr. Elliot led me through a pair of swinging doors into an office with a carpet so thick I couldn't see my shoe tops. A desk in Russian gray sprawled in one corner. My office, Mr. Dollar. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you're here, that the insurance company heeded my call. Well, I hope we can help you straighten this matter out. Well, it's scandalous. It's truly scandalous. Five thousand dollars. Really? Uh, the complaint said four thousand two hundred and eighty-five, Mr. Elliot. Well, that's almost five thousand. Besides, I like to deal in round figures. Brett Narnby to my auditors, and they said that you are the very important investigator in insurance circles. Well, I'm flattered. Did they happen to leave a copy of their findings? Yes, they did. They most certainly did. But before I give it to you, I must explain how awful this situation is. Now, please do. Well, you've no doubt heard of Patricia's things. No, uh, no, I don't think... Uh... Uh, Patsy's things? Why, of course... Oh, you're just joking. I am Patsy's things. In fact, I made Patsy's things. It's our highest price line, you know, evening dresses. Oh, you don't say. I definitely do. Oh, the nights of thankless work that go into creating just one gown. One supreme gown for the season. Oh, I'm sure. I'll tell you, Mr. Dollar, it's... Well, it's a thankless task in one respect. It... But that's a different story. What I'm trying to say is that this loss is devastating me. I mean it. I must. I simply must have an adjustment immediately. Well, the insurance company sympathizes with you, Mr. Elliot. We'll try to adjudicate it as quickly as possible. Oh, that's comforting. That's very comforting. Oop. Rob Elliot here. In my opinion, hats are just not important this year. Yes? No, 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 no. Positively no. No advance layouts on the new line. Not until later. No, not tomorrow. No, I can't. I simply cannot. Oh. Anything wrong? Well, that's what I mean. That's what I'm trying to explain. This matter simply must be handled with all dispatch, Mr. Dollar. You see, my firm operates on a... On a... Shoestring? Well, <laughs> spider's hair would be more apt. Five thousand dollars. Mr. Dollar, that comparatively small loss is stopping me from showing my new line of patsy's... The evening dresses. Yes, yes. I must show them before month's end or I'll lose my entire opportunity for profit. So, you see, I must have compensation for the loss. I think I get the picture, Mr. Elliot. Now, there. That, 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 that was the newspaper calling, and it's terrible. They all want advanced viewings of my new line, and I simply can't afford to. I, I can't afford to pay my help to produce the models. Mr. Dollar, for three agonizing months I worked. Frantically, I drew, I cut, I stitched. And not one warp over for my creation will be exhibited, can be exhibited, unless this matter is settled. Then suppose we get down to business. Well, the business is that some ruthless brigand pussyfooted off with my company's money. Well, do you have any idea? I don't. I don't have... No, no, no. Not so much as a footprint or a strand of hair. And, Mr. Dollar, if you don't find out who it was and return my money, I'll be cremated. Professionally cremated, that is. Why, I might even have to join the Foreign Legion. Well, don't worry, Mr. Elliot. If your loss is verified, and apparently a reputable auditing firm has already done that... I can assure you that the insurance company will reimburse that loss in the time it takes to get a check made out and in the mail. Oh, good. I'll be forever grateful. Well, while you're in this mood, would you mind me having a little closer rundown on what happened? Well, the auditors simply uncovered a shortage, that's all. I know that much, Mr. Elliot. May I see their report? Yes, of course. There. Isn't that binder an atrocious green? <laughs> well, if you say so. I'd like to keep this, Mr. Elliot, to verify my report. Of course, Mr. Dollar, anything, anything at all. Just save me. I left Mr. Elliot in a fainting condition, went back to my hotel and studied the auditor's report. The obvious conclusion after an hour's reading was that the funds had been embezzled by someone in the bookkeeping department. A series of crude erasures and bad fumblings indicated that whoever had done it had been something less than expert. In fact, he or she had been almost idiotic. 
The next morning, I confirmed my own findings with Mr. Brett at the auditor's office. We uncovered the loss two days ago and advised Mr. Elliott to contact his insurance company first. Sure. Dollar, any reservations on your part? No. No, Elliott's got a legitimate loss here. I'm sending in my report today. He should be compensated in another two days. And he'll be relieved to know about that. <laughs> I know. I met him. Well, what's your next step? Well, we'll pay off Elliot so he won't have heart failure. But, of course, we'll try to make recovery. I noticed the losses were in book series F6 through G10. Yes. Did you talk... Forbes was in charge of those books. I don't see how it could possibly be anyone else. No, neither do I, Mr. Brett. May I use your phone? Oh, sure. Help yourself. I noticed all the money was stolen in the last four weeks. Yes. You'd think he'd at least have strung it out. Greedy, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Hello. District Attorney's office, please. My name's Dollar. I want to talk to someone about a warrant. Embezzling funds, grand theft. Oh, hold it, please. Forbes. What's his full name? Uh, Sheldon Thomas Forbes. Thanks. Sheldon Thomas Forbes, bookkeeper at Century Styles Incorporated. Hmm? Good. I'm on my way. Expense account item four. Three dollars. Cab fare to the offices of John L. Gregory, deputy district attorney. I explained the situation to Mr. Gregory and furnished him with the auditor's report. An hour later, I was back at Century Styles with our friend, Mr. Elliott. Well, if it has to be, it has to be. There he is. Forbes? Hmm. Third death. Sheldon Thomas Forbes was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular, not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected would swipe $5,000. Oh, Mr. Forbes? Yes? This gentleman would like to see you. I feel like Brutus. Oh, why don't you run along, Mr. Elliott? I'll handle it from here. Oh, thank you. Hello? Sheldon Forbes? Yes. My name's Dollar, Continental Adjustment Bureau. We represent Delaware Mutual Liability. They cover this firm for losses by theft and fire. Uh Uh-huh. Two days ago, the auditing firm of Brett and Iron Beach located a loss of almost $5,000 here. Naturally, the matter came to our attention. I'd like to talk to you about it. Why me? There's every indication that the loss has occurred in the particular accounts you've been handling. Uh Uh-huh. You do handle books F6 through G10? Yes. Will you step over here a minute, please? Sure. Would you look at this, please? Your figures? Yes. Your handwriting? Uh-huh. Your entries and your initials? Yes. Well? What do you have to say? Nothing. Look, you know why I'm talking to you, why I came to you first. Yes. Still nothing to say? Nothing. Well, aren't you being a little silly? Why? I stole the money. You've proved it. What am I supposed to say? You admit it. How can I deny it? Okay, we've got that much covered. Well, look, my company's interested in recovery of $4,285. Do you understand? I think so. Oh, now, Forbes, come to your senses. What do you want to do? Go to jail, or do you want to give the money back? (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Oh, no, I don't think it's funny. I doubt if you will. I've got 16 cents in my pocket. Will that help? Where's the money? I haven't got it, Mr. Dollar. You'll have to take me to jail. Shall we go? Okay. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Forbes Matter tomorrow. What makes a man steal? Everybody's tried to answer that question at one time or another. Tomorrow I'll take a crack at it. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Rob Elliott here, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Century style? I know, Mr. Elliott. How are you today? Terrible, Mr. Dollar. I feel terrible. I'm calling from the district attorney's office. You there about Sheldon Forbes? Yes. I had no idea I'd have to act. They want me to sign a complaint. Well, that's pretty usual, Mr. Elliott. Forbes admitted taking the money from your firm. He's guilty as charged. You're the injured party. They want to get on with the prosecution. Oh, dear. So you do whatever they say, Mr. Elliott. Well, will it affect my payment at all? A payment of the claim? No, not a bit. Your check's on the way to you right now. Oh, that's a relief. Now, how about you? Are you going back to Hartford? Uh, Should I thank you now? You can thank me, but I'm not going back. What? My job's just beginning. I have to recover the money for the insurance company. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter theft of nearly $5,000. Expenses continued. Item four, I think it is. $10 deposited on a rented car. First stop, Central Division Headquarters, where I was informed that Sheldon Thomas Forbes had been formally arraigned and was being held in the city jail. Second stop, an address on 56th Street. Second floor next to a dental laboratory. And on the door it said, Edward Gumby, attorney at law. And below it said, walk in. So I did. Uh, Hello out there. Mr. Gumby? Yes, sir. Come on in. It's warmer in here. Edward Gumby was standing in front of a gas heater in the inner office, which consisted of nothing more than a telephone, a desk, and a dozen law books. He was a medium-sized man, about 40 or so. A little tired, a little seedy. But he had a nice grin. Dollar? Dollar? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Gumby. You don't know me. I'm with Continental Adjustment Bureau, representing Delaware Eastern Liability in this Forbes matter. Oh, yes, 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 of course. understand you're representing Sheldon Forbes, is that right? Well, I don't know whether it is or not, Mr. Dollar. I happened to be in magistrate's court this morning when Forbes was arraigned. I took him on because he didn't have counsel and the court appointed me. I don't know whether he took me on or not. Sit down, sit down. Oh, thanks. New York is the coldest city in the world. Absolutely the coldest when it's cold. (laughs) Yeah, it sure is. Look, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, Mr. Gumby. Time? (laughs) I've got time, boy. That's all I've got. What's on your mind? Your client, mostly. He's admitted guilt. But, of course, we're interested in recovering the money he stole. $4,285. Yeah. I can't blame your company for that. Well, prosecution could probably be stopped if we made recovery. Sure, sure. I thought I'd tell you this in in case you had any influence on Forbes. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Dollar. It's very understandable. But as I say, I was court appointed. I really haven't talked to him yet. So I'll have to confess I don't have any influence with him at all yet. Struck me as a nice sort of chap. Mm -hmm. Don't quite get it myself. Probably an explanation for it. Married once, I understand, and... Widowed right after the war. He worked for Century Styles about five years. Have you talked to the police yet? No. I understand they're going to work on it today. Maybe they'll have a little more information for you about the recovery. <laughs> Probably find the money in an old sock or something like that. That's the way these things generally run, you know. I agreed with Mr. Gumby. That was truly the way these kind of cases usually ran. And I was a little surprised that afternoon when I spoke to the officers at the city jail. They reported that a complete search of Forbes' apartment and automobile unearthed nothing like the missing money. They further reported that they had found no reliable evidence of any material possessions that the money could have been spent for. My next stop, city jail. He won't tell you anything. Hmm? Kept his trap shut all the time he's been in here. As far as we've been able to find out, no previous record, no background. We're checking his prints with Washington. I don't know about this one. You know, the ex-cop wise. Know what I mean? Won't give a police officer the time of day. That means he could have been in before. Now, on the other hand, it could mean he's just scared. That too. Well... <clears throat> Uh, 
Well, now what? Take it easy, Forbes. This is Mr. Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, Forbes. Hi. See you later, Dollar. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Just give a yell when you're finished. Right. They treating you okay? Swell. What do you want? I want to talk to you. Well, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody. That's all. Now, you're acting like a baby, Forbes. You'll have to talk to somebody. Don't lecture me, Mr. Insurance Investigator. I've had all the lectures I want from myself. I don't know why you're here. I, I thought we settled our business yesterday. The whole thing's just a technicality. I've been arraigned. I've got my confession. I'll go into a court, and they'll give me the business. Well, what are you doing in here, anyway? It's a swell day to be outside. Yeah, it is. Want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Well, why are you here? To help you out of this mess, if you'll let me. <laughs> That's funny. Not a bit. Why should you want to help me? Well, it's not because I have any use for you, mister. You're nothing to me but a guy who stole a pile of money. My job is to get it back. $4,285. Oh, that. Yes, that. Now, how about it, Forbes? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? That, that I'll go to prison? That's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. Oh, it's too bad about your insurance company. No, it's too bad about you. You're being foolish. A hold or partial recovery can have a great deal to do with what happens to you from now on. Three years is the minimum sentence, you know. Twelve years maximum. Now, is it worth it? Sure. Sure, it's worth it. And I don't want to be foolish anymore. But I have been foolish. I took it and I spent it. Every dime of it. There's no way to pay it back. What did you spend it on? It uh, doesn't make any difference. They make a lot of difference. You can redeem it, turn it back. Oh, no, I can't. Why did you take the money? All right, look, your salary's close to 100 a week. You're single. Wasn't that enough to live on? Why don't you get out of here? I don't have anything to tell you. Ever been in trouble before? Huh? Under another name in another state? No, They no. consider backgrounds like that when a man comes up to be sentenced. Forbes, this is your first offense. I know, I know. Are you trying to shield someone? Why don't you go away? Have you been trying the market? Did you gamble? No, no. Just, just leave me alone. I won't tell you a thing, If Dollar. you bought something with it or gave it to someone, if it can be recovered in some part... Oh, no, I tell you. Just go away and leave me alone. I'd like to. Believe me, I would. You're a thief, Forbes, and you're going to get what's coming to you, but I can't leave you alone. Listen. No, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be very honest with you. Eastern Delaware wrote a comprehensive policy on century styles promising to indemnify them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. In case you didn't know, Forbes, an insurance company won't take the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell. Sitting in a jail cell feeling sorry for himself where there's cash to be recovered. Now, you swiped it within the last month. You have something to show for it somewhere, somehow. Whatever you spend it on, or whoever you spend it on, remember that that money is the same as stolen property. A car, a diamond ring, or something. Now, if you give it to someone or spend it, when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable, and we mean to redeem it. All right, now, what do you have to say? This won't do you any good. Don't, don't try to bulldoze me. I'm no punk caught crawling into a drugstore window late at night. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk to you about this. You or anybody else. I can't make it any clearer than that, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the lousy money. I've admitted that. I did a bad job of it. You caught me. I confessed. And you've got me. Now, what more is there? That's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Forbes. Go away. Just go away. On my way out, I saw his attorney, Edward Gumby, on his way in to see Forbes. I waited around the sergeant's desk. Accidentally, on purpose, I glanced at the admitted visitor's register... Only two people had contacted Forbes since his arrest, Gumby and myself. That struck me as odd. I glanced at his folder named No Close Relatives, named no one, in fact. 
I was thinking about that when Gumby came out from his visit. Gumby looked worn out. Uh, hiya. Hi. How'd you do? Not so good. Hey, tell me something. He asked you to contact a girl or anyone? Nope. I don't think he has a girl. I don't think he has anybody. You want some coffee? Yeah, good idea. We slushed across the street and found a diner. Expense account item five, 42 cents. Coffee and sinkers for Ed Gumby and myself. I think you're going to strike out, Dollar. I already have. And I think I have too. Huh? You know what I've been talking to him about in there all this time? The same thing as you, restitution. But he won't open his mouth about it. He did say one thing, though. He wants me to waive a jury trial and go up for sentencing. What? Yeah. Plead guilty and take it. He's sure to get at least three years. What can I do? Yeah. Got any ideas? Oh, I've got a lot of ideas, Dollar, and all of them make me sick inside. That boy's not a criminal. He took that money because he was desperate about something. You know that from the awkward way he took it. He spent it on something and he won't talk about it. But now he's about to ruin his whole life, in spite of what you or I or anybody else tries to do for him. All he has to do is give back the money or promise restitution or call up a friend and borrow it. With his clean background, the court had listened to a mercy plea. Dollar, you know what Forbes is? What? He's something I call a, a calendar job. A calendar job? Yeah. 33 years old. Now, now think about that. Born with one war just ended. Raised in a depression and then bangled. Another war. You might say the first 25 years of his life, nothing but war and depression. Or the effects thereof. A calendar job. <sighs> Apparently it's what he wants. But, Mr. Dollar, I'm going to hate to see him go to prison. You know something, Mr. Gumby? So am I. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a sudden twist in the case that throws all the usual theories right out the window. The unexpected. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ed Gumby, Mr. Dollar. Attorney for Sheldon Forbes. Oh, hello, Mr. Gumby. How are you? Oh, I don't know. The hearing's been set for 2.30 this afternoon. Okay, I'll be there. No need to, particularly. As I told you yesterday, he requested me to waive trial and plead guilty. Well, won't he be sentenced today? No, this is just a preliminary hearing. He'll probably be sentenced before the week's out, though. The court will simply consider the waiver and inform him of his rights today. Oh. Anything I can do? No, I don't think so. I'm going to try to talk to him again and get him to reconsider the waiver. I doubt if I'll have much luck, but I'll try. All he has to do is return the money he stole. Well, buck up, Mr. Gumby. If he won't return it, maybe someone else will. Hmm? What do you mean? 
I'm going to try and find out what he did with it. My company wants it back, sure. But we also want Forbes to have a fair chance. You're pretty decent, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Embezzlement and a very frustrating case. Expense account continued. Item 6, $3.50, lunch. For myself and a Mr. Arnold Haven, head of the accounting department for Century Styles Incorporated. Mr. Haven, a tall, balding man in a dark suit, had ulcers. His poached egg and dry toast didn't interest him too much. Uh, What's going to happen to Forbes? Oh, I don't know, Mr. Haven. That depends on several things. Right now, I have to tell you that it looks like he'll go to prison. Worse than that, it looks like he wants to go to prison. He's waived trial. Prison. That's too bad. Too bad. I always liked Sheldon Forbes. You, uh, you hired him, did you, Mr. Haven? Yes, I hired him. He was a good man right from the start. He did his job, and he did it well. I never had a complaint against Forbes. Why do you suppose he stole the money? You've got me, Mr. Dollar. We paid him the going rate. That's a good salary for accountants. He seemed happy enough with it. When he knew he was in line for substantial raises. Uh Uh-huh. I could understand it, in a way, if he had a family and heavy responsibility... Or if he played the market, or if he gambled. But Forbes, he just baffles me. Yeah, it baffles me, too. Huh? Oh, yes, of course. Well, the people around the office, they're, they're pretty upset about this. Any particular people, Mr. Haven? Everybody. But anyone in particular? A girl, for instance. Oh, oh a girl, yes, I see. Well, no. Did he go out with any girl in your office? No, no, most of them are married. No, at least as far as I know, Forbes didn't go with any of the girls there. He kept to himself. Oh, he might have lunched with one or the other now and then, but... No, no, he more or less kept to himself. Uh Uh-huh. Well, the reason I asked you, Mr. Haven, is that what little I've been able to find out about his personal life isn't very helpful. My company wants the money back. We're willing to give him a fair break if we can get it back. He's pretty stubborn about cooperating. Yes, we know about that, Mr. Dollar. But how can we give him a break if he doesn't want us to? And we can't find out anything about him. Look, if there's anything you can think of, any any reason he might have had for taking the money... And I've racked my brain. I can't think of any reason. I... Oh. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute. I did notice a change coming Forbes. It was about a month or six weeks ago. Oh, it was nothing, really. It was just, a, I guess, an anxiety about him. Well, he took all the money within the last four weeks. Would that correspond? Roughly, yes. Well, that's a start. I hope. I returned to the accounting offices of Century Styles with Mr. Haven and spent two hours questioning different members of his staff regarding Sheldon Forbes. His habits and his personality were pretty much the same as Haven himself had described them. Expense account item seven, four dollars, gasoline. I put a tank full of gas in my rented car and went over to an apartment on 59th Street where Sheldon Forbes had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Kanopka was the manager. Yes, what is, please? You're Mrs. Kanopka? Yes. What do you want, mister? I understand Mr. Sheldon Forbes lives here, is that right? Oh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear he still monies. Bad. He, he not in, uh, in uh, jail, I think. Yes, I know about that, Mrs. Kanopka. I'm from the insurance company, and we're involved in this case. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. I wonder if you'd help me. Well, I fix dinner for my husband. He's come home from work. It so... won't take long. Uh, what I do? Well, I, I want to know about Sheldon Forbes. What? The works, Mrs. Kanopka. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? He always pay his rent. 
You are policeman? An insurance investigator. Uh, please, uh, sometime else. Maybe you speak to my husband. He speak much better than me. But it's important now. I talk to Mr. Forbes on telephone. He called me from jail. He say I no have to answer any questions. No, no, you don't have to answer any questions, Mrs. Kanapka. But I'd sure appreciate it if you would. My husband home pretty soon. You ask him. You can help him, possibly. Now, would you like to help him in this trouble? All right, mister. But how I know these things you ask about the uh, men who live here? Well, well, look, how about his friends? Who visited him? I, I cannot say. No visitor. Was he a good tenant? No trouble. Like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor. Mr. O'Sullivan always drunk. Called police twice. Mr. Forbes, no drink whiskey. Uh Uh-huh. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Sure. He had a girlfriend, didn't he? Oh, I think you mistake. I know I ever see girlfriend here. All right. How long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe. Ever since he moved in here to this place. But no girl? No. Well, how'd he spend his time? Work. He worked very hard. No, I mean, besides working at the office, how else did Forbes spend his time? I... Oh, he poor feller, that one. Huh? Sure, he steals money, but he poor feller just the same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Mr. Forbes, he quiet and, and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet and think. He does all time think. No whiskey, no girls. Oh, he paints sometime, listen to music, think. Oh, my husband, Dina Byrne, please, you go Well, uh, just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment if I can. No, no matter. Here. You bring back key, please. Sure. Thank you, Mrs. Kanopka. The apartment Sheldon Forbes called home was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court onto another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was threadbare and dusty. A small ironing board and iron attested to the fact that Sheldon Forbes laundered his own shirts. Other small evidences of frugality were about the premises. A hot plate and a can of souring cream. Two suits of clothes, neatly brushed and pressed, but inexpensive. The record player and a collection of a half a dozen good albums were the only sign of material accomplishment. The painting materials, easel, canvas, and oils were also inexpensive. No liquor, no jewelry, no expensive clothes. Nothing that cost $4,285 or anything like it. Oh. Here's your key, Mrs. Kanopka. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I thank you. Well... What do you think? I think he's had a very lonely life here. Oh, Doc. Yes. Lonely is the word. Lonely. Um, oh, wait. Has he got a car? In back through alley. Thanks. It was a Ford. Vintage of 1946. Tightly locked up. The paint was scaling away, the tires worn down, the mileage 77,000 miles. He certainly hadn't blown the money on a fancy car. Now I felt completely frustrated. Expense account item 8, 79 cents, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 79er, a place I learned where Sheldon Forbes frequently took his evening meal. The restaurant manager, a man named Alexander Dupolis, remembered Forbes and he liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street also remembered him as the young man who bought a roll there every night. Probably the roll to go with a lonely cup of coffee in his room the next morning. She liked him, too. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Sheldon Forbes that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, he wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. I dropped in at the city jail about 7.30, and I was surprised to find lawyer Edward Gumby sitting on a bench, briefcase in hand. Dollar? Hello, Mr. Gumby. Nothing new, huh? Well, that's the way it goes, I guess. We had some action today. Oh? Yeah. The hearing was this afternoon. Man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against Forbes and make the charges. Uh-huh. 
I spent the whole time pleading with Forbes not to go ahead with the waiver. Did I miss anything? No, he wouldn't open up at all. Just said he'd spent the money. I couldn't talk him out of the waiver, so it went through. When will he be sentenced? They set the date for Friday. I don't know whether they'll get around to it or not. I'd like to talk to him again. Has he been moved yet? No. I thought he'd be transferred to the sheriff's office. Well, ordinarily he would, but since he waived trial, they announced bail. It's proper procedure in cases like this. Gives him a couple of days to straighten out his affairs. What? Somebody bailed him out? I did. Oh. Has he left yet? Uh Uh-uh. Won't get out till late. That's when the shift changes. Think it's worth trying to see him? Yeah. I think I'll stick around, Mr. Gumby. I gotta find out something about this case. An hour later, when Sheldon Forbes emerged from the doorway and turned right, I was following him. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one and stayed right with him. When he got out at the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door, I was standing by the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came back out, hailed a cab, once more I followed. This time, I followed him to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. Forbes? Forbes? Hey, Forbes, it's me, Johnny Dollar. I want to talk to you. It took me a few seconds to understand what it was. I got a couple of whiffs of it coming from under his door. Forbes! The room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes, and Sheldon Forbes was stretched down on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. When I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a switch in the case that starts a real chase and a race against time. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the police operator. Are you the party who called for an ambulance? Yes, didn't you get it? It's on the way, sir. I'm calling to verify the circumstances. Attempted suicide by gas. Yes, sir, we have that. The victim's name... Sheldon Forbes, F-O-R-B-E-S. Forbes? And your connection, sir? Relative, perhaps? No, no relation. Insurance investigator. I just found him. Will you please remain there until the officers arrive? Are you kidding? I asked you, but... Oh. Oh, well, thank you very much. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. Sheldon Forbes pleaded guilty to a $4,285 embezzling charge. He waived jury trial and was awaiting sentence when he was bailed out of jail, went home, and turned on the gas. Thirty seconds after I dragged him from the apartment, I called the police emergency squad. In a matter of minutes, they arrived, and a couple of interns were working on Forbes with a pull motor in that dingy, dirty, badly lighted hallway. There was no telling how much gas Forbes had breathed in, or for how long a period after he went into his apartment the gas jet had been open. Hand me that hypo, Al. Thanks. Swab. Okay. He, uh... He alive? Barely. You the fellow who found him, mister? Yeah. Hard to say what can happen on these kind. That shot I just gave him should produce some reaction. Hmm? This your place? His. You know who he is? His name's Sheldon Forbes. Nice looking guy. Al, I'll I'll need that. Yeah, thanks. I think we're getting somewhere now. Hey, look, can I help? No. Al, you better hand me one of those, too. I'm going to be pretty sick if. Oh, hey, good. He's, He's catching on. Yeah. Let's have a little increase, Al. Up it just a little. Okay, hold it there. The intern and his assistant worked quietly and methodically. There was nothing I could do but stand and watch. After about a half an hour, the color of Forbes' skin seemed to me a little more close to normal. His eyes were still closed, though, and he showed no signs of movement. I waited. Okay, Al. You can kill the pull motor. Uh, Getting some pulse now. Respiration, too. Will he make it? Uh, It depends, mister. If he has any kind of heart condition, it'll be tough. We can tell more when we get him into a hospital. Nothing more we can do for him here. Okay, Al. Have the boys load him up. Let's get out of here. Uh, now, mister, you say he's a friend of yours? Just someone I knew. He's got you to thank, in case he makes it. Where'll he be? We'll take him over to Bellevue. All attempted suicides get over there. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Any idea when that'll be? No telling. Better phone in first. Police will want to talk to you. You give identification to headquarters when you called in? Yeah. Yeah, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. My job is to handle them, but I wonder why they do it. Oh, this guy's got a problem. He's out on bail, goes into court Friday to be sentenced. Embezzling charge. Oh. Seemed like a nice guy to look at. I think he probably is a nice guy. Well, I thought you said he was an embezzler. I did. Well, be sure and call in. Yeah, sure, doctor. Thanks. Good night. The uniformed officers outside the apartment house questioned me thoroughly regarding the circumstances of the attempted suicide. I told them what had occurred and gave them my business address for reference. They asked me to ride over to the station with them and verify the facts. I did. All of that took about two hours. When I was finished, I put in a call to Bellevue. No change in Sheldon Forbes' condition. Expense account item nine, two eighty, one theater ticket. That's what it cost me to see the last fifteen minutes of a fairly bad musical play at the Empress Theater. When it was over, I walked around to the stage entrance. Eh, didn't quite get that, mister. Dollar. Dollar? Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, Uh uh-huh. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight, a man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. A lot of people talk to me here. That's my job, talking to them. One man in particular. His name is Sheldon Forbes. Uh, I don't remember nobody named Forbes. Well, maybe he didn't give his name. He was a tall man, about my size, 30 or so, dark hair, clean cut. Wore a tweed suit. Mm -hmm. Uh, Beats me. 
Did he come here to see somebody in the show? Is that it? He might have. I don't know. Well, how do you know he came here? I followed him. I saw him. Huh? It's a business. My business. I'm an investigator. Oh. oh. Wait now. Did he have a hat on tonight? No, no, he didn't. A uh, short haircut? Yeah, do you remember him? Sure, sure. What's he done? Struck me as a nice young fella. He's been around here a lot of times. Sheldon Forbes, yeah, yeah. I didn't recognize the name at first. Would you mind telling me why he comes around here? Comes here to see Betsy Walker. One of the girls in the show. Betsy Walker, is she his girlfriend? No, don't think so. Uh, it's like this. He comes here asking to see her, and she never sees him. You get it? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, who is she? Oh, she sings here. Dances a little. Pretty girl. Have you ever seen her with Forbes? Well, I, I can't say. I guess not. Is she still here? Huh? Betsy Walker, is she still here? I'd like to talk to her. Well, she wouldn't be here this late. She finishes her bit in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? No. Oh, no. No, no. I'm sorry, boy. I can't tell you that. All right. Well, where can I phone her? Can't tell you that either. Uh, now, uh... Why don't you drop around tomorrow? It's important tonight. Hey, look, would you do me a favor? Depends. What is it? Would you telephone Betsy Walker? Tell her my business and ask her if she'll see me. Well, suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Take a chair there. I'll see what I can do for you. The doorman did all right. Expense account, item 10, $2.65, cab fare. I gave up my rented car and had the cab driver find the address Betty Walker had given. It was a rather nice apartment in a rather nice part of town. and was almost one in the morning when I got there. She met me at the door, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown with cold cream on her face. Miss Walker? Uh, you must be Mr. Dollar. Yes. Uh, now, just wait a minute. Do you mind if I see some kind of identification or something like that? Oh, no, no. Here you are. Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, <laughs> you'd be surprised at some of the things some men will try. Come in, please. Thank you. I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the doorman at the theater. Yes. I didn't know quite what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Uh, yes, and I'd appreciate you letting me see you tonight, Miss Walker. Sit down. Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. Uh, Frank mentioned something about Forbes. You're here because of him? Yes, Miss Walker. I understand that you know Forbes. No, uh, not exactly, that is. Uh, there's some reservation in the way you say that, Miss Walker. You know his name. Yes, I, I know the name. Uh, can I ask you what this is all about? Routine investigation. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Sheldon Forbes? That's what I'd like you to tell me. Well, first about my name. Forbes was at the theater earlier tonight asking for you. I understand he's been around there quite a bit. Yes. I really don't know how to tell you this, Mr. Dollar. I've only seen that man once in my life, honestly. He's... Oh, he's really quite impossible. I just... Oh, dear, this is so embarrassing to try to explain this. Maybe I can save you some embarrassment, then, if you'll answer one question. Sure, why not? Did Sheldon Forbes ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, uh, that cigarette box on the table there. And the lighter to go with it. Hmm. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? Yeah, very. Also expensive. What else? Well, um, let me think. Um, oh, no, no, that wasn't from him. Oh, uh, that was the lamp over there. Mm Mm-hmm. And a first stole. May I see it? I'm afraid I gave that away. You did? I gave it to my kid sister who was visiting me last week. I already had one. Oh, I see. What else did he give you? I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night for the last month. You only saw him once and he gave you all these gifts? Oh, dear, I, I know how that must sound. I just... Look, it started a month or so, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Sheldon Forbes. So? 
Well, I'd never heard of anybody named Sheldon Forbes, and I just tore the card up. But every night after that, I kept getting orchid and the card. And then the gift started to come. The cigarette box first. That's when I saw him. Uh-huh. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. But the gift still kept coming. Flowers, invitations. I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, and I didn't know where to send them. Some I gave away, and some I've kept. I didn't want his gift. He was nice, but I... Well, I just didn't want anything to do with him. When I did meet him, he was so different than what I had imagined. I mean, well... Gee, I've had my share of stage door Johnny's, but this man was... Well, he just couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. He told you that? He didn't have to. Those gifts... Well, he didn't have money, Miss Walker. He worked for $82 a week as a bookkeeper. You must be mistaken. I'm afraid not. He stole the money to buy you all these things. Well, for heaven's sake. For heaven's sakes, and you caught him? Yeah. Forbes tried to commit suicide earlier this evening. Suicide? Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He's refused all along to tell anybody what he did with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but it's crazy. We had nothing. He's just a name to me. He means nothing to me. Yeah. But apparently you mean something to him. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Forbes matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, proof that $4,285 worth of unrequited love can spell three years of prison. But sometimes there's an angle. In this case, a rather startling one. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Betsy Walker, Mr. Dollar. I'm up and around. Yes, thanks for calling. Have any time this morning? I think so. If possible, I'd like to come over to your apartment again and take an inventory of the gifts that Sheldon Forbes sent you. That'll be all right, sure. About an hour? Sure. Uh, I couldn't sleep much last night thinking about all this. I mean... He stole that money because of me. You mustn't feel that way, Miss Walker. He knew what he was doing. You had no part in the theft. I have the gifts. Well, we may have to take those away from you. I don't mind that. I... You said he tried suicide. How is he this morning? I just talked to the hospital. He's going to be all right. But he has to go to prison? Yes. (sighs) Funny world, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Forbes matter. 
More expenses. Items 11 to 16. $78.40, cab fares, meals, accounting services, legal services, cab fares, and more cab fares. I made a comprehensive inventory at Betsy Walker's apartment and spent the rest of the day tracking down the places where the items had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Total, $2,780 worth of gifts, bought with stolen money. Betsy Walker also told me that Sheldon Forbes had made appointments to meet her at various times at very expensive restaurants in New York. She had never once kept any of these appointments, but a check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that Forbes had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills came to $835. The florist bill, $670. Total amount spent, $4,285. Total amount stolen, $4,285. Century Styles Incorporated footed the bill in his unsuccessful courtship of Betsy Walker. Hello. Hi. Remember me, Forbes? Sure, insurance man. Well, what now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Same reason you'd save a man who was dying. Huh. You know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions you wouldn't answer. I met Betsy Walker. What? My job, Forbes. I had to. How did you know about her? I followed you night before last. When you got out on bail, I saw you go to the theater. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You have no right to involve her in any of this. Why didn't you think of that a month or so ago? It's the company's money you've been spending on her. I had every right, as unpleasant as it is. I suppose she knows all about me now. That's right, all. Boy, I sure must look like the prize sucker of all time. (laughs) Just handed her a laugh. She didn't think it was one bit funny. And Forbes, I don't think it's funny either. Then what are you standing here for, lording it over me? I'm not doing that at all. I'm just here to let you know how things are at the moment. All right. How are things? Well, first off, we took back all the gifts you gave her. Dirty scum. Don't get mad at me, Forbes. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money and try to impress her. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me, but it means something to my insurance company. They still want it back. And they'll get as much back as they can. Well, well, good for that. What do you want now? Your signature. Hmm? I think I trace most of it down. You want to look this over? Go ahead. Uh, Those figures about right? I suppose so. I didn't keep track. Approximately? I suppose so. You're pretty thorough, aren't you? We have to be. Will you sign this? No. It'll help to clear up our bookwork a little. What difference does it make now? We've got you cold. Okay. What difference does it make? Give me. Okay, thanks. It's all it means to you, isn't it? Hmm? Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen, Forbes. Remember that. You wouldn't let me forget it. No, I wouldn't. You did the dumbest thing in the world. You stole nearly $5,000 trying to make an impression on a girl who didn't want to have a thing to do with you. You went about it wrong from top to bottom. You've acted like the great stone face ever since you've been found out. You wouldn't bother telling me about it. I had to go out and find out myself. Off the record, Forbes, what'd you do? See her on the stage one night? No, at the office. Office? Your office? No, not exactly. Ellie was having a showing for some buyers from the West Coast one day a few weeks ago. For those kind of showings, he hires models from the agency. Betsy's listed with one of the agencies. You know, she acts and sings and models. Oh, sure. Well, I happened to be upstairs when the showing was going on. A lot of publicity people there taking pictures and so on. And I saw her. She was wearing a black... A black dress, and her hair was soft... She's got a smile like all the sun risings. Sound silly? Not at all. It's just that I never in all my life saw anyone like it before. Yeah. I don't know how it is with other guys, but she was for me from then on. I I couldn't get her out of my mind. I found out her name, and then I found out she worked in that show at the Empress Theater. Yeah? All I had was her name. I, I didn't know how to go about meeting her. I... I just didn't know. You figured a little money might attract it to you. I've heard that's the best way to do it. That's one way. Not the best way, kid. Probably not. The best way I could think of. 
What did you think about taking the money? I thought I'd be able to stick it back. I guess I really didn't think much beyond just meeting her. Having her look at me the way I... I wanted her to look at me. (laughs) What? It was the wrong way to go about it, sure. But then did you ever think of my alternative? Hmm? I thought of it. I pictured myself knocking on a door one night, and I could see her answering it. I'm Shelley Forbes, Betsy, I'd say. Clothes don't make the man, I'd say, while she sort of took in my tweed suit and the only coat I've got to my name. Listen, I'd say, I got an 8 by 10 apartment over on 59th Street. The halls always smell like cabbage, but I'm a heck of a fine guy. And I drive a 1946 Ford that misses a little, but it's good enough for us. Then I'd say, why don't you toss on your mink, and we'll go over to my dump, and we'll have a bottle of beer, and I'll tell you how much I love you. How about that? (laughs) Some alternative, huh? She makes more money in an hour than I make in a week. I couldn't even afford to keep her in cigarettes. Lord, I... I wanted her like nothing in my whole life. She might have taken you up on it, Forbes, if you'd put it that way. Yeah? What makes you think so? She wasn't impressed by any money or any gifts. More than that, I met her. She's a pretty nice girl. Yeah. Up until the time I talked with Sheldon Forbes in the hospital, I'd always had my doubts about love happening at first sight. After my talk with him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering... If I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Expense account item 17, $4.90. I sent a wire to my home office telling them that the recovery would be in the amount of something like $2,500, obtainable on the redeemable gift items recovered. After that, I went back to my hotel. I was surprised to find Betsy Walker waiting in the lobby. Dollar. Why, hello. I was afraid you might leave town. I wanted to talk to you. Sure, you just caught me. I was going upstairs and pack. What is it? Could we have a drink or something? Sure. Expense account item 18, two dollars, two drinks. For Betsy Walker and myself at the hotel bar. It was midday and there wasn't much action. She sat across from me, ordered an old-fashioned and asked for a cigarette. Sure. What'll happen to him? Forbes? Yes. Oh, he'll be sentenced Monday. They canceled the Friday scheduling because he was in the hospital. He'll go to prison? Yes. Have you seen him since he tried to kill himself? Just left him. I guess he feels awful. Yeah. I told you I haven't been able to sleep thinking about all this. Well, about him, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. Would he have to go to prison even if all the money was returned? Only half of it's redeemable, and the rest, florist bills, restaurants, and so on, just gone. How much does it come to, Mr. Dollar? Uh, short about 2000 roughly. If, well, if you had that money, what would happen to him? Oh, it'd be up to the court. I, I'd say he'd have a good chance of getting off if he changed his plea. Could I get him to change his plea? <laughs> I think you could get him to do anything. I want to pay it. You what? I want to pay that other 2000 for him and get him to change his plea. I'll make up the whole thing. Hey, now, look, Miss Walker, I, I know your motives might be the best, but you aren't responsible in any way for this man's actions. He stole money because of me. He tried suicide because of me. And now he's going to prison because of me. But you had nothing to do with it, no part of it. You may think I'm 20. actually went out on a limb for a girl he loved. I'm the girl, and he's the man. You're serious. I probably won't remember his name a year from now, but that poor, stupid, wonderful dumbbell, he doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice girl somewhere. I want to help him get out of this trouble. Can I? Betsy, I... After all, he's given me something... Call it faith in mankind again, if you like. What's the kiss for? 
What you just gave me, Betsy. Faith. Expense account item 19, $48, hotel. Item 20, $37, meals. 21, $15, miscellaneous. 22, same as item 1, $28.63, fare back to Hartford. Total cost of investigation, $363.51. Remarks? She got Forbes to change his plea. She paid back the additional money. He comes to trial next week. He might get a suspended sentence. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a trip south of the border where the flashing eyes of a dark-haired senorita spells plenty of, well, believe me, romance and trouble can go hand in hand. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Sandra Gould, Jack Edwards, Herb Ellis, James McCallion, Parley Bear, John Stevenson, Howard McNair, Bob Bruce, and Junius Matthews. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time for that weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Well, have you quite recovered from your holiday festivities? I think so, my boy. And I was particularly flattered by the number of friends who were kind enough to remember a rather elderly and lonely doctor at this time of year. Well, as long as you keep telling those swell Sherlock Holmes stories, you'll never be lonely, Dr. Watson. Then I'd better get on with tonight's new adventure. <laughs> It involved us in one of the most shocking scandals of the 19th century. A scandal that, had it ever emerged in the light of day, might easily have brought ruin and disgrace to one of the most famous men who ever came a member of the House of Lords. Well, this one I've got to hear. But first I have a message for our listeners. Today, more than ever before, I think men realize how important it is to keep their hair neatly groomed. And men, may I ask you this about the preparation you use... Does it give your hair that old-fashioned, greasy, patent leather look? When you run your hand back over your hair, does your hair feel greasy, sticky, or dirty? Does grease come off on your hand or hat band? If it does, then be smart, men. Change at once to Kremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why Kremel keeps your hair in place longer with such a handsome, well-groomed look. When you use Kremel, you can run your hand back over your hair, and men, it's really a pleasure. No grease comes off on your hand. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the way Kremel always looks and feels so clean on your hair and scalp. Let it keep your hair looking handsome at all times. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber's. 
K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the 19th century scandal in which you and the great Sherlock Holmes became involved? Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in the very early days of the great man's career. World acclaim and handsome fees were some years ahead of him. And in those times, we spent many long evenings discussing whether a decent living could be obtained by the practice of criminal detection. On the day that this particular story began, we just finished our breakfast. Holmes, a curved pipe clenched between his teeth, was scanning the personal columns of the morning paper. I can almost hear him now, as he said... Demi Watson... The agony column of the Times is more than usually barren this morning. Are you looking for a possible client, Holmes? Naturally. Since we already owe Mrs. Hudson for two months' rent here, and our doorbell has been frighteningly silent during that period, I must see what possible service I might render these unhappy correspondents. Well, I glanced over the column, but I couldn't see anything very promising. No, Watson. It's a rag bag of bizarre happenings. What a chorus of groans, cries, and bleatings. One skims through them, and what does one glean? Lady with a black bow at the Prince's Skating Club wishes to meet gentleman who was kind enough to... That we may ignore, I think. Yes, she doesn't sound as though she needs your services. Oh, well, here's mine. a item. <laughs> Surely Jimmy will not break his mother's heart. Hmm. That appears to be irrelevant. If the lady who fainted on the top deck of the Brixton bus... She doesn't interest me either, Watson. No, probably anyone else who wasn't on that bus. Every day my heart longs for... Ah, bleat, Watson. All this twaddle is unmitigated bleat. It's very disheartening, Holmes. You haven't had a case for over two weeks. Yes. Sometimes I think I chose the wrong profession. What do the public, the great unobservant public, who can hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Holmes, uh, come over here to the window. What's wrong, Watson? Uh, look at that man walking down the street. He's looking at the numbers of the houses. Let's hope 221B is the number he's searching for. What do you make of him, Watson? Well, let me see. What do I make of him? Well, I uh, say that he is a foreigner... Yes, foreigner, look at those flashy clothes and his pointed moustache. Oh, don't be misled by externals, old chap. Observe the steady, controlled gait. No trace of the light agility of the Latins or the military heaviness of the German. No, Watson. I think an English gait in foreign attire would suggest an expatriate Englishman, only just returned from a stay abroad. He is coming here, Holmes. Meet him on the stairs, Watson. It'll save Mrs. Hudson a trip. Yes, so that's all. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson, uh, how do you do, sir? How do you do? Uh, would you please come along up? That's right, sir. Straight up here. Uh, in, in here, sir. Which of you fellows is Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir. And your name is... Uh... Tremaine. Reginald Tremaine. I'm Dr. Watson. Uh, sit down, won't you, Mr. Tremaine? My business won't take long. Holmes, I need protection. And I'm prepared to pay for it. Protection from what? My life's been threatened. The police wouldn't do a thing for me, so I've come to you. I'm told you detective fellows will do anything for money. Oh, really? Then you've been misinformed, sir. My friend... Your here, friend well... is very interested in Mr. Tremaine's problem, Watson. Mm -hmm. Pray continue, sir. Holmes, I want you to warn my cousin. Tell him you'll get nowhere by threatening me. Frighten the wits out of him if you can. I'll give you 20 pounds uh, and another 20 if I need to again. And uh, who is your threatening cousin? Lord Darlington. Oh, really? Charming fellow. I He's a him... scoundrel. Oh, but his title impressed Scotland Yard. That's why they wouldn't help me. Well, even a title can be vulnerable. A public scandal would shake him. And that's what is going to happen if he threatens me any more. And you can tell him so from me, Holmes. I've always heard of Lord Darlington as the very model of an English aristocrat. Why should he threaten you, Mr. Tremaine? That's none of your business. Oh, my soul, none of your, your job is to see that he doesn't carry out his threat of thrashing me with an inch of my life. Very well. For 20 pounds, I shall warn Lord Darlington that I stand between you and a thrashing. The fee will be paid in advance, please. I have it in this envelope here. And I expect immediate action, Holmes. You shall have it, Mr. Tremaine. Holmes, the man's insufferable. Why'd you take on the case? He's a bounder. Let him get thrashed. 
These four crisp five-pound notes persuade me otherwise, Watson. We owe money to Mrs. Hudson, and your medical practice shows little signs of picking up. I must take what fees I can. Oh, how can my practice pick up when I spend half my time chasing all over the country with you? In any case, Watson, ask yourself why such a man as Lord Darlington should threaten Tremaine with physical violence. Obviously, only because Tremaine is himself in some way a threat to Lord Darlington. There may be yet another fee in this case, and a much fatter one. You're going to see Lord Darlington at once? Yes. I'd ask you to come with me, old chap, but after your remark about chasing all over the country, I hesitate to waste your time. Rubbish. I was only joking, and you know it, you silly fellow. Of course I'm going with you, Holmes. Get your coat and hat. The game's afoot. Ten thousand pounds, my dear cousin, or the scandal will be spread all over London. It's preposterous, Reginald. And I warn you that if you continue in this vein, you'll get that thrashing, I promise. Oh, no, I won't. I've engaged a detective fellow by the name of Sherlock Holmes. He's going to act as a bodyguard. So you'd better not try any tricks. He should be here at any moment. How dare you bring a stranger into this mess? How dare you? <laughs> That's right, my dear cousin. Bolster up your courage with the brandy bottle. Oh, be quiet, Reginald. It'll cost you ten thousand pounds to keep me quiet. I won't pay it. The scandal will make pretty readings in the newspapers. Before we go any further, Reginald, I insist on one thing. I shall bring Lady Darlington to here, and you must make this shocking accusation to her face. I shall be delighted to. Yes, Jenkins, what is it? Excuse me, Your Lordship, but there's a Mr. Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Watson to see you. I told them that you were engaged, but they seem most insistent. Better have them come in, my dear cousin. We may need independent witnesses. Oh, very well. Show the gentleman in, Jenkins. Yes, Your Lordship. And then if you'll ask Lady Darlington to come here, I'll be very glad to make my accusation in public. It's blackmail, Reginald. That's what it is. You'll never get away with it. <laughs> Won't I? I think you'll be surprised. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Allow me to introduce my cousin, gentlemen. Lord Darlington. How do you do? How do, you do? Uh, Jenkins? Yes, Your Lordship. Ask Lady Darlington to step in here for a moment. Yes, Your Lordship. Lord Darlington, I greatly admired your speech in the House of Lords on tax reform. I only wish we had met under different circumstances. As it is, it is my duty oh, to... Oh, that's inform... all right, Holmes. I've already told my dear cousin that I'd engaged your services. I want you both here as witnesses. Witnesses? To what? Reginald has made a shocking accusation. As soon as my wife comes here, I'm going to insist that he repeat the statement to her face. Ah, oh, there you are, Clara. Well, I'll just put Gordon to sleep, dear. Hello, Reginald. How are you, Clara? My dear, I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? But do sit down, won't you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Albert, what's wrong? You all look so dreadfully serious. Clara, my dear, Reginald has made a shocking accusation. It concerns you. And I insisted that he repeat it in your presence. An accusation against me? Yes, Clara, my dear. You see, I'm requesting a paltry sum for concealing my knowledge of the Darlington substitution scandal. Substitution? What on earth do you mean? Well, who should understand me better than you? The baby asleep upstairs. The supposed heir to the Darlington title is not your child. That's a lie. How dare you say that, Reginald? Lord Darlington, surely you were present at your son's birth? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't. I was abroad on government business at the time. My wife went to the country with a paid companion. My son was born there. Oh, no, my dear cousin. A son was born there, and then it was passed off as yours. That's a foul lie. Albert, make him leave this house. I'm afraid, Clara, my dear, that, well, he's threatened to go to the newspapers. We must hear him out. Lord Darlington, surely the matter is not hard to settle. You say your wife had a companion... Confront her with a story. She can establish the truth of the matter. Oh, yes, of course she can, but where is she? I haven't seen Maud Harris since she left me a year ago. Then I have a surprise for you, Clara. She's waiting in my cab outside now. I'll tell Jenkins to send her in. Jenkins? Yes, sir? Ask Miss Harris to join us. She's waiting in my cab. Yes, sir. Albert, I don't know what devil's work Reginald's up to... But you don't believe him, do you? Well, of course not, Clara, darling. Mr. Tremaine, 
How did you get in touch with this uh, Miss Harris? For an employee, you ask a lot of questions, Holmes. I met Maud Harris at Brighton last week. As soon as she knew I was the black sheep of the Darlington clan, she thought we might profitably put our heads together. And so you organized with the idea of blackmailing this poor lady. And such a valuable secret is surely worth a few thousand pounds, Dr. Watson. Maud. Yes, Lady Darlington, it's me. You're just in time to settle a most important truth. I'll handle this, Reginald. Young lady, as I understand it, you claim to know that the boy lying upstairs is not my son. Who should know better, Your Lordship? He's mine. Maud, how can you tell such a lie? It's no lie, and you know it, Lady Darlington. Your child was born dead. Oh, but make her stop saying such things. Here, my dear, control yourself. Let's hear this shocking tale to the end. Well, go on, young woman. You were abroad, Lord Darlington. When her ladyship lost her child, she was terrified. She knew how much you longed for a son, and she made this plan. Oh. I was a widow, and I was going to have a child, too. We fooled the villagers, even the doctor... By giving each other's names. And so my son was born as the Darlington heir. Maud, that's the most shocking lie I've ever heard. I can't stay here and listen to any more of it. Mr. Holmes, I understand you're a man of discretion and ability in such matters. What am I to do? I would like to ask this young lady a few questions. Miss Harris, why have you chosen to reveal the supposed truth now? I thought that money could compensate me for the loss of my boy. But I was wrong. A mother's love can never be stifled. Indeed, and I suppose Mr. Tremaine's plans for blackmail are purely incidental. Oh, keep out of this, Watson. It's no affair of yours. Establishing truth and justice is anybody's business, my good man. Mr. Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name to disprove this monstrous story. Oh, no, you don't, my dear cousin. Holmes is employed by me. Mr. Tremaine, I've undertaken to protect your physical safety. That pledge I will keep. Otherwise, I'm a free agent. Then you'll accept my commission? Yes, Lord Darlington, on one condition. And what's that? You have asked me to disprove this story. I would prefer that you ask me to establish the truth. Of course, Holmes, and spare no expense. Remember, the honor of the Darlingtons is at stake. Little did I think when Tremaine called on us this morning that we'd end up the day tramping a village lane in Surrey, looking for a Dr. Godfrey. And yet, that gentleman must surely be able to give us the final answer. Lady Darlington said that he attended yes, her. Yes, but supposing the companion's story was true and they had changed names. Even so, the good doctor will certainly know whether the boy was born to a slight blonde woman like Lady Darlington... Or a brunette Amazon like Maud Harris. Well, here's the doctor's house. They said in the village it was the one with the gabled roof. Hmm. No lights visible. I hope the doctor's not out. Doesn't seem to be any answer. Confounded. I don't believe there's anyone at home. And you will observe, Watson, that this morning's delivery of milk still stands on the doorstep. Curious. Let's explore a little. Well, perhaps the doctor's gone away for a few days. If so, he's a very careless man. Look, that window's wide open. Well, do you think we might go in and look round? We not only might, we will go in. Too much is at stake to stand on ceremony. Strike a match, Watson. Right, you are. I'll light that lamp. There you are. Holmes! Holmes, look, look, look! The figure slumped over the desk. Someone has reached the doctor before us. He's been shot through the chest. He's dead, Holmes. How long would you estimate he's been dead, Watson? Oh, uh, about 24 hours, I say. So now we become involved in murder as well as blackmail. Well, the answer's perfectly obvious to me. Tremaine came here and shot him. He knew that he could never blackmail Lord Darlington while this doctor was still alive. Not necessarily, Watson. If the story of the substitution is true, you must realize that one other person would have an equal motive for murder. Which cut, Holmes? Who? Lord Darlington himself. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes as they endeavor to solve the mystery. But first, they say New Year's resolutions are made to be broken. But here's one which should pay you big dividends to keep. Resolve to take better care of your hair, to keep it better groomed, your scalp hygienic. 
Start using Kreml hair tonic at once. You see, Kreml is a highly specialized hair tonic. It contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. That's why it keeps hair neatly in place longer and gives the hair such a natural, well-groomed appearance, never greasy or sticky. But men, Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking attractive. Its light oils have a fine lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes loose dandruff. And a quick massage with Kreml stimulates the circulation of blood in the surface of the scalp. Notice how alive, how invigorated your scalp feels. And men, you like to rub Kreml on your scalp because it's such a clean hair tonic. Never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and looks as if it had some body to it. So men, for better groomed hair and a hygienic scalp, change to Kreml. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, so you went to interview that village doctor and arrived there to find him dead. Yes, Mr. Bell, but before we reported the tragedy to the police, Sherlock Holmes conducted an intensive search of the dead man's room. After a moment, he turned to me and said... Watson, we must see what the inanimate objects in this room can tell us. Aha, here's the doctor's appointment pad. Let's see who his last visitor was. Look, look, there's the name of Darlington. Yes, but that tells us little. If the companion's story is true, the word Darlington could refer to either of the women or to Lord Darlington himself. But what are these letters scribbled before the word Darlington? Why must doctors have such illegible handwriting? Doctors don't have illegible handwriting. I disagree. Hmm? In fact, I've often thought they train you to write badly in medical colleges. Yes. The letters are R-E, re. Re, re, Darlington. That means that someone was calling about the Darlington case. A fact we already knew. Yes, oh, Let's see what else we can find. Hello. Look over here on the sideboard. Brandy decanter with a stopper left out. And one glass that has been drunk from. The killer must have had a drink after he shot the doctor. And in so doing, I think he gave us the clue to his identity. Oh, how? There's a speck on the rim of this glass. I think it's... Ah, the very thing, the doctor's microscope. Most convenient. What does it tell you, Holmes? Uh, wait a minute. Uh-huh. I was right. This speck on the glass is wax. Wax? Then that means the murderer used a candle. Oh, no, Watson. Oh, didn't... Come on. Oh. We must go back to the village and report his death, and then we'll catch the next train to London. Uh, aren't you going to stay here and help the police? Why should I? Beyond telling them the name of the murderer. You mean you know who did it? Of course. And so should you. Well, I don't. But we don't know the answer to the Darlington substitution scandal. That answer, Watson, still lies in London. Nine thousand, nine thousand five hundred, ten thousand pounds. Well, there you are, Reginald. Thank you, my dear cousin. I'll put the money in my bag, Reginald. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Lord Darlington. That sheaf of banknotes in Miss Harry's hand. Surely you didn't pay the blackmail. I discussed the matter with my wife, Mr. Holmes. She's deeply upset. We both agreed that the scandal, once started, would cling to us for life. Even if it was disproved later. That's why I paid the money. You engaged me as your representative in this case, Lord Darlington. Miss Harris, give that money back at once. It was a gift from Lord Darlington in front of a witness. If you try to touch it, I shall send for a policeman. That won't be necessary. Two of them are waiting in the anteroom now. Police? Oh, Holmes, you shouldn't have done it. I wanted no breath of this scandal to emerge from beyond these four walls. The fact that police are here has nothing to do with the problems of blackmail. I brought them here to apprehend a murderer. A murderer? Well, what do you mean? Dr. Godfrey, your wife's physician, was shot dead during the past 24 hours. He was killed before he could tell us the true answer to the parentage of the child upstairs. Murdered? Oh, what a dreadful thing. Have you any idea who did it? Every idea, Lord Darlington. But before I expose the criminal, I'd be obliged if you'd bring Lady Darlington here. And also the child. Oh, very well, Holmes. This is going to be a terrible shock to her. You're suddenly very quiet, Mr. Tremaine. Am I? I was wondering who might have killed Dr. Godfrey. Fortunately, we don't have to wonder. The murderer left a clue. 
After he'd committed the crime, he made the mistake of taking a drink. Darlington's quite a drinking man, you know. And you have been known to take a drink on occasions too, Mr. Tremaine. For instance, uh, after you'd killed Dr. Godfrey. After I'd... What rubbish are you saying? You see, the murderer left a tiny blob of wax on the glass. Oh, what does that prove? Merely that someone had been carrying a candle. But this wasn't candle wax. It was cosmetic wax, such as you used to wax that pointed moustache of yours. Reginald. All right, all of you, I'm getting out of here. <gasps> he snatched my bag. Reginald, come back here. I'll go after him. No, no, Watson. The police are prepared to arrest him, but not the young lady. We shall need her cooperation in the last act of this little tragedy. But surely the whole thing's clear by now. If Tremaine killed the doctor, obviously the whole story about the substitution is, is a lie. Not necessarily. Even if it were true, the doctor was still a menace to his plans. How could he and Miss Harris ask the highest price for their secret when the doctor also knew it? No, Watson. Tremaine had a motive for murder either way. In the meanwhile, I must set the stage before Lady Darlington gets here. Where'd I put that parcel? Oh, here it is. What the devil have you got in there, Holmes? A present from a plumber friend of mine. Though the object in this pa package is only a simple tool of his trade, I feel that it may give us the answer to a peer's inheritance. Upon my soul, you're being very mysterious. In a few moments, I propose to conduct a test. You must hide outside the windows. When I turn down the gaslight over the mantel here, Watson, I want you to strike a match, apply it to the object in this package, and toss it through the open window. At the same time... Cry out the word fire at the top of your oh, voice. Fire. I remember that. I think the results of the experiment may prove quite startling. <laughs> Lord Darlington, now that all the principals in this case are assembled, I shall conduct my experiment. Very well, Holmes. I don't see why I had to bring the boy down here. It's long past his bedtime. I assure you, Lady Darlington, that his presence is absolutely essential. Please place him in the bassinet on the sofa. All right. Uh, that's it. And you, Miss Harris, will you be good enough to place your handbag on the table? Mm, very well, Mr. Holmes. But no funny business now. The police took it away from Reggie and gave it back to me. That money's mine. Each of you ladies claim to be the mother of that boy. Since scientific tests of parentage are notoriously unreliable, I shall conduct a simple experiment which I think may give us the truth in this matter. Now... I want both you ladies to come toward me with outstretched hands. That's it. I turn down the gaslight over the mantel. So. Ah! Ah! Oh, dear, oh, darling! It's all right. It's all right. If you look closely, you'll observe that this object is a perfectly harmless plumber's smoke rocket. Ah! Oh, ah! You can drop the masquerade, Watson. The case is solved. Ah! Oh, is it home? Holmes, what on earth are you up to? You'll notice that on the cry of fire... Miss Harris ran for her handbag containing the 10,000 pounds. Lady Darlington instinctively rushed to her son. I think, Lord Darlington, that there can no longer be any question of the child's parentage. Midnight. <laughs> Been a long day, Holmes. Yes, but uh, profitable, Watson. A very profitable day's work indeed. Here's a thousand guineas from Lord Darlington. And uh, don't overlook the twenty pounds that Mr. Tremaine well, gave me. Certainly, Sean. He retained you for protection, and you end up by sending him to the gallows. A fate that he richly deserves. I only wish I could have persuaded Lord Darlington to prosecute Miss Harris. Blackmail is a devilish crime. It's funny to think that a simple plumber's rocket smoked out the truth. Yes. Though, you'll remember, I've had occasion to use the instrument before. When a woman thinks her house is on fire, her impulse is at once to rush to the thing she values most. It's a perfectly overpowering instinct. Well, you certainly took advantage of the fact. Ah, well, Watson, you may remember the old Persian saying. There's danger for him who taketh the tiger cub, and danger for whoso snatches delusion from a woman. Oh, really? Oh, yes, Watson. There's as much sense in Hafiz as in Horace and as much knowledge of the world. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a very exciting story. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bell. Incidentally, don't you think you'd better tell our listeners about the change of day and time for our next meeting? Yes, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, our next broadcast will be on Monday, January 13th, over these same stations. And better consult your newspaper for the time. 
Girls, have you noticed how men can't help but admire the bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair? Then why not follow the advice of the famous Million Dollar Powers models? Girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural, radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, how about next week? It's not next week, uh, Mr. Bell. It's a week from next Monday. Yes, of course. Well, what story are you going to tell us a week from next I Monday? I think I'll tell you about the Devil's Foot. The Devil's Foot? What was that? I won't tell you now, Mr. Bell, but I will say that Sherlock Holmes and I never encountered a more gruesome or a more horrible mystery. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us one week from Monday. That's January 13th when Dr. Watson will tell us about the devil's foot. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Bold Venture. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring... Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean Bold Venture Once again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. In Cuba, they grow the banana tree, tree for you, banana for me. In Havana they got the chicken and rice, the men of danger and ladies of spice. In Havana there is the Shannon's place, rooms to let tobacco in the case, mosquito netting to hide the bed, and the desperate effort to keep out of the red. <laughs> you see, even your King Moses confesses to it. You need me, you two. The impression left hanging in the air before the musical interlude was that you needed us, Mr. Reed. Go on, have another banana. Uh, well, I... Oh, go on, take another one. I love to watch you eat. We don't get much chance to feed actors around here. Gee, Slate. Look how he peels a banana. The grace, the flourish, the drama. Well, that's because when Mr. Reed was a boy, he had advantages. And stardom, Mr. Shannon. Do you realize that when I was a boy, only a shade younger than I am now, that is, when I was a youngster on top of the heap, it took ten persons to handle my fan mail alone. Uh, don't drop the banana peel on the floor, Mr. Reed. I'll pick it up. Take this away, King, and bring another dish of fruit for Mr. Reed. Uh, 
a pomegranate would be nice if it doesn't deprive you. Oh, we got cans of them, Mr. Reed. We have saved them for such as you. I will apply myself to Just them. Just open a number two can and bring it in, huh, King? As you say, Mr. Slate. You know, my mother used to take me to your pictures, Mr. Reed, in her lap. It was the only way she could make me take my afternoon nap. Uh, I mean, uh, oh, you thrilled Mom to the fiber. And now here I am talking to you in person. And... I will thrill again if you will only consent to the use of your boat and your knowledge of Manet Island. I don't know, Mr. Reed, running this hotel... Is... Listen to me, Mr. Shannon. All I have left in the world I've put into this venture. It'll bring me back to the top of the heap. Laszlo, the director, Billy Craig, the cameraman. They are the best. I could get them only by making them equal partners in the company. And all you want is for us to lead you to good background shots on Manet Island. Is that it, Mr. Reed? You find the backgrounds, and I'll illuminate them with my talent, my virility. Bring romance back to the starving women of the world. Slate. For my mom, huh? She's got a picture of Mr. Reed on her dresser. Make it live again for her. Ah. Uh, oh, for your mom and for the starving women of the world. Oh, there's King with your palm granite, Mr. Reed. Take it out on the patio, huh? Out there, so you can throw the peel to the winds. Ah, in front of this jeweler's window, I could stand all day, Billy Boy. Just to look at that, for instance, over there. That three carat diamond. You'd whiten your nose, wouldn't you, Laszlo? Would and will. When we return to Hollywood, I will have a party for the occasion. Well, let's walk. Guy in the shop's crooking a finger at it. That would be pleasant to have money again. Personally, I think it's a chance to take. Killing Ricky? I don't know. They got penalties for knocking off in Cuba, too, you know. Yes, but on Money Island, so many pitfalls, so many chances for accidental death. Ricky Reed will die, and the funds which he has set up for the cooperation will be to us. Of us, ours. Mine and yours, Billy. Mine and yours. So it is simple. Uh, here's another jewelry store, Laszlo. You want to stop and look? At your insistence, Billy Boy? <laughs> Where's the heart throb, sailor? Where's Ricky Reed? Out on the patio, acting out incognito. <laughs> yeah. I'll bet that's something to see. Oh, it is. Still, he doesn't want us to let anyone know he's here. <laughs> For a romantical figure like him, he's not being very cooperative, sailor. You know what else he is, Slate? Likeable. I like him. Yeah, me too. Well, I hope he gets what he wants. The comeback, the tiger skin upholstery, the aftershave lotion in the swimming pool, the whole deal. Whatever he wants. Amen. When do we take him and his crew to Manet Island? <laughs> he's been consulting his astrology chart. He says he'll let me know. He... Uh, customer, sailor, do your nip-ups. Welcome to Shannon's place, madam. The Hotel Nifty, rooms 350. The moon in your lap, the waves slap, slap. All I want is Ricky Reed. Give him back to me. It's where Ricky belongs. It's where he can be safe. Where he can live out his days in dignity and love. Gee, if we knew a fellow like that, we'd sure want him to have all those good things, wouldn't we, Slate? Gee, and gosh, we sure would. You want him dead. You and that Laszlo and Billy Craig. Death incorporated. You want him dead. You'll take him on that island and kill him and steal his money. And let him die alone in a forsaken place. Make a fool of him. Well, that's not the way the plot goes, madam. The plot says Ricky Reed's going to star in his own motion picture on a tropical island. Make a comeback and be famous again. And live to autograph again. Ricky told you that? The boy. The dreamer. He's through. Finished. A flickering candle. Sick with young dreams. Please don't kill him. Just give him back to me. I'll save his money. I'll... If we ever run across him, we'll tell him we've got a plan for his investment. Who shall we say has this plan? Thelma Bronson, number three wife. He has six, you know. But all the five put together never loved him as much as I. It was in all the newspapers how much I love him. How I follow him through the world. Run through a scrapbook with her, will you, sailor? I want to check with a man about his old age pension. Hey, 
Ricky, 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 Ricky. Laszlo. Ricky. Me too, fellas. I brought Slate Shannon with me, Laszlo. He's a skipper. Come in, come in, come in, come in, come in. Come in, come in. A skipper? A skipper? Ricky means he's chartered my boat for the trip to Monet Island. That means skipper. Uh, means a boat captain. Uh, where's Billy? Uh, like a carefree scamp, he's Billy. With a camera, he's on the sidewalks of Havana taking pictures for sending back. Mr. Shannon wants to ask you something, Laszlo. Uh-huh. So, ask something. A little while ago, a woman walked into my place. Her name was Thelma Brunson. You remember Thelma, Laszlo? <laughs> Could I forget her? Ask me. Could I forget her? Such anklets and delicate wrists. She said you and your cameraman were going to kill Ricky. But she had no talent. Absolutely, she had no talent by the pick. She said you've organized this company with Ricky's money. If Ricky dies, all the money goes to you and your boy. Ricky, Ricky, Ricky. Thelma was lying, wasn't she? Well, then why should she follow you all the way to Havana? Ricky, tell him. Thelma has never stopped loving me. She has dedicated her life to following me, following me and loving me. That's Thelma's career, and we mustn't speak harshly of her. And you positively want to go on this trip, huh? We will make an epic. Laszlo, you wouldn't... Uh, we will leave as soon as possible, Shannon. With a tight skipper. Honest to Betsy, Slate. To who? To Betsy. Honest to her, Slate. I'm enjoying myself. Small deserted island in the Caribbean. Walking along the beach at midnight in Slate Shannon. <laughs> yeah, makes a girl flip, huh? In spades. Let's just stand here for a minute, huh, Slate? Slate, I feel... Yeah, I know. That's because you're standing in water. Your feet are wet. Hey, back off, will you, sailor? <coughs> Wait. Slate, look. Hey, what's the matter with you, buster? What's the big idea of... Taking pot shots at people? A whimsy of mine. I've been taking pot shots at birds for six years. People are bigger. I thought this island was deserted. It's going to be. But first, the humanities. I'm Edward Sloan. I only tell you because it doesn't matter. Slate Shannon. This is Sailor Duval. Who's she? You know, I ask myself the same question many times a day. You came on this island with three other men. Where are they? Out, looking around the island. For shots for motion pictures. Get out of here. All of you. Because you say so, Buster? I don't want this place cluttered. People come here, one, two at a time. They come, go. I watch them. Five people, you, that's too many. Get out. I asked you a question a few seconds ago. We go because you say so? You'll go. I'll bet he won't shave until we do, Slate. You'll go, one way or another, because I say so. Good night, you two. Stay happy. Oh, oh shut up. Oh, who can sleep? Slate? Slate, you awake? I'm asking you something. You awake? Yeah, no, baby. I just bowl out of my bedroll like this whenever one ant slaps another one around. Let's go wake up Ricky, huh? I want to check on how movie actors wake up. There you go, sailor. I don't think I could. Not without my breakfast first. All right. You don't care who I go around waking up. All right. Ricky! Mr. Reed, wake up. It's the dawn of a glorious tropical day. It's get up and emote time. It's... Uh... Ricky? R Slate? Slate, come here quick. Please, Slate. Yeah, hey, what's the matter, sailor? Your actor friend hates you in the morning? Look at him, Slate. Dagger in his chest. When I turned him over, I... Yeah. Uh, he's dead. Ricky paid for his own comeback, sailor. He never made it.
to Bold Venture. Our stars Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall and the second act of our story. Poor, poor Ricky. One moment dead, one moment alive. Why should it happen to him? A lady warned us it might happen, and it did. We woke you and Billy up so that maybe you could tell why it should happen to him. What's with her, Shannon? What's with her is a question. Somebody stabbed him during the night. Terrible, terrible. Question. How much money did Ricky have invested in this nothing-type production? You will wait. I will think. Hundred thousand? Two hundred thousand? About in the middle. A little to this side. Approximately one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Imagine that. And now it belongs to you. Him and me. According to the terms of the contract. In Hollywood, everything is contract. He forgets about it, Slate. We're liable to whisper it around that Ricky's murder had something to do with Billy and Laszlo. Or equally you too. You will need proof. Personally, Billy and I resign from the responsibility. Ah, he's right, sailor. Leave us not forget the man with the beard, Eddie Sloan. He threatened us, remember? Who threatened? What threatened? Last night, a guy took a shot at us. A guy who lives on this island warned us away. So we're waiting for what? Let's get out of here, let's. There he is, sailor. He's on our boat. Come on, we're duck standing here. Laszlo, quick, behind these rocks. Hold on your face, sailor. You all right? I hope these palms are the sheltering type palms. I dig a hole in the sand for your head, baby. You're going to have a long time finding out. Kill me, that madman with the beard. He will kill me. The way the message reached me was for all of us. Shannon, his girl, me, and you. What's the matter? Can't you spare a tear of genius for the rest of us, Laszlo? What matters the rest of us? It is Laszlo he will murder. Laszlo he will cut off in the prime of Laszlo's life. There is too much in me left to live. Reads money, waiting only for me. The persons they will buy for me. And I only have to write on a piece of paper. I was there when Ricky Reed died. Leave something out, genius? What's to left out? I do not wish to die. I wish to live a lush life. What is more is there? Me. Mm, when you die, I will take an ad in the papers for a eulogy for your splendid camera work. I don't die, genius. I don't die. You killed. You put Ricky on a knife like a shashlik. For this, you must die sometime. But not now. Not here. In the States, maybe. Yeah. With a glass in my hand and a blonde at my side, lighting C notes to keep us warm. You got the plan, Billy Boy? You got the plan for both of us to stay alive? You got a plan? I know what you got. What include me in? All I've been to you, Billy Boy, include me in. <laughs> All you've been to me, huh? Pick a rock, Laszlo. Any rock. You'll need one to mark your grave. <laughs> Ten hours, sailor. That's a pleasant thought. I thought it was ten hours, ten hours ago. I wonder where they got this heat. Yeah. Hey, what are you doing? I want to see if a flag of truce will work. Slate, listen to me. That heat's been beating against the back of your neck. The digest magazines say that's not healthy. You should take a little uh, at a time. Slate, come back here. Stay there, sailor. Eddie! Waving at something, Shannon? Yeah. You. Mind if I come aboard my boat? I don't mind. As long as there's people around. I could use a conversation. Just keep your distance, Shannon. What's on your mind? Did you stab a man last night? Never did. All the nights I remember. Never stabbed. I thought you wanted us off your island, kid. What made you change your mind? I said get off, you did. Now you gotta go my way, Shannon. How I want it and when I want it. One by one, huh? Right. And your turn isn't yet. Go on back to your lady, Shannon. Hey! Hey, mister! Another white flag waver, Shannon. Yeah? I wanna talk! Well, come on. Right there, friend. Talk. I, uh, I want to give you something. Money. 
You don't look like you're carrying very much. I got it. Over a hundred grand in the States. And you'll bring it back? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, leave Shannon, the dame, and that director as hostages. Honest? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You shot him down in cold blood, Eddie. You want yours now? No? Get back to your dame. <laughs> What kind of a man is he, Slate? To kill like that in cold blood. Oh, I met his type before. Something turns them sour, the world maybe, the way things crowd in maybe. Put your mind to it and it's not so hard to understand. He's an animal. That's all I need to understand. Now take it easy, baby. You've got enough troubles. Keep them simple. He's going to kill me. And you. How simple does it have to get? That could be worse. You could die someplace other than the Caribbean island. You could die where a trade wind never touched your hair, sighed across your cheek, followed the lines of your mouth. Cut it out, Slate. You make it so attractive. You should sell insurance. You should. Whatever bill of goods I sold you hasn't brought you much, has it, sailor? You fishing for a complaint, Buster? If you've got any, now's the time to turn them in. Last chance, kid. The windows can close without your knowing it. Let me think. Well? Let's see... There's the time you dribbled my tortillas down the sidewalk just to prove to everybody what a lousy cook I was. <laughs> well, you are a lousy cook. One more try, kid. There was the time you never let me finish telling you what it is to be with you. The hurt, the laughs, the free rides. Oh, shut up. Slate. I said shut up. Come here, Slate. What was that for? Just to prove something to myself. Like what? Like I'd be crazy to deprive myself of that stuff. Don't go away, Slate. Are you out of your mind? Make a move and Sloan will kill you. Not if I move in the right direction. Go get a balcony seat in a palm tree, Slate. This will be a part you never came in on. your life in your hands, honey. Help me aboard the boat, Eddie. All right. I remember how to do this. You okay? Hmm. I came down here to get an opinion. Now put the gun down and consider it. You know, when I was running from the cops in Havana, a girl on the street stood there and watched. It excited her. She was like you. How do you know? You never found out. Maybe I missed a lot of things. Man like you, man like you could have it all back. You're selling Shannon out? I haven't made up my mind. Help me. You want me to let that director and Shannon go, don't you? That's not a bad bargain. You'll see. <laughs> it wouldn't be a that. Only this. The monkeys will start laughing at me. You know why? Because your fellows are bring back other fellows for me, for you. Take us both away. If I tell Shannon that's the way it is, that's the way it'll be. Those six years I've been on this island, you could wipe it all out. It's a deal? I don't know. It's a deal. I'll go tell Shannon. Sit down, honey. What for? When it's a deal, I'll tell you. Right now, you stay. Listen to me. You stay. Reach over and hand me that rope, honey. Thanks. Put your hands behind you. It's going to take me time to make up my mind. I don't want you to go away. I don't want to have to hurt you. I want you to stay right here. Laszlo. Hey. Hey, Laszlo. Stay away from me. Billy tried to get me killed. Now you stay away from me. You got a knife. I want it. I have no knife. The one you killed Ricky with, I want it. The bad man on the board killed Ricky. Give it to me. 
Now, now you're going to give it to me. Here, here, I give it to you in the heart. Dickie didn't give you this much trouble, did he? I'll get back to you later, after I see the man on the boat. Thanks for the knife. You will see. You will die. I will live. You will die. Oh, he cringed to you, Sloan. Mr. Shannon with a knife. Be careful of him. He will... He lost it for you, Shannon, so I made it up to you. I shot him. Thanks. You want to keep coming or you want me to go after you? You're the bright boy, you... Nice, huh? Try it. My rifle gives me a long reach, kid. Beats your brain. Let's stop playing marbles, huh? Don't do it, Shannon. Don't stick... I don't talk, kid. You'll get throat scratch. Take your dame and get off the island. You killed two men. Look, you're alive, aren't you? Go home. Forget about it. On your feet, Eddie. What did you do with Sailor? Tied her up. She's okay. Walk. Sailor! Slate, are you all right? What? I said get me out of here. Keep your ropes on, kid. I'll be right there. Then we'll go home. <laughs> Slate? Oh, get away from me, sailor. What's the matter with Just you? Just get away from me. You got a headache? What brings that stupid expression to your face? Ah. Tell, baby. I had a chance to get in talking pictures and you blew it. Why, Slate, you want to be a talking picture actor? Once in the life of every man. Well, we got to find out do you got talent. Hoist your pants, Slate. Let's take a look at the ankle. Hmm. Bony. What's bony? It'll be a sensation in Technicolor. Come here, baby. No, no, not like that. Pucker. Like this? That's right. Hold for a still. Bye, baby. And so, our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, together in Bold Venture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Well, this is great. Rain, rain, rain. I bet even the ducks wouldn't come out in weather like this. But me, I'm an idiot. I gotta go and take up a profession like being a writer. I couldn't take up something easy. Oh, no, not me. I gotta be a writer so I can be out on nice, cold, wet nights. Feeding my brains out. Looking for an idea. Idea. Deadline. Oh, sure. Mustn't forget that ever loving deadline. <laughs> what a way to make a living. I could have stayed a reporter at the Star Times and had nice assignments. Like listening to political speeches or covering the opening of a new manhole. Oh, no, but not me. I have to write fiction. Do it the hard way. Well, I might as well take the usual hand, open the usual door to the usual place, and hear the usual comments. 
Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hiya. Coffee, coffee boy. Hiya, Dan. What do you say, Ed? Fifth editor, want you? How goes it, Holiday? Oh, pretty good. Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. How are you? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hello, Susie. Anything in box 13? Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Now for Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. What a character I am. Standing here in front of the wanted counter in a newspaper office while the rain runs down off my coat collar into my shoe. Mr. Holiday. I gotta ruin my last pair of. Huh? What's that, Susie? I said there's a message in box 13 for you. Here. Oh. Thanks, Susie. Don't mention it. Say, hey, aren't you going to open it? Sorry. Not here, Susie. You know, you got all of us down here at the Star Times awful curious, Mr. Holiday, running that ad. Have I? You've been running it for months. Why don't you change it? Well, I haven't read it for so long, I've forgotten the words. How's it go? Don't you remember? Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. How about that? I still like it. You'd do a lot better with Adventure if you ran your picture with the ad. No, no, thanks. Just keep on running it the way it is. But, gee, aren't you ever going to tell us what you do for a living while you keep running that ad? Susie, same old question, same old answer. No. Well, if I'm not doing anything else, at least I've got the people at the Star Times curious. They'd think my brain cells were ten feet off first base if they knew why I really run that ad. Maybe they are. Hmm. You can help a person out of great trouble and gain an adventure for yourself if you call Chester 8945 and ask for Carla Williams. Chester 8945. Carla Williams. Hmm. Sounds like an interesting name. Well, I hope she's home. Hello? Oh, uh, this is the man from Box 13. Oh? Tell me, are you serious or was that ad just a joke? No joke, Miss Williams. Are you willing to try anything? Well, uh, that depends what's on your mind. I can't discuss it over the phone. Will you meet me? Of course. There's a little French restaurant down on Ledge Street. Meet me there in the cocktail lounge. Uh, what time? Make it 10 o'clock tonight. Tell the bartender you want to speak to Carla Williams. French restaurant on legs, 10 o'clock. Oh, uh, what block number? The 600 block. You won't fail me, you'll be there. Lady, if it were winter, I'd come with bells on. This sounds like the beginning of a very interesting story. Beautiful woman in distress calls on struggling writer for help. Only she doesn't know I'm a writer, and I don't know she's beautiful. What's yours, mister? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm looking for a Carla Williams. Oh, yeah. She's sitting over there in that front booth. Thanks. Uh, Carla Williams? Yes. Oh, ho. Carla Williams could be material for a love story or an adventure story. Or, uh, maybe both. And, uh, do you have a name? Oh, uh, uh yes. Dan Holliday. Uh, what's it down? Oh, thanks. I'm, uh, agreeably surprised. I didn't think a person would get such a satisfactory reply from a war dad. And I didn't think I'd get such a nice reply. You're wondering about me, aren't you? You're wondering why you're here. Naturally. Well, I'm being blackmailed. 
That's a very nasty business. I've been paying blackmail for five years, but tonight's the end. I'm to meet him in 15 minutes and make the final payment and get the letters. Well, that sounds like the end of your troubles. But is it? I can't be sure. That's why I need your help. But what can I do? Well, you can be there as, as a witness. You can make sure this is the end. You can see that I get the letters and get away safely. Oh, uh, lady, you need the police. Why? To make sure everything I've kept hidden for five years comes out in the open? Maybe a friend could do it. My friends would be the last ones on earth I'd want to know. Are you afraid? No. You advertised for adventure? Blackmail isn't my idea of adventure. I'm sorry if my trouble doesn't measure up to your expectations. The best I could do on such short notice. Uh Uh-oh. Well, I guess I had that coming. Maybe this isn't your idea of adventure, but I do need help. I need help badly. Let's leave it at that. Now, that might appeal to my early Boy Scout training. Then you will? I always help ladies across blackmail wraps. Uh, What happens if your friend makes trouble? We can't make any trouble. He seems to have done all right for the past five years. There won't be any trouble if you're along. Here, reach under the table. Take this. Oh, uh, now wait a minute. This is a gun. Put it in your pocket. Don't let anyone see it. This is supposed to make everything all right? Well, you won't need it, believe me. I, I thought it would make you feel better. It makes me feel like a policeman. And I still think a policeman is what you want. But you promised. I said maybe. I have to meet him in 15 minutes. Please help me. Where do we go? His apartment. Far from here. We can make it if we leave now. What do you say? Maybe I should never have been a Boy Scout. I watch Carla Williams closely as we ride over to the apartment where she's to meet this man she's been talking about. She's perfectly groomed with a certain niceness about her, except for those twin furrows of worry between her eyes and a cold look of anxiety. I don't think I would like to have her angry at me, though. That's funny. You should have been here 20 minutes ago. Why don't you try the door? It was unlocked. You might as well wait inside. Unless you have any objections. Not at all. There's a light switch on your right. The living room is straight ahead. Say, you sound like you're familiar with the place. Why not? I've been here many times before. There's a light on him there. Suppose he might have fallen asleep? Waiting for his money? Hardly. Well, this is more like it. And this spot is nicely furnished. With my money. But at least we can sit down and make us... Make us... Oh, no. Miss Williams, what's the matter? What happened? By the floor. By the desk, look. You stay here. Well, well... He's better call the police. He's dead. Dead? Yeah, he's been shot. Once. Through the heart. I'm glad. He's the one? The man who was blackmailing? Yes. Would you... Could you go through his pockets? He must have some of those letters with him. Look in his coat pocket. Uh, Just a minute, Miss Williams. You don't understand. This man has been murdered. We've got to call the police. Murdered? What makes you so sure? There's no gun around any place. Just the same before the police come. His pockets... Please, I've got to have those letters. Okay. But it isn't right. Are these what you wanted? Let me see. Yeah. They're all here. Now, where's the telephone? We've got to get the police up here and fast. There is no phone. No? How do you know without looking in this? I told you I've been here before. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, go downstairs. There's a pay phone in the lobby. Tell the police to come up here right away. And come back and we'll wait for them. You're not planning to leave while I'm downstairs, are you? No. Here, here's a nickel. Just dial low and tell the operator you want the police. Hurry. But you, you'll be here. Call, I said. <laughs> I wanted adventure, so I put an ad in a newspaper. And I certainly found what I wanted. Only this isn't good. 
The man is lying dead on the floor of this apartment. And Carla Williams and I will have to get down to the police headquarters and answer a million questions. All of them embarrassing. Uh, I hope she's made the calls. Say, that's funny. Why would there be a telephone directory in a place where there's no phone? Or maybe there is one. Of course, right here in the hallway. I wonder why she said there was no phone here. Maybe it's been disconnected. Hmm. Operator. This is the operator. Oh, fine. I've written a dozen stories like this. And whenever I've reached this point, the hero always finds that he's been framed. <laughs> framed. The gun. And I look at that gun. i to find out if it's been fired. One shot has been fired. And the police surgeon will probably find a bullet from this gun in that dead man's body. The police... Seems like little Carla took care of that. Me, I'm going to take care of something else. I'm leaving. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. <laughs> Once again, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, right now I'm wishing I were half as smart as the heroes of some of my stories. I've got a murder, a strange woman, a strange apartment, and a strange feeling that this might not work out to a happy ending. What I need is a cab, a quick trip home, a short drink, and a long, long think. Sure is a rotten night to be out. Yeah, it sure is. Never seen such rain. Not so good. Cops are sure busy tonight. Sounds like it. I wonder who they're after. I uh, wouldn't have any idea. Could be a murderer, you know. Yeah, just could be. Just a night for a murder. Perfect. How come you got so wet? It's uh, raining. <laughs> I know, but how come? My umbrella needs recovering. You want the Normandy arms? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's your building up ahead, but it looks like you've got lots of company. What do you mean? Them's prowl cars, mister. All over the place. Oh, this is very nice. Carla Williams called the police and must have mentioned my name in passing. I'm the type of interesting young fellow that any cop would like to meet. Especially with a murder weapon in my pocket. Tonight, Mr. Holliday, I think you will sleep elsewhere. Want me to pull right in where all them cops are? No, they look busy, so maybe we'd better not bother them. Just keep on driving. But this is where you live, ain't it? I don't feel like going home tonight. I could shove them cops aside, you know. This is a legitimate hack. Uh, that would be fun, but don't bother. And you're the boss, mister. Where to? Uh, there's a place down on Franklin Avenue. 1612, I think. I know that place. That's the cheapest hotel in town. Yes, I believe it is. Hey, how do you know about a place like that? I got information there for a story. What a joint like that. What are you going there tonight for? To sleep. You're writing another story? I'm living one. Living one? Yes, I left my typewriter at home. Well, Mr. Holliday, to what do we owe this great pleasure? Maybe you're just lucky. More research on the seamier side of life? No, not tonight. I'm looking for a room. A room? Might I remind you, Mr. Holliday, this ain't the Roney Plaza. Have you got a room? Any particular exposure you might like? 
The less, the better. I'm sure we can fix you up. That is, if you're willing to pay in advance. Buck, buck and a half, how much? Twenty-five dollars, Mr. Holiday. Twenty-five dollars. And if you committed the murder, it'll be fifty dollars, Mr. Holiday. Come on, talk straight. I don't want any trouble with the police. What makes you think I'll cause you trouble with the police? Little box called the radio. Police calls. They're a lot of fun to listen to, Mr. Holiday. Yeah, I'll bet they are. You'll be comfortable here and safe. I'm beginning to wonder if I could afford it. With your money? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I wasn't trying to. Where's your phone? The one on the wall costs a nickel. Thanks. You're staying tonight, Mr. Holiday? Got back there in a hurry. You? Where are you? Still in town. What about the police? They with you? What do you think? Thanks for putting in a good word for me. I had to. They made me. Look, I, I want to talk to you. I know that feeling. I want to talk to you, too. I can explain everything. Like a gun with one bullet fired? Yes. A missing telephone that wasn't? That, too. Oh. Then you're just the little girl I want to have words with. Can you come over here right away? Are the police there? Name the place, I'll meet you. The corner of 6th and Victor, 10 minutes. Right. Follow me, Mr. Holiday. Oh, where to? Your room. This ain't the Roney Plaza, but the service is just the same. I've changed my mind. You're not staying? Your rates are too high. I'll drop in again after I've made a fortune. Now I know how the fox feels when the hounds are closing in. Hmm. <laughs> Someday I'll have to write a story about a fox. Put that guy Burgess and his Peter Rabbit out of business. Hey, Cab! Oh, it's you again. Yeah, I get around, don't I? I thought you were set for the night. No running ice water. Six and Victor. Where'd you say you wanted to go? Six and Victor. But there ain't no place to sleep there. No, I'm not sleepy. I just want to examine a fire hydrant. Okay, mister. I'm glad it's your money and not mine. If we keep on, it will be your money. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Say, uh, is that tonight's extra lying up there? Sure. Want to take a look at it? Oh, yeah, thanks. That picture they got of you on the front page is lousy. What picture? You look like you was facing the camera through a screen door. Yeah, let me see that. Well, 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 this is just wonderful. Prominent writer named by police. Carla Williams accuses Dan Holliday of the murder of Harry Granger. Brief stricken girl witnessed the murder of her fiance. And there's going, Carla. It's your word against mine, plus the evidence against me. Now I know why they wrote that song, I get along without you very well. Well, there's Six and Victor. Cruise on by. You ain't gonna stop? I haven't made up my mind. Looks like a couple of cops waiting around for somebody. That's the way it looks to me. That might be the law. Yes, they might be. What do you want to do now? Get away from here and find a city directory. A chap by the name of Harry Granger should have a home. And he should have stayed in it. <laughs> either just ahead of the police or right behind them. And if this game keeps up much longer, I'll be right with them. Yeah? Oh, uh, Harry Granger live here? He did. You the police? Well, no, not exactly. A reporter? I used to be. Come here, you. I wonder if you're one of them blackmailers. Just a minute, friend. My coat rips easy. No, I guess not. If you were, you wouldn't be here. Mind if I step in? Come in, come in. This whole thing's got me all upset. You don't say. Oh, uh, you said something about a blackmailer. That's what I'm here for. I came to help Harry get rid of those rats. You mean he was being blackmailed? For five years. I lent him most of the money to pay off with. I told him he was a sucker, but it looks like I got here too late. 
You heard what happened? Saw it in the papers on my way from the station. Have you told the police? Not yet, but I'm going to. Who did you say you were? I didn't say. You know something about this? I think I do now. I began to see the light when the city directory listed this place as Granger's apartment. Can I help? You might get into trouble. Well, how? Breaking into a woman's apartment. After this, I'll use a fire escape and more of my stories of the most interesting things about a building. From homicide, we'll be out in the hall saying that no one comes in here. I'll have to work fast, Holloway. You'll have to find something that the police weren't looking for. There must be something. Bills, letters, comments, that's no good. Look, look for the obvious. That's, that's what I always have my hero doing. Let's see what's the obvious. Oh, the living room. Now, let's see. That's where the body was. Nothing obvious there. On the desk. No, no. The table. No. The fireplace. Hello, hello, hello. A small frame snapshot. And I think it might be just what I'm looking for. My old friend, the bartender, and Carla Williams. And with your arms around each other. You know, you two make a nice couple, a wonderful couple. I wonder if they'll let you have your arms around each other in the electric chair. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I finally made it. I'm down at police headquarters in the office of a tall, gangly character named Lieutenant Kling. Of course, a few things have happened. Carl and the bartender were brought in, too. He's so much cooler than I am. Oh, those cell bars give you such fine ventilation. Holiday. Um, what's that, Lieutenant? I said you were a very lucky citizen. After what Carla Williams told us, we thought you were guilty. You should have told me that story to believe it myself. Approving that she and the bartender were married put a crimp in her act as the injured fiancé. Yeah, you showed it up as the same old racket. Smart woman teams up with smart man to blackmail innocent citizen. But just the same, I think you should stick to your writing and let police work alone. Uh, Lieutenant, I'll have that printed and framed in blonde walnut. Hang it on the wall? (sighs) No, around my neck. I'm glad to hear you say that. You may not always have a guy like this Grant who backed up your story. Oh, Granger's friend? That's the one. Say, he's a nice fellow. Wants me to visit him on his ranch. Why don't you do that? Riding the range all day when I could be cooking in town? Uh, Pardon me. Homicide, Lieutenant Kling. Oh, yes, yes, he's here. It's for you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Yes, Susie. Can you come down to Star Times right away? Oh, what's the matter? There's another letter for you in Box 13. Oh, no, no, no. Should I uh, open it and read it to you? Oh, not now, Susie. I've got enough material to last me for a month. Three weeks of which will be a rest. Tell me where. Maybe I can come down and help you. You really want to help me? Sure I do, Mr. Holliday. Then put that letter back in box 13. But, Mr. Holliday... Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. (laughs) 
Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize this assignment's going to wind up with me staking my life on a bluff and then finding out, much to my surprise, that I wasn't bluffing at all. Good morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you wanted to see me. Steve, last night three men landed in Miami by plane. They were picked up in a limousine. The local police chased them and the car crashed, killing all three men. So what's all this got to do with us, Commissioner? One of those men was a well-known foreign agent. Oh, I see. How about the other two? A check uh, was made on their identities. Phony, both of them. Oh, you mean they were carrying phony identification papers? No, the papers were legitimate enough, but they didn't belong to the men who were carrying them. We believe those papers were stolen from U.S. citizens who were traveling abroad. And in each case... Those citizens were traveling alone and unattached. Hmm. Five will get you ten that also, in each case, those U.S. citizens are dead right now. Exactly. Well, Steve, it looks like we're up against a clever and vicious scheme to get foreign agents into the States. Yeah. They grab one of our tourists, bump him off, take his papers, and then slip one of their boys into the States with those papers. We've got to work fast. We don't know how many times they've pulled this trick so far, but we've got to keep them from continuing. Get down to Miami, Steve. Backtrack their operation until you find out who's behind it. Then smash it once and for all. Well, I said, you've got your assignment. Good luck. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, There you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. Well, ordinarily, there's nothing I'd like better than a trip to Miami, but from the look on the commissioner's face, I've got a strong hunch I won't be spending my time water skiing through a blue lagoon with a beautiful doll perched on my shoulder. My plane lands there on Friday morning, and I head for the immigration office. Oh, Mitchell, we've been expecting you. I've got some luggage here you might be interested in looking through. This stuff here? Yeah, just help yourself, huh? This is the stuff that originally belonged to the tourists that we think these foreign agents murdered and then impersonated. Mm, Routine stuff, clothes, curios. Yeah, Yeah, that suitcase that you're going through now belongs to a Harold Davis. Yeah, according to my information, three guys landed here in Miami and were whisked away in a limousine. Yeah, that's right. When their car crashed, they were all killed. And that's where we recovered this luggage and those identification papers. But it didn't take us long to discover that the men in the car didn't belong to this stuff. Oh, what kind of a plane did they land in? A regular passenger plane. Caribbean Airlines from Trinidad. Hmm. Hmm? Well, what is it? Hey, this picture here in the suitcase. Is this the real Davis? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's Davis, all right. Well, maybe you should say it was Davis. <laughs> that girl with him in the picture, that's not bad. Not bad at all. You say the guy who was impersonating Davis flew in from Trinidad, hmm? Yeah, that's right, you think that this picture was taken there? I know it was. I recognize the hotel in the background. Oh. Well, in other words, this picture shows that the real Davis was in Trinidad. But the man who flew up here from Trinidad wasn't Davis. Well, that means that... That means that Trinidad is my next stop. So the trail's warming up. At this point, it looks like Trinidad is the spot where the switch has been taking place. I realize I've got to operate under cover and fast. So far, we've managed to keep that auto crash in Miami a secret, but it's only a question of time before the outfit that's running the racket finds out we're on their trail, and when they do, they'll drop their quaint little habit of bumping off tourists and concentrate on bumping off the guy who's after them, namely me. My plane lands in Trinidad the next afternoon, as usual. It's hot, but I've got an uneasy feeling that before I wind this one up, it's going to get a little hotter. I scout around to find the office of the Caribbean Airlines. Back at the counter, a tall, skinny gent is sleepily fanning himself with a travel folder. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Are you the ticket agent here? Yeah. What charming and delightful spot in the Caribbean do you want to fly to? You sound bitter. Well, this morning I didn't get a job I was counting on back in the States, and I also didn't get a raise here. Instead, I got a heat rash. I should be happy. Courage, Camille. Thanks, old man. (laughs) Now, uh, where do you want to go? Or did you just want to browse through some rare travel folders? I'm checking on a friend of mine, a guy named Harold Davis. Oh? What about him? Uh, I owe him some dough, and somebody told me he left Trinidad by plane the day before yesterday. I thought you might be able to check it for me. 
Okay. Oh, oh Davis. Davis. Uh, oh, yes, yes, uh, Harold Davis took off for Miami night before last, flight 17. Hmm. Wonder why he decided to leave here. This is something we don't ordinarily ask our customers. Well, he make the reservation in person? Oh, no, it was handled through Inter-Ocean. Inter-Ocean? Mm-hmm, travel agency here in Trinidad. I see. You uh, happen to have their address? Yeah, here's their card. It's uh, just down the street. Thanks, I... What's the matter? Uh, oh, nothing. I won't keep you up any longer. So long. What snapped me into action is a girl walking along the sidewalk outside the airline office. I only get a brief glimpse, but it's enough to tell me that that's the same girl who posed with the real Davis in that picture I found in the suitcase. I go outside and follow her down the street. A few doors down, she turns into an office, and that's where I get my second surprise, because there's a sign on the door, Inter-Ocean Travel Agency, the outfit that's been booking passengers on Caribbean Airlines. Now I know the trail's heating up. I follow her inside. Hello. Hi. What can I do for you? Well, that's what I came in here to find out. You run this travel agency? Sort of. I'm Miss Gray. Susan Gray. You a tourist here? Uh, yeah, sort of. Sounds like you're a little at loose ends right now. <laughs> Matter of fact, I am. Maybe it's just that I'm running out of places to go and things to do. Can't your wife suggest something? I'm not married. I see. Traveling alone? Yeah. Well, I'd be very happy to suggest any number of interesting little side trips. Good. That is, if you're not on any fixed schedule. What I mean is, is there anyone in the States who's expecting you back at any particular time? No, I'm what you might call completely unattached. Oh, well, in that case... Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I could sure use someone to show me around Trinidad. That is, if you happen to have any spare time. I think that could be arranged. Um... Steve Mitchell. Okay, Tell you what, Steve, I'll try to line up a little trip for you. Then we can talk about seeing some of the sights around Trinidad. Where can I reach you? Hispaniola Hotel. I'll be hearing from you then, Susan. Yes, you will, Steve. And very soon. I start back to my hotel, so I dangle a little alone and unattached bait in front of little Susan's nose, and she snaps it up like an underfed cobra. Which is all very fine, except that what it boils down to is that I'm setting myself up as a grade A clay pigeon. Then, as I'm walking down the street, I pass a bar, and I hear a very familiar voice. I shove open the door and go in. It's my old friend, Lord Byron, the Calypso singer. So come to the trade winds bar for your drinks. The price is right, and the food, it's good, too. <laughs> And Lord Byron spots me at the bar, and his face lights up like a neon sign. Oh, once was a brave man, Steve Mitchell, he, the best ever came to Trinidad Colony. He made a friend of Lord Byron, that's me, and both of us went sailing out to sea. We ran into bad men in diving suits, and had much trouble, you can bet your boots. But when all the fighting was over and done, the bad men had lost and Steve Mitchell had won. Steve. Steve Mitchell. Hello, Lord Byron. Hey, look, thanks for the free publicity, but I just assumed that nobody knew I'd ever been to Trinidad before. But why, Steve? At present, I'm making like a typical tourist. Oh, you're after someone again, Steve? That's right. Why don't you give it up, Steve? Huh? Always you look for bad men. Why don't you forget it? Now, me, I'm a happy man. This is the life here. To go fish, to go sail, to lie in the sun, to be happy. That's nice work if you can get it. There is more to life than this? Well, I guess there shouldn't be, but I... What, what's the matter, Steve? That girl who just came in. Girl? Oh, sure. She's nice looking, Steve. You want to meet her? I've already met her. Susan Gray works for a travel agency. Does she come in here often? Oh, yes. She comes in here almost every night. Uh, the tourists, she's always with them. I see. Well, that checks. Okay, I think I'll go have another talk with her. Be careful, Steve. No trouble. No trouble. Hi. Well, hello, Steve. I was just thinking about you. How was it? Hmm? The thinking. Nice. When do we start seeing the town together? Tonight, maybe? Oh, I'm sorry. I have plans tonight, but we'll make it real soon. Okay. And in the meantime, I'm trying to line up a little trip you might be interested in. Oh, 
Good evening, my dear. Oh, hello, Carlos. I do not believe I have met this man. Well, you couldn't have very well. I just met him a couple of hours ago myself. Steve Mitchell, Carlos Gelder. Hello. This man is perhaps bothering you, my dear? Of course not. He seems to be presuming upon a very short acquaintance. Look, Buster, is there any law against talking to a girl in a bar? In this particular part of the world, there are many unwritten laws covering various subjects. Oh, what subjects, for instance? For instance, you. Carlos, please. Just a minute, Susan. Okay, Gelder. Just what are those unwritten laws covering me? The same which apply to anyone who seeks to tread on forbidden ground. I could take that either of two ways. You may choose whichever you like, but just be certain that you do take it. Okay, for the time being. And I can assure you I am not talking in terms of the time being. Yeah, yeah. See you later, kid. Steve, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get in touch with you later. So, Steve, she's a popular young lady. Too popular, Lord Byron. Who's that little gent in the white suit I was just exchanging gay repartee with? Oh, he's a bad man, Steve. Stay away from him. Oh? Carlos Gelda. He's a very powerful man. What's he do? No one knows. But in Trinidad, his name means trouble. I see. He and Susan seem pretty thick. One trouble plus one trouble. He's double trouble. Hey, wait a minute. They're leaving together. No, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I know. No trouble. See you later, Lord Byron. <laughs> By the time I get outside, Susan and Gelder are nowhere in sight. I start along the sidewalk, and suddenly there's a guy walking beside me. A grinning native. I speed up. He stays with me. I stop. He throws a shoulder at me and sends me lurching into the alley. I whirl around. There's another guy in the alley waiting for me, also with a big grin on his face. And in his hand is a wicked-looking knife with a spring blade. He edges towards me quietly. The knife held low and pointing up. The first guy is somewhere behind me. I flatten myself against the wall and wait, watching the knifer's eyes. He starts to jab. I fling my butt. The knife goes flying, but the guy just keeps grinning and moving in. I dive for the end of the valley, but the first guy jumps on me. I give him a left, but too late. They're both swarming all over me. One of them pins my arms. The other starts working me over. He was doing a good job on me. Body punches enough to hurt, but not enough to knock me out. After what seems like an hour, I guess he gets tired. He winds up and lets fly with one to my face. And that does it. Here's a word about another NBC Chime favorite returning to the air this fall. It's Chester A. Riley, played by William Bendix in The Hilarious Life of Riley. Riley will be back over most of these stations just one week from today. Chester may not be the combination of lady killer, star athlete, and mental giant he thinks he is, but Mom, Babs, and Junior love him anyway. And you'll love them all, even the friendly undertaker, Digger O'Dell, when The Life of Riley returns just one week from tonight. The Chimes are your invitation. Now, back to Dangerous Assignment and Steve Mitchell. Steve, Steve, oh. Steve, come on, Steve, Steve. Uh, oh, Lord Byron. What happened, Steve? Oh, I wasn't playing tic-tac-toe. I don't know. Steve, it's no good. Someone was giving you a warning. Oh, come on back into the bar with me. I could use a drink along about now. Look, did Susan and Gelder come back into the bar after I left? No, I, I didn't see them. Steve, mm. Lord Byron is your friend. He gave you good advice. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's trouble. <laughs> I'm afraid it's a little late in the game to back out now. Come on, let's go on over to the bar. Other guy sticks his head out and says, now get this. He says, okay, wise guy, how are you going to get back? <laughs> Don't you get it? How are you going to get back? <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble. You guys just don't appreciate a good American joke. Scotch and soda, bartender. Hey, another American. Huh? Oh, yeah, another American. Clay's the name, friend. Abner H. Clay. Put her there. Hi. Mitchell's mine. Here, let me buy you a drink. Thanks, but I... Uh... I insist, friend. I insist. Okay, thanks. 
Well, 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 well. It sure is good to run into another traveler from the blessed land. Uh, yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, friend. I'm having a whale of a lot of fun on this trip, but I just haven't seen anything that compares with a little old hometown, good old Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yes, sir. Say, say, I got a great idea. Why don't you and me do this town up together? Thanks a lot, but no thanks. Oh, come on. Say, I can show you places you never even dreamed about. And girls? <laughs> I suppose you've even got a chicken inspector badge, too, huh? Oh, uh, what? Skip it. Oh. Uh, come on, friend. Let's make a night of it, huh? What do you say? After all, it's my last night here for a few days. I want to make the most of it. What do you mean, your last night? Well... Going to take a little boat trip around the islands. We shove off first thing in the morning. We? Uh, just small party. About three others, I think. Just a minute. Are you, by any chance, traveling alone, Clay? Alone? I sure am. You know, tell you how it happened. I was sitting there in my office in Milwaukee three months ago, and I suddenly said to myself, Abner, my boy, what you need is a vacation. So... Here I am. I see. And this little boat trip you're leaving on in the morning, mind telling me who arranged that for you? Not at all, my friend. Inter-Ocean Travel Agency, right here in town. Hey, there's a little lady there who is just... Uh, Susan? Yes. You know her? Slightly. Oh, she's sure been mighty sweet to me. I don't doubt it. Oh, come on, friend. Why don't you change your mind and make the rounds with me tonight? I just did change my mind. Let's go, friend. <laughs> Brother, is this someplace, huh, Steve? Well, it looks about the same as the last five bars we've been in, Clay. Look, this boat trip you're taking in the morning. Yeah. Have they told you where you're going? Oh, they said we'd poke around a few little islands in the out-of-the-way places. Uh -huh. I suppose you're taking all your luggage and papers with you. Well, that's right. Matter of fact, they told us to be sure and bring them. Oh, well, they said we might stay longer than we expected if found places we like. I see. Look, Clay, I but what's the matter, friend? Somebody just walked in. Huh? Oh, we... Oh, it's Susan. Hey, Mitchell, I got a great idea. Why don't you come along on this trip? Huh? Well, I don't know. It's pretty short notice. Well, uh, Susan, Susan. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> well, it's Mr. Clay and Steve. Hello, Susan. I'm glad I ran into you again. Uh, where's your boyfriend, Gelder? Oh, we had a quarrel. I'm awfully sorry about that scene he caused at the Trade Wen's bar. I collected a few lumps in an alley right after that. What? But I don't suppose you or Gelder would know anything about that. Of course not. I, I don't understand, Steve. I'll skip it. Uh, say, Susan, I just had me a great idea. What is it, Mr. Clay? Well, Steve and me, we got to be old buddies, and I was wondering, why couldn't he go along on this boat trip in the morning? I was working on a trip for Steve a little later on. I I'm afraid the one tomorrow is pretty well booked up. Oh, well, I'll bet you could change that little lady. Yeah. Now, couldn't you? Well, I suppose I could make some last-minute arrangements. I'd sure appreciate it. All right. Yeah. There, that's my girl. That's my girl, all right. Yeah, how about that, Steve? Uh, Isn't yeah. that swell? Yeah, yeah. All right, now, I'll tell you what. Meet me down at the dock at 7 tomorrow morning, okay? All right, Clay, I'll be there. <laughs> Things are turning out a little differently than I'd bargained for. I'd figured on having more time to find out a few things about the Inter-Ocean Travel Agency before I took one of their little trips. But now here I am scheduled to sail in the morning. I'm not sure I like it, but I don't have any choice. To back out would probably arouse their suspicions. And besides, looks like I'm stuck playing nursemaid to the happy American tourist, Clay, who's looking for all the world like the pigeon of the same name right now. The next morning, I take my luggage down to the dock at 7 o'clock. Susan and Clay are already there beside a small motor launch. Morning, Mitchell. Hi. Come on board, Steve. Okay. Well, where are all the other passengers? They should be along any minute. How many are there? Three. Oh, well, great morning for a trip, huh? Yeah, but how about this boat? It doesn't seem to look big enough for much cruising. Oh, this is just a launch that'll take you to an island down the coast away. You'll pick up the cruise boat there. I see. Oh, here comes one of the other passengers now. I... No, no, I guess it isn't. Hey, it's that Calypso singer. Huh? Hey, Lord Byron. Oh, Steve. Uh, What's the matter, Lord Byron? Uh, nothing, nothing. I came down to give you a goodbye serenade. Oh? 
Well, you really get service, Steve. Yeah, so it seems. Now, where else could you find an atmosphere like this, huh, friend? Okay, let her go, Lord Byron. Oh, Steve Mitchell came down to Trinidad And met a girl who sure made him glad She worked for a travel agency And arranged little trips for a modest fee Well, thanks for the plug. Then Steve met a tourist in the bar last night Who took him around and showed him the sights But poor Steve Mitchell, he doesn't see That the tourist owns a travel agency Well, uh, a happy trip, Steve Lord Byron, come on back here But you see, I, I've got to... You're not going anywhere, friend Come on, Why? get in the boat, move Very well Well... Thanks for the try anyway, Lord Byron. Sure, Steve. Okay, Susan, shove off. What about the other passengers? We can't wait for them now. We'll take care of these two birds first and then come back with the others. Get going. All right. Uh, you've been the big boy in this deal all along, Clay, huh? I sure have, friend. Well, I guess congratulations are in order. That's quite an act you put on being the great American tourist. Not bad at all, is it? And with Susan giving them the come on, I don't suppose you have much trouble getting all the unsuspecting tourists you need. We haven't had much trouble so far, and that's the way we're going to keep it. You mind telling me where we're going? Not at all, friend. The Bago Island, a little way down the coast. But you know, it really shouldn't matter much to you where you're going. Because I'll tell you something. You and Lord Byron aren't coming back. <laughs> Steve and Lord Byron got big troubles now. They're locked up in the cabin of a little scow. The bad man tell them they're holding the sack. They go to an island, but they don't come back. Hey, look, will you lay off? It's bad enough being cooped up in here waiting for the axe without you making a musical comedy of it. All right, Steve. But why is he taking us to Tobago Island? That's probably where his agents are hiding out, waiting. It's probably also the tourist graveyard. Incidentally, where is Tobago Island? We've been cruising about two hours. There's another hour left to go. All right. Wait a minute. We're turning and slowing up. I'm going to take a look out the portal. Hey, I thought you said it was another hour to Tobago Island. That's right, Steve. Well, don't look now, but there's a little island right in front of us. What? Yeah, and we're heading toward what looks like a little abandoned dock. Let, let me see. Huh. It's not Tobago Island. San Miguel. I wonder why the switch. Are you familiar with this island? Sure, Steve. Deserted island. I was here once. All right, friend. I'll on deck. I thought you said we were going to Tobago Island, Clay. We were. But Susan and I got to figuring. Maybe you were a little wiser to our operation than you've been letting on. I still don't get you, Clay. Maybe you already knew Tobago Island was our rendezvous point. Maybe before you came down to the dock this morning, you arranged to have a little help show up there. All right, come on ashore. Seems to me you're giving me a lot of credit, Clay. Well, I figure it's always safer to overestimate the opposition than underestimate them. So, Susan, I spotted this little deserted island and figured it'd be a convenient place to stop for a while. I will lead the way. There, there is no train. I right, just don't get too far ahead of us. You've got the whole deal figured out, haven't you? I sure have, friend. Look, it seems to me you're taking care of Lord Byron and me the hard way. You could have tied us up and thrown us overboard. No. There's always the chance your bodies would start drifting around and be discovered. It's much better to have you safely buried in the ground. I see. Just like you did with the other tourists, huh? <laughs> you catch on quick, Mitchell. Yep. This underbrush is pretty thick. Follow closely in my tracks and you will have no trouble. Hey, he's an obliging guy all of a sudden, isn't he? Yeah, I don't get it. Well, uh, here's a little clearing. Yes, sir. This is where we stop. All right, it's as good as any. So this is the last stop, huh? For you and Lord Byron. For all of us. What do you mean? This San Miguel Islands is a very bad place. What are you talking about? Steve, you've heard the legend of San Miguel, haven't you? Legend of... Oh, yeah, well, sure, sure. It's supposed to be a pretty bad place, isn't it? Yes, a very bad place. Look, bluffing's not going to do you two any good now. It's no bluff. I'll tell you the story of San Miguel. 
Oh, once came a man to this island here. He built a house and he built a pier. Then he walked into this jungle so nice and green, and never any more was he seen. Look, what are you giving us anyway? It's the truth, Susan. I remember it all now. The ground opened up and down he went. The earth closed over him without a dent. But on some night you can still hear him say, From San Miguel Island, stay away. All right, all right, that's enough of your silly song. It's not a silly song, Clay, it's truth. All over the island, quicksand. Quicksand? Sure, that's it, quicksand. The whole place is quicksand under it. Every once in a while, the crust over it collapses. All right. I said cut out the fairy tale. It's no fairy tale. Look, Lord Byron's the only one who knows where to walk safely. You kill us and you'll never make it back to the beach. Clay, what if he's telling the truth? Ah, they're not telling the truth. I tell you, they're bluffing. Oh, what was that? Probably a hunk of ground collapsing. Shut up, Mitchell. It was just an animal of some kind, was it? There it is again. Where did it come from? It came from right over there. Thanks for turning your head away. Yeah, let go of me, Mitchell. Drop that gun before I break your arm. So, the quicksand story was a bluff. Sure, it worked. Lord Byron's sharpen. I figured now. Drop that gun. Yeah. That's better. I'll get it. Oh, no, Susan. I'll take the gun. Clay, come back here. Let him go, Steve. Let him go, are you crazy? Clay! Oh, he's out of sight. You will not go far, Steve. What? Clay. What happened? Don't move anyone. But what happened to Clay? He's gone. Quicksand. What? Quicksand? But I thought... I was telling the truth. It's San Miguel, very bad place. Oh, brother. All this time I thought we were just bluffing. Come on, let's get out of here. Lord Byron, very happy to do just that. Look, you can't leave me here. Don't worry, you've got a date with a jail, Susan, and I imagine the Harbor Patrol will be happy to head for Tobago Island to pick up Clay's boys. Well, uh... Let's go back to the beach, Steve. Okay, but just one thing now. Oh, Steve's friend Lord Byron has saved the day. And under the quicksand you'll find clay. Now two more words and then I'm through. My dear Lord Byron, after you. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jando, with music by Basil Adlam, and is produced and directed by Bill Karn. Be with us again next week at this time, when Brian Donlevy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Saturday night chimes mean Dennis Day and Judy Canova. Dennis Day will be back on Saturday, October 7th, just one week from tomorrow, with more songs and merry, mischievous mix-ups. The Judy Canova show returns on the same day. And when Judy and her pals get together, it's 30 minutes of mountain-style music and mayhem. The chimes are your invitation to Dennis Day and Judy Canova. And now, stay tuned for Dimension X on NBC. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Most private detectives, when they're called into a case by a wealthy patron, are ushered into the library or the gun room or the master's private den. 
Not so private detective Michael Shame and his attractive assistant Phyllis Knight. Oh, no. They find themselves at San Francisco's Cliff House to keep a date with, well, let Phyllis tell it, which she is doing without any of the poetry she knows so well. Now, there's no use arguing, Mike Shane. If she oh. weren't a blonde and good-looking, you'd have turned the case down. For the thousandth time, honey, I tell you, I haven't seen the girl. Oh, really? She isn't blonde, and I don't know whether or not she's good-looking. I'll bet, I'll I bet. I only know, honey, that she's frightened. Mm-hmm. She said she was a brunette, five foot two, and wearing a Kelly green raincoat. Well, then, there she is, hmm? staring out the window. Right, Angel. Well, leave us ankle over. You know, she does look scared. Oh, she saw us. Hey, does she know you? No, but I told her I was bringing you along and there aren't any other couples around. Mr. Shane and Miss Knight? Correct. You, Miss Jones? Well, no. Well, that is, I used that name over the phone, but my real name is Wright. Not Patricia Wright? Yes. Hmm? Oh, then it was your brother. I mean, I read the article in the papers. Say, what is all this? My brother was killed Monday. The police said it was an accident. He fell over the cliff, they said, but... But you think he was killed <clears throat> deliberately? Yes. Uh, murdered, in fact. Yes. Why? Well, I just know he was pushed over that cliff. And now, whom do you suspect? Oh, I don't know. My father's manager, Mr. Haberman, for one, and, mm-hmm. and a Mr. Armstrong, a businessman dealing with my father, and... And... And your father? Well, yes. Well, not that I think my father killed my brother, no, but... Well, I am suspicious of some of my father's business dealings and very suspicious of some of his associates. Uh, Miss Wright, your brother was in the business with your father? Yes, and, well, he didn't approve of some of their deals. Did he complain to you or to your father, or both? Both. Oh, they've had bitter quarrels over some of their transactions. And how about you, Miss Wright? Are you afraid for your own life? Yes, terribly oh. afraid. Okay. Okay, that settles it so far as I'm concerned. We'll take the case. Now, uh, how about going out to your place and looking over the ground? Hmm? But we can't. That's why I use the assumed name, and that's why I met you here instead of at the house. Listen, Patricia, your best safeguard is to let the murderer know that you have a detective on the job. The very fact that you've engaged me will make them wonder how much you know. We'll watch out for you, Miss Wright. Nothing's going to happen to you while Mike's on the job. Well, all right, I'll do it. Fine. Good. Now get in your car, then, and we'll follow you out, and even if he turns out to be your father, we'll get the killer. <laughs> It's over here, just by that white post. That's where he, he fell. Uh-huh. Oh, boy. Did they, uh, did they take your brother's body away from the bottom of the cliff or uh, bring it up here on ropes? Well, they took it away from the bottom, in a boat. I see. Was there much of a crowd here at the top? No. Why? Well, there are a lot of footprints here. I'll the ground see. is pretty well tramped down. But there weren't any people here at all. Why, this is private property. The murderer tramped the ground to confuse... Hey, wait a minute. What? What is it, Mike? Honey, you see those marks? Yeah. Those marks were made by a dead man's heels as his body was dragged to the edge of the cliff and thrown over. And the killer hid behind the tree. Yes, and probably hit his victim with a rock. Yeah. Uh, Patricia, did your brother have a date with anyone the night he was killed? Yes, with Mr. Haberman, Daddy's partner. Mr. Haberman came out to the house at 8 o'clock and mm-hmm. said that he'd made an appointment to meet my brother. But about 10 o'clock, he decided to go home. Just as he was leaving, the chauffeur came to the door and said that they'd found the body down on the rocks below the cliff. Was the chauffeur looking for your brother? No, he didn't know anything was wrong then. The chauffeur was out fishing and was just coming into the little cove when he saw a hat on the water. He turned the boat along the rocks and found my brother's body. The chauffeur is up at the house now? No, he left. He left? He left? What do you mean? Well, he'd been doing a lot of drinking and my brother fired him about a week ago. Oh, fine. We seem to be turning up suspects wherever we move. Uh, right, Angel. Well, Miss Patricia, will you get your father's manager and Mr. Armstrong up to the house right away? Use any excuse at all. I'll get Inspector Faraday to find the chauffeur, and we'll have a little quiz contest with Mike Shane as quiz master. <laughs> I don't know what on earth you could be thinking of, Patricia, to do such a thing. But, Daddy... Not another word. You tell this Shane fellow to get about his business. When any private detectives are hired to come to this house, I'll do the hiring. Daddy, I'm more convinced than ever that my brother was murdered. Murdered? Stuff and nonsense. My dear, you're upset. I don't blame you for that. 
You were very fond of your brother. But thinking for one moment that any of my business associates could be guilty of such a thing. The idea of dragging Mr. Haberman and Mr. Armstrong out here to be cross-questioned by a, a private detective. Why, it isn't as if there was any suspicion about your brother's death. The police were satisfied it was an accident. I'm not satisfied, however, Mr. Wright. Who are you, sir? Michael Shane, private detective, and this is my assistant, Miss Knight. Hello, I'm very happy to meet you, Mr. Wright. I'm sorry I can't say the same. Hmm? I hate to appear impolite, but I must ask you to leave my house immediately. Well, let's go, Mike. We don't have to take this sort of thing from anybody. Uh, just a minute, Angel. Oh, really? Mr. Wright, I suppose you realize that by your attitude, you're casting a lot of unnecessary suspicion on yourself. Why, you impudent young whelp. If I were a younger man, I'd thrash you within an inch of your life, you... Will you leave quietly, or will I have to have you thrown out? Evidently, there's company at the door, and I'd much prefer not to have to introduce you. Pardon me, sir, but to Mr. Faraday. Faraday? Detective Inspector Faraday, sir. With a chauffeur, sir. Hello, mm. Mike. Fellas. Hello, Inspector. Mr. Wright here was just about to order us thrown out. <laughs> he won't have a private detective around the place. I see. Well, maybe he'll let you stay as my assistant. What on earth are you talking about? I'm talking about the fact that we're here to investigate the death of your son. I'd just as soon get on with the questioning if you haven't any objections. Will you have everybody come in here? Uh, Inspector, they're all out in the front hall. I Maybe don't know what this is all about. I'm only the chauffeur. I haven't done anything. I'll sue you for arresting me. That's, That's what right. Do. Be sure and do that. All right, into the front hall. Well, which one of you is Haberman? I'm Mr. Haberman. Why? And Armstrong, that's you, I suppose. Mm-hmm, correct. Now, I don't know much about this except what Mike told me over the phone, but I understand that you, Mr. Haberman... Had an appointment with Mr. Wright Jr., the deceased, the evening he was killed. Yes, that is true. Uh, what was that meeting about? Well, I don't see that it's any of your business. You mm -hmm. can answer that question here and now or at headquarters later. Take your choice. Well, uh, it was a business matter. Don't answer him. But right, if I don't, he'll take me in and... And you know. he'll have to answer in the long run. It was uh, business, and young Mr. Wright was going to tell you that he wouldn't play along with the kind of deal you and his father were cooking up, correct? Well, that's putting it rather strongly. Hmm. He was a young fellow, too many idealistic ideas for the business world. I was quite certain I could straighten him out when we sat down and talked it over. And when he wouldn't listen, you threatened his life? Of course not. You didn't see him that night at all? No, I didn't. And you weren't anywhere near the top of the cliff between 8 and 10.30? I most certainly was not. Can you prove that? I can. I sat and talked with Mr. Haberman all evening. And Mr. Armstrong, I suppose you have an alibi, too? Well, I don't know. I think I was at a picture show that night, but I wasn't keeping track of my movements. Uh, I wasn't anywhere near this house, though. Mm-hmm. Oh, Inspector. Yes, Mike. Come here. I think we ought to do some checking on the murdered man's papers. We might find something that would give us a lead. You're probably right, Mike. Okay. You can all go now. But don't leave the place. We may want to do a few more answers before we leave. Uh, Miss Patricia. Yes, Inspector. Will you take us to your brother's room? We'll see what that leads us to. find anything, honey? Uh-uh. Nothing important, Mike. How about you, Inspector? Nothing. I hope we're not on a wild goose chase. Oh, I know we're not. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's something. What, what is it, Mike? Mind, Mike? It's a memo pad. And here's an entry. It says, must talk to father about Haberman's inability to do things honestly. If he can be so dishonest with the people we are doing business with, there will come a day when he will be as dishonest with us. Mm. Hey, hey, look at that later entry, Mike. The one made the day he was killed. Here. Oh, yes. We'll have showdown with Haberman mm. tonight. Either he goes or I get out of the business. I've called him and made appointment for 7 o'clock. Wait a minute. 7 o'clock? Haberman said he made the appointment for 8 o'clock. Yeah, that's he did. right. Come on. Come on, we'd better hurry up looking through this stuff and then a little more questioning for Mr. Haberman. What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? Mr. Shane, Inspector, yeah. it's it's unbelievable. It's horrible. What is it? What is it? Haberman. I I went to the stables a few minutes ago. Go on, go on. Haberman was lying there, dead. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane and his assistant Phyllis in their adventures. All of us know that some restaurants always seem to serve better food than others, even though their menus may read the same. The reason, of course, is simple. Better ingredients plus extra attention on the part of skilled help. The same principles apply to car lubrication. For example, Union Oil Stopware lubrication is more than just a grease job. Stopware lubrication is a highly specialized servicing process. 
Only trained attendants using the latest and most modern equipment are allowed to service your car. Each fitting and bearing is thoroughly lubricated with the finest, high-quality greases in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. While your car is on the hoist, the Minutemen inspect out-of-sight points and check them for danger signs. As final evidence of the care and exactness with which stop wear lubrication is performed, you receive a thousand-mile written guarantee with each job. Definite proof of reliable service. So, ladies and gentlemen, since careful, thorough lubrication is so vital to the life of your car, why not buy Stopwear? Stopwear guaranteed lubrication is available only at Union Oil Minuteman stations, and it costs no more than ordinary lubrication. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. It is a few minutes later. Mike, Phyllis, and Inspector Faraday have reached the stables and stand looking down at Haberman's body. Now, how did it happen? Well, he just got too close to Prince, and Prince lashed out and kicked him. I found him lying here when I came by. Was anybody else around the stables? Yes, uh, Armstrong was here, and the groom and the gardener. Isn't it a bit odd that everyone should gather at the stables? No, I don't think so. Everybody's interested in the horses, especially Prince. Why Prince? Well, I've warned them all to keep away from him. He's a killer. Why have you kept him, then? Because I can handle him. So can the stable hands, and he's a very valuable horse. He just lashes out at strangers or people who don't talk to him as they approach him. Hmm. Surely you don't think this is murder, too? Hmm? Why, it's ridiculous. Nobody in their right mind can have any doubt as to how Haberman was killed. The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain... Well, you can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. Perhaps I'm not in my right mind, Mr. Wright, but when two men engaged in the same business die within a few days of each other, I'm suspicious. You and me both, Mike. Mr. Wright, you just walked out from the house and found Haberman lying dead. Well, uh, more or less, I came out from the back of the house, hmm? saw that the upper half of the door to Prince's stall was unlatched. I came over to latch it and found Haberman. I couldn't see him lying on the ground from where I was because, as you can see, he was hidden by the water trough. Yes. Yes, I see. So, Inspector, depending on how you look at it, everybody has alibis or nobody has an alibi. You're right, Mike. They all have alibis if they're telling the truth. Well, I most certainly have. I was talking on the telephone from the time I left you until I came out here. The servant saw me in the hall when I was on the phone. Oh, yes, and the chauffeur and the stable boy, Joe, saw me at the back of the stables. I didn't even come around front until Wright called out. That's true. I'm his alibi and he's mine. <laughs> so I'm afraid, Mr. Shane, you'll have to pin the guilt on the horse after all. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? Oh, Mike. Yes, Inspector? How about running down to headquarters with me? Okay, but you're going to leave someone here. Well, I hardly think we need... Inspector. Inspector, for 24 hours, I'd like someone posted at the stables and at the west side of the house looking out toward the cliff. Yeah, but Mike... If only to guarantee the safety of Miss Wright. Okay, Mike. I'll leave the sergeant and one man. Will that satisfy you? Excellent, Inspector. Excellent. And now I'm quite ready to accompany you to headquarters. Okay, here you are, Inspector. Report on a threatening telegram. A threatening wire addressed to Haberman was handed in at San Francisco's main office. No one remembers what the man looked like. They paid no attention. Okay. Follow through on the chauffeur, will you? Yes, sir. Well, it's not much help. Oh, why don't you give up, Mike? After all, we're just following nothing but a hunch from that girl, Patricia. Well, that's right, Mike. I admit it's a bit gruesome having two deaths in the same household, but it's happened before. Oh, there's something wrong about the whole thing. What do you mean, Mike? Well... As I see it, the father, Mr. Wright, isn't above entering into shady deals. No, that seems apparent. So one can legitimately assume that his manager, Haberman, wasn't uh, averse to entering into the same sort of deal. We don't have to assume that. We know it from the son's memo pad. Yeah, that's right. The son actually accused him of being crooked. And we have Armstrong, a business associate. We can assume in his case, too, that he's not above turning a sort of twisted penny. To all of which the son is opposed. To such an extent that he actually puts in writing that he's going to talk to his father and that either the crooked manager goes or he does. Right. And if we assume, too, that the father would rather have his son in the business than the crooked manager, we have motive for murder. For some men, at least. And we have Haberman making a date to see the son. Which Haberman says was for 8 o'clock 
but which we know for a fact was at seven o'clock. You build in quite a case, Mike, but it all hinges on supposition. Suppose, Mike, that you're right. Yeah? And if you are right, and Haberman did kill the son, just has already overtaken him. Yeah, but there's something wrong with the whole thing, Inspector. You say I'm building the whole case uh, uh, of a supposition. Well, plus a hunch of the girls, Mike. And a funny little quirk that keeps running through my own mind. What? Well, when I was a kid, I used to hold horses at the old Fairfax Hunt Club. Yes? Sometimes for a whole day's work, I made two bits. One day, well, I hadn't made my two bits. I guess I was a little on the anxious side. I stepped up too quickly to a horse. He lashed out at me, and I, I jumped back. But that hoof, with its iron shoe, seemed to be following me. It was a huge, as huge as a, as a barn door. A great big black iron shoe that would mash my face in from chin to forehead. A great big letter U coming at... Go on, go on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, a big U. That's it, that's what's wrong with the picture. Oh, what a blockhead I've been. Say, what goes? What is it, Mike? Oh, come on, can't you picture Haberman lying there on the ground by the stable? Well, sure I can, Don't but... you remember what Wright said? The mark of the horseshoe is as plain, too plain... You can see the curve of the shoe across his forehead. I remember him saying that, but what on... Mike, you're right. Well, I don't get it. I get it. Yes, I do. Haberman would have had to be standing on his head for the horseshoe to have left a mark like that. Atta girl, honey. The mark was upside down. Come on, come on. Back to the right stables as fast as that squad car of yours will take us, Faraday. Go right back to the stables, Inspector. We can park there. Right, Mike. I'm going to follow my hunch as long as I'm in the mood. What do you mean, hunch? If I were a killer and had killed a man at the stables... Yes? ...and I was so certain that everybody would think it was an accident... ...and so nobody would even think of looking for a weapon... Yeah, yeah. ...where would I go to hide the weapon? The, the hayloft. Hay right. So, come on, up these steps. Here, honey, I'll help you there. Well, I'm not very good at this. Wait. I know that, but come on. There we are. Now you take the far end, honey. And I'll right. climb up onto the rat. Okay, and I'll take the scent. It's not behind this feed box. It's not here either. Where's it? Where's Phyllis? Here. Here, under this load of hay. Okay. Anything up there, Inspector? No, everything up here is covered with dust, so I think this is all in the clear. Okay, come down then before you break your neck. Ooh. What? What is it, honey? Oh, it's something heavy and wet. Huh? And sort of sticky. It, it's blood, Mike. Let me have it. I'll use my handkerchief. There may be fingerprints. What is it? Just a second. Oh, ye gods. Look, Inspector. A heavy piece of timber. Oh, but with a horseshoe nailed to the flat side. Upside down. Okay. Okay, let's keep our find a secret and continue our quizzing. <laughs> We'll rejoin Mike Shane, Phyllis Knight, and Inspector Faraday in their search for the killer in just a moment. We'd like you to listen for a moment to one of the most sickening sounds of modern life. Lately, you've been hearing that sound more frequently. Traffic accidents in the United States are increasing to an alarming extent as our automobiles grow older. To reduce human casualties and conserve transportation, the International Association of Chiefs of Police has developed a program to emphasize the need for good brakes for all cars. For the next six weeks, law enforcement officers throughout the nation will conduct a brake-checking campaign. They are seeking to protect your life and property. This program on brake emphasis for traffic safety is supported by over 100 automobile clubs and traffic organizations, including the Office of Defense Transportation. Your cooperation is earnestly requested. You can help by checking your own brakes. If you can depress your brake pedal within an inch of the floorboard before the brakes take hold, they are inadequate and demand immediate attention. Remember, serious accidents can occur at speeds as low as 20 miles per hour 
if your brakes are in poor condition. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have the slightest doubt about the condition of your automobile brakes, don't take chances. Have them inspected without delay. Mike, Phyllis, Inspector Faraday, and Patricia Wright are in the library waiting for the members of the household to put in an appearance. Are you sure you don't want me to get Daddy and the others in here? No, no, not yet. We let them wander in one at a time and take them by surprise. I, I have a reason. Hey, what about the chauffeur, Mike? For my money, he's out. Mm-hmm. Why, Mike? Well, as a suspect for the killing of the son who fired him, he was a possibility, but I see no connection between him and Haberman's death. No, perhaps not. But don't forget one thing. He's the alibi for Armstrong, just as Armstrong is his alibi. The way I'm thinking right now, honey, no one has an alibi. What do you mean? When all the suspects have alibis for their actions, and yet you have two bodies to account for, there's only one act. One and that is? Someone or all of them are lying. And the alibis mean nothing, so just ignore them. Mike, somebody's coming. Hmm? That's right. Oh, there you are, Pat. What? Oh, I, I thought you'd all gone back to the city. We did, sir, but we have a few more questions we'd like answered. <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so, I... I think you're not quite bright. Hmm? Meaning what, Mr. Wright? Meaning that you're all following a completely senseless theory, trying to find clues to a murder when no murder has been committed. To everyone but you, it's obvious that Mr. Haberman had been kicked by Prince. Suppose we just skip that for a moment, huh? Uh, Mr. Wright, just exactly what is the relationship between your firm and Mr. Armstrong? I don't see that it's any of your business. Oh, now let's not go through that routine again. If you'd let me finish, I still think it's none of your business, but I'm perfectly willing to tell you. Mr. Armstrong is an agent for some eastern industrial properties which we're considering purchasing. I see. And was Mr. Haberman in complete agreement with you about this purchase? He was up until a few nights ago. Uh, what or who changed his mind? Well, uh, my son wasn't too happy about the deal, and I think he changed Haberman's mind. When did your son tell you that you either fired Haberman or he would leave the company? What? Why? No, you... no, no, no. Don't I... get all ins- insulted and abusive. We know your son did tell you that. Patricia, if you... Your did... daughter had nothing to do with our knowing that, Mr. Wright. Ah, uh, let's not argue about it. It is true, isn't it? Yes. And what did you decide? Well, go on. Answer. Well, I... I hadn't made up my mind. I... I sort of hoped that things would work themselves out. And they have, sir. First, by the death of your son, and next, Haberman. Both troublesome elements removed within a... Surely you don't... You can't think that I'd connive in the death of my own son. Patricia, you... Yes, Father. You don't believe that I had anything to do with... No, Dad. And I don't either. Nor do Miss Knight and Inspector Faraday. Well, I... I'm glad of that, I... I'm glad, too, that you're coming to your senses and realizing that my boy's death was an accident. No, Mr. Wright, your son's death was not an accident, any more than Haberman's was. Well, who could you possibly suspect? Who stands to gain by both deaths? Why, no one. What about Armstrong? Armstrong? But Armstrong... You mean that Armstrong was afraid that my son's objection to our deal and later Haberman's objection might cause the deal to fall through? Exactly, Mr. Wright, and it's very easy to prove, that is. It Mm. will be easy. If you will cooperate. Oh, oh, certainly. I'll cooperate in any way I can. But... <laughs> you haven't been very cooperative so far, Mr. Wright. I... Yes, well, I'll, I'll do whatever you ask me to. Now we're getting somewhere. Now here's what we'll do. Phyllis, the inspector, and I will hide. Phyllis behind the curtains leading to the terrace. The inspector in that closet. Got it. And I'll get behind the door. Yes. Patricia will go to her own room. You, you, Mr. Wright, will call Armstrong in and tell him you're not going through with the deal. Mm. I'm quite certain his reaction will be enough to convince you. Well, I, I don't think I'll find that difficult. I, I'd practically made up my mind to that anyway. All this I think is Armstrong ju- is coming in the front door hall. Oh. Oh, all right, all right, now, quick, everybody, quick, get set. You run upstairs, Patricia, go on. Okay, right, call him in. Uh, oh, uh, <clears throat> that you, Armstrong? Yes. Did you want me? Uh, yes, yes. I I think in spite of all the tragedy around here that we ought to arrive at some definite conclusion about this transaction. Well, I suppose you're right. I didn't want to hurry you or seem aggressive with all the things that have happened. Yes, yes, I understand. But it is an excellent opportunity, and I know you'll make a mint out of it. I'm not going through with it, however. I... What? I'm not going through with it, Armstrong. Oh, you're not, huh? Well, that's what you think. What was that you said? I said that if you think you've got to back out now, you've got another thing coming. Oh, wait a minute. You're not leaving me holding the sack. I've obligated myself for those properties, and you're going to buy them. I'm most certainly not going to buy them if I don't want to. And maybe this will persuade you. Put that gun down, you fool. Drop it, Armstrong. The next time, be faster. What is this? 
Is this a trap? In a way it is, yes, and apparently quite a justifiable one. I must apologize for the gunplay, and I must apologize for being quite slow and somewhat blind. Blind, Mike? Yes. Yes, I should have noticed long before this that Mr. Armstrong was left-handed. I didn't, however, until he whipped out that gun of his with his left hand. Left-handed? Yes, I... Phil, left-handed. What? What does that matter? I... I've been left-handed all my life. Yes, Armstrong, left-handed. I think you can produce the evidence now, Inspector. Right, Mike. Did you ever see that weapon before, Armstrong? Where did you find it? In the hayloft. That's where you hit it, isn't it, Armstrong? Okay, Inspector, I don't think we'll get any more argument out of him. You ready, Armstrong? Uh, yes. Want some more coffee, Inspector? No, thanks, Phyllis. Mmm, that was an excellent dinner. Oh, say that again. Angel's a good cook. Flatterer. As well as being good at uh, mm, poetry reviews. Oh. <laughs> say that left-handed business. I've been turning it over and over in my mind. I don't see what on earth Armstrong's being left-handed had to do with the case at all. Hmm? Well, I thought perhaps his being left-handed was, well, responsible for him nailing the horseshoe on the club the wrong way. Oh, no, Angel. No. That was just the inevitable slip that a murderer makes. Well, then what was the left-handed clue? When I remarked on Armstrong's being left-handed, you repeated it after me, remember? Yeah, sure. I... I caught the look in Mike's eye and repeated it after you. Well, yes, I remember that, too. It impressed me, but I didn't catch on. Ah, then it impressed Armstrong, too, and he didn't catch on. He didn't know why or what we had in mind, and the inspector and I didn't give him time to find out. We played cat and mouse with him. Armstrong thought that his being left-handed was a clue. He couldn't figure out what it was. But our tone of voice convinced him that we had him dead to rights. And, well, he broke down. Smarty. Hmm? <laughs> it was nothing but playing up a guilty conscience. <laughs> right, Angel. One of the best weapons a private detective has. So let it be a lesson to you there, darling. And don't try holding out anything on your old man, Mike Shane. Or your good old conscience will get you. again next week at 8.30 for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, and Joe Forte as Inspector Faraday. Tonight's story was written and produced by David Taylor, and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Rexall family druggist speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names. 
and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company, like Rexall MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular and versatile mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full strength MI-31 kills contacted germs almost instantly, yet will not harm the delicate membranes of the mouth and throat. Ask for Rexall MI-31 at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another exciting half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. I'm a detective agency. When it's murder or less and you're caught in a mess, if you can't pay my fee, my advice is confess. <laughs> Rick, you old son of a gun. <laughs> this is Frank. Frank? Oh, Frank Bowers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's good to talk to you again, Rick. How you been? Well, no complaints, Frank. What's with you? Uh, doing great, Rick. Just great. Bought me a half interest in a gym here in town. Yeah? Sell all your fighters? Oh, but one. Boy by the name of Max Farmer. Say, he's going to the main event tonight. You want to catch him? Well, it all depends. Who's throwing him? <laughs> no, Rick, no. This boy's really good. Say, why don't you drop by the arena tonight? Oh, sorry, Frank. I got a date. And she hates the sight of blood. Ah, talk her into it, boy. I'll leave a couple of passes for you at the gate. Uh, passes? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I'm a sucker for a good argument. See you tonight, Frank. That night, I led Helen to our seats at ringside. She was dressed to kill, and from the look on her face, I thought I might be the first on her list. Rick. Yes, baby? Would you mind telling the man behind me to stop dripping mustard on my mink? Oh, sure, sure, honey. Hey, Buster, please do not feed the animals. That's the good boy. Rick, why of all places the fights? But, honey, these are $10 seats. Hey, Ricky, Ricky, glad you could use the passes. Boing. Move your feet, Rockefeller, and let the man in. <laughs> oh, gee, it's good to see you again, Rick. <laughs> say, say, I want you to meet Lorna Thorne. I, uh... Wow. Hanging onto Frank's arm, I saw why boys like girls. She was wearing slightly more than the fighters. Had so many curves, I got seasick just looking at her. As I stared, I suddenly felt a strange sensation in my legs. Helen was digging her heel into my shin. Come up for air, Ricky, dear. Mm. Oh, uh, honey, uh, honey, I want you to meet Frank Bowers. Sally, I know you anywhere. Rick's told me a lot about you. Frank, yeah? that was five years ago. This is Helen. Oops, <laughs> my mistake, huh? <laughs> Lorna, I want you to meet Helen. Hiya. Well, when in Rome... <laughs> Hiya. What a spot for a thesaurus. Hey, sit over there, will you, honey? I want to sit next to Rick. Oh, Rick, it's a shame I didn't tip you to this fight earlier. You could have put some dough on my boy and really cleaned up. Uh, you think he'll win, huh? No, I know he'll win. He's fighting Lou Scott, strictly a bum from upstate. The syndicate made the match just to build up Farmer's name and pick up some easy dough on the side. Now he tells me. <laughs> there. There's my boy getting in the ring now. I watched Max Farmer climb through the ropes, stop, smile at the television cameras, then at the crowd, and then at the cameras again. If the people at home thought they were seeing a reissue of The Hairy Ape, then television had improved. Because that's exactly how Max looked. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your main event. Ten rounds of boxing. In the white corner, wearing black trunks, Weighing 175 and hailing from Buffalo, Lou Scott! And in the black corner, wearing purple trunks, weighing 179 and right from our own New York City, Max Farmer! The boys met in the center of the ring, received some fatherly advice from the referee, shook gloves, and went back to their corners. Okay, Max! Okay, our boy, do it! Go on, get him! Get him! Well, Frank was right. It certainly was a pushover. Two minutes later, the fight was seven counts from being over. Only it wasn't Lou Scott who was fast asleep on the canvas. The sleeping beauty was Frank's boy, Max Farmer. Max! Max, get up! Max, please, come on! Shut up! Max! Hey! Max, get up! No! Get up, you bastard! 
Don't you teach your fighters to duck, Frank? Oh, I don't understand it. It's all wrong, Rick. Rick, how can that man sleep up there with all this noise? Oh, Helen. Just call me, Sal. Now can we go home? Sure, baby. Rick, Rick, uh, stick around, uh, will you? I may have a job for you. Oh? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'm going down to the dressing room. Meet me there in ten minutes. Come on, Lorna. From the look on Frank's face, I could tell he was worried. So I took Helen outside and put her in a cab. She was a good sport about going home alone, though. Didn't say a word. Not even goodbye. Then I went back inside and made my way to Farmer's dressing room. Inside, I could hear Frank's angry voice. All right. All right, so you won't tell me who. But you ain't gonna get away with the snacks. I'll find out, and when I do, you'll be back there. Frank! I'll be right out, Rick. And remember this, you bum. We're through, see? Through! Uh, hello, Rick. Aren't you a little tough on the guy just for losing a fight? Farmer lost that fight before he ever got into the ring. It was fixed. Well, that's strong talk, Frank. Got anything to back it up? Look, I know this boy. I trained him myself. He could have won tonight's fight with his eyes shut. Somebody paid him to take a dive. Maybe it was his own idea. Uh, Max, don't get ideas. He's too dumb. Whew. Rick. Rick, I want you to find out who is behind this fix. Well, you make it sound simple. Got any leads? Maybe. Drop by the gym the first thing in the morning and we'll start from there. First thing next morning, I went down to Frank's gym. They say the early bird gets the worm, and I guess it's true. For standing right inside the door was none other than Sergeant Otis. Pride and joy of the 5th Precinct. Uh, pardon me, but aren't you Jack Dempsey? Uh, no, my name is... Uh, oh, Diamond, you here? Very observant, Otis. You're improving. Learn to blow a whistle yet? Oh, why do I always have to run into you? Aren't you afraid to be out without your keeper? Where's Walt? Frank, what are you doing here? Oh, hi, Walt. Hi. Well, I've got a client here. What's your excuse? Routine check on a suicide. Guy by the name of Frank Bowers leaped from the Brooklyn Bridge. What? Frank Bowers? Yeah, know him. Yeah. Well, are you sure about this? It's open and shot. Three witnesses saw him do it. We pulled his body out of the river this morning. Oh, I can't believe it. Frank had no reason to kill himself. I was with him all last evening. That's a good reason. Shut up, old yes. Sorry, Rick, but these things happen. No, not to guys like Frank. He was no quitter. You sure about those witnesses? They're ordinary citizens, Rick. We took their statements this morning. That still sounds phony, Walt. Look, Rick, I know it's hard to believe a friend to take the easy way out, but in this case, it's a fact. Walt, Frank was a good friend. And before I believe he killed himself, someone's got to convince me. All right, all right. Otis, drive Diamond out to those witnesses' homes. I'll walk back to the office. Oh, Lieutenant, why do you always pick on me? Fate, Otis. Don't fight it. It's bigger than us. Come on. Otis drove like a madman, which was strictly in character. The first witness, a butcher named Henry Burton, was at work. But the butcher's wife, a typical homemaker, gave us her version of Frank's death. And just like I told the police, off went the overcoat and over he went. Oh, it was awful. The woman trembled, Otis gloated, and I grabbed my hat. Her husband worked at a nearby market and their stories checked. That took care of the first two witnesses. Then we drove to the home of Bill Voss, the third and final witness. Well, uh, I was coming home from a late movie and I started across the Manhattan approach to the bridge. Uh, this guy, uh, Bowers, was about ten yards in front of me. I was foggy, and I couldn't see him very well. But I could make him out when he stopped. He threw off his top coat, climbed the guardrail, and dived in. I, I yelled, but it was too late. Uh, I'm the one who called the police. The story's all checked. But I still wasn't convinced. So I had Otis drop me off at Frank's gym. If Frank did kill himself, then there had to be a reason. I decided to check on Frank's partner, one Ben Lamb. I found him in his office. It's too bad about Frank. Lamb, what about the business here? Any trouble that might explain why Frank did it? No, everything's running smoothly here. Of course, it was last night's fight, but... Ah, that's out of the question. Well, then maybe it's an answer. Keep talking. Well, the syndicate is looking for whoever fixed last night's fight. Uh, they play kind of rough when they're mad. And, well, maybe Frank was afraid of what they might do to him. Huh? You mean he'd kill himself just to save them a bullet? Yeah, that's false economy. It's just the thought. Forget it. I have. But I take it you think Frank was behind the fix. I didn't say that. But Farmer couldn't plan it himself. He's too dumb. And Frank was too smart. I said it. Just a thought. That you may be partly right. 
Maybe Frank's death does have something to do with last night's fight. Is Max Farmer around? I saw him outside earlier. Thanks. Now, Mr. Diamond, might I ask what makes you so interested in Frank's suicide? Was it suicide, Mr. Lamb? Well, wasn't it suicide? I ask you first. See you around, Lamb. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. Last week, a customer told me that... Something I really like about Rexall Milk of Magnesia is that one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and the next one thin and watery. Somehow, Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity, or it won't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? Well, an easy definition would be the degree of thickness in the liquid. Now, Rexall scientists conduct scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to make sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity because that's one big reason why you'll always get a uniform dosage from every bottle. Oh, and I thought it was all just an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can always depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I stood in the center of Frank's gymnasium, certain that Frank's supposed suicide had something to do with last night's fight. But how? That was the jackpot question. In one corner of the gym, I saw Max Farmer hitting a punching bag with a methodical, monotonous rhythm. I walked over to him. Max? Yeah. My name is Diamond. Yeah. I was a friend of Frank Bowers. Yeah. Well, if you can spare any more words, I'd like to ask you a question. Look, if it's about last night, forget it, see? I don't know nothing about nothing. No argument there, but I came to see you about boxing. Huh? I don't get you. Well, Frank always said you were one of the best, and I thought you could give me a few pointers. Oh, you, uh, you a fighter? No, no, no. I just like to show off at the Y. You know how it is. Oh, sure, sure. Well, you get some trunks from the shower, boy, and we'll go with you. You can learn plenty from me. Good, Max. That's just what I'm hoping to learn. Plenty. The shower boys gave me a pair of gloves and purple trunks. I felt like a self-conscious tulip as I entered the ring, but Max seemed quite impressed. Hey, you got a pretty good bill. I also go steady. You all set? Yeah, I'm ready. Put them up. No, not above your head. Max, we come from different environments. Okay, let's go. <laughs> hey, you're, you're not bad. Uh, just just lucky. Hey, wait till I tell my friends that, that I box with the Max Farmer. Yeah, they like that, huh? Like it? I'll be a hero. After all, Max, you've never lost a fight. Oh, oh, I, I, I forgot last night. Sorry. Oh, uh, don't no, think nothing about that fight. I'll be up there again. You'll see. Oh, no doubt. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait. Let, let's take a break. I, I'm winded. Okay. Whew. You know, you, you, you fighters have a lot of perseverance. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we got, all right, uh, what guess... you said. I guess good athletes are just born, huh? Not made. Buddy, that's the truth. You know, I've been in sports since grade school. Uh, still at it? What, sports? Uh, skip it. I bet you were good even then, Max. Oh, boy, was I. I played football in high school. Made all state. Weren't always a boxer, huh? No, no, I've done everything. Hey, tell me, tell me. What's the greatest exhibition of sports in the world? Go on now, go on, think. Uh, Shriners Convention? Shriners? Ah, uh, no. Nah. The, the Olympics. And I was in them, too. Would have won, but Marshall Wang beat me on points. My, my. Boy, I have a lot to tell my friends. You know, there's just one other fighter I'd like to brag about sparring with. That's Lou Scott. Lou What? That Scott's a bum. I could whip him with my eyes shut. Oh? I heard that's how you lost. Look, forget about last night. That fight was... Fi- uh, go on, Max. 
Oh, yeah, I had a headache last night, that's all. Now I gotta take a shower. See you around. It was the first time I'd ever gone fishing in a boxing ring. I was hoping to find out who was behind the fix. That might throw some light on Frank's death. But to coin an old phrase, the big one got away. Next on my list was the girl Frank was with at the fight, Lorna Thorne. She danced at the Silver Circle, a small nightclub not far from the gym. I went backstage, climbed the iron stairs, and found her room. Just a sec. Well, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Miss Thorne. Sit down. Care for a drink? It all depends. Are we drowning our sorrow or celebrating? I don't get you. Well, you don't seem too upset about Frank. Oh, that. I'm not the type to cry, honey. Ruins mascara. Oh, don't get me wrong. I liked Frank. Liked him a lot, but we were both in it just for the last. Mm-hmm. Tommy, did Frank come up here after he left the arena? Yeah. He came up and we talked till it was time for my number. He left about midnight. Did he seem upset? Now that you mention it, he did. Lorna, uh, how well do you know Ben Lamb? Only seen him around. Why? Well, Lamb thinks Frank might have been behind the fixed fight. Hmm, could be. He sure was nervous. Mm, I see. You and Lamb didn't compare stories by any chance? I told you, I've only seen him around. Uh-huh. Hey, this is a nice mink coat. Been saving unemployment checks? I'm a working gal, remember? Oh, come now, honey. You don't earn enough here to buy this kind of coat. I'm a bookie on the side. Hmm, Patterson's Furrier's on the label. That's real Richie, kid. Thanks. Now I got a change. Okay. Oh, don't run off. I'll only be a minute. Uh, some other time, honey. Suit yourself. I'll be around. I'll bet you will. I went back to my office, locked the door, put my ox buds up on my dusty desk, and tried to think. There was no logical motive for suicide, but there was plenty for murder. Lamb would inherit Frank's half of the business. Farmer might have been afraid Frank would blackball him with other managers. And Lorna was the type who would do anything for a fast buck. But then there was that constant headache, the three witnesses. My thoughts were all jumbled up. I kept trying to remember everything that had been said today. I kept hearing voices in a jumbled sequence. Yeah, the syndicate plays rough. Frank may have been afraid. Why, well, I've been in sports since grade school. It's an open and shut case, Rick. You're a hard man to convince, Shamus. Then over he went. Oh, it was awful. Frank behind it? Yeah, it was only a thought, damn it. I'm not the type to cry, honey. It ruins mascara. Then he climbed the rail and dived in. I don't want to, only Marshal Wayne beat me on points. Climbed the rail and dived in. Marshal Wayne beat me. Marshal Wayne. Wayne! Then he dived in. Dived in. Dived. I had it. I knew how Frank was killed. Hello? Mr. Diamond, this is Francis. It was Helen's butler calling to invite me to dinner that evening. He said something about Helen expecting me, but I wasn't listening. I kept hearing that witness say Frank dived in. It was the answer to the whole thing. Mr. Diamond, sir, are you listening? Francis, Francis, if you were going to commit suicide... Suicide... I beg your pardon, sir. Look, if you were going to kill yourself from the Brooklyn Bridge, what would you do? Oh, dear. I'd reconsider. No, 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 Francis. If you really were, would you jump or would you dive? Why, uh, I'd probably jump, sir. Yes, I, I'm sure I would. Well, of course. It's a natural thing to do. See you later, Francis. The pieces began to fall into place. I remembered something Max Farmer had said earlier. Marshal Wayne had beaten him on points. Marshal Wayne. I had associated that name with boxing, but now... I checked in the sports almanac. Listed under the 36 Olympics, I found Marshal Wayne won the high diving competition that year. And Max had competed with him. Now I was certain. First, I put in a call to Federson's Furriers for some information. So far, so good. Then I called Walt and told him to meet me at the gym. It was closing time when I got there and most of the fighters were leaving. But I caught sight of Max Farmer as he made his way out of the showers. How's the water, Max? Huh? Diamond. What's the matter? You don't look happy to see me. What are you doing here? 
The boys at the Y, remember? I came for some more pointers. It's closing time. Oh, that's too bad. That's the only reason you don't want to spend some time with me, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, you're not too tired. Me? I'm never tired. I just closing up, that's all. Well, Max, old pal, I've got good news for you. I fixed it with lamb for me to lock up when we're finished. Huh? Well, I... Not, uh, scared by any chance. Me scared of you? Why, you... Get some trunks. You'll see who's scared. I wondered if my Blue Cross plan was still in effect as I changed clothes and followed Max out to the ring in the middle of the deserted gymnasium. Max had an ugly scowl on his face, and I knew that this time he would pull no punches. Ouch. Playing rough, eh, pal? You got a lousy guard. That's all. Hi. You act nervous. Tired of boxing? Maybe you'd rather be swimming, huh? 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 Oops, sorry. Now your guard is down. Of course, a, a born athlete like you would be happy doing anything in the way of sports, I suppose. Maybe even diving. Your guard, pal, your guard. You, you don't make sense. No, I think so. Your mind's wandering, Max. Keep your guard up. You know, for a real sport, like, say, high diving... There's really no place around here to practice. Unless, of course, you tried the Brooklyn Bridge. I'll bet a really good diver could make it from the Manhattan approach without a scratch. Now, listen, what's the... Ad- <clears throat> the guard, Samson. Better watch it. Hold it a minute. Hold it a minute. What's the big idea? Well, the big idea came when I figured out how three witnesses could see a suicide that wasn't a suicide. You're lonely. Am I? Those witnesses didn't see Frank because he was already in the river. You had pushed him in. You waited for some people to show up, and then you dived in. No. Yes, Max, yes. But you weren't alone in this. Someone had to talk you into taking a dive in the fight and a different kind later on. You'd have thrown the fight for any man's money, but you'd only risk your neck for a particular species. Female. Men are funny that way. It ain't true. It ain't true. Max, Max, Lorna confessed an hour ago. What? I'll kill you for this. That's your third and final dive, Max. <sighs> That's a nice right cross, Rick. Oh, I seen better. Ah, oh, the little boys in blue. About time. Walt, when Joe Palooka here wakes up, I think he'll confess. He believes the girl already did. Yeah, so I heard. Rick, how did you figure her in this mess? Well, like most females, she couldn't wait for a mink coat. According to Fetterson's furrier, she bought an expensive coat the day after the fight. Paid cash for it. <laughs> These amateur criminals. Yeah, someone had to be the brains behind Max's action, so I put two and two together and got two. Max and Lorna. Yeah. Otis, go pick up Lorna Thorne. Well, stop fixing your tie and move. Oh, let him alone, Walt. First date he's had in years. What is it? Do you have to play so loud? Well, I can't help it, baby. It's the brute in me. Mm-hmm. And that shiner, darling. What happened? Client or doorknob? Young lady, I have been boxing. Just call me Kid Diamond, please. Oh, no. Boxing. You? Well, why not? It's so strenuous. Well, <laughs> I'm in fair shape. What do you use for muscles? You just put up your dukes and I'll show you. All righty. Now get up and sing. I'm young and healthy, and you've got charm. It'd really be a sin not to have you in my arm. I'm young and healthy, and so you. When the moon is in the sky, tell me what am I to do? If I could hate you. I'd keep away, but that ain't my nature, I'm 
full of vitamin A. I'm young and healthy, so let's be bold. In a year, or two or three, maybe we will be too old. If I could hate you, I'd keep away. But that ain't my nature. I'm full of vitamin A. Ooh, I'm young and healthy, so let's be bold. In a year, or two or three, maybe we will be too old. Rick. I'm sorry I hit you so hard, but you're such a show-off. Now, look, honey, you got the wrong idea about this whole... Uh, uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Diamond, sir, but I just wanted to tell you that I've changed my mind. I would dive off the bridge. What, Francis? You see, I've always been afraid to dive, and, well, it would be fun just at once. Oh, no. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. So whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Richard Carr and Marvin Marks with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, D. Tatum, Wally Mayer, Howard McNear, High Aberback, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, beautiful. Get lost, bristle puss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids, like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll... Go Stag. That's it. Join the Stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes, to make girls care. Go Stag. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. places in this world where intrigue and danger go hand in hand, where death and disaster are the rewards of weakness, in such places will be found a man named Jordan. street off Istanbul's Grand Bazaar, not far from the Mosque Valid Sultan, stands the Café Tambourine, run by a man named Jordan. The Café Tambourine, clouded with the smoke of oriental tobaccos, crowded with humanity, alive with the babble of many languages. <laughs> Ollie, 
Rocky Jordan's faithful man Friday has just told Rocky, Duke, and Tony of a discovery made by his nephew, who is in the employ of a Spaniard named Chavez. At the home of Chavez, many strange things have been happening. Many trunks, boxes, and crates have arrived. Many strange men and women with Spanish, Swedish, and Swiss names, but with the accents of Central Europe, pass through the home of Chavez. Ali's nephew reports that the boxes which arrive, labeled merchandise, contain money, gold, precious stones, art objects, things of great value, which are hidden in the basement. Rocky, intrigued by the possibilities of profit in this information, shows interest in further investigation. His theory is that Mr. Chavez has established a station for escaping Nazi war criminals. When the others leave, Rocky drifts down into the cafe. And when he sees an old acquaintance, an international crook rejoicing in the name of Triflis, he walks over to his table and says, Hello, Triflis. How's tricks? Ah, Rocky, my friend. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, thanks. I haven't seen you for some time. Where you been? Oh, I have been away. I... Making arrangements to enter a new business, Rocky. I am now engaged in that business. No kidding? Mm -hmm. Anything legal enough to talk about? Oh, Rocky. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Uh -huh. But a fine occupation. Very remunerative and uh, no risk. Uh, sounds good. Making any money? Rocky, you wouldn't believe it. Such money I have never seen. I, I think perhaps you would be interested... Ah, sounds very possible. What's the deal? Deal? It is not within the law, Rocky. Uh -huh. Go on. It is an operation which helps many people, uh, people who are in danger. Sounds better all the time. How about a breakdown on it? I cannot talk here, Rocky. Uh, uh, tomorrow, perhaps, in your office. Uh, I uh, need a partner, Rocky. Okay. Tomorrow at noon. Be there. I, I shall be there, Rocky. It's a deal. Yeah, so long, Triflis. Deal tomorrow, then. Hey, what's that big smile on your kisser for, Rocky? I just had a talk with Triflis. He wants me for a partner. Huh? Triflis teaming up with you? Yeah. We're going to talk it over tomorrow noon in my office. And if he's mixed up in the deal I think he is, he's going to be mighty useful, Duke. He's my pigeon. Anything you can tell me about? <laughs> Guess I can tell you what I think. Oh, brother, I'm weary. Let's sit down over here and have a beer before we turn in, shall we? Sounds good to me. Oh, Akim. Draw two, will you? Yes, you Fendi. Boss, you look tired enough to call it a day. Why don't you turn in? I'm going to in just a few minutes. I just want to relax a little bit before I hit the pad. You know, Duke, I think our little chum Triflis is going to be a great help to us. Yeah. Well, it's about time Triflis was helping somebody. There's one guy that makes me sorry I didn't stay home and practice my piano lessons instead of learning to fight. Oh, Triflis is a necessary evil, Duke. If it wasn't for people like him figuring out strange ways of making a dishonest dollar, we wouldn't have much fun. Yeah, maybe you're right, Rocky. Sure, I love guys like Triflis. They think they're so clever that it's like shooting fish to outsmart them. What's the angle, boss? What's Triflis cooking up now? Well, I tell you, Duke, since Turkey has declared war on Germany, there's a lot of embarrassment in certain circles. Know what I mean? Yeah. This ain't a neutral country no more. And they're going to round up all the crowds, huh? Yeah, and the Japs. Now, the Japs are just plain out of luck because the Japs are Jap. But the Heinies are in a little better shape. If they can get their hands on a phony passport. Ah, that what Triflis is up to? Sounds like it to me. Yeah, it all adds up, Duke. The dope we've got in this house where Ollie's nephew works. The whole thing. Nobody expected Turkey to declare war. The Germans who can get out of Germany. The rankers in the Nazi party. They've been shipping their money and their valuables into Turkey for months. Waiting for the day when they have to change their names and their nationalities to beat the war guilt trials. And the confiscation of the piles of dough they've stolen from the little people in Germany. Great little group, Duke. 
Fine little gang. Yeah. We're going to take a shot at getting them, huh, Rocky? Can you think of any more pleasant work? No. Sounds like a job that could be enjoyed. You know, Duke, these guys we're fighting here in Istanbul, they're the real heels in this war. They're the guys that stood on balconies and shouted their lungs out, selling a lot of dummies on the fact that they were members of a master race. They're the guys that gave the orders to wipe out the population of towns like, well, Lidice in Czechoslovakia. The guys that robbed the churches and looted the towns in every country the Huns occupied. Yeah, and now they're going to try to get away with it. Yeah. Now, while Hitler chews the carpet and orders the soldiers and the square-headed civilians to die defending their homes and their fields, these big shots are taking a powder. They know they're whipped. They know they're slated for a blank wall and a firing squad. Well, some of them will get away with it, but... uh, We'll take care of a few, huh? The next morning, Rocky Jordan awakens with a feeling that something unusual is going to happen to him this day. A premonition of something unfinished. As his mind clears, he remembers that Triflis will be at his office at noon. Triflis, the nondescript hanger-on who has suddenly blossomed into a man of wealth. As he is struggling with his shirt, trying to get his broken arm through the sleeve, the door to his quarters opens, and Ollie, his faithful servant, says... What is the matter, Rocky? I I heard such language. Uh, I was just trying to get this Uh, thing... Let me help you, Rocky. You are so impatient. A great big boy like me having to be dressed. Rocky, you cannot get that arm through your sleeve with the bandages on it. It, it, It's too big. Uh, We'll slip the sleeve, then. Uh, Yes, Rocky, I will. Yeah, that does it. Rocky, my nephew, uh, the, the one I told you about, uh, the one who's working as a houseboy for Senior Chavez, yeah. uh, he'll be here in an hour. Uh, you you said you wanted to talk with him. Yeah, that's right, I do. Uh, he is most anxious to talk with you. Uh, I hope it is not too early, Rocky. Yeah, look, hand me that brown knitted tie there, will you? Uh, yes, Rocky. Uh, uh, he... Shall, shall I, I tie it for you? Yeah. My gosh, I didn't know how much I used that left arm of mine. Hadn't any idea what a handy thing it was. <clears throat> Your nephew uh, run across any more dope that sounds interesting? Uh, I think so. Uh, get your chin up, Rocky. Uh, I cannot see what I'm doing. Oh, sorry, old man. My my nephew reports that two more visitors have arrived at the home of Senor Chavez. They, they arrived at dawn. Uh-huh. Ah, oh, come on, come on. That tie must be all right. Mm-hmm. Let's get out of here and have a talk with your smart relation. Uh, here, here's your coat. Uh, oh, Rocky. What? Uh, where's the sling? You, you must have that arm in a sling. <laughs> all right, doctor. It's over there on the dresser. Hmm? Oh, oh yes, here it is. Thanks. I don't know what I'd do without you, Ali. You've been more than a mother to me. <laughs> You're making fun of me, Rocky. I don't know whether I am or not. Hey, Rocky. Oh, for the love of Mike. Come on in, Duke. Uh, I sure get a lot of privacy around this joint. What's the matter? Am I getting fat or something? You guys figure I'm getting too much sleep? I just came up to see if you were awake, Rocky. What's he doing here? Uh-uh. Duke, I came to tell Rocky that my nephew would be here soon. Ah, this joint is paved with good intentions. Oh, well. What's the occasion, Duke? Well, I've been out around already this morning. I thought maybe you'd need some help getting into your duds with that uh, broken arm. Well, (laughs) Ollie got me dressed all right. Where you been, Duke? Over to the British Embassy. Talking to Major Pettigrew. Oh, yeah? What do you have to say? Well, I just sort of asked him what was going on, now that there's a war on. The people of Turkey are are glad that we have finally declared war on the Axis. We have a fine army, one of the finest in the world. I don't think that Turkey's planning on taking any very active part in the war. What did Pettigrew think, Duke? He thinks the same as you. Hey, Ollie. Mm-hmm. How about running downstairs and having the kitchen send up a little breakfast, huh? Yes. Uh, you had breakfast, Duke? Yeah, I had one early, but 
I'm ready for another one. Uh, I had mine. Uh, shall I have two breakfasts sent up, Rocky? Yeah, that's right. Bacon and eggs, over easy. And whatever else they have. But quick. R- right away, Rocky. And as soon as I get that done, I shall go get my nephew and bring him here. Okay, Ollie. See you later. Reason I came back, boss. Pettigrew wants to see you. He does? What about? Something's cooking. Something that he thinks you can handle better than his outfit. Well, did he give you any, uh, any hints as to just what? Well, I tell you, Rocky. While I was talking to him, I just casually mentioned the fact that you were pretty sure that there were a lot of crowds here in Istanbul, passing as neutrals. Yeah? Maybe you talked too much. I didn't tell him anything. I was just seeing if I could get him to talk enough to do us some good. Yeah, what'd he say? Well, he thinks you're right. In fact, he knows you're right. He wants to work with you. Oh, that's just fine. What do I want to work with him for? What do we need him for? Well, don't jump down my throat. I didn't crack anything to him. All I know is that he's got some dope on a few people that he's suspicious of. And he's willing to let you use the information. Go talk to him yourself. Okay, I will. And look, Duke. I'll do the thinking for this outfit. Don't be getting nine feet five when you're five feet nine. I'll make the contacts and the decisions. Okay, okay, so I got out of line. I'll get back in. That's good. Unless Major Pettigrew or any other authority of any country knows about what we're doing the next few weeks, the better off we're going to be. Okay. Nobody's hurt. Come in. Rocky, when I went downstairs, my nephew was there waiting for me. Yeah? Uh, Senor Chavez had sent him to town on an errand, and he came by here. Uh, Can you see him now? Yeah, I suppose so. He he is very excited, Rocky. He says that he has news of the utmost importance for you. These are exciting days in Istanbul and at the Café Tambourine. With Turkey in the war against the Axis nations, many things are happening. And Rocky Jordan is going to be interested in an exciting new venture. Don't miss tomorrow's dramatic episode of... A Man Named Jordan. A Man Named Jordan is written and directed by Ray Buffum and is presented every day, Monday through Friday, at this same time. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. It was a hot afternoon in Cairo when she walked into the Café Tambourine. She was beautiful, but there was something else. Something so wrong with the picture that I couldn't take my eyes off her. It wasn't the blonde hair piled on top of her head, or the dress that clung to her like a football player covering a fumble, nor even the set expression on her face. But when she stopped in front of me, I knew what it was. She was all woman, but not an inch under six feet four. <laughs> Again, we bring you a story of adventure with a man named Rocky Jordan, proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine in Cairo. Cairo, gateway to the ancient East, where modern life unfolds against the backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Bartered Bridegroom. We've had a pretty fair assortment of customers in the tambourine. Almost anything on feet. But when I looked up into that icy-faced six-feet-four of blonde female, 
I knew we had our first Amazon. You're ready, Mr. Jordan? Uh, ready? You're wasting time, Jordan. I didn't catch the name. Lily Carroll. You're being rude. The face is familiar. Maybe we met in Istanbul. No, Jordan. Alexandria, maybe? The arrangements are made. You're stalling. <laughs> Look, uh, suppose we take it from the top of the page, Miss Carroll. Naturally, you're interested in the money. This, too, has been taken care of. Now about the ceremony. Ceremony? The wedding. Be there in an hour. Oh, sure. I'll be there in plenty of time. I'm a great believer in weddings. Oh, by the way, uh, who's getting married? I am, Mr. Jordan. To you. Um, uh, maybe we'd better go into my office. That will not be necessary. Timmy Rogers has made all the arrangements. Timmy Rogers. Now I know we'd better go into the office. <laughs> She sat across the desk from me and lit a king-sized cigarette. The hand that held the match wore a queen-sized diamond. It sent a reflection against the wall. I didn't like the way the reflection quivered. Her face was under control, but her hands gave her away. She was a nervous bride. Timmy should have explained these details. If I know Timmy Rogers, he doesn't bother with details. That's unfortunate. Nevertheless, in one hour, you and I shall be married. You will receive $5,000, is that clear? Oh, very... It is not enough money? Oh, well, uh, it's not entirely it, Miss Karoff. Having never been married before... You're being rude again. I plan to leave Cairo immediately after the ceremony. Really? Tell me, Miss Karoff, uh, where are we going on our honeymoon? Enough, Jordan. I will not be insulted further. You will receive the $5,000 as soon as I have sold my interest in the club Fashad. Fashad? Oh, yeah, yeah. Now I remember you and Mike Sloan bought that together recently. Yes, but I am selling my interest. Is the matter of business falling off? No, not business. You see, I'm a white Russian. Certain of my friends have been disappearing lately. I do not wish the same thing to happen to me. I see. But this is not what I came to talk about. Now, the wedding... Look, will... Lily, I've got news for you. I'm not in the mood for marriage. Your moods do not interest me, Jordan. You are going to marry me. Hmm. And I'll admit you're more persuasive with a gun. You will not refuse me. Maybe it didn't occur to you, Lil, but you can't marry a dead man. Ah, come on, put the gun away. There are many other ways to make certain you do not back out. Jordan, be at my club in one hour. It means your life. <laughs> She moved out of the office as silently as an Arab pulling his tent. I followed her out in time to see her climb into a black sedan two feet shorter than the Queen Mary. It faded off into the crowded street. I stood there trying to figure out where I could rent a tux cheap when a hand thumped against my back. I turned to see a watered-down version of Tyrone Power, all of five feet five in his elevated shoes. It was none other than the little fixer himself, Timmy Rogers. Rocky, old kid. I just saw her leaving. Congratulations, kid. Now, this makes my day complete. I'm so happy for you, kid. You'll make a lovely bridegroom. Slow down, kid. You're drooling on my wedding suit. <laughs> what a woman. You're a picker, Jordan, if I ever saw one. Aren't you forgetting one little item? You picked her, not me. A mere formality. Greatest girl this side of Minsk. Well, at least the biggest. But, Rock, kid, for $2,000, how can you miss? It's even less interesting for 2000 Huh? How's that, Rock? Lily offered me fire. Well, what do you know? She really must be scared. Okay, suppose you give me the straight story. Well, Rock... Uh, well, well, I'll tell you. Still I, listening? Well, look, why don't you and I go into the bar for a drink, Rock, and I'll tell you all about it. I followed the little man into the bar. We pulled up on a couple of empty stools by the open front door. Timmy Rogers rubbed his hands, licked his lips, and ordered a double orange blossom. Ah, orange blossom for a wedding day, huh, Rock? Ah. Now, where was I? You and Lily Karoff, remember? <clears throat> yeah. Well, sir, Rock, it's like this. Lil has a few roulette wheels out in the back room of her joint, as you know. Mm. The other night I ran into as tough a streak of luck as has been seen in Cairo since Happy Harper was picked up for trying to sell some tourists the Sphinx. How much? Uh, how much? Uh, how much? Uh, well, I, uh, I dropped $5,000, which it just so happens I couldn't cover at the bank. Mm-hmm. So then came Lily. Yeah. 
Lily made me a proposition. She'll forget the 5000 if I marry her. Sure. But it turns out she's looking for an American. She wants a ticket to the USA. Oh, that pitch, huh? Well, can't say that I blame her, Rock. Things can get pretty rough around Cairo for the wrong... Hey, hey, hold it. Huh? That guy's been staring at me too long. Standing there in the open doorway was a brown suit full of balloon-shaped Egyptian. His eyes didn't leave my face as he hooked his cane over one arm and smoothed his white gloves with his hand. He tipped the brown bowler on his fat head and waddled toward me. You are Mr. Rocky Jordan? Yeah? I am Ahmoud Pasha. My card. Hmm. Yeah, what's on your mind? I will not waste time, Mr. Jordan, regarding your coming marriage to Miss Lily Karoff. Oh, I suppose you're the bride's father. Indeed, I am not. My affection for Miss Karoff is not paternal. I have come to offer you $10,000 if you do not go through with this wedding. Ten? Huh. It's the best offer I've had all day. In cash, Mr. Jordan. If it makes you feel any better, Pasha, you can forget... <laughs> I hit the floor fast. Over my head, the big mirror behind the bar shattered and rained glass. When the rain stopped, I jumped up and raced for the door. Outside, there was a dent in the usual late afternoon traffic, and down the street shot a black sedan. It was the same car Lily Karoff had stepped into 15 minutes ago. Well, that gave me something to think about as I walked back into my cafe to survey the damage. The man in the brown bowler had vanished. Underneath the table, his broken cocktail glass in his hand was Timmy Rogers. I helped him to his feet. All right, little man, fit that into your patch story. I had nothing to do with it, Rocky, so help me. You'll have to do better than that. Rock, listen, I didn't know Lily would go that far. It wasn't Lily. She may be in a hurry for a wedding, but she doesn't want to marry a corpse. Well, maybe she was only trying to scare you, Rock. Could be, but I don't like her idea of a wedding invitation. Come on, let's go. What are you going to do, Rocky? I'm going to pay my respects to the bride. It started with an Amazon looking for a husband and then a two-bit gambler with a sense of humor. Then in comes a fat man in a brown bowler who wants to pay for no wedding at all. <laughs> Rocky Jordan, bartered bridegroom. I shoved Timmy Rogers into a cab and hopped in behind him. I gave the cabbie the address, Club Fashad. Ten minutes later, we pulled up in front of a big streamlined white building. I paid the driver and we got out. The sign on the door said not open until 7 o'clock. Hmm. Sometimes you can't believe in signs. Coming down the corridor was a slim, tux character named Mike Sloan, manager and co-owner of the club for shot. A nasty smile cracked his face. Oh, I'd seen Sloan kicking around Carol before, and I didn't like him. I like him even less now. Well, Rocky Jordan. Congratulations. Listen, Sloan, I didn't come here for... Oh, now, don't bother to explain, Jordan. I understand. You, uh, got our wedding invitation? Oh, sure. The bride wore a 38. Uh, Lily is sometimes a little impulsive, Jordan. After all, no one was hurt. But you'll get a bill for that mirror. We're ready for the wedding. You're wasting time. It's off, Sloan. Couldn't find the right size wedding cake. Rogers, what about that? I thought Jordan was all lined up. I... I did my best, Mike. I'm not backing out of it now, Jordan. Let's go. The bride's waiting. Pack her in ice. She'll keep. I'm out of it. Too easy, Jordan. Not a chance. <laughs> Just watch me. Rocky, listen. You're making a mistake. You sure are, Jordan. Oh, I see. It's going to be one of those uh, shotgun affairs, huh? Oh, yeah. I wouldn't want to have to kill you. This way, Jordan. The gun in Mike Sloan's hand didn't move. It buried itself into the middle of my spine. Timmy Rogers wrung his hands and trailed along behind us. Sloan walked me down a thick carpeted corridor and we turned left into the main office of the club for shod. The blinds were drawn. Sloan slammed the door behind us. Coming toward me from the other side of the room was Lily Karoff, with gold earrings swinging like pendants. She was poured into a glaring red dress that revealed an awful lot of the new look. Well, Jordan, 
I see you couldn't pass up the money. Tell your boy Sloan to get the gun out of my back and I'll show you how fast I can pass it up. Mike, is everything prepared? Ready and waiting, Lily. In fact... Lily, my flower. Lily, what's happening? It was the balloon-shaped Egyptian in the brown bowler. His cane still draped gracefully over one arm. As he paddled toward us, his mouth fell open. Inside was a small fortune in gold fillings. What are they doing to you, my delicate Lily? Ahmed, please leave at once. I do not need your help. But, my Lily, I'm here to protect you. These men, they are making a fool of you. Do not believe Get me. Get out of here, Pasha. This is out of your range. Please, Lily, my blossom, I beg you to see reason. These men, they only mean to do you harm. I... The light. Where are the light? Help! <laughs> room was a pool of black ink. I dived for the spot where Sloan had stood with the gun. I felt hot air on my neck and turned. The carpet came up and made a fuzzy pillow for my cheek. As everything folded into a nightmare of spinning rooms. And somewhere off in the distance, I, I heard the toll of wedding bells. Tonight's story continues in just a moment. We're sure you listeners, many of whom have written letters to CBS, are happy to know that Rocky Jordan is back on the air. Yes, Rocky Jordan joins one of the most outstanding mystery lineups in radio. Over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour, each Sunday evening, will be the time for Rocky Jordan. Now, back to tonight's story, The Bartered Bridegroom. It was still the office of Lily Karoff. I opened my eyes into a stream of water cascading down my nose. It was coming from a big white pitcher. Holding the pitcher was Sam Zabaya, Captain, Cairo Police. Well, Jordan. You know, Jordan, on you, this carpet looks very good. I wish I could say the same thing for my head. Oh, what happened, Sam? Nothing unusual for you, Jordan. Only murder. Look, beside you. Really? Miss Lily Karoff, quite dead. Like a model for a detective magazine cover. Mm. Only she is not posing, Jordan. Huh? Okay, Sam. Am I booked? Not yet, Jordan. Not yet. The dialogue wasn't exactly sparkling on the way to the Cairo jail. Sam confined himself to a few official grunts, and I sat back and watched traffic. In ten minutes, we... Pulled up to a sand-colored building, and Sabaya and I got out. I followed Sam to a small back room. He closed the door and pulled up a couple of chairs. Uh, uh, coffee, Jordan? Oh, I need more than coffee, Sam. Uh, but we serve only coffee here. Sorry. <clears throat> now, please uh, tell me everything. Uh, beginning when? The police received an anonymous phone call to come to the club facade at once. I arrived to find the body of Lily Karoff shot to death. The gun that apparently killed her was in your hand. Oh, you tell it much better, Sam. Go ahead, go ahead. Never mind, Jordan. I'm waiting for your story. All right, I'll make it brief. Lily came by my office this afternoon with the idea of marrying me. She said something about wanting to leave the country. Leave the country? Yes, she's a white Russian, Sam. Mm -hmm. Said certain friends of hers had been disappearing lately. Hey, underground stuff, maybe, huh? Uh, yeah. Underground, of course. Very likely. Well, that's what the lady said, Sam. The lady deceive you, Jordan. I will show you. Now, here we are. A complete report on any and all underground activities in Cairo in the past year. Look, not one case of unexplained uh, disappearance, as you call it. Well, uh, Sam, a good job wouldn't leave a case history for the police. 
Jordan, I'm afraid you have been taken in by this fantastic story. Mm -hmm. Live and learn. Well, anyway, after Lily, my next caller was Timmy Rogers. He's a small-time gambler. He gave Lily the idea about marrying me. Mm -hmm. Go on. Then a short, fat man in a brown bowler shows up. Lily's stage door Johnny. He tries to buy me out of the marriage. Mm. Jordan, I'm trying very hard to believe you. So then Mike Sloan, one of Lily's boys, shot up my place just so I wouldn't forget. It's my wedding day. All right, I went to Lily's to set everybody straight, and that's where you found me. Jordan, what about this man in the brown bowl? His name is uh, Ahmed Pasha. We got anything on him, Sam? <laughs> Certainly, John. <laughs> Ahmud Pasha happens to be one of the richest men in Cairo. Yeah, but... And the most respected. He is a business broker of high reputation. He buys and sells business enterprises. Like uh, nightclubs? And why not? Uh, George, you are beginning to waste my time. <clears throat> it is not likely that you killed Dilly and then struck yourself on the head. Therefore, I shall release you with the usual warning. Jordan, do oh, not... Oh, not again, Sam. I've heard that speech before. No, I'm not leaving Cairo. I like it here. I strolled out of Sam's office and onto the busy street. The neon signs were beginning to light up, which reminded me that the night crowd would be moving into the Cafe Tambourine. But there was one little matter that came before business. Murder. I was only a block away from the station when a small character stepped out of a darkened doorway. Well, 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 Rock, old kid, I've been looking all over for you. Why don't you try the other side of town? Listen, Rock, I didn't know it would turn out this way. I just read the extra about Lily. Look, Rock, you got to believe me. I ran out of Lily's place the minute the lights went out. I didn't know about it till later. Sam Sabaya might like to hear that story. Look, Rock, I saw something in that room. You know who turned out those lights? Sloan did it. I saw him. It's not news, little man. But Mike Sloan has some answers, and that's the man I'm going to see. But, Rock, he wouldn't be hanging around the facade. Uh, maybe we ought to go back to your place and uh, uh, get a drink first, huh? Hey, maybe you're right for once in your life. You give me an idea. Timmy Rogers and I headed back to the Cafe Tambourine. At every corner, Timmy looked four ways before crossing the street. It was exactly 7.30 when we walked in the front door. I worked my way through the crowded tables toward my office. Timmy Rogers hung on my coattail like a scared kid at a bargain counter. I opened the door. Just as the books were beginning to balance, I knew I had to throw them all out of the window. Sitting behind my desk was the man I was looking for. Mike Sloan. He was dead. Three holes neatly punctured the starched white shirt front of his tuxedo. Rocky... Is he dead? Shut the door. Rock, what's that? It's a calling card. Sloan had it crumpled in his hand. Gee, Rock, let me see it. Not so fast. Here. What? There's nothing on it. Just a dirty orange spot. Try turning it over, Timmy. Makes more sense that way. Rock, it says Ahmed Pasha. You guessed it. It's his calling card. Then, then that means Ahmed Pasha left it there? Oh, not likely. Maybe Sloan was trying to tell us something. You're right, Rocky. Sure, sure. Ahmed Pasha was in love with Lily and she wouldn't have him. So when he couldn't stop the wedding, he killed her. And Sloan saw him do it. It fits that way. And yeah, maybe it does, Rocky. What are you going to do now? Find Ahmed Pasha. Well, I... I don't know, Rocky. The Pasha didn't strike me as that kind of a guy. Maybe we're jumping to conclusions, Rocky, huh? Well, maybe not. Well, I don't know. That isn't much proof. Ahmed Pasha just doesn't look like the kind of person who would commit murder. Are you going to call Sabaya? Yeah, later. There's one other call I'm going to make first. Where's that, Rock? The card says office number 17, Kadru Street. Well, pretty late for calling at Pasha's office, isn't it, Rock? Oh, just a hunch, that's all. Uh, coming with me? Yeah, well, okay, Rocky, I guess so. <laughs> We ducked out the alley door. Down the street, we hailed a taxi and gave him the Pasha's address. As we weaved through the night traffic, wheels in my head ticked along with a cab meter. Everything added up like a traveling salesman's expense account. It fit now. I wouldn't be throwing any more books out of the window. 
There was a light in the office front as the cab pulled over to the curb. What is it, please? I'm looking for Ahmed Pasha. Is he here? It, it's rather late. No, no, he's not in. Do you mind if we step inside? Well, very well. You are also from the police? Rocky, maybe we better no, get out. No, not exactly, sweetheart. Ahmed Pasha left a calling card at my place. I'm returning the call. Then you are not the police? No. When were the, uh, the police here? A while ago. I don't remember. Please. Ahmed Pasha is not here. I cannot help you. I have not seen him all afternoon. Oh, just calm down. We'll make this short. Please don't ask me any more questions. It is time to close the office. I must go home. One thing more. Any idea where we could find him? Perhaps at his hotel. That is all I know. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the partner. No, no. The Hotel Shepherd, room 614. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, that's it. Uh, uh, sorry to bother you. I watched the girl bolt the door behind us and pull the curtains. So Sam Sabaya had paid his respects to the Pasha after all. Didn't look like his luck was any better than mine. Timmy Rogers had something in his mind. It's this way, Rock. The pastor shows up in your cafe and I get shot at. Then he comes to the wedding and Lily gets killed. You know, Rock, I don't think I'm in a hurry to meet that Pasha again. Uh, see what you mean. Look, Rock, why not let Sabaya handle it? If you go up there to Ahmed Pasha's hotel, you don't know what might happen. Jimmy, I think you got something there. Maybe it would be a nice idea to have Sabaya along. Sure thing, Rock. That's playing it smart. Oh, come on, we're wasting time. And not we, Rocky. If Sabaya is checking on Ahmed Pasha, I'm next. I don't want any part of that police station. The last time I dropped in to see Sabaya, I stayed 30 days. <laughs> All right, see you around, Timmy. Yeah, sure, Rock. See you around. I found the nearest phone booth and dial police headquarters. Sabaya was gone for the night. My next stop was the Cafe Tambourine. Nothing had turned up. Mike Sloan was still sitting behind the locked door to my office, and I left him there. That made it complete. There was only one item left on my list. Hotel Shepherd, room 614. The lobby of the Shepherd was teeming with a tourist trade. I strolled over to the main desk and waited for a pith-helmeted Englishman to collect his mail. Then I moved in. Rocky! Rocky Jordan, I say it's good to see you again. Where you been? Oh, usual places, Archie. Ah, what's on your mind, Rocky? Archie, you got a small favor. Oh, Rocky, the last wave you asked of me almost caused me my position here. Oh, sorry to hear it. This one's going to be easy. Oh, yes? What is it? I want the key to room 614. Really? Oh, no. Oh, now, Rocky. Oh, there you go again. Oh, this is important, Archie. Oh, I, I can't do it, Rocky. Sorry. I'd, I'd really be discharged doing a trick like that. Besides, that, that that's uh, Akmud Pasha's room. Don't you know that? Well, he's a permanent guest Look, here. Look, Archie, I said it was important. Oh, well, I, I, I'd like to, Rocky, but you know... Thanks, Archie. I knew you'd help me out. Archie's a real friend. He made like he didn't even know I'd slipped him the ten spot when he handed me the key. Being in Shepherd's was like old home week. When the little numbers on the door said 614, I stopped. This was the end of the line. I put the key in the lock. I gave the doorknob a quick turn kick the door open and dive for the floor inside. When the shooting stopped, I reached back with my foot and kicked the door closed. In the thick darkness, I started crawling for the spot the shots had come from. I figured he wouldn't move, but I was wrong. I met him halfway. He didn't have time to shoot again. The lights came on, and in the doorway stood Ahmed Pasha. All cane and white gloves. The brown bowler resting neatly on his round head. Well, what is the meaning of this? Well, I don't have time for the shooting. Maybe you'd like to meet the man who murdered Lily Karoff. Ah, take a look. Why? Why? That's he's... right. The little fixer himself, Timmy Rogers. <laughs> Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Now a note for you listeners. Remember, Rocky Jordan has joined one of the most outstanding mystery lineups in radio. 
Over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember this same time each Sunday night for Rocky Jordan. Now for the ending of tonight's story. It was after midnight before Sam Sabaya and I could settle down back in my office at a cafe tambourine. They had taken Sloan's body away, and as usual, Sam wanted details. Now, Jordan, about the Pasha's calling card. I found Sloan dead with a card in his hand. It was Ahmed Pasha's, all right, but on the back there was an orange spot. The Pasha's too neat a guy to be passing out soil calling cards. Besides, the color of the spot struck me. Where would you pick up an orange spot? I have the slightest idea. That's because you don't drink, Sam. Ever hear of a cocktail called an orange blossom? The real fancy things made with orange sherbet and gin. What has this orange blossom to do with the calling card? Timmy Rogers was drinking one this afternoon when my bar got shot up. He must have picked up Posh's card off the bar after the shooting. What he didn't notice was that a little of his own drink had spilled on it. Then he deliberately left the card in Mike Sloan's hand after killing him. Sure. Timmy had it all set for Ahmed Pasha. July made him think Pasha knew something. That's when he got scared. He waited for Pasha in his hotel room, and when I came in, well, you know the rest. He fired at a swinging door. So Timmy killed Lily, and then Mike, because Mike had seen him do it. Well, the whole scheme was simple, Sam. It was Timmy's idea to set up the phony white Russian scare. That was to get Lily out of town so he and Mike could take over a money-making nightclub. They were going to buy her out for almost nothing. And at the same time, Timmy could square the 5000 he owed the club. A good scheme it was, too, Jordan. Except that Timmy Rogers lost his head and killed Lily when Ahmud Pasha threatened to expose them. Ahmud Pasha must have loved Lily very much, Jordan. Lily. His uh, little flower, hmm? Uh, do not make fun of his love, Jordan. Love is a serious business. I uh, guess I wouldn't know, Sam. <laughs> I guess I wouldn't know. Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and William Frug, produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again. The choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. They offered me a cool million and a half, but I couldn't be bought. Oh, Sam, all the time fooling. Straight goods, Abby. Oh, really, Sam? Why didn't you take it? Oh, but you couldn't, of course. That's right, Angel. Taxes. Oh, you mean it would put you in a bracket? Uh, the girl's name, in case you were going to ask, was Sugar Cane. Was she sweet? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, not much of one, no. That is true. But even though you do seem to be, as you would say, in a jugular vein, I shall be right down, serious and frowning, to dictate a chronicle steeped in the bitter tea of general confusion, brewed in a witch's cauldron of murder, greed, and avarice... That's what gives it that nutty flavor. What, Sam? Silly girl, I refer to the sugar cane caper on which I will forthwith my report be down to dictate on, uh, uh it, uh, uh, with, uh, goodbye. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama... Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Want to look better on the job? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Want to look better to that gal of yours? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. 
Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic improves your entire appearance by grooming your hair neatly and naturally, relieving dryness, removing loose dandruff. If your family hasn't yet enjoyed the benefits of America's leading hair tonic, here's what to do about it. Ask at your drug or toilet goods counter for the new 25-cent get-acquainted bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. You were so lugubrious over the phone. Sometimes you're so bucolic, but tonight... What am I? When? Lugubrious tonight. Just, just, just bowling over. Do you uh, possibly mean I'm being lush with my verbiage? There, you see? Well, that's because I've been at work in the environs of Snob Hill, where they never use one word if 12 will do. <laughs> Are you uh, ready for the dictation? I guess it is. I plan to be most amusing tonight. Already I am yet. <laughs> Look, I haven't even started. Oh. Really, I haven't. All right. Now, pencil. Date. <laughs> Alan should have such an audience. Date. October 3rd, 1948, to Clifton Cavanaugh, Esquire. Down, Effie. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the sugar cane caper. On Thursday last... At 11 a.m., as I waited for the traffic signal so that I might legally cross Powell Street and order to board a cable car, a cat rubbed up against my leg. I leaned over to stroke it and noticed that it had six toes. I wondered if that meant anything. It didn't. Most Knob Hill addresses don't mean much anymore, but yours still does. The house was big, hideous, and reassuring. Oh. Are you from Pfeffersnow? Uh, no, I'm in business for myself. Mr. Cavanaugh in? Oh, well, come on in. I can't understand what happened to that boy from Peppersnell. Oh, uh, pardon me if I seem a little hungover. Gladly, but can you ever forgive yourself? <laughs> I like you. You got a sense of humor. You'll need it. You were uh, trying to tell me you don't approve of Mr. Cavanaugh? That perfume pothead. What did he do to you? He married my mother. Oh, stepfather? Yeah. No, I'm Fred Blair. Spade's my name. Where do I find him? Detective? Check. I'll give you a clue. Look behind you. I did. I turned and found myself looking straight into your handsome face. You looked several years younger than your stepson, with regular aquiline features, dark, widely spaced eyes, and blue-black hair. Well, so you're the notorious Sam Spade. Well, I don't want to seem modest. Come into the conservatory. There's just the barest chance that we'll not be overheard. Good. There. Sit down. Uh, what's your problem, Mr. Cavanaugh? Problem indeed. Problems, plural. Starting with that junior grade lush that collared you at the door. He's very fond of you, too. Well, you can't imagine what a trial that boy's been to me. Both the children. For some reason, neither Fred nor his sister Eunice ever quite accepted me as their father. You don't say? I suppose my youth counted against me. I think they misinterpreted my motives. When any man marries a wealthy widow twice his age... Yeah. Uh, why did you send for me, Mr. Cavanaugh? Well, it all started several months back, before my wife, uh, their mother, uh, 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 where was I? Oh, died. The scandal quite literally killed her. You're sure that's what did the trick? Fred, uh, who, among other talents, was a positive genius for knowing the wrong sort of people, struck up an acquaintance with a hoodlum named Johnny Verona. Nice, clean-cut gangster type, runs a joint on Pacific Street. Precisely. With the positively hysterical name of the Subtropico. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a sordid brawl of some sort. A man shot. Obviously, this Johnny Verona shot him. Fred had to give testimony before the grand jury. It was all we could do to keep it out of the paper. But you did. No. And old Eleanor, my wife, that is, uh, dropped dead when the butler brought in the Chronicle. But the worst was yet to come, Sam. Well, uh, don't keep me hanging, Cliff. Uh... Well, Fred continued to frequent this bistro, this dive of Verona's. I understand. I believe the bait is a toothsome little teaser with the unlikely name of Sugar Cane. She likes Fred. No woman in her right mind would look twice at that idiot, even if he were twice as rich and only half a sodden. Then, 
Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, this... This, uh, uh, this Verona person came here several times on the pretext of pouring Fred through the front door and thereby bet, met my, my, my stepdaughter, Eunice. Well, uh, that's uh, a very interesting story, Mr. Cavanaugh. Now, uh, maybe you'll tell me what you want a detective for. Because my stepdaughter has brazenly informed me that she intends to marry this gangster. I want you to help me prevent that marriage. I uh, don't see. Don't see what? I don't see how I can. Well, perhaps I didn't make myself clear. When Verona was arrested for that shooting in his club, Fred didn't tell the grand jury all he knew. Now, if you could prove that Verona is guilty, then we'd be rid of him for good. Is it Verona you want to get rid of or your stepson? Good Lord, you don't, you don't think Fred did it? Do you? Why, no, of course not. Okay, supposing Verona did it, then Fred goes up on a perjury rap, maybe accessory. Oh. Well, I have no overwhelming desire to injure Fred. Uh, look, why don't you tell me what you have an overwhelming desire for? Well... Under the terms of her mother's will, Eunice will inherit three million dollars as soon as she marries. When? Uh, when what? When do I meet her? Be serious, man. Now, I will pay Verona fifty thousand dollars in cash if he'll stay away from her. Would you take fifty grand as the payoff on a three million dollar caper? In this instance, yes. Eunice is not very well, and you may quote me on that book, chapter, and verse. To Johnny Verona. Uh, to Johnny Verona. Okay. Water's mighty cold this time of the year at the bottom of the bay, but if you don't care, I don't. Thank you. Let me know how it comes out. Don't give it a second thought. You'll know. Uh, don't get up, Mr. Cavanaugh. I know the way out. Hey, Spade, wait up. Well, you look a little better. Listen, there's something you ought to know. He was my sister's boyfriend before he married my mother. He did it out of revenge because Eunice threw him over. He still wants to marry her. Any particular reason? Oh, my mother put that crazy marriage clause in her will. He's been systematically getting rid of every man who's been interested in her. Bought him off, threatened him off any way he could. Why? He thinks Eunice will eventually marry him to get her inheritance. But she won't. She'll kill him first, and if she doesn't, I'll do it for her. Fred. Oh. Oh, yeah? Fred, what on earth are you saying? Who is this man? Well, he's the detective. Sam Spade. You're Eunice Blair? Yes, I want to talk to you. Fred, go, go and... Yeah. Uh, see you later, Spade. I know why my stepfather hired you, Mr. Spade. If you need the money, go ahead. But this time, it won't work. You look as if you'd like to be a nice girl. How did you happen to settle for a cheap grifter like Johnny Verona? Because we understand each other, and he can't be scared off. Any message I can take him from you? Tell Johnny I'll meet him at the usual place. And tell him I still like my coffee black. No sugar. <laughs> I didn't ask her what kind of sugar she didn't want any of. I thought I knew. <laughs> the only thing wrong with uh, Sugar Cane's dance was her dancing, but the customers didn't seem to mind, and I didn't either. It was a pleasure to size her up carefully, as I would have felt obliged to do anyway in my professional capacity. She was a black-haired number with aquiline features and widely spaced dark eyes. It was a beautiful combination. And I wondered where I'd seen it before quite recently. I decided to find out. Hey, what's the idea of barging in here after me? Can't you see the sign on the door? No customers in the dressing room. Then let's go someplace else. I want to talk to you. Beat it. Take it easy. This is on business. Good. I'll fix it up with the boss. Johnny! Yeah, sugar. Uh, what's the matter? Is Joe giving you trouble? You trailed in here after me to cheat, Masher. On the pretext of discussing business affairs. Okay, out you go. Uh, wait a minute. Come on, move. And don't uh, come back. Well? Uh, sorry, I had to give that bum's rush routine. I don't want to get her excited. She's a nice kid, and she doesn't know why you're here. I take it you do. Yeah. Eunice called me and told me you'd be down. Okay, Johnny, I'll give it to you fast and get out. Clifton Cavanaugh will pay you 50 grand to leave Eunice alone. He also made a few idle or not-so-idle threats about what might happen to her if you don't take his money. Uh, for example? He said she hasn't been feeling well, might not live long enough to get married. I don't have to tell you what I think about that kind of talk, and I wouldn't be peddling it if my office rent wasn't due. That's why when you started giving me that bums rush, I made only, shall we say, a token resistance? Yeah. About me marrying Eunice... You can tell Clifton to stop worrying. Hmm? Yeah, Eunice and I got married three weeks ago. You what? Married. Well, you want to see the papers? 
Why the secrecy? I don't want her to get hurt. You're scared of Clifton? Nah, sugar. She's got a very low boiling point. She's a... Oh, uh, pardon me. Yeah. Yeah, Nick. What is? Go ahead. Yeah, I heard you. No, no, don't touch anything. Don't let anybody in. I'll be right over. Bad news? Yeah, Eunice. She's dead. How? Uh, one of my boys found her in my apartment. She was supposed to wait for me there. How did it happen? He's not sure. He thinks she took poison. I had to give Johnny Verona one thing. He didn't make any pretense about being grief-stricken. But after all, he just inherited three million bucks. Sugar Cane took it standing up, too, but she just lost a rival and got her man back three million bucks richer. I wasn't with you when you got the news, Mr. Cavanaugh. But the one I really wondered about was Eunice's brother, Fred. What brought that on was something I picked up in Johnny Verona's apartment where we found Eunice's body sprawled out over a tray of coffee things. It was a medicine bottle with a doctor's prescription number on the label. The name of the druggist that had put it up was Pfefferschnau. I remembered what Fred had said to me when he admitted me to your house that afternoon. Quote, are you the man from Pfefferschnau's? I wondered if I'd answered yes, would Eunice still be alive? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the sugar cane caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. morning papers didn't carry anything new on Eunice's death. The cause was put down to an overdose of a toxic drug. The doctor who prescribed it said she'd requested it for migraine headaches, which he suggested might have driven her to suicide. He did not explain why she had taken four doses in capsule form and dissolved the rest of it in a decanter of coffee. I thought somebody else had dosed the coffee, and so did you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Barona did it, of course. He knew she was taking those pills and dosed the coffee just enough to be fatal when added to what she took voluntarily. You knew all that, too. Well, so did Fred. But you had more reasons, three million more. But they were already married. You know that when you hired me? Yes. Then how come? I knew she was planning to do away with herself. I thought if we could pin it on Verona, after all, he's guilty of that old murder. Fred's a witness to that. Well, if he were convicted, the money would revert to me. Nuts. You don't believe me? She wasn't planning suicide, and you know it. Well, then... I don't care who takes the fall, but I got less on Verona than I got on you. Then I'll give you something. Here. Take a look. Verona's lawyer sent this around before her body was cold. A claim for three million dollars notarized yesterday while Eunice was still alive. Well, Mr. Spade. Pardon me when I drop dead. You did and waited hopefully, but I managed to stay on my feet. I even managed to make it down the hall to the bar where I found your stepson ambushed behind a row of empty bottles. Fine detective you turn out to be. I warned you. Stand up like a man. That's all right. I'll take on both of you. Come on, sober up. Makes sense. Where's my drink? 
Who took my glass? Here it is. Give me it. Sure. You spill it. Who's ice on my shirt? Listen to me. This is very important. Important? You were expecting a delivery from a drugstore when I arrived there yesterday morning. Who ordered it? She did. Eunice, she told me to watch for it and bring it to her. Did you do that? No. No, she wasn't here. What did you do with that bottle of medicine? I'm sleepy. I gotta get some rest. Wake up! I said, wake up! Leave me alone! Now, now, listen. You took that bottle with you when you went out. Where did you take it? If I tell you, will you let me go to sleep? You took that bottle with you, didn't you? You're guessing. I know you're third degree. You went to Verona's apartment, didn't you? Two gentlemen of Verona. Willie Shakespeare. You doped that coffee, didn't you, with the poison that killed your sister? I didn't mean it for her. I, I didn't know she was going there. Go on talking. <laughs> I want a lawyer. I, I know my rights. Listen, I'm not a cop. I'm not taking a statement. You're too drunk for it to hold anyway, so you can tell me. Uh, okay. Here's how it happened. She, she took four pills and went to bed. Yeah? I, I, I sneaked a bottle out of the medicine chest and I went over to his place. His boy Nick was there making coffee for the boss, he said, when he got home. I hung around talking for a while, and I I, I slipped some of the stuff in the percolator while he was getting out the cups, and and that's all. Why did you want to kill Johnny Verona? So Eunice wouldn't have to marry him. What do you mean, have to? She was doing it for me, so he'd keep quiet. About that brawl in the club, that old killing they tried to nail Johnny for? Yeah, Yeah, that's it. The gun that did it, He got rid of it before the cops arrived. That was my gun. Fred, straighten up. Look. Johnny dictated the story you told the grand jury. How do I know he didn't dictate the one you're telling me now? Who are you covering for? I I didn't say anything. I didn't tell you anything. Get out of here! What's the matter with you? I... Get get out the window! The revolver barrel that crashed through the darkened window pane behind the bar spoke twice. I answered it. I looked out into the darkness, making myself a good enough target to draw some fire. I fired back at the flashes. I was depending more on luck than aim, and luck was what I wasn't having much of. I went back to the place where Fred had fallen. The shots that had dropped him were luckier. He'd been dead before he hit the floor. What is it? What's happened here? See for yourself. Who? Shot through the window, couldn't see anything but the gun muzzle. Looked like a forty-five. Johnny Verona, he packs a forty-five. Who told you that? It came out of that investigation, one of the reasons they couldn't indict for that old shooting. There are a lot of reasons they couldn't get that indictment. What are you driving at? Neither one of the leading suspects was guilty. I don't follow you. Sugar Kane did that job. Well, that's wild. What if I told you Fred made a statement of that effect before he was shot? You're lying. He confessed. Did I tell you that? Well, he must have. He, he always talked about it when he was drunk. All right. All right, I was bluffing. Why? Just a crazy hunch. I thought there might be something between you and Sugar. Now I'm sure there isn't. Of course not. Should have spotted it before. You're too much the same type, even look alike. I can't make you out. Well, don't try. It's not worth it. Uh, you'd better call homicide about Fred here. Tell Lieutenant Dundee if he wants my statement, I'll be at my apartment. <laughs> After I pretended to leave, I came back and did a little eavesdropping of my own. You didn't phone homicide, but you did spend an hour filing out the barrel of a forty-five automatic. Then you went out. I tailed you to an address on Sloat Boulevard. A short time after you went in, Sugar Kane came out alone. I followed her to, you know the answer, my apartment. I went in the back way via the fire escape and arrived in time to answer her buzz. Oh, Mr. Spade, thank heaven I found you at home. So am I. Come in. I know it's terribly late. Forget it. Won't you take off your uh, coat or something? Can't stay very long. It's not safe. I may have been followed here. Oh, surely not. Sam, you don't mind if I call you Sam? No. I'm so frightened. It's about Johnny Verona. I don't know what he may do. He's convinced that Fred killed Eunice and he's out gunning for him right now. We've got to stop him before he does anything rash. You come to the wrong party, sugar. I'm working for the enemy. Enemy? Kavanaugh. Oh. It's no skin off his nose if Johnny Verona drops Fred Blair or if you all drop. All he does is sit back and collect. He can't be as cynical as that. You ought to know. Has he told you anything about me? I'd rather hear it from you. May we sit down? Well, there's not much to tell. I played along with Johnny for one reason and one reason alone. To save Fred from that old murder rap. Were you uh, figuring on marrying into that family, too? Oh, sir. A regular pincers movement, wasn't it? Johnny and Eunice, you and Fred. All right. It's true I wasn't in love with Fred, 
But it wasn't all the money. I was sorry for him. Money's not what I really want. I know that now. What do you want? Someone. Someone I can trust. Me too, sugar. Oh, Sam, you're what I want. Say you want me to. Please say it. Don't answer it, Sam. Why not? Johnny may have followed me here. He's insanely jealous. Well, I gotta face it out with him sooner or later. Might as well be now. Sam, be careful. Stand out of the way, sugar. No, Sam. No, no, please. Don't reach, Johnny. I'm not gunning for you, Spade. In that case, come on in. Well, sugar. I didn't believe him that you were coming here. I had to, Johnny. He got some crazy confession out of Fred while he was drunk. I had to stall him until you and Cliff could talk to him. To save Fred, I mean. Oh, stop horsing around. We all know that we all know Fred is dead, and we all know that we all know who killed him. Oh, uh, then Cliff was leveling. You are trying to pin that on me. I don't need it, but if you want it, you can have it. There's three million bucks in my part of it. I'll split down with the middle with you. If you throw in with them, it's a three-way split. There's no split at all if you take the rap for Eunice's killing. And you will if you throw in with me. It's their word against mine. Two witnesses against one. And all I've got is a confession by a drunk who is now dead. Sam. Oh, Sam, I was sure for a moment you... Get away from me. Sam, <laughs> Go on. Go to work on him. I should have given you a little more time. That wasn't fair, was it, Sugar? I hate you. I hate you both. I never want to see you again. Get back in that room, Sugar. Cliff. What happened, Sugar? Why were you running away? Johnny double-crossed us. Now Sam knows everything. What does he know? The whole caper. Part of it I wasn't quite sure of until I saw you and Sugar standing side by side. That blue-black hair, the same eyes, plus the fact that the bell on Sugar's apartment on Sloat Boulevard reads Kane, parenthesis, Kavanaugh. You took a crazy chance when you knocked off Fred with me right there in the room. The kind of a crazy chance a brother would take to keep his sister clear. I could have told you that. It would have helped a lot, Johnny, but you didn't. When a man lets his sister go on dancing in a joint like yours after he's in the chips and she goes on liking it, you can be sure they're both playing for big stakes and for nobody but themselves. Where do you think you were supposed to wind up, Johnny? I'll tell you. Drinking that poison coffee that Eunice got hold of by mistake. That isn't true, Johnny. I never told Fred a thing. He thought you really loved Eunice. I don't know how he found out you were forcing her into that marriage. Uh, did you also neglect to tell him that he was innocent? That you pulled a trigger in that old killing and, and shoved a gun into his hand when he was too drunk to know what he was doing? I've heard enough. Watch it, Johnny. Please, no! Ow! I winged you a split second before you fired. Your aim went wild. All I saw at first was that it missed Johnny. Then I saw him move forward in her direction. She was leaning against the wall, a puzzled expression on her face. Her hand plucking nervously at a spot of red that was spreading against the white of her dress. He caught her as she pitched forward and carried her over to a couch. She didn't speak again. You and Johnny knelt beside her until the cops arrived. If you were aware of each other's presence, neither of you showed it. Period. End of report. That was a sad ending, Sam. Yes, it is. I'm sorry it ended so sadly. Well, it was bound to one way or the other. There wasn't anybody in the whole gallery that thought about anybody but himself. Except poor Fred, I guess, and his his only friends arrived in bottles and left in the ash can. All those millions and millions. Who oh, get the money now, Sam? I'm glad you asked that. It leaves me cold. Go type that up while I knit myself a sweater. And now, listen to this. It's the smart mother who sees to it that wild root cream oil is always kept handy around the house. For she knows that wild root cream oil grooms her family's hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Get acquainted by asking for the new 25-cent bottle. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men and women and children, too. terrible group of unfortunates. Hmm? As you say, it just had to end badly. If you hope to get back in my good graces by quoting me, to trick me into agreeing with you, you have succeeded. Oh, there you go, Sam. So lugubrious. Effie, what is this? What means lugubrious? Oh, Sam, it's wonderful. It's my new habit. Oh? Every time I read a book now, mm -hmm. and you know, like you read a book and there's a word you don't know what it means or you're not sure. Yeah. Well, I make it a practice now to write down and learn three new words per day. Well. And learn the definitions to use them in conversation. You know, like, uh, desultory. And lugubrious. Yes, that's one of my three for today. Mm. See? Lugubrious. Right here it is. Mm -hmm. To talk a great deal. Um, bucolic, state of being sorrowful. 
and verbose to be out in the country. I see, I see. Very praiseworthy. <laughs> Enlarging your vocabulary. Yes, love it, I love am. it. I am. But I don't expect to be really lugubrious for, oh, for the nonsense. Uh, look, Effie, why don't you go verbose for the weekend? It's the best cure for the bucolic. Oh, Sam, look what I've done. What have you done? I've clipped the wrong definition to the right words. Well. For instance, lugubrious, well, it isn't that at all. Mm-hmm. And bucolic, oh, let me see. Oh, Sam, I've learned them wrong. I wasn't going to tell you, Effie. It's better to find out for yourself. It's more, uh, Effie cases. My new habit. Oh. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dow. Musical direction by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Renee Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Are you baldy? Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast... From the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Half an hour from now, when this Equitable Society program ends, the following scene will be enacted in hundreds of American homes. Husbands will turn to their wives and say, Dear, did you hear what he said about that fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers that the Equitable Life Assurance Society has published? Sounds like just what we need. I'm going to ask my Equitable Society representative to bring me a copy. It happens every time we offer the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Requests pour in to the Equitable Society. Uh, what is this chart? What fact does it help you to find? Listen carefully in about 14 minutes and you'll learn all about this famous chart created for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Friendly Forgers. When you hear the word criminal, you are likely to think of a young man thoroughly corrupt and thoroughly tough. A young man who uses a blazing gun to punctuate his every action. In the most recent survey taken by your FBI, a survey which covered the field of crime throughout all of the 48 states, it was found that the greatest number of those arrested were 21 years of age. The second greatest group was age 22. Those are shocking figures and tend to sustain the common picture of the criminal as a young man. However, that same survey revealed that the number of arrest records for those in the 50 and over age bracket was more than the total of the 21 and 22-year-olds put together. Almost 10% of all people arrested in the United States this year had reached the age of 50, and their violations covered every statute in the books. This aged group of lawbreakers has rejected the proverb that crime does not pay and has substituted their own slogan. If at first you don't succeed, 
Cheat. Cheat again. Tonight's file opens in a building located in a small Midwestern town. It is early afternoon, and in one of the rooms of this building, an elderly lady is seated talking to her husband. Calvin, I've got a lot of marketing to do before dinner. Would you please sign my checks now? Uh, of course, Hattie. Let me have them. All right. Here you are. And here's a pen. Uh, thank you. You sign Mr. Thackeray's name on the blue checks and Mr. Goodwin's name on the yellow ones. All right. <laughs> you know, Calvin, I was just thinking this morning, you sign Mr. Thackeray's name better than he does himself. Thank you. Uh, I wish I could make these checks bigger, Hattie, but... Oh, I'm not complaining. How about the young man who's passing these for you? Mr. Raymond? Yes, has he given you any of the money? Well, not yet. Hmm. Doesn't sound like that boy is treating us right, Hattie. Well, every time I see him, he says that all his money is in a safe deposit box and he can't get to it. Why not? Well, I always see him at night when the bank is closed. Oh. He did give me a note saying he'd pay me what was coming to us. Mm-hmm. Well, let me see it. Well, now, let's see. Oh, yes, here. Here it is. Mm-hmm. Now, the note says he'll give us our money tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, uh, let's give him one more chance. Deliver these checks to him tonight and then go to see him in the morning. All right, Calvin, I will. Your time's up. Yes. Well, I'll see you tomorrow, Hattie. I've... Got to go back to my cell. Meanwhile, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is seated at his desk when Agent Glenn Adams approaches. Did you want to see me, Jim? Hmm? Oh, hello, Glenn. Yes, I walked by your desk before, but you were out. I had to go over to Memorial Hospital. Ah, oh, you look pretty healthy to me. Well, it wasn't anything personal. Ah, that's good. I had to interview one of the patients over there. Oh? That's a long ride. Well, Glenn, you've got some more traveling to do. Oh? Mm-hmm. The SAC just assigned us to work on a bad check case together. A traveling case? Uh-huh. Here, take a look at this map. Okay. See all those little X's? Uh, these? That's right. I just finished putting them there. Well, what are they? Well, each of them indicates a place where one of the bad checks was cashed. Hmm. Uh. Looks like a lot of checks. Thirty-seven of them have turned up so far. Hmm. Well, whoever passed them really fanned out, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, look at this. Now, you can see he left here. You can follow the X's north on Route 26 until they reach Corona. Uh-huh. And he passed three, four, five, six, seven bad checks all along Route 11. Uh-huh. Now, he worked around here, then back into town along Route 82. Well, have we got any description on who passed the checks? Not a very good one, Glenn. I guess that's one of the reasons you were assigned to the case. The SAC wants you to visit each of these places and make up a composite picture of the check passer. I guess I might as well start right now. Picture will be a big help, Glenn, as soon as you get it finished. I'll be back as soon as I can. Good. Oh, I've already sent the checks down to the lab in Washington. We should have a report back by the time you're finished with the drawing. Yeah. Who are you talking to on the phone? Oh, Lady Bingham. She's in the lobby. Mm, what does she want? She's coming up to see me. What? She wants some money. Now, that must be her. Get it, will you? Okay. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Raymond. Hello, Mrs. Bingham. Come in. Well, thank you. Hi, Mrs. Bingham. Oh, hello there. Oh, let me have your pair. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, would you like a drink, Miss Bingham? Oh, I don't drink. I learned my lesson about whiskey at an early age. Oh? My father was in the forging profession, too. And when he drank, it affected his nervous system. And he couldn't sign any name but his own. <laughs> well, he finally vowed to never drink when he was working. He kept that vow, too. You know, my husband Calvin is a lot like him. Iron-willed. Determined. Uh-huh. Now, just look at Calvin right now. Any other man in jail would just sit there and do nothing. But not a week goes by that Calvin doesn't learn a new signature. Wow. Why, the first time he ever went to jail, 
Calvin sold mining stock through the mails. Oh? Yes, sir. He used the prison library as his office, and he made enough money to hire a new lawyer who got him a pardon. Well, he sure deserves a lot of credit, don't he, Ruth? Yeah. Well, you keep working that hard, Mr. Raymond, and you will be as successful as Calvin is at his age. Well, I'll sure try. Uh, now, let's see. Mr. Raymond, did you pass any of the checks I delivered to you yesterday? Uh, no. No, I, I didn't work last night. Well, then, may, may I have the money that's coming to us from the last batch of checks? Well, I'm sorry. I still haven't been to the safe deposit box. Well, the bank is open this morning. Why don't we go down there now? Uh, well... Oh, Chuck, today's Monday. The bank's closed today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of a bank closing up on a normal day. Well, you've heard of it now. Mr. Raymond, I hate to say this. But I don't think you're telling me the truth. Oh, Mrs. Bingham, do I look like a man who would cheat an old lady? You gave me a note, and your note said that you would pay me today. Well, I know, but if the bank is closed, what can I do? I need that money to get Calvin out of jail. Oh, I'm sorry. Young man, you're trying to hoodwink me, but you're not going to get away with it. I'll get the money that's due me, even if I have to turn legitimate and call in the police. <laughs> Oh, Hattie, I, I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Oh, that's all right, Calvin. I had to clean up my cell before they let me come out to see you. Well, I haven't been waiting long. Uh, did you get to see Mr. Raymond? Yes. Well, did he give you our money? No. He refused to. Oh, oh that's terrible. I was wrong about that man, Calvin. He's completely dishonest. He certainly is. He was also very rude to me. Well, he sounds like a terrible person. Your time's to be up. Oh, oh, dear. Today was my third visiting day this week, Calvin. Now they won't let me see you again until Monday. Yes, yes, I know, but don't worry, Hattie. Well? I'll think of some way to get our money from Mr. Raymond. <laughs> Jim, it took a lot of work, but I've got that composite picture. Good. Let me see it, huh? Here. Uh, I know I'm no Rembrandt, Jim, but I think that's a pretty good likeness of whoever passed those checks. Oh, I'm sure it is, Glenn, but this is a young man. Well? Well, before you came in, I got a report back from the lab in Washington. What did they say? The handwriting analysis section said that these checks are the work of an old-time forger named Calvin Bingham. Well, maybe Bingham is working with this young man. Oh, he can't be. Why not? According to the records, Bingham started a two-year sentence for forgery last September. Was the lab sure about it being Bingham who wrote the checks? Glenn, they never make a mistake about a thing like that. Oh, you're right, they don't. You know, you should have brought me back a picture of an old lady. Why? Well, Bingham used to write the checks and his wife used to do the passing. Well, these checks were definitely passed by a man, Jim. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, we ought to know a little more when I get my report on Bingham. Mm -hmm. I sent word to the warden of the jail he's in and asked him to question Bingham about these new forgeries. Well, Jim, maybe I should go down to Ident and see if I can find anybody whose picture looks like this drawing I've made. That's a good idea, Glenn. Yes. Oh, pardon me. Sure. Special Agent Taylor. Yes. That's right. What? When? I see. Thanks very much for calling. Glenn, a lot more of old man Bingham's checks may show up in the next couple of days. Why do you say that? He just broke out of jail. It's me, Hattie. Calvin! That's right. My goodness, Calvin, what in the world are you doing here? Well, I've come home, that's all. Well, when did you get out? What happened? Well, I suppose you'd say I broke out. Jailbreak? Yep. Well, but how did you manage it? I was given a new cell companion yesterday. A man named Miller. Yes? He was very angry about being in prison. So, early this morning, he decided to break out. When I learned of his plan, I prevailed upon him to let me accompany him. Well, that was very nice of him. We left right after breakfast. After breakfast? Hmm. Why, gracious, it's almost four in the afternoon now. Where have you been? I had something to attend to. Even before you saw me? I wasn't sure this thing could wait, Hattie. I went to see Mr. Raymond. Oh. I wanted to talk to him about his being so rude to you yesterday. 
Calvin. I also wanted to ask him for the money he owes us. What did he say? He refused. So there was nothing I could do but pick his pocket. Good for you. I got all the money he owes us and more besides. From his pocket? Indirectly. I got $8,000 in cash. $8,000? My, why, that's like old times. Hattie, I think we ought to take a little trip with Mr. Raymond's money. Oh, I like that, Calvin. And it'll teach him a good lesson, too. He'll know now that honesty is still the best policy. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Now, listen. Do you hear that clock? Not many more minutes of 1948 left but still time enough for fathers and mothers who truly love their children to make an extremely important New Year's resolution. What is that resolution, Mr. Keating? Resolve here and now that beginning in January 1949, you will not leave your children's future happiness and security to chance. Resolve that even if you, the breadwinner, should die unexpectedly, your family will continue to be well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed. I've often worried about that. Wondered what income they'd really need to live the way they should. George, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has published a chart which will give you the answer to that question. It's called the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. It was designed by the Equitable Society to help you figure just what income your wife and children would need to maintain a comfortable standard of living if you should be taken from them. This chart makes it simple and easy because you're guided every step of the way by easy-to-understand pictures. In five minutes you'll know just how much money your family will need to keep going and to keep together during the critical years until your youngest child finishes high school. Mr. Keating, I could use one of those charts. Where can I buy one? No, you can't buy it, George. It's free. Phone your Equitable Society representative soon and ask him to bring you a fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Or send a postcard, care of this ABC station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Your request will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable representative. Yes, 1949 is coming nearer and nearer. Resolve now to start the new year right by sending for the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Friendly Forgers. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates an important point, a point which you, as law-abiding citizens, would do well to ponder. The prison from which Calvin Bingham escaped was a small, poorly guarded one-story building. It was not poorly guarded because of carelessness on the part of the guards, but because there simply were not enough guards to do the required job. That situation exists in too many prisons in this country. In the majority of those cases... Prison authorities who are capable and conscientious are not provided with adequate facilities or adequate funds. This is a penny-wise and pound-foolish approach to the problem. Under the best of circumstances, it is a difficult job for any law enforcement agency to apprehend the criminals of the community. Once apprehended, though, it is obviously to your best interests that those criminals serve the sentences which have been meted out to them. For only in that way can you be sure that any real advancement is being made in the constant war against crime. Tonight's file continues at the apartment of Chuck Raymond. All right, all right, I'm coming, I'm coming. Who is it? It's me, Ruth. Okay. What happened to your key? I lost it. That's not very bright. How come you're up and dressed? I uh, had company. Who? Calvin Bingham. He busted out of jail and came up here to see me. He wanted some dough. What'd you tell him? I brushed him off, chased him out of here. Told him if he beefed any more, I'd blow a whistle on him. Good. Uh, Chuck, there's a joint around the corner. Give me your key and I'll go down and get a new one made. Okay. Hey. What? My keys are gone. Well, maybe they're in on the dresser. No, no, no. I remember putting them in my pocket. Hey, wait a minute. 
Old man Bingham, he clipped me for my keys. So he clipped your keys. What are you getting excited about? One of those keys was for our safe deposit box. Sorry I'm late, Glenn. Well, that's all right, Jim. I've made a little progress while you were out. Oh, what'd you find? Well, I took my composite picture over the ident section, and it turned out to be a pretty good likeness of a petty larceny thief named Chuck Raymond. Chuck Raymond, mm-hmm. huh? I looked up Raymond's arrest record, and I found that he seems to work with his wife. Hey, good work, Glenn. I-, I made a little progress myself. In which direction? Well, the local police captured Miller, the prisoner who escaped with Bingham. Mm-hmm. Were they still together? No, but I'd just been talking to Miller. It took me quite a while to convince him that he'd be better off telling me anything he knew about where Bingham might have gone. What did he say? Well, he finally told me that he knew Bingham was headed for the Lakeview District, but he didn't know the exact address. Well, that's a pretty big district, Jim. Yeah, it's too big for the two of us to cover. I had the local police send out an alarm on them. Good. I've been working for the last hour down at police headquarters trying to find out if Mrs. Bingham ever gave a Lakeview address when she was arrested. So what do we do now, Jim? Glenn, you say that picture you made was a good likeness of a man named Chuck Raymond, huh? That's right. Do we know where this Raymond lives? Yes, I got his address just before you came in. Oh, swell. Why don't you get a warrant for the arrest of Mr. and Mrs. Raymond and also of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bingham? I've already gotten those, Jim. Good. Have you got search warrants? Yes. Okay, now why don't you go over and see if you can make the arrest on the Raymonds? All right, Jim. I'll stay here and see if I can find out anything on old man Bingham's address. Just think, Calvin. My first plane ride. Nice, isn't it? Yes. Calvin, you never did tell me how you got Mr. Raymond's money. Well, I just took his keys and went to his safe deposit box. When I got there, I copied his signature off the note he gave him. That was very clever. Thank you, Hattie. You've earned a good vacation. Oh, I intend to keep working. What a lovely place like St. Petersburg. Oh, Calvin. St. Petersburg is where all the old folks go. They're a very fertile field. How do you mean? They're always playing shuffleboard. You know the way they play that, Harry? Is that where you take a stick and push a little round piece of wood across a place that's got some numbers painted on it? Mm, That's right. And whatever number the little piece of wood stops on is what you count on your score. Oh, uh uh-huh. The highest number is ten. Hattie, I've got a way to play where I get all ten. Really? How? Paint the ten with heavy lead paint. And then put a strong magnet in the little round piece of wood. Calvin, I'm proud of you. (laughs) Imagine being married to the first shuffleboard hustler in history. Jim, I went to see the Raymonds. What happened, Glenn? They were gone. They took every stitch of clothing they owned along with them. Oh, fine. The place was absolutely cleaned out. There wasn't even anything in the waste paper baskets. Any lead on where they went? None at all. There's a self-service elevator in the building, and none of the neighbors saw them leave. Well, that makes our problem a little more difficult. Mm-hmm. Nothing came in on the Bingham alarm, did it? No, not a thing, Glenn. Do you suppose they could all be together? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Oh, pardon me, Glenn. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Yes, Lieutenant. You did? Oh, just a minute, I'll copy that. Pencil clean. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, Lieutenant, go ahead. Hmm. Yep, got it. Thanks very much, Lieutenant. We'll get out there right away. Glenn, that was police headquarters. A cab driver just called them to say he saw old man Bingham's picture in the paper. Uh-huh. He says he picked Bingham up in front of the First National Bank yesterday afternoon and took him to uh, 831 Oak Street. Well, that ties in with what Miller told you, Jim. Mm-hmm. Oak Street is in the Lakeview District. Yeah, I know that. Come on. Let's get out there. Find anything yet, Jim? Just a figure written down on this telephone pad. Yeah. One hundred and eighty-seven dollars and fifty cents. Yeah. Well, that could represent almost anything. <laughs> You're so right. 
I've questioned all the neighbors, and none of them were friendly enough with the Binghams to be able to give us any information on where they might have gone. Superintendent says they left here early yesterday afternoon. Did he talk to them at all? Yes, but all he knew is that Mrs. Bingham said she was going to take her first airplane ride. Hmm. She didn't say where they were going. I see. Well, I guess they left here about the same time the Raymonds checked out of their place, huh? You know, Glenn, I'm not so sure that they're together now. Why not, Jim? Well, the superintendent told me there was a man and a woman here looking for the Binghams right after they left. Did he give you any descriptions on them? Well, luckily, I had a picture of Raymond in my pocket. Is that who it was? That's him. Superintendent made positive identification on him. He told me that Raymond gave him $20 for the privilege of looking around up here. He also said that Raymond picked up something and said, Now I know where they went. Let's go get them. Well, what did Raymond pick up? Well, whatever it was, he put it in his pocket. Oh, fine. That helps a lot. <laughs> Glenn. Yeah, well, wait a minute. This number on the telephone pad. $187.50. Well? Well, that could be helpful to us if, and this is a big if, if my hunch is right. <laughs> Shop aboard without anything on your head. Oh, but I did. This There's sun enough. is very strong down here. How did you make out in your game this morning? Well, I purposely <laughs> lost the first two games, and then the old coot I was playing with bet me fifty dollars on the next game. He's coming back this afternoon to play for a hundred. Oh, how sporting of him! No, oh, this is a delightful means of making a living, has he? Indeed it is. Even better than check passing. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Calvin. After all, in check passing, there's traditions. Well, I suppose so. Besides, we all... Calvin. Huh? Look who's coming down the path. Mr. and Mrs. Raymond. Oh, my. All right, you two, just stay where you are. Uh, why? Hello there. Uh, how, how did you ever know we were here? Found the telegram you got from this hotel confirming your reservations. Oh, that was careless of us, wasn't it, Hattie? Dear me, yes. Chuck, let's get our money and get out of here. You heard what my wife said? Get it up. Well, I'm sorry. I deposited all the money in the bank this morning. Look, that's our routine. He really did, Mrs. Raymond. Listen to me. If you don't turn around and walk back to your hotel with me and get me that money, I'll crown you both. Mr. Raymond... Please don't create a scene. You heard me. Now, do I get that money or don't I? I don't think you do. Huh? Look, mister, you stay out of this. This is private business. Oh, no, it's also my business. Good for you, young man. I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh. I'm taking all four of you down to headquarters. Oh, and, uh, Mr. Bingham, I've got some advice for you. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And what's that, sir? When we get to headquarters, don't try to put up a check for your bail. <laughs> four criminals in tonight's case were given long sentences for violation of the National Stolen Property Act. The clue which led to the capture of the four criminals in tonight's case from the files of your FBI were the figures which Special Agent Taylor found written on the telephone pad at the apartment which had been occupied by Mr. and Mrs. Bingham. The figure, $187.50. Upon checking at the airport, Special Agent Taylor found that the only place to which that figure was the exact fare was St. Petersburg, Florida. By catching a plane, he was able to arrive at St. Petersburg at approximately the same time as Mr. and Mrs. Raymond, who had taken a train. In a few hours, it will be 1949, and all of us want to convey to you our best wishes for a happy and prosperous new year. We also want to extend our greetings to a man who celebrates his birthday tomorrow, Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Happy birthday, Mr. Hoover, and a happy new year, everybody.
just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. But now, listen. With every second, 1949 is coming nearer and nearer. So don't forget that important New Year's resolution you made a few minutes ago. Your resolve to ask your Equitable Society representative to bring you the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. If you have difficulty in finding an Equitable representative, write a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. Your card will be forwarded to the nearest Equitable office. In any event, be sure to start the new year right by getting the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers prepared for you by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A preview of the streamlined criminal machine of 1949. Its subject, murder. Its title, The Out-of-Date Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The out-of-date killer on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.